Chapter 961 Chase Among the Mountains At this moment, Samira felt her heart suddenly tighten. The sense of crisis that came from behind made her body rush towards the tree. An arrow that was almost integrated into the night flew into the night sky grazing the tips of the broken hair on her head. She knew that the feathered arrow from the black shaft was an arrow secretly shot by the sharpshooter hiding in the dark in the opponent's army. If it weren't for her inexplicable sense of crisis, the arrow would have been able to shoot through her head. Samira no longer dared to stand carelessly in the open and snipe at the surviving black magicians in the air. She was also secretly observing the second-turn archer hiding in the dark. But she saw that man hiding in the military formation. He was very alert. When he saw Samira observing him from a distance, he immediately disappeared into the crowd. Before Samira, two second-level swordsmen were shot by his hidden arrows. Fortunately, the two arrows were not coated with messy poison and the two second-level swordsmen knew how to avoid vital points at critical moments. Although they were injured by the arrows, their actions were not affected. Serdak also immediately used holy light to treat him. During this kind of field march, the role of the paladin was immediately reflected. It is simply a life insurance. The eyes of Lord Trollope and Lord Quintus looked at Serdak, and they became quite eager. Hey, Serdak, do you have any idea of joining our constructed swordsman group? Being a commander in the Legion is really not suitable for you. Great swordsman Quintus patted Seldak's face. Shoulder. Asked him earnestly. I think by Len's plane is pretty good. Serdak did not say that there was an iron mine waiting to be developed by him. Seeing Seldak's tactful refusal. Great swordsman Quintus stopped asking any more questions. Although this time the assault team entered the mountains and forests at night like last time. They failed to escape the group of Lord MacDonald's private troops behind them. There are more than 3,000 lords' private troops behind this group of second-rank swordsmen, forming a huge net, ready to surround the second-rank swordsmen. This time, the black magicians were also in the night sky, dropping fireballs into the forest from time to time to determine the specific location of the assault team in the forest. The black magician was like a swarm of flies that couldn't be driven away, trying to wrap the assault team to death. The dark red night gradually faded, but the sound of horns could still be heard from all around. The assault team traveled through the mountains all night. But unfortunately, they still couldn't get rid of Lord MacDonald's army behind them. The number of troops entering the mountains to participate in the capture operation has been increased to 5,000. And there are more troops. Enter this mountainous area. It's getting brighter. During the day, it is difficult to avoid the black magicians flying around in the sky. That night, this group of black magicians threw countless fire bombs into the mountains. Just to follow the assault team. They did not get close but hung far behind. Obviously, this sneak attack by the assault team completely angered the black magicians of the magic monastery. They stayed up all night and flew in the sky on magic harpoons. The assault team was not able to rest all night, but chose to rest in a valley for nearly an hour during breakfast. The assault team went further and further in this mountain forest and had already left the regional map of Makuso City. There are only two kinds of maps in everyone's hands. One is the general area map of the Ganbu Plain. This one is just about the general shape of the Ganbu Plain. It looks like a shorter shoehorn. The other one is for this operation. The map used for the outskirts of Makuso City. The assault team has now left the map area. Serdak only knew that he was in the Grove Mountains. But he no longer knew the specific location. Great swordsman Quintus chose some mountains that were difficult to climb. Trying to use the complex terrain to get rid of Lord MacDonald's private army behind him. It's a pity that those black magicians in the sky smashed his plan to pieces. But after all, they are a group of second-level swordsmen. In terms of physical strength and strength, there is a huge gap between them and ordinary soldiers in the army. During the day, the assault team no longer took deters to avoid tracking, but directly followed a straight line southward, gradually gaining distance from the pursuing army in this mountain range. Now everyone cannot return to their houses in the suburban town of Makuso. It is not impossible to set up a temporary teleportation circle in the wild and return to Benis City. The temporary teleportation array was carried by the space magician in his magic pocket. As long as there was a sufficiently hidden place, the temporary teleportation array could be deployed at any time. It just takes time to build a temporary teleportation circle. A lot of time. Not only does it take time to build, but it also requires the magician to calculate the spatial orientation and make subtle adjustments to the matrix, which also takes a while. After everything is ready, it is possible to connect to the teleportation gate in the teleportation hall of Benna City. The troops pursuing behind them were actually not that far away from the assault team. The assault team had been marching for a whole day. 
and the distance they could open was extremely limited. There are several black magicians in the sky above their heads, flying around like smelly flies, but they just refuse to leave. Great swordsman Quintus, great knight Trollope, great swordsman Sabrina, and Archmage Merlin got together and had a serious discussion in the evening. Then, they called the space magician after passing by. A group of people devised a plan. The most important part of this plan is to let the Archmage Merlin and the great swordsman Sabrina take the space magician to hide secretly. Then the great swordsman Quintus and the great swordsman Trollope led most of the members of the assault team to circle with the pursuing army behind them in the mountain forest. After the temporary teleportation circle was set up, everyone quickly gathered it together. The 28th members used this time difference to complete the teleportation and quickly return to Bena City through the temporary teleportation circle. The only troublesome part is that this temporary teleportation circle is likely to fall into the hands of the opponent. Unless the location of this temporary teleportation circle is sufficiently secretive, it may not be found by the other party. To know the value of this temporary teleportation circle, you definitely don't need a second level magic pattern structure or an epic weapon. This set of temporary teleportation arrays is considered the private property of this space magician. But this magician is very easy to talk to. Quintus Great Swordsman just proposed such a plan. But he did not expect that the space magician was very cheerful. I agreed. This makes Great Swordsman Quintus feel a little embarrassed. Although there is bound to be some compensation from the military department and the House of Representatives, it probably won't be the full amount. Everyone didn't rest that night, trying to take advantage of this night to completely throw off the pursuing army. But early on the third day, Archmage Merlin, who secretly flew out to conduct a reconnaissance in the mountains, brought even worse news. Some troops were also discovered on the south side of the mountains. Chapter 962 Get Rid Of He was covered with a piece of green moss, which was in a semi-dry state and had a pungent smell like moss. He reached out and climbed onto a rock wall quickly climbing up to the highest cliff where he could overlook the entire valley below. He saw the assault team entering the valley one after another from a distance. And then he lay down on the boulder, his body pressed against the rock that was brittle due to weathering, licking his dry lips. He was a little afraid of the female archer who hid her face in her hood. His innate keen sense of bows and arrows allowed him to almost get injured during several sneak attacks. He lay on the rock and began to fantasize. If the female archer who covered his face was not so ugly, he would be willing to marry her. Then, he would take the position of leader of the Archer Regiment and leave Lord MacDonald's army. The two of them people can explore the world. Close your eyes. Take out a piece of pickled bacon jerky from your bag and throw it into your mouth, allowing your body to slowly replenish a little salt. He didn't dare to drink too much water. The only disadvantage of setting up an ambush on such a huge rock was that he couldn't move around at will. And he had to go to the toilet on the spot. He didn't want his pants to smell like urine. He tried to count the number of people in the assassination team on the opposite side. But these people always hid their bodies in the densest bushes and only occasionally showed their figures. So they could not be counted at all. He only knew that there should be 20 or 30 people. And that everyone was a level 2 powerhouse. Thinking of this, his spine felt a little chilly. Seeing the great swordsman walking in front with two huge swords on his back. He pulled the string of the long bow attached to the rock wall and pointed the arrow tip at his chest. Once the arrow is shot, Several second-level experts will immediately approach his hiding place. Therefore, when choosing an ambush location, he basically chooses a steep cliff on one side, so that even if the opponent finds him, he can leave calmly. However, there are too few such places to choose from in this mountainous area. The opponent's team includes archmages and second-level archers. Once he is entangled by the opponent while escaping, and those second-level swordsmen catch up, he will never leave alive. He will prioritize his retreat every time. After shooting an arrow, instead of looking back with confidence, you have to run away with your tail between your legs. If you don't run, you will just wait to die. He didn't sleep much for two days and two nights. He felt that his mental energy was on the verge of exhaustion. Even if he lay on the rock and closed his eyes for a while, he didn't dare to close his eyes before waiting for this assassination team. I was afraid that the assassination team would leave just as soon as I closed my eyes. When the assassination team passed by in the valley below, he refused to close his eyes. There were too many things he wanted to do. For MacDonald's legion, being attacked this time was truly humiliating. Lord MacDonald was easily kidnapped by the other party. Even though they knew that there were a large number of private troops near the manor, these second-level swordsmen actually turned back and slaughtered the five magic towers behind the manor in front of everyone's eyes. 
although there is a fundamental difference in strength between the second level powerhouses and the first level knights. They are not gods. They will die just like being shot through the head. There are so many people, and no one is left. He was very angry. His heart was beating fast. And his breathing was disordered. So he decisively gave up shooting the arrow in his hand. As a senior second level archer, this was the first time that he pursued a group of people so hard. He bit the second level swordsman on the opposite side. He lay on the boulder with his back pressed against the rock. The sky was light orange. And the air around him had a fresh smell. He is very familiar with the Grove Mountains in the Ganbu Plain. It can be said that the last monster in this mountain range was killed by him with one arrow. In order to open up this territory, he led a group of men who ate an unknown amount of food. Bitter. This was the land of Lord MacDonald. And he decided to defend his rights in this land. It's just that there are so many second level swordsmen. If you want to catch them completely, you don't know that you have to sacrifice many lives to fill it. He reached out and took out a green fruit from his backpack. This fruit was sour and astringent. But it had a refreshing effect. He closed his eyes silently as he watched the assassination team passing by. He was worried that his gaze would be sensed by the strong opponent. Sabrina great swordsman hid behind the tree. She looked up at the top of the cliff. She knew that the archer was ambushing there at this moment. She glanced at Archmage Merlin to make sure that he had sensed it. But this kind of rock wall with a steep side and a gentle slope was too common in this mountain range. Even if she climbed up with all her strength, she would probably have escaped long ago. And they are hiding in the rock crevice now and don't want to be discovered. The assault team had set countless traps in the past two days, trying to surround and kill this marksman. But he just wouldn't bite the hook. Speaking of which, the main reason is that the opponent is too familiar with this land. On the battlefield, this geographical advantage can indeed be transformed into a victory. Seeing the great swordsman Quintus and the great knight Trollop leading the group through the valley, the archmage Merlin shook his head slightly. The three of them hid their bodies in the crevices of the rocks and waited quietly for the black magicians in the sky to leave. This place is halfway up the canyon cliff, with trees blocking the stone crevice. If you just pass by here, no one will climb here. They were hiding in this crevice just to avoid the eyes of the black magicians. The space magician was taking out the materials for setting up a temporary teleportation circle from his magic pocket. Sabrina Great Swordsman glanced at the crimson sword in his hand, carefully injected a bit of fighting spirit, and slowly cut through a rock in front of him. She wanted to carve out an area deep in the stone crevices, a place where a temporary teleportation circle could be arranged. She was somewhat helpless. Such a sharp sword turned into a rock drilling tool. After Night Trollop and Great Swordsman Quintus led the assault team out of the canyon, they changed their marching direction without any warning, made a 90 degree turn from south to east, and then turned over an unfamiliar road. Good walking hills. The second level archer climbed down from the boulder and hurriedly chased in the direction where the assassination team left. But he seemed a little uneasy in his heart. So he climbed up to the high tree crown and made a gesture to the black dots flying in the sky. Not long after, two black magicians flew towards this side, and they hovered above the second turn archer's head for a while. The second level archer wanted to leave a black magician behind to continue the investigation and wait for the army behind to catch up. This time the assassination team made a sneak attack on Lord MacDonald's manor. Instead, the two forces, the Black Magic Priory and Lord MacDonald's Legion, which disliked each other, tried to cooperate with each other. With the help of magicians, the pursuit effect is really good. In the past two days, almost all the Black Magicians have been guiding the Lord's private army from the air to catch up. The Black Magicians flying in the sky were unwilling to accept the command of the second turn archers. They waved to the second turn archers, pointed in the direction of the assassination team, and rode on magic harpoons to catch up. The second level archer stood on the canopy of the tree and hesitated for a moment, then quickly jumped off the canopy. Originally, he wanted to leave this canyon and follow the assassination team. But now the second level archer wants to carefully explore this canyon. He felt that something must have gone wrong. Otherwise they would never have marched out of the canyon. He paused thoughtfully. In addition to these black magicians in the sky, the second level archer who has been following the assault team is another reason why everyone can't get rid of Lord MacDonald's private army according to Sertak's idea. In this situation, he hoped that the second-level swordsman could turn around and face the Lord's private army and fight a bloody way out of the situation from the front. This will prevent them from even having the courage to pursue. Instead of just going around in circles like this, playing a cat-and-mouse game, the Janice people like Sia traveled over mountains and ridges 
and their physical strength was greatly exhausted. Although Serdak had helped her bless her with the blessed body, her physical strength still could not be restored. In some difficult places, she lay on Soldak's back all the way, rather than sitting on the shoulders of the two-headed ogre. Sia wanted to lie on Soldak's broad back, because she could always see Gulitam drooling while looking at her. His good brother's brain flowers will talk about grilled fish and other topics. Samira slid down the tree trunk with some confusion. After walking out of the canyon this time, the second-level archer didn't follow him for some reason. She counter-crouched for possible ambush points, but found nothing. The assault team walked very fast in the mountains, and the black magician in the sky continued to drop fireballs to test the location of the assault team. Samira raised her head and looked at a few black spots in the sky through the gaps in the trees. She squinted her eyes and jumped to the top of the mountain like an agile cheetah. Her speed was very fast. The horizontal branches between the trees were her. It seems that jumping on the trees is a little faster than running on the mountain. This time she rushed directly to the crown of the tallest tree on the top of the mountain, holding the sky strike bow in her hand, squatting among the dense branches and leaves, waiting for the black magicians. As expected, the few black spots in the sky did not deliberately raise their flight height at the top of the mountain when they crossed the mountain, but flew straight over the mountain. Seeing these black magicians getting closer and closer, Samira knew that she had made the right bet this time. She tried to relax herself as much as possible, and her breathing was steady. A trace of wind element appeared in the hand holding the sky strike bow. At the moment when a black magician flew past the top of the tree, a great elf windrunner appeared. The shadow appeared behind her, and she suddenly pulled back the bow string. The great elf windrunner also followed her in doing the same action and two arrows flew out at the same time in no particular order. The arrow made a sharp whistling sound in the air, and crackling arcs of electricity appeared and died on the arrow shaft. When the two black magicians saw the shadow of the big elf appearing on the canopy not far away, their hearts went cold. They no longer even controlled the magic pot handle, but tried desperately to tear open the magic scroll. Unfortunately, their movements were still too slow. The moment the magic scroll shattered, the arrow penetrated their chests. At the same time, a thunder fell from the sky. Explode. Two black magicians fell from the sky, scaring these black magicians again into flying high into the sky. They watched as the assault team entered the dense forest, their figures completely obscured by the dense woods. There was no second-level archer to guide the direction. When the black magicians followed up again, they were helpless to find that they had lost track of the assault team. The great swordsman Quintus led the assault team to run in the dense forest at a rapid march. Serdak was carrying Sia on his back, and the second-level magic pattern structure on his body exuded a faint magical aura. Some lines of the Eisenhard magic pattern structure had already lit up, and then his legs seemed to have been poured into some kind of power, and his running speed increased a lot. Following these second-turn swordsmen, it's not so strenuous behind me. Snow White arms hugged his neck tightly. Sia's breath occasionally blew into his ears, and her long seaweed-like hair caressed his cheek as it flew in the wind. In comparison, the two-headed ogre who ran the easiest among the members of their team had great strides, and one step could take as long as two or three steps for an ordinary person. Samira also seemed very relaxed, and would occasionally stay behind to see if anyone was following. Even if she is left far behind by the assault team, she can easily catch up, pushing aside the bushes in front of him. The great swordsman Quintus looked up at the orange sky outside the dense forest. Not a single black spot could be seen under the clear sky and the black magicians did not follow him. Strange. Why didn't they follow? Great swordsman Quintus said doubtfully. Did we completely throw them away when we passed through this dense forest? Nitrollop appeared behind the great swordsman Quintus. A ranger responsible for investigating the surrounding situation immediately stood up and said, I'm going to take a look around. Samira caught up from behind. Serdak put down Sia and let her sit on the root of the tree. Then asked Samira, Is there any black magician following behind? Samira shook her head and said in her unique hoarse voice, No, they completely lost our direction when they were in the middle of the dense forest. The magicians chased us in different directions. We are right in the gap between the two magicians' detection areas, the great swordsman Quintus said with excitement. They really didn't catch up. Not long after, the two rangers who ran around to conduct environmental reconnaissance came back. The great swordsman Quintus asked, Are there any of Lord MacDonald's troops around? The two rangers said almost simultaneously. No! Great swordsman Quintus found that it was so easy to get rid of the tracking of the black magicians, and couldn't help but regret his decision last night. If I had known this, 
I would not have acted separately from Sabrina Great Swordsman and the others. It's a pity that the Space Magician, the Great Swordsman Sabrina, and the Great Wizard Merlin are not here. Otherwise, the Great Swordsman Quintus even wants to set up a temporary teleportation circle directly in this dense forest. He probably can return at night. Been a city. All we can do now is wait. When it gets dark, they will return to the valley to meet up with the Sabrina Great Swordsman. Now it is natural to find a secret place to take a good rest. Chapter 963 An Arrow in the Dark The Black Magician chased the assassination team away. The second level archer wandered around the canyon for a long time, but found nothing here. Seeing bright yellow lines appearing in the night sky, the army that fell behind still failed to catch up. He planned to rest in a tree for the night and then return to the archers. Due to a mistake in judgment, he lost track of the assassination team, which made him depressed. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Those people across from you are a group of second level powerhouses. He comforted himself like this, climbing up a crooked tree and squatting on a thick horizontal branch. He used a dagger to cut off a branch so that he could hang his hammock on the tree, wrapped in a blanket and lying in a swaying hammock. The second turn archer quickly fell asleep. He has been quite exhausted these past two days. In his dream, he saw the face of the other female archer hidden under the black gauze. There were several scars carved on her face, which looked a bit ferocious. Then the face turned into the face of a lizard man, with a the forked tongue kept licking his lips, which frightened him into taking two steps back. When he woke up from his dream, the starry sky above his head was still dark red. He wanted to adjust his sleeping position until dawn. At this moment, he heard a series of brisk footsteps. Someone stepped on a branch on the ground while running, startling a group of birds perched on the top of the tree. Plop la la flew clean. He completely woke up from his trance, and his eyes quickly adapted to the surrounding light. Not far from his big tree, a group of strong swordsmen ran back briskly. The second level archers never expected that the second level swordsmen of this assassination team would actually come back overnight. Seeing the second level swordsmen running towards the canyon wall, the second level archer quickly jumped out of the hammock and followed them from a distance. A small cave was dug out next to the stone crevice and only six people could stand on the edge of the stone wall. It's very secluded and not easy to climb. However, the steep stone wall was not a problem for these second level swordsmen. Great swordsman Quintus climbed up first and saw that the temporary portal inside had been set up. The magician was doing the final step of calculating the spatial coordinates. So he relaxed a little. Take a breath. How are you preparing? Great swordsman Quintus asked in a deep voice. Serdak followed and saw the faint light emitting from the magic pattern array on the cave floor. And the portal had begun to take shape. It'll be ready soon, the young space magician said without raising his head. Soldak retreated from the crack in the stone. And Sia was leaning against the rock wall, pouring a water bag from her head, looking a little pale. This is the bad thing about the Janice clan. They have been out of the water for too long. And they look like they are half dead. Be patient for a while longer and the temporary teleportation array will be healed soon, Zerdek said to Sia in a low voice. Thea nodded slightly. In fact, she was not as uncomfortable as she looked. She even lay on Soldek's back, feeling a little lost in herself for a while. The two-headed ogre scratched his head. He nailed a metal room plate to the stone wall above Sia's head, and a light blue magical glow lit up. Countless water elements gathered together and formed small raindrops, which fell on Sia's body. These scattered small raindrops are more like gentle rain mist. Sia's hair is wet. Her face is covered with crystal water droplets. And her whole body becomes moisturized. There was an uncontrollable cheer from the other side of the rock wall. And some magical radiance emerged from the cracks in the stone. Serdak squeezed past and discovered that a mirror-like door appeared again in the center of the temporary teleportation circle. The space magician tiredly let go of the parchment in his hand. Which was filled with matrix formulas. His face was a little pale and it seemed that his body was a little overdrawn. He said in a very soft voice, The temporary portal is opened. If if the calculation is correct, the opposite side should be the teleportation hall of Bena City. Great swordsman Quintus and great knight Trollop stood at the front. The two looked at each other, and the great swordsman Quintus stepped inside. After a short interval, and there was no movement on the other side, Lord Trollop signaled the second-level swordsman of Johnson's Legion, Archmage Merlin, and the second-level swordsman of Luther's legion to line up and follow him. The two-headed ogre stood in the middle of the team, his strong body looking unusually tall. Wait a minute. I'll adjust the magic hub. I'll double the size of the portal, and you'll be able to pass through it easily. 
but it consumes a lot of magic power. You have to go through it quickly. The space magician said to Gulitem said. Only then did Sirdak see clearly that there were rows of magic crystals in the grooves of the gem base connected to the magic pattern array. As the magic power circulated, the magic crystals in the grooves of the gem base were flowing. The pieces shattered with a sound. This temporary teleportation magic circle is like a machine that eats magic crystals like jelly beans. One of them will break after just a few breaths. Seeing that Gulitem failed to pass, Sirdak stood up from the team and prepared to go with him. Seeing this, Sia and Samira also walked out of the queue and stood aside waiting. The 28th members of the assault team quickly passed through the temporary portal. The space magician squatted next to the gym base to adjust the magic power delivery. The magic pattern array on the ground suddenly emitted a strong light. And the portal in the center also surged. Nearly doubled. The two-headed ogre seemed very happy and said to Soldek, Boss, how about we stay in Bena City for a few more days this time and then return to the Belan Plain? What do you want to do? Serdak asked in a relaxed mood. The two of them were about to enter the portal. The two-headed ogre was still saying, Of course I want to try it. Before the two of them finished speaking, just when the space magician was about to stand up and follow everyone into the portal, a bright black arrow drew a black line in the air and hit the space magician. The magician's back was exposed from his chest. He suddenly fell down on the gym base, and blood flowed out along with the arrow. The space magician looked down at the arrow in his chest with a desperate look on his face. He almost used up all his strength and shouted to Soldek. You guys hurry up! The portal can't hold on for more than a few seconds! Serdak quickly ran towards the space magician, grabbed his magic robe, and dragged him towards the temporary portal. He doesn't even know the magician's name yet. Gulitem also came to help, and his body instantly condensed into a layer of ice armor. But just as everyone was rescuing the space magician, a jet black arrow pierced the night sky again, hitting the box with a gem base with a click sound. The box with a gem base suddenly shattered. The last few magic crystals placed on it rolled to the ground. And the portal on the temporary teleportation circle actually went out at this moment. Chapter 964 Chase There was a black steel arrow stuck in the magician's chest. And the tip of the arrow protruded from the middle of the sternum. Although the blood was flowing outward, it was not the kind of blood spurting out when the hard tube was severed. He was in so much pain that he could hardly breathe, and he did not spit out anything from his mouth and nose. Blood foam. Serdak and Gulitem looked at each other, looking at the extinguished temporary portal, the exploded gem base, and the scattered magic crystals. Gulitem let out an angry roar, and the brain flower was also in the palm of his hand. A fireball was ignited in it and thrown in the direction of the arrow. The third black steel arrow made a ding sound and nailed the Gerda shield on Serdak's arm. Samira quickly ran out, and through the light brought by the return ball, she saw the second turn archer flying down from the tree crown. The shadow of the great elf windrunner emerged from behind again, and a magic crystal exploded from the sky strike bow in his hand. Countless wind elements and thunder elements turned the arrows into bright silver and flashed with light arrows of electric sparks. The moment he shot the arrow, the second level archer fell to the ground as if he had something in his heart. The arrow hit the big tree where he was living and a bolt of lightning fell from midair, splitting the big tree in the middle and burning violently. Samira cursed in her mouth and ran into the darkness like a female leopard. Boss, the temporary teleportation circle seems to be useless. What should we do? Gulitem stood at the entrance of the cave with a depressed look on his face and asked Serdek. But his eyes were focused on the darkness of the forest outside. Serdek squatted on the ground and quickly condensed the holy light in his palm. A holy light spell fell on the magician. He did not dare to pull out the steel arrow rashly, so he could only cut off the exposed part with a broad sword. Fortunately, Eisenhardt's broadsword was very sharp, and the whole process went very smoothly. Unbutton the shoulders of the magic rope, and use a hemostatic bandage to wrap the arrow wound on the magician's chest to prevent him from dying of excessive blood loss. What was certain was that the steel arrow did not hurt the magician's heart, but only passed through the gap between the two lung lobes. Take away all these magic materials on the ground. Let's get out of here and move to a safe place first before making any plans, Serdak said quickly. Gulitem and Sia quickly began to sort out the materials for the temporary teleportation circle. Serdak also pulled out a box from his magic belt bag and picked up everything scattered on the ground. Even the exploded gym base. Also packed into boxes. Everything was packed. Gulitem carried the magician on his shoulders. And Serdak carried Thea on his back. In the dark of night, the two of them jumped down from the cliffs on the mountainside 
and along the rock walls. With their excellent physical strength and coordination, they could still jump in time even if they sometimes missed the cliff. A just back. Soon, he fell to the bottom of the canyon. Serdak turned around and whistled, informing Samira, who was chasing the second turn archer in the forest, of his direction, and then went upstream along the river at the bottom of the canyon. Not long after Serdak left, two black magicians rode magic harpoons and hovered over the big tree that was on fire. At this time, Samira had already followed from behind. The second level archer hiding in the dark had nothing to do with Samira. And Samira couldn't catch the second level archer either. That guy was like a cunning fox. With a nose that could smell danger. He was a fast runner and knew the forested canyon well. Samira watched helplessly as he disappeared into the shadows deep in the woods. Next to the dark and quiet river valley. Serdak carried Thea on his back and walked upstream on the pebbles. The two-headed ogre was carrying the magician. Gulida muttered that he had missed the dinner time in Bina City. He must capture the hateful archer. Hang it on the barbecue grill. And smear it with secret sauce. Good brother now Huar checked the magician's condition from time to time and reminded Soldak. His condition is not optimistic. We need to find a place to help him treat his wounds. The three of them walked very fast. And the light at the bottom of the canyon was very dark. It was only through the sparkling waves of the stream that Serdak could accurately step on the big rocks beside the river beach. Thea whispered to Serdak that she could turn into a mermaid and swim upstream in the stream. Only then did Soldak put her down. Sia jumped into the clear stream and immediately transformed into a mermaid body more than three meters long. The three-color fins looked very beautiful in the stream. She clasped her hands on her chest, silently recited the magic spell in her mouth, and raised her hands above her head. His body stood upright in the water. His arms held a huge water ball, and he slowly sank into the stream. As the magic pattern circle dimmed, a huge wave suddenly surged in the stream. A soft and simple head and strong arms appeared in the wave. It gently blinked its transparent blue eyes and glanced at the mermaid beside it. Thea then nodded slightly. The next moment, Serdak, Gulidam and Samira felt their feet being lifted up by the waves. Then the huge wave suddenly accelerated, carrying the water in the river upstream, and the speed of the surge was getting faster and faster. The faster it goes, the more it sounds like a tsunami. The waves overflowing to both sides knock some trees to pieces. This rapid surge lasted for a quarter of an hour. Directly from the river branching outside the valley, the waves hit the huge rocks on the shore. Like a pair of gentle waves, the big hands helped everyone to the rock. And then, they turned into a piece of white foam and disappeared. The receding water returned to the river again. And Sia also transformed into a human form again. Standing on the rock with everyone, waving gently towards the receding waves. What is that? Serdak could feel that there was another form of life in the river. This was not a simple magic, Sia said with soft eyes. They are the water elves in this river. A second level archer followed closely behind the Serdak team. At this time, the riverside was in a mess under the impact of the waves. He looked at the river valley as if a flood had suddenly erupted. He continued to chase the team he had left behind in the Ganbu Plain along the river beach with some distress. He nimbly jumped onto a boulder and continued to chase upstream along the river valley, quickly disappearing into the night. Serdak found a quiet tree cave among the mountains. Gulidam very politely invited the owner of the tree cave, a brown bear weighing more than a thousand kilograms. Out. Now the brown bear has been cut into several large pieces and placed on the grill of the campfire outside the cave entrance. The bear's skin has been hung on the horizontal branches of the trees to dry. Serdak performed a sacrificial ceremony in the tree hole. This time he not only blessed the injured magician with God's blessing, but also took out the steel arrow left in the magician's body. But the magician has been in a coma. After everyone in the team received the blessed body blessing, Serdak called out Aphrodite again. When she knew that Serdak was trapped in the dry cloth plain, she looked outside the tree hole and whispered to Serdak, I can take you back, but they can't. This kind of thing is related to the magic contract. Serdak glanced at the comatose space magician. He still didn't know his name and said, Whether we can return to Bena City may depend on him. Aphrodite spread her hands and looked at Soldak with a puzzled look on her face and said, Then find a way to save him. But I'm not good at treatment. You didn't call me here specifically to discuss this matter. Bar? Serdak waved his hand and said, Of course not. I want to get rid of the tail that is following us. There is a second level archer who has been following us. And he is blocking us from leaving. Aphrodite leaned against the entrance of the tree hole, folded her hands on her chest, looked outside the tree hole, and asked, 
So you called me here to help you deal with that archer? Yeah, Soldek said. A trace of joy appeared on Aphrodite's face. When she saw Samira sitting next to the tree hole with a sky strike bow on her back, she said with a smile. Leave this to us, Samira and I. I have a solution for this. The second level archer pushed aside the bushes in front of him. With a somewhat dry camouflage on his head, he carefully looked around. There was a towering tree in front of him. There was a huge tree hole under the tree. The bonfire at the entrance of the hole had been completely extinguished. But the animal bones scattered around can still show that someone stayed here not long ago. They must have hunted a brown bear. It seems that the two-headed ogre is quite edible. The second turn Archer thought to himself. The team he was chasing included two-headed ogre warriors, knights, archers and magicians. It was almost a perfect team mix. And everyone was excellent. He followed cautiously, taking every step carefully, for fear that he would be too careless and fall into their trap. The female archer, who was as nimble as a leopard, was always looking for opportunities to shoot him. If the two of them had the same weapons and equipment, he would not be afraid at all, and even felt that he might be able to pinpoint the opponent. But not only was he wearing a set of devil snake teeth magic pattern structure, he was also holding a sky strike sharp bow. This bow was a bit too powerful for him. After all, no one wants to walk and be struck by lightning in the next second. He knew very well that he killed the magician with one arrow, and the second arrow destroyed the temporary teleportation circle, leaving a total of five people on the other side in the Ganbu Plain. Five figures also appeared in the mountains ahead. They were walking south along the mountains. The second-level archer was not in a hurry to catch up. He emerged from the bushes, first walked around the huge towering tree, and then carefully observed some campfires, and saw a small one at the entrance of the cave. The broken arrow without tail feathers and arrowhead, still stained with blood, happened to be the one he shot. He got into the tree hole and found some blood stains on the ground, and even cut up hemostatic bandages. The moment he lowered his head, he suddenly felt like there was someone behind him. He didn't even dare to look back. His body suddenly tensed up, and he rushed towards the cave entrance like a spring. However, his hands took out a hunting bow and an arrow, forcibly twisting the body in the air, twisting the elbow joint at an incredible angle, pulling out the bow string and shooting the steel arrow in his hand behind him. A string of pleasant chuckles came from behind. The arrow flew out and inserted into the wall of the tree hole. But when the second-level archer turned around, he found that there was no one behind him. His steps did not stop, and his body got out of the tree hole. Unfortunately, at this time, he saw that no longer ten meters away from the tree hole, the female bow was half-kneeling in the forest clearing, holding the sky strike bow in her hand, and she had already drawn the bow's string and pointed it at his chest. His body was as light and agile as a swift. The moment he jumped out of the hole, he turned back and hid his body in the empty tree hole. At this moment, he felt inexplicably horrified. He clearly saw all five people on the other side leaving. So he ran over to investigate. Why did the female archer appear here? But what made him despair was not Samira squatting outside the tree hole with a bow and arrow. But the second weird laughter coming from the tree hole. He glanced in the direction of the sound in shock. It's the dark top of the tree hole. A giant eyeball with a diameter of more than one meter hung at the top of the tree hole, constantly moving its transparent eyelids, staring at him unblinkingly. A pair of golden eagle eyes emerged from behind the second turn archer, and he decisively shot an arrow at the eyeball of the tree hole. The second level archer also immediately stepped back. He stepped hard on the ground, and the moment his back pressed against the wall of the tree cave, he exploded with powerful force and forcefully knocked out a large hole in the one-foot-thick wall of the tree cave. His entire body the person also got out with this momentum. It's just that he saw the eyeball after all, and he felt dizzy at this moment. The eyeball hanging on the top of the tree hole also fell down like a water balloon, and the viscous liquid flowed all over the floor. Aphrodite was floating behind her eyeballs. A pair of transparent insect wings gave her the ability to stay in the air. The steel arrow flew past her cheek, and cut off a strand of her hair. The side of the mithril mask also appeared. A scratch. If she hadn't turned her head subconsciously, she might have been nailed to the top of the tree hole at this moment. Samira squatted outside, waiting for the second-level archer to come out from inside. But she didn't expect that he would break through the wall of the tree hole, break out of the blind spot where her sky strike bow could not shoot, and rush out. She took two steps forward, hurriedly drew the bow, and shot the arrow on it. The second-level archer staggered a little, as if he didn't notice the flying arrows. 
By the time he came to his senses, it was already too late to avoid the arrows. He could only twist his body as much as possible to avoid his vital points. One of the two feather arrows was inserted into his left shoulder, and the other arrow drilled out close to the ribs, leaving only a scratch on the left side of his abdomen. Pair of finger holes. The second turn archer did not dare to stay any longer and ran desperately towards the densest bushes in the forest. It's just that his mind is still a little groggy at this moment. Serdak emerged from behind a tree and smashed his shield into his face. The second turn archer barely dodged and grabbed a dagger and stabbed Serdak with his backhand. A ding sound struck the shield. Serdak kicked the second turn archer's thigh and he could even hear the sound of bones breaking. The second turn archer turned around and still ran forward without any hindrance. A big stick, with the roar of the wind, hit the second turn archer hard in the chest. The second turn archer was like a sandbag. His whole body immediately changed direction and flew back. The two-headed ogre poked his head out from behind the tree and took a look. Yulidum and his good brother Nailware had another dispute. I told you to control your power, but you still didn't listen. Look at what you've done to people now. Chapter 965 Wake Up The second level archer's back hit the main trunk of a big tree, and the bark behind the main trunk was damaged in the shape of an explosion. He leaned against the tree trunk, with a huge depression in his chest. A face that had lost its vitality looked up at the sky behind the gap between the tree crowns, and sticky blood continued to pour out from his mouth and nose. A trace of breath drifted out from his body. He opened his mouth slightly, but he couldn't make any sound. There is a magic hunting bow in one hand, and although the other hand is empty, there is a mithril ring on the thumb. Serdak stepped on the dead leaves in the forest and slowly approached the second level archer who had caused him a lot of trouble. He watched silently as he took his last breath. The hunting bow wrapped with some linen cloth came from it fell from his hand and fell to the ground with a clack. Serdak reached out and touched his breath, then touched his carotid artery, and glanced at the two-headed ogre next to him. I knew this job was mine! Gulitam sighed and said to his good brother Nauhor. He picked up a machete and squatted next to the big tree to dig out a pit. Serdak was not prepared to leave anything valuable to this second-level archer. He pulled out a somewhat broken magic pattern structure from the archer. But Samira didn't even look at it. Or even looked at it. Looking at the hunting bow. He only took off the quiver hanging from his waist. There were still seven black steel arrows left in it. Hanging neatly on his waist. This archer doesn't have many valuable things on him. Apart from a purse containing more than 30 magic crystals and more than 20 gold coins. There are only a few Warcraft materials in the magic storage belt. It's hard to imagine this. A second level archer is so poor. Maybe he is just not used to carrying valuable things with him. After searching the second level archer's belongings, Serdak dragged the archer's body into the pit, and then buried him under the tree with the two-headed ogre. At this time, Sia ran back panting. But when she came back, even the battlefield had been cleaned up. Aphrodite walked out of the tree hole, stood next to Serdak, and said to him with some pride, Look, it's not that you can't handle this matter yourself, but that you didn't think carefully. Why? Make reasonable use of the people around you, including me. Of course. Hearing what Aphrodite said, Serdak did not defend himself. By the way, do you want to write a letter to Bena City? Aphrodite asked Serdak. Although Aphrodite's eyes were a bit teasing, Soldak still wrote two letters seriously. One to Marquis Luther of Bena City. Detailing his situation. Another letter was written to Selina in Doden Town. Belan Plain. Telling her that she could not return to Belan Plain for the time being. Then Aphrodite picked up the two letters. Held the long skirt in both hands. And slowly walked into the void gate. Soldak went to see the magician who was still unconscious. And said to Sia. This magic is called mirror image. Sia nodded and said softly. It's a third level water magic. I didn't expect it could be used like this. It is not yet known where Lord MacDonald's army has gone in the mountains. But Soldak feels that there is nothing to worry about. The target of the team of five people is much smaller. If they want to avoid being hunted by the army behind them, it's actually not too difficult. Serdak saw no traces of black magicians in this area. The mountains are so big, and he doesn't know where these black magicians have flown to now. The most important thing at the moment is to revive this space magician. Only he can rearrange the temporary teleportation circle and take a few people back together. However, the various conditions in this mountain range were really poor. Soldak took out the map of the Gombu Plain and looked at it for a long time. After determining his approximate location, he continued walking in the southwest direction, according to the map of the Gombu Plain, as shown on the regional map. 
there is a large town called Hatangata in the southwest of this mountain range. Serdak felt that he could stay in Hatangata town for a while. Otherwise, he might become a native savage if he lived in this mountain for too long. Now we just have to wait for the magician's physical condition to stabilize before he can leave here over the mountains. Samira found a stone cliff in the mountains that could shelter her from the wind and rain. And Serdak and his team set up a tent under the stone cliff to live. Probably the group of black magicians thought that the assault team had returned to Benis City. Serdak had lived in the mountains and forests here for three days. But he never saw any trace of the black magicians. As for Lord MacDonald's army, not even a shadow was seen. The space magician only woke up on the second night after living under the stone cliff. Serdak and the magician lived in the same tent. The magician's cry of pain in the middle of the night woke up Serdak. Serdak crawled out of the sleeping bag and first made sure the magician was conscious before giving him some water. Then he checked the injury on his chest. After recovering from the blessed body, the arrow wound on the magician's chest had basically scabbed over, and the wounds inside were not infected. It was just that the wound was on the chest, and every time he breathed or even his heartbeat would cause him great pain. Did you save me? The magician looked very weak. His eyes recovered from the daze. Well, we are fighting partners together, and it doesn't matter who saved the other. Serdak took out a bottle of light blue potion from his magic pocket, shook it in front of the magician, and asked, Do you want it? Want to have one? But this isn't free. Psychic potion? Do you still have this? The magician looked at Soldak in surprise, then shook his head and said, Although it is not needed for the time being, I still want to ask, Can I pay for this bottle of potion? Do you want to buy it? Of course. No problem, Soldak said. Where are we? The magician asked curiously. He looked at the roof of the tent. The night wind blew the tent back and forth, causing it to bulge and dent. Serdak said to the magician, You are still in the mountain. When your injury gets better, we will leave here. I think we can set off tomorrow. By the way, my name is Serdak. I don't know your name yet, Serdak said to the magician with a smile. Avid, I know you. This Count Serdak. I have heard Grand Knight Trollop and Great Swordsman Sabrina talking about you. One of them said he was your friend, and the other said he was you. He is a friend of his fiance, and they also have that kind of relationship. Even though his chest hurt so much that he couldn't breathe, the magician Avid was full of fun talking. Chapter 966 Asking for Directions Avid looks very young and loves to joke, always speaking with a different kind of self-deprecation. Many magicians are good at refining potions, and their actual age is difficult to distinguish from their faces. Serdak did not think that he was a young man who had just graduated from a magic academy. All space magicians need to join the Astrologers Guild. The Astrologers Guild and the Magic Guild are affiliated, but they have an independent institutional system. Not all space magicians can join the Astrologers. They only absorb the elite space magicians. Moreover, the Astrologers Guild has built teleportation halls in the capitals of each province in the Green Empire. These teleportation halls only open to magicians and high-level officials. The openness of aristocrats can only be characterized by one word. And that is expensive. The cost of each transmission would feel like a rip-off for ordinary nobles. Therefore, the benefits of magicians in the Astrologers' Union are top-notch. And every astrologer is very rich. The magician Avid asked Serdak to help him up. Serdak folded a blanket and put it behind him so that he could lie on it comfortably. So as not to cause greater damage to the wound on his chest. Oppression. Serdak opened the tent curtain a little to let in the cool summer night breeze. You are the most caring noble lord I have ever seen. Avid's words were full of gratitude. I'm just used to taking care of the wounded. After all, I'm a paladin. Serdak got out of the tent and sat on the wooden pillar outside the tent. He saw Samira sitting on the branch of a tree on watch. He waved to her and motioned for her to rest for a while. Samira directly pulled up a hammock like a fishing net on the tree trunk and hung herself on the tree quickly. It looked like a cocoon formed by insects among the leaves. The two-headed ogre lay on a flat rock, with his head resting on a log. He snored loudly while sleeping. If there are enemies around, you probably don't need to explore. You can just follow the snoring and come over. And you can finish this small camp in one go. The cliff is covered with some very moist moss, which clings to the rock wall. The root system without much soil absorbs a large amount of water. The water seeps down from the rock wall little by little and condenses into water droplets continuously falling to the bottom of the cliff. A small pool actually gathered at the bottom of the cliff. This pool was hidden in the crevices of the rocks, just big enough for Sia to lie in it. Before going to bed, Sia moved a pebble the size of a basin to the edge of the pool. 
she lay in the pool, holding the smooth pebble in her hands and resting her head on it. Her long hair, like green algae, spread out. If there was still moonlight, this picture would be very beautiful. It's a pity that this is the dry cloth plain, and there are only a few light yellow ribbons in the night sky. Seeing Serdek looking up at the night sky, the magician abbot also looked at the night sky along the gap in the tent. Although this is a woodland between mountains, the trees next to the cliff are not so dense, and you can comfortably see the dark red night sky. This kind of night sky will make people feel very depressed after watching it for a long time. I said that those are the turbulent currents of time and space, which contain countless collapsed plains, filled with various ancient ruins. Ruins, a large number of time and space rifts, and time and space storms. It is the home of the time and space shifting beasts. Only they can survive in that kind of time and space. Life in a dangerous place. Magician Avid explained to Serdak. It turns out this is the turbulence of time and space. Magician Avid continued. My mentor often opens a portal to pick up rubbish there. But the only ones who can pick up rubbish in the turbulent flow of time and space are the great magisters. Pick up garbage? Soldak asked again in confusion. Yes. There will always be something left behind in the various ruins abandoned in the turbulence of time and space. However, if you want to go to the turbulence of time and space, the most basic requirement is to be able to see through the rifts in time and space. Otherwise, you may not be able to walk there. The body was cut into several sections by the free time rift. Avid smiled and explained to Serdak. Is it dangerous over there? Serdak asked curiously. Compared to the alien star realm, it's relatively safe there. You probably don't know how terrifying the star beasts over there are. They specialize in hunting void creatures. Void terrors and predators. The magician Avid told Serdak a lot about the star field. Have you brought out the construction materials for the temporary teleportation circle? Magician Avid asked Serdak. Serdak pulled out a box from his magic belt bag, threw it at the tent door with a bang, and said, Well, everything that can be collected is in this box. Please be gentle. The half-elf archer who hung himself on the tree moved his pointed ears slightly. The next day, with the blessing of the blessed body, the magician Avid's mental state has also recovered a lot. He sat by a rock outside the tent, pointed at the regional map of the Ganbu Plain, drew a circle in the vague area southwest of Makusuo City, and said, This is Grovet Mountain Ridge. We want to heading to Katangata Town from here? Serdek raised his head and asked, How about that small town? The magician Avid immediately became energetic. He took the water glass with some difficulty and took a sip of water to moisten his throat. For him, even the slightest swallowing pain lasted for a long time. But this still couldn't stop his eagerness to chat. The further away from Makuso City, the weaker Lord MacDonald's dominance becomes. Originally, the management here was okay, and many nobles were willing to expand their territories in this rich little plain. However, as this place becomes independent, the first batch of nobles who came to open up the plain left one after another. And those who stayed were all those who were reluctant to abandon their family property here. Others who took advantage of the opportunity to make a profit. And those who had little financial ability to leave here. In order to occupy a city in the southern region of Terrapagan, Lord MacDonald mobilized a large number of garrisons from almost all over the Ganbu Plain. Unfortunately, he did not realize who he was facing. He sighed softly. He always thought that after the plain war started, the lords of Bena province would not be able to do anything against the brainless Dark Legion of Hell. And there would be nothing they could do against a lord like him who occupies a plain. What's ridiculous is that when the constructed swordsmen reached the city, they realized that the army they spent huge sums of money to build was no different from the armies of other lords. Serdak didn't want to hear the magician avid spraying these lords like a machine gun. He was also a lord himself. We are going to live in that town for a while until you recover from your injury and then we will find a way to leave here. Soldak said to him, Samira carried a crisp branch and emerged from the forest in the distance. She jumped lightly on the rocks a few times, came to Serdak's side, and threw away the branch covered with small red fruits. He gave it to him, glanced around and said, They are still looking for us. Those black magicians from the Black Magic Monastery? Serdak asked. Yeah. Samira replied. Serdak patted his forehead and said to the two-headed ogre next to him, who was about to get up to get some food. Ghoul item. Let's pack up and get ready to leave here. The two-headed ogre immediately helped Serdak pull out the tent and cover the campfire with a few rocks. The group of people walked west along the cliff. Hiking through the grove forest in the Ganbu Plain may be a very dangerous thing for ordinary people. 
and it may be an experience for the students in the Warrior Academy. But for Sardak, as far as the team is concerned, they are really just walking. There is not a single magical beast to be seen in this mountain range. One mountain range stretches onto another, and the edge can't be seen at a glance. Sardak was carrying a water-gathering rune board, so he didn't need to think about drinking water at all. He had prepared a lot of marching rations in his pocket, but he didn't need them at all. He encountered edible prey in the forest, including the two-headed cannibal. The devil will never let you go. Occasionally, when there is a break, Sardak will cross the void gate and return to Pussy Mountain, where there is also a large amount of red and dried meat. Occasionally, he will kill a salamander in the lava mine to improve the food. The only trouble was the magician Avid. Sardak specially made him a chair-like tool and asked him to sit on it. He then tied it with a tie to prevent it from falling. The other side of the chair can be carried on his back. The backpack straps on the shoulders were carried directly behind the back, carrying the magician all the way over the mountains. It's a little heavy, but for a second-level powerhouse like Sardak, it can't be considered a burden at all. Most of the time, the two-headed ogre carries the burden, but Sardak will insist on carrying it for half a day, trying to share the load with the ogre. On the tenth day, the Sardak team walked west along an unknown river valley. Thea likes places with rivers. At least she can soak in the water in the morning and evening. Another advantage of walking along the river valley is that the team can eat grilled fish. Along the way, Samira was exploring the path. She stood on a large rock in a river valley, glanced at the river in front of her, jumped down quickly, turned around and ran back. What did you find? Soldak stopped and asked, There is an adventure group camping by the river ahead. Should we go around it? Samira said. Sardak glanced at the lush mountains and said, You can't even see half a monster here. How could there be an adventure group? Could it be an experienced team from an academy in a nearby town? Let's go over and take a look. Maybe we can exchange some useful information. He added, Several brand new tents were stationed by the river. And a group of young men and women were playing by the river. Looking like they were fishing. There was a bonfire on the beach by the river and several river fish were threaded on tree branches, stuck diagonally on the sand, and roasted next to the fire. There was an iron pot on the bonfire, with some food cooked in it. Two girls squatted next to the campfire, cooking ingredients. There were also several young people walking out of the woods by the river, carrying a bundle of branches on their shoulders. They were wearing leather armor, with swords on their waists, and daggers tied to their legs. At first glance, they looked like this. You know, this is what college students look like when they are practicing in the wild. Serdak took Samira along the riverbank, worried that his whereabouts would be exposed. The two-headed ogre. Thea and Avi did not follow him, but hid in the forest behind. Before Soldak appeared, he took off his magic pattern structure and put on the half-new salamander leather armor that he usually wore. Samira also put away the demon snake's fong magic pattern structure and the sky strike bow. But no matter how they restrained their aura, it was difficult for them to look like ordinary people. Hey, can we exchange some information around here? Serdak waved from a distance and called to the group of young people in the river. The young people in the river straightened up and looked at the men and women who suddenly appeared in the distance. The man's body is muscular and explosive, while the woman's body is slender and well-proportioned. Of course, the young captain of the team stood up and said, We are an adventure group coming from Makuso. We want to cross Grove Ridge to the town of Katongida in the west. Serdak first introduced his origin, and then asked the other party, Where are you from? When they heard that they came from Makuso City, the young people were a little surprised and seemed a little incredible. So someone said, Why don't you take the high road and go over Grove Ridge? I'm sorry you can figure it out. Serdak scratched his head and said directly, I originally wanted to see what I could gain in this mountain range, and maybe I could encounter Warcraft or something. Before he finished speaking, someone interrupted him. Where did you get the news? There have been no monsters here a long time ago. This place is only suitable for simple training. Young people are always like this. After chatting for a few words and feeling familiar, they like to talk all over the place. Are you going to the Tangata town? Said a young girl. Then you are going the wrong way. You must have missed it. Katangata town is northwest of here. You can see an avenue when you walk out from here. You can get there by walking north along the avenue. The young girl's legs very long. It jumped up on a boulder and pointed to the woodland on the other side of the river valley. The young captain stood up and said proactively, This is very close to Takarai town. If you want to go further north to Bant's town, Takarai is the only place to go there. Bant's town? 
Serdak repeated doubtfully. The young captain smiled and said, Many adventure groups like to go there. It is located on the edge of the plain. And you can see many Earth-type monsters and rock golems there. Oh, we just want to go there, Soldek said. I think we can go to Takalai Town to replenish some supplies. Serdak then said to Samira, Thank you for the information. We climbed all the way over the mountains and didn't encounter any magical beasts. Fortunately, we encountered a lot of wild beasts, and our hunting skills are pretty good. As he spoke, Serdak took out a magic sealing box from his magic pocket and opened the box. It contained some endless fresh meat, and he selected some to give to these young people. Then he added, You can soak the meat in the stream for half a day. This will remove the blood and fishy smell inside. Thank you for the news. I wish you a smooth journey. The young captain happily accepted Serdak's gift and said happily, This is what every Takaliai person should do. Chapter 967 Rich Judging from the regional map of the Ganbu Plain, Takalai Town is located in the southwest area of the Ganbu Plain. It belongs to the southern edge of the Grove Mountains and is only more than a hundred kilometers away from Matengada Town in the north. As for the Banks Town mentioned by the young captain, it is in the southernmost part of the Ganbu Plain, which can be regarded as the most edge area of the plain. The Serdak team stood on the top of the mountain. The town of Takarai is located on the southern slope of the mountain. All the buildings in the town can be seen. There is a big river in the distance. Coming from the gap between the two mountains, flow out and pass south of the town. On the docks on the river bank, you can still see some workers carrying various goods. There were so many tugboats parked on the pier that they were almost crowded. There were even several long tugboats moored in the river outside the pier that could not dock. The tallest building in the town is a clock tower. This is a clock tower with six dials. It is located in the central square of the town. There is an exquisite statue of liberty on the top of the tall tower. But its face seems to be covered. A piece of white cloth, the scepter symbolizing freedom in his hand, was also broken. And the whole town looked a little desolate. The town is huge, at least a quarter of the size of Halanza city. There are many pedestrians on the street. The magic caravan is speeding on the street. The pedestrians are on both sides of the road. And they appear to be in order. There are high walls and city gates on the outermost edge of this town. There are not too many guards at the city gate. People entering the city have to wait patiently in line for a while before they can pass through the city gate. There can only be a guard every 10 meters on the city wall. But there are quite a lot of colorful flags planted at the top of the city. The colorful flags are fluttering in the wind. Making the town a little more lively. We will live here. And when you are healed... We will find a way to return to Benes City, Serdak said to the magician Avid. Magician Avid sat on the chair, looking a little excited, and suggested to Serdak, We don't have to stay in a hotel. That way our whereabouts can be traced easily. I can buy a property here. This kind of investment doesn't cost much. If I don't use it in the future, I can sell it and save me money on rent. There are three residences in Makuso City. If the temporary teleportation circle is set up in the residence, and there is no unlucky encounter with a thief. It can be kept there forever. Serdak also felt that the members of his team were too conspicuous. So he bought a house and lived in it, which would obviously make it less likely to be discovered. Well, when we get to the city later, we will go directly to the real estate company to buy a house. Soldak said decisively, Gulitam did not follow everyone into the city. Serdak planned to use a four-wheel truck to pull him into the city after everything was settled. When passing through the city gate, Avide showed off his magician badge and entered Takarai town directly through the special passage without queuing up. Serdak, Samira and Sia didn't have to say a word during the whole process. The street shops in the town looked very prosperous, with a dazzling array of goods displayed in the glass windows. And there were many people on the street. After entering the town, magician Avid waved directly at the roadside, and a magic caravan quickly stopped on the roadside. Several people got into the magic caravan. Magician Avid said to the driver, Take us go to the biggest real estate company in town. The coachman raised his whip, and the magic caravan quickly merged into the traffic. The steps for Magician Avid to buy a house are very simple. Basically, he tells the receptionist his needs. After the receptionist finds a suitable house, he sees the first single-family villa worth 80 magic crystals. I quickly decided to buy it, and then read on. Next, the land of the second house is larger. There are some palm trees planted around the surrounding walls. There is a fountain and swimming pool in the yard. The green plants in the back garden are also neatly trimmed. A three-story building is located in it. 
Such a manor covering an area of 1.5 acres was worth 200 magic crystals. The magician poured out all the magic crystals in his pocket, counted out 201 magic crystals, and handed them to the real estate trader. Bought it on the spot. It was a picture of a magical nobleman's tycoon style, which directly knocked the young real estate trader unconscious. If he hadn't seen Avid's sickly appearance, maybe this real estate trader could still provide some information tonight. Special services are coming. No means were used yet. The two transactions were concluded easily, and the real estate dealer almost walked out of the house with ballet steps. That night, Magician Avid obtained the property ownership certificate with his name in advance. Once he stamped the seal of the magic noble on it, the two houses would belong to him. Gulitum did not stay overnight outside the city. He took a horse-drawn carriage transporting green plants directly into the town of Takale. That night, everyone sat by the manor swimming pool, eating barbecue dishes prepared by Chef Ching Lai from the town's high-end restaurant, and drinking. Drinking the black pearl wine that is abundant in the southern part of the dry cloth plain. We sat on the lounge chair and looked at the stars while chatting. Magic is just a necessary means to become a noble. The main thing is that after we become a noble, we have wealth that others cannot have. How should we enjoy life next? The magician avid, who had drunk some wine, was completely in a state of disbelief and talked with Soldak about what constitutes a noble. Soldak was also more relaxed than ever before, holding a glass of wine and chatting casually with Avid. Thea was sitting by the swimming pool. She had no intention of restoring her mermaid body shape in front of everyone. Her face turned a little red after taking a sip of wine. Serdak said that he owns a territory in the Belan Plain and wants to freely come and go from the territory to his hometown. Avid drank a little too much. He waved his hand and said straightforwardly, It is definitely impossible for you to build a large portal. There is only one large portal for each seat. In addition to the construction cost. In addition to the astronomical figures. Another reason is that the lords who control this plane only hope to have a portal. The most important thing here is to control the taxes on goods entering and leaving the plane. This is a source of income after owning a plane. You have built a teleportation gate in your territory. How will the good circulation tax be calculated in the future? Although it is prohibited to build large teleportation gates, temporary teleportation arrays are not prohibited. However, the transmission cost of this temporary teleportation array itself is very high, and this temporary teleportation array cannot be directly connected to the home. It also needs to go through the node portals set up in the teleportation halls of each province are used to handle urgent matters. It doesn't matter if you go there once, but if you often use this kind of temporary teleportation circle, even for you lords, it will really affect your life. Then the two talked about the materials for building a temporary portal, and the magician avid whispered. The most important part of this temporary portal is the magic hub. The core components inside are made from the spine of the time-traveling beast with the magic pattern of life. Currently, this type of magic material is mainly in the hands of the Astrologer's Guild. The time-traveling beast is a level 6 monster. And as a knight, you may not be able to catch it in your lifetime. Soldak took a sip of wine, looked at the bright yellow streamers in the night sky above his head, and said nothing more. Then have you ever hunted a time-traveling beast? The two-headed ogre asked curiously. Magician Avid said, That's not true. I can't do it either. It's entirely due to the gap in level and strength. But my mentor has hunted him. Chapter 968 Changes Outside the Pussy Mountain's Lava Mine Two cobalt slaves led an ancient bolai horse to the entrance of the cave. The lava waterfall at the entrance of the cave spread heat waves outwards. And these heat waves burned people's faces. Kubalama didn't want to get too close and kept moving back, shaking his head. The cobalt slave was unable to hold the horse and growled threateningly. The two cobalt slaves wore leather hoods on their heads with a copper wax stand and laid on the hood and half a candle on top. In the sulfur mine, only those who work diligently for 30 consecutive days will be rewarded with such a unique hat. But just such a hat with half a candle has become the pursuit of almost all cobalt slaves during this period. In fact, if you know these cobalt slaves, you will know how difficult it is for this group of cobalt slaves to get from Benna City to today. But it is undeniable that life is getting better little by little. When they were in Benna City, the biggest wish of these cobalt slaves was probably to survive. The slave owner de Shijin almost massacred them en masse and buried them under the flowerbed of a farm on the outskirts of Benna City as fertilizer. If Serdak hadn't brought them to a deserted place, perhaps their bones would have been covered with rose roots. Later, when they arrived in the deserted land, 
The wishes of these cobalt slaves changed. Initially, they hoped to eat all grain porridge. However, this wish was already realized when the drainage canal was dug. The cobalt slaves who had filled their bellies further hoped to move from the shack surrounded by reed mats to brick houses with wooden partitions. Although it is still Daytonkyu. If some adult cobalts are in need, at least Daytonkyu can be divided into single rooms with reed mats. Although it cannot be soundproofed. Who cares about that? However, they finally realized their self-worth in the sulfur mine camp of Pudu Mountain. The cobalt slaves finally realized that the life here, although there was no freedom, seemed to be better than the poor tribe they lived in before. With the sulfur mines collected by the lava river every day, no one is worried that Lord Serdak will bury them in the farm as fertilizer. In the past two years, cobalt slaves have even given birth to many cubs. Now their pursuit is more advanced. Pursuing the recognition of the overseers and the respect of other cobalts. What can reflect their achievements is the leather hat with half a candle. This method was thought up by the old village chief. The sulfur mine will select 10 outstanding cobalt miners every month. The 10 cobalt miners will not only get a higher level of food quota, but also get such a leather hat. They are all excellent models among miners. However, these 10 outstanding cobalt miners will be reselected every month. Sulfur mine output has continued to grow in the past three months. Aphrodite walked out of the sulfur mine and ordered the two cobalt slaves. During my absence, you two will stay here. You will eat and sleep here. You cannot leave for a moment. No other people are allowed here. Someone broke in. Do you understand? Although the cobalt slaves don't speak imperial English very well, they have no problem understanding them. He got on the ancient bolai horse and followed a winding path to the temporary warehouse where sulfur or was stored at the foot of the mountain. Luke was waiting here. He saw Aphrodite coming down from the mountain on horseback and immediately rode up to meet her, saying to Aphrodite, The airship ticket has been purchased and we have to get to the Helensa City Airport Terminal before tomorrow night. Aphrodite wore a mithril mask and said calmly, We have to rush back to Wall Village first. She followed Luke, and the two rode along a cement road covered with volcanic ash, heading towards the village of Wall, town of Takale. In the morning, Serdak ran around the residential area outside the manor. It was dotted with manors covering an area of about one or two acres, and these manors extended to the river south of the town. There is a slightly higher mound over there, and larger manors are gathered there. There is no free market in the residential area. Soldak ran seven streets and found a market along the street. There were bakeries, vegetable and fish stalls. But it seemed that the most popular one was a grain store. These people carrying pockets, almost all those who buy wheat flour or miscellaneous grains, are complaining that the price of grain seems to have increased again. Serdak asked a fish stall owner strangely, Don't we have a wheat growing area? Why is the price of food still going up? The fish stall owner also shook his head with worry and said, I heard that the wheat production in the grain producing area may be reduced this year. Now that Makuso has cut off contact with the outside world, maybe the price of this grain will still be high. It will go up. He first bought a few river fish and then bought 15 slaughtered fat chickens from the butcher stall. Serdak didn't carry it himself. He only had to write down the address and someone at the market would be responsible for delivering the food to his door. Get out of the market. Serdak planned to pass directly through this street from the west and then return to the manor in the east. The houses here are basically three-story lofts built along the street. But these houses look very old. Some poor people gathered on the roadside and saw some ornately decorated carriages stopping on the roadside. Everyone stood up and gathered around. The employer in rich clothes stood at the door of the carriage, shouting loudly, basically shouting, 80 cents a day, 80 coppers a day, free lunch, carried bags at the dock, Young and strong young man. I. Please look at me. I am strong enough. Hire me. More and more people gathered. Serdak didn't expect that this street was actually a labor market. And the whole street was packed with people waiting for work. It's just you guys. Come with me. The employer randomly selected a few people. Let them sit on the luggage rack behind the magic caravan. And quickly left in the magic caravan. The people waiting for work on the street dispersed again. Serdak walked through this long street and found that there were hundreds of townspeople waiting to do odd jobs on the street. Some of these townspeople who can't find jobs are sleeping against the wall. Some are chatting together, and some are gambling together. It can be seen that they do not have a positive attitude towards life, and just want to continue to have fun. In daily life, if you make money, eat something good. If you don't make money, eat whatever you have. 
This is the town of Takale as Sirdek sees it. After passing through this long street of hired workers, Soldek passed by the central square of the town and saw the clock tower that was nearly 70 to 80 meters high. Just to the north of the bell tower was the Warrior Academy in Takalai Town. At this time in the morning, a group of young students are entering the school one after another. The two sheriffs were strolling back and forth in the central square. They were wearing standard leather armors and long swords at their waists. This season happened to be summer, and the leather armors they wore were very cool. There were no leather coverings on their thighs and arms, with a wisp of red tassel on the leather hat on his head. There are not many adventure groups in this town, probably because there are few resources around. Adventure groups generally don't stay in this town. Soldak happened to see Samira and Sia standing in front of the fruit stall at the edge of the square, choosing cactus fruits. When he walked over, they had already selected the fruits. Seeing Sirdak appear in front of them, the two of them were not surprised at all. Sia pointed to the tall bell tower with an expected look on his face and said to Sirdak, We want to see it from above. See, do you want to come together? Okay, let's go take a look. Sirdak said to the two girls, When I walked down to the bell tower, I saw two middle-aged men in uniform sitting at the door of the bell tower. There was a square table in front of them. Next to the square table was a notice board, which stated that if you want to climb the bell tower, every day people need to pay a viewing fee of one silver coin. When the middle-aged man saw Soldak coming with the two girls, he immediately became energetic and asked Soldak, Would you like to go for a walk up there? Climb to the observation deck above. The entire tower panoramic view of Calais Town. Soldak paid three silver coins and the middle-aged man left to help them open the door under the bell tower, asked them to climb up the winding staircase inside the building, and told them not to get too close to the big bell above. When it hits the hour, the big clock will be rung. If you get too close, it will easily hurt your ears. There is still half an hour until the next time the hour is struck. There were only three of them in the empty bell tower. Soldak, as they walked up the spiral staircase, they could clearly hear the friction sound of the mechanical gears inside. Climbing to the top of the building, there is indeed an observation deck above. Standing on the observation deck, you can see a panoramic view of the entire town. Almost all the balconies of the houses near the square have some flowers and plants. And many trees are planted along the streets, making the entire town look full of vitality. Samira held the railing with both hands and looked at the mountains in the distance. Sia took out her water bag, splashed some water on her face, and looked at the big river in the south of the town. She seemed to want to go for a stroll by the river. It turns out that this is a human town. There is a big difference between me and the underwater city of Arjana Sea Tribe. Sia said while standing next to the railing, We're going to live in this town for a while. I'm afraid we won't be able to send you back to the Seven Seas for the time being. Soldak said apologetically to Sia. Sia blushed slightly and whispered to Soldak. I said it doesn't matter. I think it's actually good to have the opportunity to walk around. Samira on the other side of the fence turned her face away. The wind on the roof was a bit strong and ruffled her hair. She wrinkled her delicate nose and said nothing. What's going on over there? Following the direction of Samira's finger, Serdak saw several plumes of smoke rising from the pier by the river. It looked like a fire was burning at the pier. Groups of soldiers holding weapons in their hands came from the pier, jumped off the tugboat with black cloaks behind them, and quickly occupied the dock. Chapter 969 War the laborers and merchants on the dock were surrounded by a group of soldiers, and the manager and sheriff on the dock soon fell in a pool of blood. Although the clock tower is relatively far away from the town's dock, the scene on the dock fell into the eyes of several people very clearly. The soldiers holding weapons were divided into combat teams and quickly dispersed from the pier and along the streets of the town. A larger combat team went straight to the outer wall of Takarai town, while another team captured the town, garrison camps, and security brigade. Anyone who encountered resistance or resistance along the way was almost always beheaded on the spot without mercy. Of course, not everyone in this group was killed. Those who gave up resistance could survive, as long as they squatted against the wall with their heads in their hands. Serdak did not expect to encounter such a thing on the second day after arriving in Takalai town. He did not even know which force wanted to occupy this town. The reaction speed of the security brigade in Takalai town was really slow. A combat team almost surrounded the courtyard of the security brigade. Only then did the city defense guards of the security brigade assemble in the courtyard. Both sides relied on the security brigade's courtyard wall. A fierce battle begins. The fighting team outside had the upper hand. 
and soon nearly 500 soldiers wearing black cloaks gathered outside the security brigade courtyard. A group of archers stood on the high wall outside the security brigade and on the roof of the neighbor's house. As a group of shield warriors broke open the gate of the city defense brigade, the courtyard of the city defense brigade fell into a melee. Just half an hour later, the city defense brigade headquarters in Takali town was declared to have fallen. Relatively speaking, the local garrison camp responded quickly. The garrison in the camp quickly assembled and launched a counterattack outward from the garrison camp. The equipment and weapons of these local garrison troops were relatively regular, and almost all of them wore thick armor. Although it was such a hot weather, it was difficult to wear such heavy armor on their bodies. It's a very painful thing. But no matter how painful it is, it's still better than losing your life. In fact, Serdak could see that the combat effectiveness of the garrison in the garrison camp was quite good. But the biggest problem was that the local garrison had less than 500 infantry. And there were no cavalry or archers. It shouldn't be a problem to defend the military camp with such a small force. But if you want to launch a counterattack against the intruders in the town, this small force seems a bit stretched. For a time, the local garrison was suppressed by the intruders on the two short streets at the gate of the camp. For such a large walled town, the garrison only had 500 infantrymen, which Serdak did not expect. The war continued to spread from south to north. The invaders were beaten down street by street, and soon they invaded the town central square along the town central street. However, their attack speed had slowed down significantly at this moment. The noble lords in the town all have some private armies, but they fight independently and basically protect their own manor. These private armies are more effective against invaders. These invaders paid a heavy price every time they invaded a manor. Seeing that the situation was not good, some noble lords quickly left the manor with their own private armed forces and prepared to leave Takarai town. However, they were intercepted by the intruders on the street. It was not easy to leave at this time. On the other hand, the civilians in the town would not be harmed as long as they did not resist and locked themselves in their homes. By almost noon, the entire southern part of Takali town had fallen. Serdak could not continue to stay in the bell tower and watch the excitement. This was the commanding heights of the town and was destined to become the first choice target for these invaders. He took Samira and Sia back to the house and happened to see the two-headed ogre Gulitum preparing to go out. Where are you going? Serdak asked the ogre. Seeing that you haven't come back for so long, I wanted to go to the town to find you, the ogre said angrily. Around this time, both Samira and the ogres were frequently exposed to war in the Belan Plain. So they looked calm at this time. This is the most famous wealthy area in the town. Most of the residents in this area are nobles. The nobles soon realized that fighting alone could easily be defeated one by one. And only by uniting could they win the final victory. So they mobilized various private armies to form a protective alliance to guard the fringes of the wealthy areas. The vanguard of the invaders has already started a street battle with this guardian alliance. Hearing that the town was attacked by invaders, the magician Avid also scratched his head. However, he and Soldak had almost the same idea. The current Ganbu plain was still under the rule of Lord Macdonald. Neither the invaders nor the town's defenders came to help them. Reasons. The magician Abbot said to Serdak. There is a magic union in the town. Magicians are a scarce resource wherever they are. We can go to the magic union to seek asylum now. They should be able to take care of us. The magic guild in Takarai town was also on the north street adjacent to the wealthy area. Soldak felt that there was nothing wrong with this. So he left the house from behind with Abbot on his back and rushed directly to the magic guild in the town. At this time, several magicians from the magic union in the town were watching the battle. Avid and Serdak came to the magic guild. The magic guild was a three-story building, narrow at the top and wide at the bottom. A group of magicians stood on the balcony on the third floor of the magic guild, looking curiously at the battle engine on. The magician Avid took out his magic badge, and a magic assistant immediately took him to the office of Cronin, the president of the magic guild in Takarai town. The identity on his badge was that of a member of the Astrologer's Guild, with an important status, much taller than ordinary magicians. Hello! It's a pity that we encountered these when we were in Takarai Town, the somewhat bald president said to Avid. They are a well-known rebel army in the southern area of the Ganbu Plain. They have fought with the local lords here many times. Unexpectedly, their appetite has become bigger this time, and they actually want to capture Takarai Town. What's the attitude of the Magic Guild? Abid sat up with difficulty and asked President Cronin. A young assistant standing next to President Cronin quickly replied, Our president is applying to each other for a non-war zone. You can move here. We have free accommodation here. 
Of course, you can also stay at your own home, but you have to cooperate with some searches and inspections. These rebels are usually very stopped killing the townspeople. Magician Abbott thought about it and said to President Cronin, Thank you very much for meeting me despite your busy schedule. Then I'll stay at home for the time being. President Luo Kinning immediately stood up and took the initiative to say politely to Avid. It's definitely a good choice. When Serdak and Avid left the Magic Guild, they saw a group of noble private soldiers passing by quickly on the road ahead. Serdak ignored them at all and took magician Avid back to the manor he had just acquired yesterday. In fact, he was thinking along the way that if the town of Takarai was occupied by this rebel army, the manor would probably become worthless. In that case, Avid would really suffer a huge loss. Chapter 970 Rita's Dowry The town of Takarai is in chaos, and the southern area of the town is still the main battlefield. The fighting situation in the northern part of the town is somewhat better. There are many private armies of noble lords gathered here. They have set up roadblocks at the intersection of the long street. At least they cannot let the cavalry run rampant in the street. Many lords in the wealthy areas sent out their private armies because they also wanted to know first-hand information on the front lines of the town. For example, how many rebels have come this time? If they fight with all their strength, what are their chances of winning? The lords are also communicating with each other privately, whether to fight or not to fight this battle. At this time, the noble lords need to stand up and lead everyone to resist the invaders from outside. This is the responsibility of every noble. As the noble lords of Takarai town, they need to fight at least a decent battle with the invaders. Instead of fleeing here in a hurry like a lost dog when they see these rebels, the noble lords fled without fighting and were held accountable afterwards. If you are responsible, you will easily be found guilty of collaborating with the enemy. Even if you will not receive any punishment during the trial, you may have to pay a large fine. Secondly, the town encountered an intruder. The prominent nobles and lords in the town sneaked away in despair. The town clerk would definitely record it in the important events of Takarai town over the years. This kind of thing would only happen once. If you become a deserter, this stain will remain in the family for decades, even hundreds of years. People like Serdak cannot be regarded as the noble lords of Takalai town. They are just passers-by in this town and have no reason to fight for this town. Now through the news from the Magic Union, it has been determined that the people who invaded Takarai town were a rebel army from the southern part of the Ganbu Plain. Apart from groups of troops, almost no one else could be seen on the streets. Almost all shops are closed, and nothing can be bought on the streets. Even homeless people on the streets will hide in safer places at times like this. Serdak walked along the long street in the wealthy area back to the magician Abbot's manor. The two-headed ogre was guarding the gate. There were even some traces of fighting here. Serdak walked into the gate and asked Gulitum. The traces of fighting outside are from the vanguard of the rebel army. No, it was a group of lords' private soldiers who wanted us to join their armed fighting group. When they saw that I didn't agree, they actually said that I was an internal agent of the rebels and wanted to rush in. But I drove them away. The two-headed ogre stood inside the courtyard wall, stuck his head out of the wall, and said angrily. Serdak walked into the courtyard carrying the magician Abbot and said to the ogre, Oh, don't pay attention to them. Throw them out if they dare to break in. Immediately afterwards, he said to Gulitam, The situation is not very clear now, but the rebels are probably well prepared this time and the chance of winning may be greater. The guards should all be supporters of Lord MacDonald. So there is no need for us to help them. Soldak said to everyone. Cries of death and some wailing can always be heard in the distance. At noon, you can see civilians fleeing from the southern area of the town to the north. It is said that the rebels have captured the three gates on the east, west, and north of the town, and have firmly controlled the dock in the south of the town. It can be regarded as blocking all the people in the town inside the town. Many people want to escape the fighting and leave here, but they can no longer leave the city at this time. I heard that some noble lords in the wealthy area in the north of the town organized an armed resistance against the rebels, and some noble lords planned to capture a certain city gate and leave Takalai town at night. So a large number of ordinary citizens in the town began to go to the north of the town. Rich areas gather. In the afternoon, many civilians can be seen on the streets looking for shelter. Serdak stood on the roof and looked at the situation outside. The chaotic streets were full of townspeople who wanted to flee. Samira asked Serdak, How about we leave here? At this moment, Serdak felt that even if he left Takarai town, the journey would be very difficult. At least the rebels did not intend to completely cleanse Takarai town. So he said, Let's take a look first. At least there are a shelter from the wind and rain. 
Thea was soaking in the swimming pool in the yard. The magician Avid was very curious about the Jana Sea tribe and sat on the deck chair by the pool and refused to leave. Occasionally, the two chatted for a few words. But Sia didn't seem to be interested in human magicians. They basically just talked casually and jumped into the swimming pool. There had just been a light snowfall in Wall Village in winter. Serdak walked out of the void gate and faced the cold wind that made his body shiver involuntarily. Aphrodite leaned next to Gubalai's horse, holding the reins with one hand, with a faint blue mark on her face. The north wind carried snowflakes like galloping horses on the hillside. There is only a mountain ridge between this place and Wall Village, which is considered to be the mountain call next door. In order to avoid being noticed, Serdak did not return to Wall Village to open the void gate. He walked over and took the reins of the horse, signaling Aphrodite to mount. Aphrodite gave him a look that said, It's better to ride together. Serdak stretched out his hand to support Aphrodite's soft waist, easily lifted her onto the horse's back, and then braved the north wind. He held the horse's reins and walked toward Wall Village. Is there a war going on over there? Aphrodite asked Soldak with a smile. The smile in her eyes was filled with the meaning of you are so unlucky. Serdak has indeed been very unlucky recently. He went to the Ganbu Plain to perform a mission. The rest of the second level experts returned smoothly. However, when it was his turn, he was left in the Ganbu Plain and had to wait for magic. Master Iwai can only come back after he recovers. It was not easy to get out of the mountains and live in a livable town. However, just half a day later, the rebels attacked the town. Serdak also said somewhat depressedly, Well, the local rebels invaded the town of Takail, and we are temporarily trapped in the town. The two walked to the top of the mountain slope. The north wind here was stronger. There was almost no snow on the top of the slope, and the strong wind blew it into the mountain call below. Wall Village is also at the feet of the two of them. Standing here, Serdak could overlook the entire fifth level reservoir. The reservoir has been completely frozen and covered with a thick layer of snow. Only the area near the spring is still intact. There is a gurgling water flowing continuously into the reservoir. But this part of the spring water forms a strange water channel in the reservoir, flowing along the top of the sluice on the east side of the first level reservoir and flowing below. Because of the existence of this spring, people in the village have always drank live mountain spring water. After the townhouses were built in the village, the old village chief, Uncle Bright, also built a suspended waterway to directly introduce spring water into the village. The weather in Wall Village is extremely cold. Thick layers of ice have condensed on the suspended waterways. And there are even ice slides like pendants. Several villagers are braving the wind and snow, holding long wooden poles, and clearing the sharp ice on the waterways. Slip away to prevent someone from getting hurt when passing by below. Aphrodite took out the mithril mask from her arms and put it on her face. This time she was just passing through Wall Village preparing to take the magic airship from Alensa City to Benes City. Since the sailing schedule has been set, the mountain road must be difficult to walk in such bad weather. So she can stay in Wall Village. Time is very limited. Serdak had also been away from Wall Village for too long. While Aphrodite was passing by Wall Village, he came back here to take a look. Aphrodite did not follow Serdak back to the village, but continued directly along the snow road towards the Paglos Pass. Wall Village is located in a mountain valley in a deserted land. A light snowfall will fill the village with snow. However, looking down at Wall Village from the top of the mountain, you can still feel the new atmosphere in the village. Neat streets. Villagers have open roads extending in all directions in the thick snow. And many villagers are clearing snow. A group of knights from the guard camp rode on horseback and walked slowly out of the village through the hillside horse track. On this road, Serdak saw a familiar figure among a group of girls. When the guard battalion knights passed by the group of girls, they actually stopped and said H, low politely. The guard battalion captain Daniela Knight greeted Rita in the crowd. And the two chatted casually. Rita then he followed these girls upstream to the village's creek. The knights of the guard camp headed out of the village along this horse road. It seems that the relationship between the two is not bad. Soldek also asked Carl to help inquire about Knight Danila from the side. Carl said that the young Knight Danila had a good reputation. Serdak entered Wall Village from the main entrance at the foot of the mountain. There were still several vendors in the free market shivering in the cold wind, and the products on the stalls were all not afraid of the cold. The Pagolas Mountains are now also covered by heavy snow, and few adventure groups dare to enter the mountains during the season. Therefore, the market in Wall Village has also become depressed. However, the original open-air tavern at the entrance of the village has now turned into an exquisite log cabin. 
The sideboard at the door creaked loudly in the wind. And there was the sound of changing glasses from inside. And a strong aroma of wine came from the door. The door of the tavern was pushed open. And two businessmen in fur coats walked out. Soldek happened to see the lively scene in the tavern. There were actually a few bartenders in cool clothes. Shuttling between the bars like butterflies. Among the guests. Serdak stepped on the snow on the road and walked up the street. He met some villagers along the way, and everyone greeted him warmly. Dak, are you back? Hi. Dark, I haven't seen you for a while. I heard you led troops to garrison on some plane. How have you been lately? Dak, some were familiar faces. Some were new faces. And everyone surrounded him all the way up the colonel. Everyone happily asked Soldak various questions. And he responded to them one by one no matter what the question was. When they reached the gate of the villa, everyone quickly waved goodbye to Soldak and let him return home alone. There was a gap in the courtyard door, and it was not locked from the inside. There was no caretaker at home. Soldak opened the door and stepped into the yard. He heard the sound of a dagger chopping into the air from the yard. I turned around and saw little Peter practicing his sword swing next to the wooden mannequin on the edge of the yard. He only wore a sweater, a pair of thick breeches, and exquisite riding boots. He kept a lunge as if wielding a dagger in his hand. In such a cold weather, there was a shiny layer of sweat on his forehead, and a few strands of soft blonde hair were wet with sweat. Peter! Serdak stood at the door and shouted. Dad, you're back! Seeing Soldak standing at the gate, little Peter put his dagger on the weapon rack aside, turned around and pounced on him. The way little Peter ran and his youthful face looked so much like his father that Soldak was even in a trance at the moment. Soldak held little Peter's armpits with both hands lifted him high, and spun him around in the sky. Hey, you've been doing well recently. I saw that you can swing your sword and break the air with sound. This is a big improvement. Soldak put little Peter down, patted him on the shoulder and praised him. Little Peter puffed up his chest proudly and said to Soldak, I practice hard every day. Soldak took out a magic sword from his magic pocket and handed it to little Peter, and said to him, I want to remind you, don't point the sword at your friend. In addition, this sword is very sharp. You're if your fingers accidentally touch the blade. It will easily fall off. So this sword is not suitable for practice. It must be maintained regularly before it can become your partner. Then, next you do each basic swordsmanship movement ten times. And let me see what's wrong with your posture. Soldak began to correct little Peter's basic swordsmanship postures and develop a correct set of basic movements, which is the first step to becoming an excellent warrior. In battle, Many times you have to respond without thinking. At this time, whether you can perform standard actions will directly affect whether you can gain the upper hand. Just when Soldak was teaching little Peter, old Sheila slowly walked out of the room. She is aging rapidly these days, and her legs don't seem to be as flexible as before. Serdak remembered that when he first met old Sheila, she didn't look like this. Now the aged spots on her face are becoming more and more obvious. Dak, you're back. There was also a kind of exhaustion in her voice. Soldak pulled little Peter up the steps, stood next to old Sheila and said, I happen to be passing by the village this time, so I came back to take a look. By the way, I plan to finalize Rita's marriage. I will go find Daniela in the evening. Now he is out of the village on duty. Seeing that Serdak had indeed kept his promise and rushed back from the plane for Rita's marriage as scheduled, old Sheila had a rare smile of relief on her face. Well, it's time to settle down. Rita will be 22 years old after the new year. After saying that, he took little Peter and turned around and walked back to the house. Natasha supported old Sheila and took a deep look at Soldak. Serdak followed into the living room. Old Sheila sat by the fireplace and warmed herself up. Natasha took out a towel to wipe the sweat from little Peter's head and asked a young maid to take little Peter to take a bath. She was busy bringing a hot towel to Soldak, letting him wipe his hands and face, and squatted at his feet to help him put on a pair of soft shoes. Serdak sat on the sofa, took out the set of magic pattern structure captured from the second turn archer from the magic waste bag, placed it on the carpet in front of him, and said to old Sheila, This set of magic pattern structure will be sent to the magic guild in Helensa City for repair and maintenance later. After repair, it will be one of Rita's dowry. Then he took out a smaller box from his magic belt bag, opened the lid, filled it with bright magic crystals, and said, This is the second dowry I prepared for Rita. In addition, I plan to let Charlie build another villa next to this yard to give Rita a third dowry. Chapter 971 Family At night, 
The lights in the restaurant of Soldak's villa in Wall Village were brightly lit. Serdak hosted a banquet for all the young knights in the Badlands Security Squadron. The 10-meter-long oak dining table in the restaurant is filled with exquisite dishes. Serdak sits on the main seat. Daniela, the knight captain of the guard battalion, sits closest to Serdak. The other knights line up in sequence. Five ten people almost fill the entire long row of tables. All the knights tried to lower their voices when speaking. Everyone wanted to leave a good impression in front of Lord Serdak. Knight Daniela seemed a little nervous. And he secretly glanced at the door of the restaurant. Natasha and Rita brought three large plates of barbecue from the kitchen with a maid. Until now, there is only one cook and one maid in Soldak's family. So Natasha and Rita are doing mini housework. In fact, even Soldak contributed to this dinner. He was responsible for marinating the yellow lamb leg, which tasted pretty good after grilling. When Rita passed by Daniela, she didn't even squint her eyes or give any hint to Daniela. Daniela was so nervous that she couldn't breathe. She couldn't help but loosen her collar and then drank it. He drank the golden cider in the cup and glanced at Soldak secretly. How is the security situation in the deserted land these days? Serdak lowered his head and asked Danila while cutting the roasted salamander meat. Daniela quickly put down the knife in her hand and answered seriously. The desert bandits entered the deserted land several times. But they only operated south of the Great Rift Valley. They did not find any villages to rob. And we discovered their whereabouts. They did not dare to go too deep. So they left hastily. This happened several times. Serdak nodded slightly, glanced at the knights at the table, and raised his voice and said, After this spring, you graduates will have served in the deserted land guard squadron for one year. The internship period here is officially over. According to the practice of the guard camp, you have the right to be transferred to other areas. Soldak paused and then said to everyone, If any of you have such an idea, you can ask Daniela to do the statistics. I will personally give you some recommendation letters. You can think about your wish to go to Hylon in advance. Which squadron is in the Saw Guard camp? I can say H, low to each squadron leader in advance here. Hearing what Serdek said, the knights sitting at the table immediately started discussing among themselves. However, Cavaliers Captain Daniela was the first to stand up and said seriously, I have been patrolling in the wasteland for exactly one year. Now I am very familiar with the northern area of the wasteland. I have basically adapted to the environment here. I want to stay and continue to guard the squadron in the wasteland. This place is closely connected with the city of Halanza. Compared with other suburban towns, the conditions in all aspects are actually not bad. So, I want to stay, Knight Captain Daniela said. Serdak smiled and said casually, Oh, others can also talk about it. Don't feel any pressure. In fact, I hope that more of you will choose to leave so that the young people in the village can people can have the opportunity to enter the guard camp and become reserve knights. Seeing that the young guard camp knights at the dining table were all thinking for a moment, Serdak waved his hand again and said, Of course, if you want to stay, I also welcome you. This welcome is not verbal, but comes with some benefits from Wall Village. Accommodation will be provided in Wall Village, and you can choose to build a building in the village. For good townhouses, you can also ask the old village chief Uncle Bright, to approve a piece of residential land and build a house according to your ideas. The young knights in the guard camp started talking again. Danila, you are their captain. I am glad that you are willing to stay. After the dinner, Danila was left alone by Lord Serdak without any surprise. And the other knights of the guard battalion returned to the security center. The matter between Captain Daniela and Rita was already a semi-open secret in Wall Village. So no one was surprised at all when they were left behind. Serdak sat in the spacious living room, and Natasha brought sweet black tea. Rita followed Natasha and brought over a plate of exquisite fruits and pastries. Serdak motioned for Danila to sit down, and then asked Natasha and Rita to sit down opposite her. The wicker chair next to the fire is empty. Old Sheila has not been in good spirits recently and likes to go to bed early. The crackling sound of burning firewood could be heard in the living room. Night Daniela was sweating. He held the tea cup with some restraint and remained silent. Serdak whispered a few words to Natasha, who immediately nodded, then turned and left. Seeing Natasha leave the living room, Rita, who was originally relatively calm, seemed a little flustered at this moment. Natasha gestured to Rita to go out for something and asked her to stay in the living room. The living room became quiet, and Soldak was silent for a while before he said to Danila, Danila, don't you have anything to say to me about you and Rita? Night Danila stood up immediately, 
blushing, and said to Suldak in the living room, Lord Sardak, I know that my status is a bit humble. I am still just an ordinary guard camp knight. I hope to gain your recognition through my own efforts. Before I propose to Rita, I can gain your approval. Agree. Sardak looked up at Danila in front of him, waved to him to sit down, and then said, As Rita's brother, I am very pleased that Rita chose an outstanding young man like you. Rita suffered a lot at home, but it was this experience that gave her many excellent qualities. Maybe she doesn't understand poetry, doesn't know how to dance, doesn't understand the complicated rules at the dance, or even isn't used to wearing those long evening gowns. But she is hardworking, brave, kind, optimistic, perseverant, and a very good girl. I agree. You can propose to Rita anytime. But here, as Rita's brother rather than a noble lord, what I want to say to you is that if you no longer love each other one day, I hope you can return Rita to us like a knight. Rita's eyes were a little moist, and her nose was red as she said, Dak, tomorrow during the day, remember to come and see old Sheila. When you have time in the future, come here more often, Soldak said to Knight Danila. Danila quickly stood up again, saluted Soldak as a knight, and replied readily, Yes, I still have something to do, so I won't entertain you anymore. Serdak stood up to see the guests off. Knight Daniela quickly stood up and left. At this time, Natasha had prepared some vegetables, frozen meat, and baked wheat cakes in the kitchen cellar, and packed several large boxes, putting the food prepared by Natasha into the magic waste bag. Serdak just hugged Natasha, kissed her forehead, and left in a hurry. Chapter 972 Stalemate At dusk in Takarai Town, several dark gray countercurrents of time and space appeared in the orange sky. The Ganbu plane is like a piece of broken tiles floating in the sea of stars. This plane is so small. According to the map of the Ganbu plane, there are only two Bina provinces here. And the Ganbu plane it is long and narrow from north to south. Narrow from east to west. Low in the south and high in the north. There are no indigenous people in the Ganbu plane. All residents on the plane are immigrants from the Bina province. And these immigrants mainly come from the Terrapagan area. During the period when the Ganbu plane was first discovered, Countless landless Terrapagan people poured into the Ganbu Plain. Although this place is close to the reverse flow of time and space, it is a land rich in water and grass. The biggest specialty of this place is the several oil and stone mines on the plain of origin. There is a dry cloth plain 20 kilometers east of Hatengata town. The largest wet stone mine is owned by the McDonnell family. Small reserves of lapis lazuli and turquoise mines have also been discovered in other places. The name Takale is a homophony of turquoise in the Green Empire language. However, due to overexploitation in recent decades, the, the turquoise veins have penetrated deep into the ground, and the cost of mining has increased significantly, but the output has been decreasing year by year. Even so, the Gombu Plain with a pleasant climate is still the first choice for young people in Terrapagan to start a business. Now the town of Takale is shrouded in flames of war. Serdek walked out of the void gate and couldn't help but cover his mouth and nose with his hands. The smell of burning pine smoke floated over the town of Takale and several houses in the town were on fire. On the street outside the house, a group of lords' private troops passed by quickly. The scraping of soldiers and footsteps made people feel a little restless. Several stragglers from the security brigade were catching strong men on the street, and some young and strong townspeople were forced to join. The improvised army was escorted to the frontline battlefield unarmed. After a burst of noise and crying, only a few women, old people and children were left on the street. They didn't even know where they should go. Many people were sitting tiredly on the street. Some people regretted that they should not have believed the news. They ran across the battlefield from Nanchung district to the quilt. They thought that the nobles here would break through the blockade and leave the town. Unexpectedly, they were killed here instead. Caught a young man. Some people hate the rebels who destroyed the town of Takali. Some people hate the town's security forces. Feeling that they usually wear black iron armor. But when a war actually breaks out, they are not only incompetent, but also take ordinary townspeople to the battlefield and use them as cannon fodder. Others just squatted there silently, holding their children and crying helplessly. Some people even fell asleep on the grass when they were tired from crying. There was no food stored at all in the mansion that magician Avite had just bought. Serdak went to the market yesterday morning and bought only enough food to feed the two-headed ogre. Today Serdak returned to Wall Village and happened to bring back some vegetables and frozen meat. Baked wheat cakes. There will be no shortage of supplies for the time being. Everyone gathered on the villa terrace for dinner. And Serdak prepared some barbecue. 
vegetable soup and baked wheat cakes. The sky had darkened, and there were no lights in the yard. Gulitam sat in front of the barbecue grill with great concentration, staring at the sizzling and oily meat skewers. The smoke drifted far away along with the aroma of barbecue. Samira sat on the stone railing of the terrace, holding an apple in her hand and taking a bite silently. Avid was lying next to the balcony railing, peeking at Sia who was lying in the swimming pool reading a book. There was a lantern next to Sia, and the surroundings seemed very dim. The light from the lantern dyed her beautiful face, added a touch of egg yolk. Serdak used a dagger to cut a piece of scone into eight even pieces, and was about to put it on the campfire to crisp it up when he saw Samira turning to look at him. Soldak raised his head and followed the direction of Samira's finger, and found that there were several children on the fence on the west side of the courtyard. There was a row of dense palm trees beside the fence, which almost completely blocked the courtyard. It was precisely because of these palm trees that Soldak did not notice the children peeping into the yard at the first time. Under the cover of trees, those small eyes blinked and seemed to be looking towards the terrace. Serdak glanced down at the baked wheat cake in his hand, decisively took out a few more wheat cakes from a wooden box, and cut them into eight pieces on the square table. After thinking about it, I picked up the vegetable soup next to the barbecue grill. The vegetable soup is actually onions, cabbage and tomato sauce mixed together and stir-fried with butter, and then a lot of water is added. The combination of this vegetable soup is in wall. Village is very popular. There are no tomatoes in Wall Village in winter. But the tomato sauce cooked by each family is enough for everyone to last all winter. Carrying a stack of cut scones and a bucket of hot soup, I walked through the front pool and the green grass and stood in front of the children squatting on the wall. The older children were so scared that they jumped off the wall. When we went to the street outside, the younger children wanted to jump with them. But they found that the wall was a little too high. And for a while, they were a little afraid to jump. Several older children stood on the street and shouted urgently to the younger children. Jump down quickly and run! The children were so anxious on the wall that they were about to shed tears. There was a little girl squatting on the wall. In her haste, she stepped on the wrong foot and fell down from the wall with her head down. A big hand held her body firmly, and Saldak lifted her up to the wall again. When a group of children were in a panic, Saldak handed over a triangular wheat cake and asked the little girl said, Would you like something to eat? The little girl was too timid to reach out and take it. Without waiting for her answer, Soldak stuffed the baked wheat cake into her little hand, and each child on the wall was given a piece of baked wheat cake. Samira followed from behind, holding a stack of white porcelain bowls, and helped Serdak distribute the vegetable soup to each child. Serdak was still reminding them. Who wants to drink more? Bowl? Hey, be careful. Don't break these precious porcelains of mine. In fact, the dinner prepared by Serdak was not much, and it was far from enough to satisfy the civilians running from the south of the city on the street. He could only give some to a few children. When the older children, who were about to run away, turned around and came back, the wheat cakes and the bucket of vegetable soup were quickly divided up. He didn't take out more baked wheat cakes. The food Natasha prepared for him was only a few large wooden boxes. If he wanted more food, he had to wait until Aphrodite arrived in the city of Valencia. The refugees on the street didn't all gather here just because a few children got some dinner. And many people take some dry food with them when they leave home. Everyone was just frightened by what happened just now. On a summer night. Even the grass on the street is not that cool. The only sad part is the infestation of mosquitoes. But these people's nerves have been tense all day. At night, many people curled up and fell asleep on the grass by the roadside with strong sleepiness. The fighting at the southern edge of the noble district gradually subsided. At night, Samira slipped out of the yard under the cover of darkness and walked around outside. The second magic pattern on her body had the ability to hide. This ability became stronger at night, as long as she remained motionless. Hiding in the shadows, no one would notice her. She ran back from outside and said to Soldek, In addition to the five streets in this aristocratic area that were guarded by the Lord's private army, the security brigade tried to retake the town hall near the central square at noon, but was defeated by a rebel force. They were broken up. And there are still many corpses in the central square of the town. The rebels are asking some residents of the town to move the corpses there. They have not lost their minds. At most, they have robbed some wealthy businessmen. Ordinary townspeople only need to hide. At home, no one will disturb you for the time being. It has been so long since they have not been able to capture the town of Takale. This rebel army probably doesn't have much strength at all. Turdak said, I have not found out which rebel army it is. 
What is the strength of this rebel army? Attacked Takale. What is the purpose of Light Town? Samira shook her head. She just went out for a walk and never thought of catching a rebel soldier for interrogation. Besides, it is very likely that even the rebel fighters cannot explain these problems to Serdak clearly. Well, we don't need to pay attention to this. Since the town has not been cleansed, it seems that these rebels can still maintain their sanity during the battle. Then we can appropriately help the townspeople outside who cannot return home for the time being. Tomorrow, I will find a way to prepare some food. At least so that everyone can have a bowl of porridge. Soldek rubbed his forehead and whispered to Samira. The magician avid seemed to have some ideas and said to Soldak, I can go to the magic union in the town to seek support for this matter. Samira glanced at him lightly and said to Soldak, I just passed by a trading house in the town. That trading house has been broken into by the rebels and the warehouses have also been sealed. I saw a few granaries next to the trading house. You mean we should go over there and get some too? Soldak immediately understood what Samira meant. Samira nodded, hearing that Serdak was going to take Samira to rob Holmes. The two-headed ogre immediately said, Boss, I want to go too. Serdak didn't want a three-meter-tall two-headed ogre to fly across the street and cause panic among the people, especially in such an emergency period. Just guard this courtyard honestly and don't run out casually, so as not to cause unnecessary trouble, Serdak said to Gulaitam. I know. Boss. Although Gulaitam looked reluctant, he still agreed. In fact, there's really no technical content in robbing homes with a second-generation eagle eye like Samira. She almost avoided the sentry posts everywhere and took Soldak directly to the roof of the granary in the backyard of the trading house. At this time, the rebel army's logistics supply vehicle had stopped on the street in front of the trading house. Many migrant workers were moving various supplies from the trading house and loading them on the carriage. These rebels were like a group of beggars who had never seen the world. Even the tables, chairs, furniture, wash basins, and bookshelves in the house had to be moved to the carriage, precisely because they wanted everything and could not take care of the granary for a while. Soldak moved more than a hundred bags of wheat flour from the granary. The problem was that his magic pocket could only hold so much. But that night, Serdak and Samira ran back and forth three times in a row, almost completely emptying a granary, before they stopped at dawn. In fact, Thea basically didn't sleep much all night. She looked at Samira with envy, imagining that one day she could become Lord Serdak's assistant. Serdak slept until noon before getting out of bed. The fighting in Takaliai town continued, probably because other places had basically been calmed down. The main force of the rebel army gradually began to gather towards the rich area. The fighting at the entrance of the alley intensified. The private army assembled by the nobles suffered heavy casualties throughout the day. Many nobles have already begun to prepare vehicles and pack luggage in the manor, hoping to secretly leave Takarai town at night. In the afternoon, the gate of the magician Avid's manor was slowly pushed open by Soldek, and the town residents who gathered in the open space in front of the gate stood up and cheered. Serdak stood at the door and looked at the crowd, selected ten women in a row, pointed at them and said, You guys come in. I have a job for you. One silver coin a day, and one for the whole family three meals a day. Several women in the crowd hesitated. Look at me. I look at you. Then a stout woman boldly stood up, pulled a child toward Soldak, stood in front of him and whispered timidly, said, Sir, what do you want us to do when you hire us? I need you to make oatmeal. Soldak said, My lord, I am willing to accept this job. The woman said bravely, Very good. Then you will be the captain. Soldak nodded slightly. Afterwards, Serdak continued to speak loudly. The magician nobleman Avid is willing to give out some food and silver coins to help the residents of the town who have been made homeless by the war. Yes, that's what he said. You, but he doesn't have enough servants to make these cereals. So he needs to choose from you who are young and strong, preferably with some cooking skills. Well, I will decide who to choose first. After hearing what Serdak said, the women around them realized what they had just missed and they all expressed that their cooking skills were actually pretty good. Serdak couldn't be bothered about this, so he immediately took the selected women into the courtyard. Their families could also come in and rest in the garden in the front yard, but no one could spend the night in this yard. Not long after, the first pot of oatmeal was carried out of the kitchen by two women. There were some green vegetable leaves and oily flowers floating on the hot oatmeal. Chapter 973 Hope the news that the magician noble Avid provided free Chinese meals to the soldiers and civilians of Takarai town spread quickly. 
The townspeople hiding on the streets in the wealthy area came to drink porridge. And more and more residents gathered at the gate. There were only a few hundred people at the beginning. By nightfall, hundreds of small town residents had gathered in front of the gate of the house. It seemed very crowded outside the gate. Serdak could only let the elderly and children who were originally staying in front of the gate enter the front yard of the manor and rest on the grass by the swimming pool. It was late at night, and the women who were making oatmeal finally finished their work. They dragged their tired bodies out of the kitchen of the manor and found their families on the front lawn. Serdak, Samira, Gulitam, and Sia could only stay in the villa. Although there were many people sitting in the courtyard, it was still very quiet. When it was getting dark, Soldak helped the haggard and sick magician Avid out of the room. He said a few words of concern to everyone on the steps at the door of the villa, and then asked Samira to leave. Some blankets were taken out of the house and given to those in need. That night, many residents in the town were talking about how the magician Avid was a true noble gentleman. He was accompanied by two beautiful maids and a brave knight. This could be compiled into a book about magicians. Adventures. The fighting on the street still didn't stop at night. The sound of fighting was very close to the manor. Swords were slashing and people were yelling and yelling. It was as if the rebels and the nobles' private army were fighting outside the wall. On the second floor terrace, Soldak could even see the wounded being carried back from the street one after another. However, these people seemed to have completely ignored the manor, even though the door of the manor was full of small town residents. These noble private soldiers did not take a second look into the yard. Although they did not forcibly recruit battlefield cannon fodder from the town residents like the town security team did, they were preparing to use the street in front of Avid Manor as a follow-up battlefield. The town residents gathered on this street would either leave or will be involved in the battle. In just one night, the rebels captured two streets in the southern part of the wealthy area, minimizing the living space for the fleeing residents of the town. In the morning, Serdak still provided free oatmeal to all the refugees on the street. He even considered waiting for Aphrodite to arrive in Haranza City to purchase more food and vegetables from there, at least to allow these refugees to take refuge. Small town residents filled their bellies. However, things changed a little on the morning of the fourth day. Several knights from the noble private army broke into the manor from outside with a group of followers. The magician Avide, who was lying on the hospital bed, could only drag his sick body and stand at the door of the villa, staring coldly at these rude intruders. Serdak stood on the steps holding a sword and shield. In order to conceal his identity, he did not wear his noble badge. The leading knight performed a knightly salute to the magician Avid, and then carefully looked at Soldak, seeing that his body was well proportioned and strong. He nodded with satisfaction, and then said to Avid impassionedly, said, Your Excellency, the distinguished magician, the battlefield in front of the wealthy area of Takarai town is in urgent need of manpower. I heard that your accompanying knight is very brave. I wonder if he can be sent to the battlefield in front to fight alongside us. The knight seemed polite when he spoke. The magician Avid looked at him indifferently and scolded him arrogantly. Are you talking to a magician noble? The knight was obviously startled. He didn't expect Master Avid to be so arrogant. Your Excellency, magician, I hope you can mobilize your entourage to fight with us. This is not only protecting the safety of the rich area, but also closely related to your vital interests. The knight said to the magician Avid with great righteousness. Said, the magician Awade, however, turned down his face and ignored the knight at all. He just said coldly, Please leave my yard. I don't want to see you again. And I don't want you to continue to have ideas about me. Otherwise, I will complain to the magic guild of Takarai town. The knight quickly defended. You are like this. Magician Avid didn't even give him a chance to defend himself. And interrupted him directly. Okay. You are not welcome here. You can leave. The knight still wanted to argue. Do you want the rebels to invade the wealthy areas? Steal our property? And then hang our heads high on the flagpole? Magician Avid stared at him coldly and said. What will be taken away will only be your property. And the head hanging on the flagpole will only be yours. Please note that I am different from you. I am a magic noble. The knight turned red with anger and said angrily. You will see the brutality of the rebels. And I will also remember what you said today. You will definitely regret what happened today. I wizard Vader. Magician Avid waved his hand expressionlessly and said. I hope you can still leave Takarai alive. I wish you good luck. How could you do this? The knight wanted to step forward to argue. But Soldak blocked it with his shield. Your Excellency, isn't what the magician Avid said clear enough? Serdak asked the knight, and then said, You can leave. 
How could you follow such a magician? After saying this, the knight left the manor with a group of followers with an angry look on his face. Serdak followed yesterday's practice and asked the avid magician to go around the yard and then comforted some of the fleeing town residents. It is nothing more than saying, this battle will be over soon. When the battle is over, no matter who takes over the town, everyone can continue to live according to the previous lifestyle. At this time, all we need to do is hide and wait quietly for this war to end. Magician Abide stood in front of a group of town residents and gave a loud speech. He received a lot of applause, and the faces of the town residents showed excitement. Until Magician Abide returned to the villa, the residents standing in the yard were still very encouraged. At this moment, even the queue to receive cereal seemed orderly. The cooks also banged the iron pot hard and shouted loudly. Your Excellency, the magician avid, ordered the children and the elderly to come to the front in line and asked the children and the elderly to come to the front. In this yard, the town residents took quick action. They even divided the lawn in the yard. Children and the elderly received special treatment. They spread blankets on the lawn. When everyone looked at the house, their eyes became brighter, as if there was more hope in their eyes. Chapter 974 The Lord Army of the Ganbu Plain In the past two days, Avai carefully checked the materials for the temporary teleportation circle brought back by Serdek. Except for a high-grade gem base that was penetrated by the archer's arrow, the magic of the temporary teleportation circle two rune boards were also damaged, requiring Avid to repair them himself. Of course, what makes Avide scratch his head the most is the high-grade gemstone base, which cannot be repaired at all. He can only replace it with a new one. Even Makuso City on the dry cloth plain may not have such a high-grade gemstone base. Aphrodite has successfully arrived in the city of Valenza and checked into the hotel in the Garden Square. So Serdak also took the opportunity to go to the city of Halanza through the Void Gate. In winter, Halanza City is covered in snow. It seems that every winter, snow removal work in the mountain city is the biggest problem. In order to quickly transport the snow from the city, the city hall has to temporarily hire some four-wheeled carriages. Walking on the somewhat sloping streets, Serdak could easily overlook the snow-covered oak forests outside the city. This time when he returned to Alinsa City, he did not go to the guard camp to report, but went directly along this road. The streets rushed to the Magic Guild. There was still plenty of time. So Serdak didn't take the Magic Caravan and just walked under the street trees on both sides of the street. On the street, a Magic Caravan slowly stopped on the side of the road. Miss Hoyle opened the door, leaned her upper body out of the car, and asked Serdak on the street, this Count Serdak, are you when did you come back? Just arrived. Soldak stopped, saluted Miss Hoyle and said, Good afternoon, Lady Bird. After marrying tax collector Bird, Miss Hoyle has become Lady Bird. In the past few years, she has not only become more mature, but also much plumper. Where are you going? If you're on the way, I can come up and give you a ride. Miss Hoyle said enthusiastically. Magic Guild, Serdak answered. Come up. I happen to be passing by that way, Miss Hoyle said with a smile. Thank you for your carriage, Mrs. Bird. Soldak readily boarded the carriage, and Miss Hoyle's maid quickly moved the seat opposite her. After Soldak sat opposite Miss Hoyle, the carriage slowly started to move again. This Count Soldak, do you want to get together with Carl and Bird at the old place tonight? Miss Hoyle asked curiously. Soldak shook his head and said, I am in a hurry to come back this time. I may have to leave immediately after meeting the Lance Magician. The party may have to wait until there is an opportunity in the future. You have all become so busy recently. You lead the army to station in other dimensions. And Darcy has to be busy until midnight every day before she can sleep. Miss Hoyle said softly. Soldak did not take up the topic and just listened quietly. Miss Hoyle is Darcy Christie's cousin. The two of them usually have a very close relationship. So they naturally know Darcy's current situation. She is now the consul of Valenza City and can be regarded as the city's top administrator. Serdak looked out the window and looked at the trees covered with rhyme. The carriage stopped at the entrance of the Magic Guild. And Miss Hoyle said to Soldak, Goodbye then. This Count Serdak. Soldak also recovered his thoughts, smiled slightly, made a nightly salute to Miss Hoyle and said, Goodbye, Lady Bird. After saying that, he jumped out of the carriage briskly and walked into the lobby of the Magic Guild on the first floor, stepping on the snow on the ground. The receptionist on the first floor knew Soldak and quickly found Lance. Lance was wearing a set of dirty magic robes. It seemed that the magic experiment just now must not have been very successful. His hair was standing on end, 
there were traces of smoke on his face. And the glasses on the bridge of his nose were also damaged. One piece was broken. And the whole person seemed to have rushed out of a fire that had just exploded. Why are you back again? After all, this is a border town stationed in the plane. You come back so frequently. Are you sure the military department won't cause trouble for you? Lance asked Serdek. Serdek smiled and said, This time I am back to perform a mission. By the way, I came to you this time to ask you to help me find a high-grade gemstone base. The kind specially used for temporary teleportation circles. Is there any way to do it? Lance felt like he was on fire. Do you think I am the president of the Bena Magic Guild? I can get any resources. This kind of gem base is usually controlled by the Astrologer Guild. This thing even in Bena City. You may not be able to buy it. Even the mid-level gemstone base is difficult to buy here in Helensa. And basically everyone can't use it. Okay then. I'll go to Bena City to try my luck. Serdak said to Lance. Hey, you came back just to buy that thing. Right. Lance said exaggeratedly. You guessed right. Saying goodbye to Lance who looked convinced. Serdak hurriedly left the Magic Guild and returned to the Plaza Garden Hotel. He used his aristocratic status to send Aphrodite to the Magic Airship and chose a luxurious cabin before passing through in a hurry. The Void Gate returned to the Ganbu Plain. On the Ganbu Plain, the rebels used the dock of Takarai Town as a breakthrough point and captured the entire town in just five days. In the last two streets of the wealthy district, the nobles organized a raid at night. Several nobles and their knights successfully broke out from Takarai Town. But most of the nobles were killed by the rebels. The cavalry stopped. And the civilians following the nobles originally planned to sneak out in troubled waters. But unfortunately, they were all surrounded by the rebels in the square at the city gate. The corpses of a group of nobles and knights who had resisted the rebels in the wealthy area were hung on the crosses erected in the square at the city gate together with the knights of the security brigade. There were no less than 200 wooden crosses erected in the entire square. The earliest one the corpse had been exposed to the sun for two days in the square. And the corpse already gave off a rotting smell. The rebel soldiers asked the prisoners to dismantle an exquisite wooden attic in the town, pile the collected firewood into a square platform, and place all the noble knights on the fire and burn them to ashes. In the past few days, most of the fires that broke out in the town were caused by the rebels disposing of the corpses of the town. Some were their comrades. And some of the fires burned were the resistance of the nobles in the town. There was a faint smell of corpses and fireworks floating over the entire town. At noon on the fifth day, the rebels had planted a flag stained red with blood on the flagpole on the top of the bell tower and announced to the residents of Takali that they had temporarily taken over the town. On the street outside the manor, the panicked residents of the town began to be interrogated and counted by the rebels. It is confirmed that those residents who have not participated in the battle can return to their residences in the town on their own. Of course, there are several houses in the south of the town that have been turned into ruins. If you happen to encounter them, you can only consider yourself unlucky. The rebels will not be in these ruins. I will build a new house and compensate you. Compared with other manors that were disturbed by the rebels, the manor of magician Avide was not disturbed by the rebels. In the afternoon, several secretaries sent by the rebels led people into the manor and conducted an identity census for the small town residents in the yard. There was also a rebel knight who led several of his men to visit the magician Avid. So Avid took him around the manor until he saw the two-headed cannibal lying in the backyard garden basking in the sun. The demon immediately became solemn, declined the invitation of magician Avid to have afternoon tea on the terrace, and hurriedly left the manor. Afterwards, the rebels did not bother the magician Avid again. But the rebel cavalry patrolling the streets every day increased the frequency of patrols. According to the information that Samira heard outside, the rebels did not seem to have any plans to run the town of Takarai for a long time. They also seemed to know that with their current strength, they did not seem to be enough to fight against Lord MacDonald's army. So after they occupied the town of Takarai, their biggest move was to do their best to move all the supplies in the town. The treasury of the town hall was opened by the rebels on the night they invaded Takarai town. There are also several military supplies warehouses in the security brigade, and almost all the military supplies in them were transported to the riverside dock. In addition, the biggest losses were the trading houses in the town. Almost all the businesses were looted by the rebels. After the rebels invaded the wealthy areas, these manors were also heavily purged by the rebels. However, there were some manors that were not looted by the rebels, including the manor of the magician Abbot. The reason seems to be very simple. The rebels are currently unwilling to provoke the magic union. In addition, 
They have more or less used their own money with the magician Avide in the past two days to help the fleeing residents in these towns. Indirectly maintaining the war in Takaliite town. Period order. Watching the truckload of supplies being transported from the street at the gate to the town dock. This time also fully demonstrated the greatest benefits that a victory in a war can bring. Serdak and Gulitem stood on the second floor terrace. Looking at the long rows of four-wheeled carriages on the street. And sighed. It seems that no matter whether it is mining or opening up new territory, it is far inferior to robbing towns to gain wealth. Huge profits. It is said that wars are often launched between the lords of the Green Empire. However, due to the frequent outbreaks of plain battlefields in recent years, His Majesty Charles issued a decree prohibiting the lords from launching wars while outside. The magician Avid was lying on a deck chair on the terrace. Go on, he said with a relaxed expression. The bandage on his chest has not been removed yet. But he looks very good. And he can sit up under his own power. And can even walk slowly. As long as he does not do strenuous exercise. And does not make his heart beat faster. His heart will not hurt. Serdak asked the magician Avid. Are you saying that wars often broke out between the various lords of the Green Empire before? Wars don't break out often. But whichever lord owns a vast land. And does not have corresponding military strength. Will be declared a war by other lords. This is quite common. The magician Avid explained to Serdak. I thought that after acquiring the land, I obtained permanent ownership. It turns out that I can steal it through this method. Serdak suddenly realized. However, in recent years, internal declarations of war have been prohibited. After all, a plain war broke out. Magician Avid said, As long as the noble lords participate in foreign wars, they are protected by the laws of the Green Empire. Serdak looked at the rebels outside the courtyard and there seemed to be something in his eyes. The relationship between the Magic Guild and the Takarai Town Hall has always been tense. This time the rebels attacked the town and the Magic Guild did not come forward. Therefore, the magicians in Takarai Town have not been affected by the war. As long as they are magician nobles, the rebels will automatically ignore them. However, if the magician is found to be suspected of participating in the war, he will also be specially treated by the rebels. Take care of it. That's how reality is. On the evening of the sixth day, an army of Lord MacDonald appeared on the mountain ridge to the north outside the town. This army belongs to Lord MacDonald's 7th Cavalry Regiment. It was originally stationed between the towns of Hatangata and Takale. It only took a day's journey from the station to Hatangata town. This support arrived four days later than expected. The reason was that when this army received the news that the town of Takarai was attacked by the rebels, they were searching for Serdak and his assault team southeast of Grove Ridge. It took them three days to get over there. Lord MacDonald's flag fluttered over the mountains. And the rebels in Takarai town began to station themselves on the city wall. Posing for a fight. The 7th Cavalry Regiment arrived outside the north gate of Takarai town. 500 cavalrymen lined up outside the town. I thought they would launch a massive attack at dusk. But in the hottest part of the afternoon. A 60-man cavalry squadron tentatively launched an attack. They were met with a hail of arrows from the archers at the top of the city. Immediately like a turtle. He retracted his head. This cavalry regiment is a light cavalry. And its armor is relatively thin. It has no way to deal with the longbow archers at the top of the city. They found that the rebels had deployed at least hundreds of archers at the top of the city. And they immediately gave up the attack. Idea. At the same time, the rebels in Takaliai town also accelerated the speed of moving supplies. But on the surface, they put on a positive attitude and even opened the north city gate on the morning of the seventh day. A heavy armored infantry regiment came out of the city to form a formation, preparing to fight the Lord's army outside the city. However, it was at noon that day that the reinforcements from Makuso City had arrived outside the west gate of Takarai town. This was an infantry regiment of 1,500 people, followed by 10 catapults. Almost as soon as the formation was set up, the catapults behind the military formation began to fire flaming flints towards the town of Takale. A huge fireball with a diameter of one meter crashed into the town. Originally, only seven or eight houses were burned in the town of Takale. Under the successive bombardments of ten catapults, the entire west side of the town was almost completely destroyed that afternoon. Hundreds of houses caught fire, and nearly a hundred were directly destroyed by flint. The residents of the town who had already resettled in the war once again fled their homes crying for their mothers. They first gathered in the central square of the town and found that the flint throne by the catapults rarely landed in the wealthy areas. One side, these small town residents once again hid in the wealthy areas. 
Chapter 975 The War in the Small Town Even the rebels did not expect that the Lord's army's offensive would be so fierce. And they did not care about the residents of the small town. Nor did they care how many houses could be destroyed. In short, it was a continuous bombardment. Using only 10 catapults. It actually smashed the west side of the town to pieces. By the time, the infantry regiment pushed the city car towards the west gate of the town. There were not many rebels even on the city wall. In fact, they had quickly evacuated the town of Takarai since last night. Except for some archers scattered on the city wall. Almost all the remaining rebels gathered on the dock of the town. If the Lord's army could have a magician ride on the handle and spin around in the sky at this time, he might be able to see the situation in the town clearly. Unfortunately, as Lord MacDonald's association with the Black Magic Priory was exposed, the Magic Union on the Ganbu Plain had actually completely severed ties with the Lord's army. They could only temporarily cut off the portal because the portal was cut off. Leave on dry cloth surface. The Lord's army used up nearly 3,000 flints with a diameter of one meter in one night. When the infantry, under the cover of the cavalry, broke open the thin city gate of the town in one fell swoop, and after rushing into the town, the entire little west district was like a, a ruin of broken bricks and tiles, except for some unlucky town residents who were directly killed by flints. The Lord's army could not see a single person in this area. The infantry regiment of the Lord's army did not encounter any resistance from the rebels and marched directly into the entrance of the town hall in the center of the town. The most ironic thing is that three flints fell in the town hall courtyard, and two flints fell from the roof of the town hall. Now the town hall has been reduced to a charred frame under the fire. A group of small town tax collectors, clerks and other officials were tied up in the courtyard of the town hall. They barely dared to close their eyes that night. They really didn't dare to sleep. I was afraid that if I closed my eyes, I would be hit to death by a flint falling from the sky. What an unexplainable death that would be. The rebels had withdrawn all last night, and these officials were kneeling in the courtyard of the town hall, watching the bolides falling. When the infantry of the Lord's army rushed into the courtyard of the town hall, some officials were even incontinent. Some of them had their hands tied with ropes, and they began to yell at the Lord's army in front of them. I will give you half of my tax money every month. It has been seven days. It only takes me two rounds to climb from the station to Takarai Town. You are a bunch of dogs. You are a bunch of bastards. The cost of transporting a flint to the station is almost more than 20 silver coins including the cost of production and transportation. How much did you use in one night? How much did you use? You losers. They all retreated when you threw the first flint. Wouldn't you send scouts in to take a look? You blind people. The ruins of the town hall were not completely extinguished. The wind blew and charcoal ashes flew all over the sky. The ground was covered with a layer of hot charcoal. And light red sparks immediately appeared. The rolling heat wave made the skin hurt. All the officials' lips were chapped. And even blisters appeared. They cursed these officials of the Lord's Army Infantry. And the corners of their mouths, they were all covered with foam. And their throats were as hoarse as if they were being torn apart. The squadron leader of the 2nd Squadron of the 1st Infantry Brigade of the Lord's Army's 7th Infantry Regiment was also ruthless. He shouted to his subordinates with a dark face. We have occupied the town hall. All the infantry of the 2nd Squadron obeyed the order and continued to march towards the bell tower. At the door plant the flag of our squadron. When attacking a city, flags are planted in various areas after the city is broken, which means to determine the ownership of the spoils. When other armies that attack the city see such flags, they will try to avoid entering this area unless necessary to avoid being in trouble. It causes unnecessary friction within the army. Usually in this situation, the commander of the army recognizes the flag but not the people. The squadron leader did not rescue these town hall officials. He only planted the flag of his squadron at the door and then led a group of infantry to seize the clock tower of the square. This was definitely ruthless. As long as the rebel flags on the bell tower are taken down and replaced with the flags of the Lord's army, even if it is announced that the Lord's army has retaken Takarai town, such a military honor will naturally be the primary target for each squadron to compete for. The hoarse curses of the officials in the courtyard immediately turned into pitiful cries for help. Other infantry squadrons came over, and the guard guarding the gate of the town hall explained, and finally said, Let them warm themselves over the fire inside, and maybe their minds can be clearer. It continued to bake like this until noon. The squadron leader remembered that the town hall had not gone in to search for loot, so he returned to clean up the scene. By the time, they started to rescue them. The entire wooden structure of the town hall had been completely reduced to ashes. Among the tax collectors 
and clerks tied up in the yard. Half of them had died of dehydration. Even those who were not dead looked at the town hall. The skin on that side was dry and cracked by the fire or had patches of blisters. In some places, if you touch it with your hand, a large piece of dry, cracked dead skin will fall off. At this moment, no one had the strength to shout or curse anymore. But the courtyard of the town hall was filled with deathly silence. Although all the people who were still alive tried their best to hide it, there was still an insoluble resentment in their eyes. On the seventh day after the town of Takarai was captured by the rebels, it was finally recaptured by the Lord Army. In this small town, the rebels almost purged all the nobles and merchants in the town. Almost all the nobles who participated in the resistance with their private soldiers were hanged on wooden crosses in the square at the city gate, and their bodies were burned by fire, turned into ashes. Many manor owners in the wealthy areas died at the hands of the rebels. But these manors were preserved in the war. By the time the Lord Army recaptured the town of Takarai, although they did not kill a few rebels, more than a hundred town residents died under flints, and more than two-thirds of the houses in the western district were destroyed. These small towns residents hid in wealthy areas and became homeless again. The only ones that no one bothered were magician nobles like Avid. He only needed to hang his magician badge at the door. And these lords would not rush in to search for loot. Serdak stood on the roof, watching the war gradually subside. But the town had already become devastated. For a while, his heart became full of mixed feelings. It was really difficult to say anything. Is this war? He lowered his head and asked the magician Avid, who was lying on the wicker chair on the terrace. Magician Avid raised his head and said seriously to Serdak, Yes, this is the war. The rebels have been relatively restrained this time. At least there haven't been many tragic things like the tragic events I mentioned. It's far more cruel than what you see in front of you. Chapter 976 Escape from Takarai A large group of residents of Takarai town gathered in the manor. They knew that the owner of the manor, the magician Avid, was a warm-hearted nobleman. He was willing to provide any help he could to all those in need, such as providing a hot dinner, or you can spend the night resting in his yard and even provide some lemon tea. After the Lord's army regained the town of Takarai, they immediately began to clean up the remaining rebel forces in the town. In fact, all the rebels have withdrawn. The Lord's army searched the town one by one under this banner. The main purpose was not to track down the rebels, but to make their own money bags legal. Although it is impossible to openly smash, smash and loot, the gimmick of cleaning up the remaining rebels before maintaining order allows them to plunder the ownerless manor. The rebels have already plundered a lot before retreating. These in the small town most of the valuable items in the manor in the wealthy area have been emptied. Now that the Lord Army has entered the town, they want to dig up some gold coins or something even if they dig deep into the ground. It has been nearly a day since the Lord's Army recaptured Takarai, and the residents of the town are still in a state where no one has taken over. The streets are full of lords breaking down doors. After breaking into every house to plunder, they always grab something and put it into a truck waiting on the street. Magician Abbott's manor was not visited by the Lord Army during the day. At night, a group of soldiers who had drunk some wine from somewhere and were walking a little unsteadily passed by the gate of the manor. Among this group of people, some were carrying a bag of scones in their hands, and some were carrying a whole ham on their backs. When they saw the large iron gate of the manor open and filled with small town residents waiting to drink cereal, they were curious. Look inside. Several soldiers wanted to enter the courtyard but found that the courtyard was crowded with small town residents. Several people did not notice the magician badge at the gate. An officer who walked into the manor shouted to the small town residents in the courtyard. The 7th Infantry Battalion of the Lord's Army has been ordered to investigate the remaining rebel forces. Everyone squats on the spot. Please cooperate with our soldiers' inspection. The residents of the town immediately squatted on the spot, and the lawn became a large area of darkness. The captain among the several soldiers jumped up on the stone pillars beside the fountain. The top of each stone pillar was an open basin design. Many nobles were used to putting some grains in them to attract some birds. The officer said coldly with a straight face, Why do you civilians break into the noble manor privately? You also use this place as a gathering place. This behavior seriously violates the noble property. Do you know that you have violated the laws of the empire? A small town resident squatting on the grass with his head in his arms immediately raised his head and explained. This is the manner of the magician Avid. He didn't notice that there was a soldier of the Lord's army standing behind him. The soldier raised his foot, trampled the town residents under his feet, and scolded. Please don't stand up casually when I'm not telling you to speak. 
It is impossible for there to be such a floating population in Takarai town. I suspect that there are rebels hiding among you. Everyone is squatting against the bush wall in the corridor and lining up for our inspection. The officer said expressionlessly said, driven by these soldiers. The small town residents in the yard all squatted beside the low bush wall. They began to be interrogated by these lords. At first they only asked about their home address and family members. Then they checked to see if they had weapons and protective gear. And then they checked to see if there were any injuries on these people. Among the residents of these small towns, women, the elderly, and children account for the majority of the population. A bearded town citizen immediately pushed the soldier away and angrily shouted, What are you doing? Why don't you go home and see your mother? The soldier had been drinking a little, and his steps were a little shaky. He didn't expect that someone in the crowd would resist. He was pushed to the low bush wall by the bearded man, and he fell backwards into the corridor. Now the bearded man stirred a hornet's nest. The soldier staggered out of the corridor, pulled out the sentry sword from his waist, pointed at the beard and shouted, He is a rebel. Arrest him. Then he pointed at the young woman and continued, This is also a family member of the rebel army. Take it away together. Other soldiers quickly came up, pushed the bearded man to the ground, took out ropes and tied his hands behind his back. Just when they were about to tie up the young woman, a big hand pressed the shoulder of the soldier holding the rope from the side. The soldier didn't even know how Serdak had appeared next to him. A gentle cough came from the corridor. With the support of Sia, the magician Avic asked weakly, What are you soldiers doing in my manor? The soldiers of the Lord Army turned their attention to the place where the sound came from and saw a magician standing in the corridor. We are checking out the remnants of the rebels. The soldier immediately said with his chest raised, How can there be rebels in my manor? It's a joke. These are small town residents who have been disturbed by the war and cannot return home. Magician Avid set his sights on the bearded man and ordered him. Civilian, state your identity. The bearded man whispered his name and his address in the West District. He also said that he was a tanner and worked in a tannery shop in the town. Magician Avid stepped forward and opened his shirt. Sure enough, a leather belt was wrapped around his waist with various leather cutting knives inserted on it. At this time, the officer from the Lord's army came up and looked at the magician avid without saying a word. See, what you call a rebel is this tanner with calloused hands and the smell of leather? He stared at the officer and ordered him. Take your people and leave my manor. The officer nodded to magician avid, then glanced at magician avid. Sophia smiled noncommittally and said calmly, When tracing the rebels, mistakes will inevitably be made. The regiment leader asked us not to let any of the rebel remnants go. You still have so many people here who have not been checked. I don't know how you avoided the rebels looting. But I think since the nobles and other manners were burned to death. But as long as you are still alive and well. Doesn't this mean something? I wish you a good dream at night. I may come to disturb you again tomorrow morning. Although the officer was smiling. There was a hint of anger in his eyes. He adjusted his collar and said to his soldiers. Let's go! A group of soldiers followed the officer as they left the estate. Unexpectedly. The officers of the Lord Army did not accept the identity of the magician Avid. Even after these Lord Army left, the atmosphere at the scene was still a bit tense. Those people stayed outside the gate and didn't leave. Samira jumped down from the top of the corridor and said to Soldak. Only then did Serdak stand up and said to the magician Avid, I guess they may go to other Lord Armies, and they may also cause trouble for us tomorrow. They don't seem to buy into the magician nobles. Samira stood beside the corridor and said to Soldak, do you think they discovered something? I always feel like there's something wrong with this. Zerdak recollected the officer's expression when he spoke before leaving. It was not a smile and a blessing. Nor was it anger. There was clearly uncontrollable excitement hidden under his smile. And he was suppressing his inner excitement. They may be the Lord's Army from Makuso City. It is possible that they completed their mission at Lord MacDonald's Manor and came here to counter the rebellion just in time to discover our identities. Told that guest. Then he added, we will leave later. I'm afraid it won't be too safe here. He said that he might have deliberately paralyzed us in the morning. Samira looked at the town residents in the yard, frowned slightly and said, What about these small town residents? Magician Avid stood up straight and said, I'll go talk to them. After saying that, he walked out of the corridor, stood on the stone platform next to the pool, and said to the small town residents in the yard, Everyone, I am the Magician Avid. Unfortunately, Given the bad attitude the Lord Army had towards me just now, it seems that they do not have the slightest respect for magicians. 
I think they may still be able to do so in the near future. They will come back to cause trouble. So we are preparing to leave Takali early. After the magician Avid said this, the faces of the town residents in the yard were filled with sadness. There is a back entrance to the manor. Anyone who wants to leave can go through that way. The magician continued to tell everyone, My friends, and I will leave later. The bearded man just walked out of the crowd and said to Avid with an apologetic look, Magic Avid, I'm really sorry because I have brought you so much unnecessary trouble. The young woman also squatted on the ground, covering her face and crying softly. Avid walked up and patted the bearded man on the shoulder and said with a hearty smile, This has nothing to do with you. If you want to blame it, blame these lords. On the contrary, your bravery deserves praise. Some residents of the town complained, What a bunch of bandits. Now I'm a little confused about who is the lord army and who is the rebel army. If you want to leave, please follow me this way. Avid said to everyone, His steps were still a little weak, and he would clutch his chest and take a few breaths after walking for a while. He walked along the corridor, to the back garden of the manor. Sure enough, there was a back door between the kitchen and the stable that led to the street behind. At this time, Soldak had already opened the back door, and a group of town residents secretly left from here while waiting for the residents of the town to leave. Samira, who was guarding the roof, noticed that the number of guards outside was gradually increasing, so she made a leaving gesture to Serdak. The two-headed ogre Gulidum once again carried the magician Avide on his back and Serdak carried Thea on his back, and followed the residents of these small towns and left the manor. You can still meet the Lord Army on the street searching for property, but Samira has been out every night for the past two days, and has already found an escape route. Several people walked along the back street to the southeast of the town. It would not be difficult for Serdak and his party to climb over the town's wall. But if there is a river, it is Shia's home field. Serdak had discussed this matter with everyone a long time ago. If everyone needs to leave Takarai town, then leave from the pier in the south of the town. Watching the group of them continue to walk southeast, the small town residents who left the manor also quietly followed them. In fact, everyone may not know where to go. At this time, the bearded man caught up from behind, came to Avid, and said to him, Your Majesty the Magician, I know where there is a ship that can help us get out of here. Avid looked at the bearded man in surprise and said to him, are you also leaving Takali town? The bearded man said with a bitter look on his face. My home has been destroyed by them. Why are you still here? He turned around and pointed at a group of old, young, sick and disabled people behind him, and begged and said, Look at us. We are either old people or women and children. I'm afraid we won't be able to leave here on our own. If we stay, there's no guarantee that what happened before will not happen. Nothing. We don't even have the power to resist. Then he said, I can help you steal that boat, and everyone can get on the boat and go down the river, so that we can leave Takarai. Follow the river, and you can reach the town of Bansk. We can start a new life there. After saying that, the bearded man's eyes became much brighter. In fact, the Lord's army did not have many restrictions on the activities of the town residents. They were just busy searching for some property in a small town to satisfy their wallets. They would occasionally wipe the will but they would never do anything like dragging a woman into the woods. After all, the order of this town has been maintained recently, and the town will return to its original appearance in the future. A group of people walked toward the south of the town along the narrowest alley in the slum area of the town. There were some slum houses on both sides. Many of the houses were burned to ashes by fire, and some remained. There were not many people around, but when the alley came to the end, the river not far away was filled with sparkling waves. Some people in the crowd could not suppress the joy in their hearts and let out a low cry. Who? Just at the entrance of the alley near the dock, a soldier walked up with a long sword in his hand, followed by two companions. The bearded man didn't expect to be discovered here. Just when I was about to bite the bullet and walk out, two old men in the crowd behind me pulled their beards back. Their faces were full of wrinkles. Their dry and cloudy eyes showed a hint of indifference to life and death. And they said loudly, It's us! Chapter 977 Parting Ways Two old men with stooped bodies walked out of the alleyway one after another, followed by a child who looked panicked. The child did not go out of the alley, but waited at the entrance of the alley with his big eyes, and poked his head to look outside. The three guards did not expect that a bearded man was pulling the child's clothes right behind the child, for fear that they would hurt the child when they jumped out to kill. Serdak and Samira stood in the crowd, but they did not take the initiative to stand up. 
The magician Avid didn't say that he was going to kill the three guards because Soldak wanted to see what else the bearded man had hidden in his hands. At night, apart from the sound of the river flowing in the distance, the only thing left was the old man's hoarse and dry voice. The house was burned down and everything was robbed. We came out looking for something to eat. There was a certain amount of helplessness in his exhaustion, and his face was filled with indifference to the soldiers. It is strictly forbidden to run around at night. If I see you running around again, I will take you to jail. The soldiers standing at the front scolded. They were assigned to stay on duty at the riverside dock at night and had no chance to go to the city to earn money. After spending a small amount of money, I felt a little irritable. The old people stood silently beside the house that was about to collapse, neither moving nor resisting. The soldier behind reminded his companions, Leave them alone. Do you still want to take them back to the military camp? The pier was very long, and the three soldiers quickly returned to the pier where they were on duty and walked west along the patrol route. Watching the three soldiers leave, the bearded forehead was covered with sweat, sitting on the ground a little exhausted. As long as the three soldiers took two steps forward, they would probably find that there were at least 200 people hiding in the alley. On the east side of the pier by the river, the bearded man emerged from the river carrying a hemp rope almost exhausted. He swung the wet rope to the shore. Soldek stretched out his hand to pull him out of the river and into the pile. The rocky embankment comes up. The bearded man grabbed the rope and at the same time called on everyone to come and help. Everyone pull hard and we pull the boat out from the bottom of the river. The bearded man whispered to everyone. By this time, these old men, women, and children were accustomed to relying on the bearded man for almost everything and they joined in without hesitation. A group of old men, women and children grabbed a rope as thick as an arm and pulled back hard. The soaked hemp rope was very heavy. But what strength could a group of old men and women have? A group of people simply couldn't pull it. In the end, the two-headed ogre had a helping hand from behind. He didn't even put Amite down from his back. He directly grabbed the end of the rope, alternately exerted force with his arms. And one after another, he alone cleared a ship full of mud. The flat bottom boat was pulled up from the bottom of the river. The boat that Big Beard mentioned was not actually floating on the river, but was hidden at the bottom of the river. With the help of Gulitum, Big Beard successfully overturned the flat bottom boat, poured out the water in the compartment, and pushed the muddy boat into the river. The boat was not too big. It could only hold 30 people if the whole boat was full. The bearded man took out two oars from the side of the boat and jumped onto the boat steadily with his bare feet. Where was he at this time? He also looked like a cobbler. Clearly a boatman. Magic Avid and the children get on the boat first. I will send you to the other side of the river first. And then come to pick up the rest. The bearded man said to everyone. Serdak didn't say anything more. And signaled Gulitum to carry the magician Avid on the boat. And Sia followed suit. Serdak and Samira stood on the shore and said to the bearded man. Let's go with the last group of people. After saying that, he picked up a child and handed him to the boat. Samira ignored the group of children by the river. She quickly jumped to a taller warehouse building by the river and looked north. It was just early in the night, and there were several bright yellow time space countercurrents hanging in the dark red night sky. The town was completely silent, and ordinary people's eyesight could only see more than 20 meters away. Samira jumped down from the roof of the warehouse. Big Beard and Gulitum were already paddling together, rowing the flat boat out of the river bank and heading towards the other bank. I didn't expect them to find the black magician so quickly. Samira stood beside Serdak and whispered. Serdak scratched his head in distress and said to Samira, We will separate from them after we cross the river. It seems that this raid by the great swordsman Quintus will destroy the black magic hermitage. The person was completely pissed off. Are you going to reveal Big Beard's identity? Samira asked in a low voice. Serdak snorted and whispered, I don't have that much evil intention. I just want to see what he wants to do by trying every possible means to bring these women, old people, and children out. Before Soldak could finish speaking, Samira looked to the west side of the pier with her reddish eyes, interrupted Soldak and said, There is someone coming over there. Let me go and deal with it. Before Serdak could agree, his body had already disappeared into darkness. The bearded man probably didn't understand why the three soldiers patrolling the dock never showed up all night. The flat boat left the river bank for the fifth time before all the people on the east dock were transported away. But for the last time, Big Beard felt that he was paddling extremely easily, and the entire flat bottomed boat seemed to be pushed forward by the waves. Sernak and Samira stood at the stern of the flat bottomed boat, looking back at the entire town of Takarai, which was dark in the night. Sernak walked up and said to the bearded man, 
after crossing this river. We will go separate ways. The bearded man was stunned for a moment, but immediately said, Oh, are you going to Bant's town with us? Let's not go now. We are going to wander around here. Magician Avid will also inform other magicians of the news. At least the magic union in the town. Saldak said. The bearded man said cheerfully. Okay. Thank you for your help. Serdak stood on the boat and said nothing more. A group of people landed on the south side of the river. Gulitam and Avid were waiting on the river bank. Before the boat could stop, Serdak and Samira jumped ashore one after another and then attacked Gulitam. Said, Gulitam, let's go here first. Hey, duck, aren't we taking the boat? The two-headed ogre quickly picked up the magician Avid on his back and chased after Soldak and asked, Don't sit down anymore. We have other things to do. Serdak said casually. Oh, the two-headed ogre was not a talkative person. So he just walked away. Samira walked quickly at the front. And no one in the group asked where Sia was. The residents of the town watched as the avid magician quickly disappeared into the night. As if they were going upstream along the river. After the group of people had walked some distance. Sia who was all wet, walked out of the river. Serdak turned to stare at Sia and asked strangely, Why don't you swim in the river? Aren't you tired from walking? At this moment, Sia wanted to knock Saldak unconscious with one fist. Chapter 978 Tanley Town At dawn, the grass on the bank of the South River in Takarai Town was bent down by gusts of morning wind. A group of black magicians flew from the sky. They flew along the river bank for a while and found nothing unusual on the river bank. So they turned around and flew south. These black magicians rode on magic harpoons and flew extremely flexibly in the sky. The magicians' robes made a loud sound in the wind, trying to return to the black flags fluttering in the wind. After the black magicians walked away, Serdak and his team poked their heads out of the grass and watched the black magicians go away. Fortunately, we hid in time. These black magicians came so quickly. Gulitam stood up straight, walked from the grass to the roadside, and said to Serdak not far away, his boots and trousers were stained with thorn nuts in the grass. It was a fruit the size of a date and covered with hidden thorns. The kernels inside were very bitter and would cause diarrhea if eaten too much. He used his big, thick hands to pick these thorns off your pant legs. Samira jumped down from a mango tree on the roadside. There were green fruits the size of fists hanging from the tree. But these fruits were not edible yet. The ogre tried it when he found the mango tree. And the sourness made him unable to speak much for a long time. What should we do? Are we still going to Bansk? Samira asked, looking at Serdak. Serdak opened the map and thought that the bearded man and the town residents were heading to Bansk town. Going there would cause unnecessary trouble for the team. He looked at Makuso's city again and found on the map found the town of Katangada. According to the magician Avide, Katangada town is also a large town in the Ganbu Plain second only to Makuso. Let's see first. Maybe it would be good to return to Katangada town. There won't be black magicians everywhere, Serdak said in a relaxed tone. Okay, let's go to Hatangata town. Maybe I can buy the required magic materials there. Magician Avid immediately raised his hand in approval. Don't worry about the magic materials. As long as you make a list, I will figure out a solution for the rest, Serdak said to Avid. The magician obviously did not think that Serdak had this ability, and said perfunctorily, I'll give you the detailed list after I sort it out. The summer in the dry cloth plain is not hot. Soldak believes that the main reason is that there is no scorching sun above the head. So everyone does not need to hide themselves in the shade of trees. The Gombu plain is a very small plain with a terrain that is high in the north and low in the south. All rivers meander to the south, going north along the river, walking out of the outskirts of Takail town, and coming to a road leading to the north. I saw many townspeople fleeing Takail town, lining up in a long line on the road heading towards Atangata town. If conditions permit, townspeople can still ride on horse-drawn carriages. However, there are not many carriages on the road, and most of the people sitting on them are old people and young children. Many people were full of food. They couldn't take away much from Takaliai, and some even had some injuries on their bodies, because the target of the two-headed ogre was too big. Serdak and his party did not take this road. They continued to walk north along the pebble beach of the river, and finally had to choose a remote mountain road. According to the map, this road perfectly bypasses the Grove Mountains and passes through about a dozen small towns along the way before reaching Makuso City. In the plain of Ganbu, only Makuso is defined as a city. And only some villages and towns can be established in other places on the plain. 
The scale of the buildings in Atengata town, Takarai town, and Bans town make them look more like small towns. But they are called towns on the Ganbu plain. The main reason is that Lord Macdonald is an earl. And he can rule a city with the greatest authority. However, the Macdonald family is the actual ruler of the Ganbu plain. So this is why there is only one central city in the Ganbu plain. And other places are villages and towns. There is a huge gap in size and population between towns. There are towns with hundreds of thousands of people. And there are also small towns with thousands of people. The road Serdak chose to take pass through more than a dozen small towns. The mountain road is a bit rugged. But the scenery is not bad and there are not many pedestrians along the way. Just between the mountains and green mountains. A small town is hidden on the southern slopes. There is a river next to the town. And almost all the mountain streams in the nearby mountains converge into this river. On both sides of the river. You can also see small wheat fields and some water wheels standing by the river. Grove Ridge is located to the northwest of the town. And only its outline can be seen. Almost all the houses in this town are built on a gentle slope. At the bottom of the valley is a road that can accommodate four carriages. There are no walls to prevent foreign invasion. Only two wooden buildings were built at the intersection of the town. Looking at the sentry tower, there are still several militiamen standing on the sentry tower carrying longbows. When I walked under the watch tower, I saw a stone tablet on the roadside that said Tanley Town. On the back, there was also the origin and some history of the town. Serdak and his party walked into the town under the indifferent gaze of the guard tower. The residents of the town were not very friendly to outsiders. No one could be seen smiling at them on the street. Only eyes full of vigilance and vigilance. There are almost no homeless people in this town. But the houses are a bit dilapidated. But some traces of repairs can be seen. There was only one shopping street and one hotel in the town. Serdak had almost no choice but to stay in this hotel. This is a country hotel with local characteristics. It has a large yard and the rooms are independent wooden houses built on the hillside behind the hotel. It looks like there should be 10 rooms. The room rate is very cheap. And breakfast and dinner are also provided. If you don't want to eat, you can waive this part of the meal fee. A group of local young people were squatting under a tree opposite the hotel and playing cards. They saw Soldak and his party walking into the hotel. At that time, everyone only focused on the two-headed ogre. This big man walked wherever he went. Cannot be ignored. When Serdak and his party walked out of the hotel, and were about to find a restaurant in the town to have something to eat. These young people saw the two women in the team. Samira has a slender figure, light steps, and her legs are round and slender wrapped in red leather armor. Although she wears a hood, her face cannot be seen. The young people stared at Samira's slender waist and long legs, and almost drooled. It will flow out. Thea has a graceful figure and a soft waist. The Janassi clan has a habit of strongly twisting her waist when walking. Even if she has legs, she cannot change it. The rhythm of the swing of her waist is easy to make people imagine. A local young man put down the cards in his hand. Wiped his hands on his chest twice. Walked up bravely. Stood in front of a group of people and asked. Are you an adventure group from outside? Do you need a guide? I have been with you since I was a child. I grew up in the town and am very familiar with this place. Unnecessary. Serdek said calmly. As he spoke, he touched the hilt of the sword with one hand. The young man's expression changed slightly. He quickly took two steps back and spread his hands in front of his chest to express. I have no ill intentions. If you don't need a guide, then forget it. After watching Serdak and his party leave, other young people dared to come up. The restaurants in the town are not that good either. Apart from a cook with breasts as big as a noodle bag, there is only one extremely cold waiter. Moreover, there are not many food options in the restaurant. The main meal is of the local grilled fish and seeing the catfish swimming in the muddy water in the wooden basin at the door. Soldak really couldn't work up his appetite. Fortunately, Samira found a fruit stall and butcher shop in the town. The fruit stall was a roadside stall. There were some round green and red mangoes on the stall. Samira picked some mangoes and bought them. As for the butcher shop, it was a bit miserable. From a distance, it looked like a hut standing on the roadside. It was simply surrounded by some wooden boards. Fortunately, it had a roof. But on the bloody meat table, there were big rats with their gray fur burned off on one side. The skin seemed to have been scraped with a knife, making it look dark. Each big rat had a round and long belly. There is a big knot on the tail, which can be hung on the hook on the meat table. In addition to these big rats, there are two dried chickens and rabbits hanging in front of the meat table. Two cow legs are hung on hooks. 
one of which has been cut into half by a knife. The ribs were spread out on the table. And some flies were flying around the fresh meat. The two-headed ogre stretched out his hand and picked up a gray mouse with a round belly and said to Soldak with a smile, This thing is really delicious. When it is roasted, the bones will be soft. And the more you chew it, the more delicious it becomes. Samira and Sia both looked a little ugly and stood far away. Serdak scratched his head and said to the ogre, How about we roast a beef leg and eat it casually? Forget about this thing. Gulitam is definitely an ogre who is willing to listen to other people's opinions. After hearing what Soldek said, his good brother Nahua quickly agreed. Well, I think this beef leg must be good if grilled directly. So under the surprised gaze of the butcher shop owner, Soldak bought the entire leg of beef for 15 silver coins. Returning to the hotel, after seeking permission from the hotel owner, Soldak lit a bonfire in the yard and grilled the entire leg of beef. Magician Abide was lying on a wicker chair in the yard, looking at the two-headed ogre who was trying to turn over the roast beef leg, and sighed. If other lords knew, all they need to impress you is eat some roast beef every day. I guess. Someone is willing to give you a pasture. The ogre squatting next to the campfire was about to use a knife to cut a piece of meat from the uncooked beef leg to taste. Hearing what the magician Avid said, Gulitam immediately asked strangely, Why are you giving me the pasture? Good brother now Huar put his ear to Gulitam's ear and said, Avid means that you can raise cattle as you like by then. Gulitam shook his head and immediately said, I like to eat beef, but it does not mean that I like raising cattle. I have raised yellow sheep in Wall Village. You must not know that I worry about losing the yellow sheep every day. Every morning and evening how troublesome it is to count the sheep. Nauhar immediately swallowed his saliva and said, Gulitmu, I think yellow sheep is more delicious than beef. Of course. Gulitam nodded and said with emotion, Speak of yourself. You have never eaten the sheep I raised. When we have a chance to return to Wall Village, I will treat you to sheep soup. The mutton soup made by Selena is the most delicious broth. The two-headed ogre started chatting and started his own chat mode. The two brothers sat in front of the campfire, cutting half-cooked beef shanks and chatting among themselves. A simple roast beef leg will take at least a few hours from roasting to finishing. But for the ogre brothers, when they can finish it all depends on how sharp the meat cleaver is in their hands. The smell of barbecue in the yard drifted outside, attracting a group of children from the town. They didn't come close. They just stood on the wall outside the hotel and curiously looked into the yard. When this group of children saw the ogre, the timid children immediately ran back. Only some bold children refused to leave. The clothes worn by children are almost all sewn from the cheapest coarse linen. This coarse cloth is almost always used to sew bags in Benna City. When the clothes are made into clothes, you will feel a slight itch when you wear them. Sewing clothes, the fabric is more delicate. Serdek walked out of the house cut some pieces of meat from the beef leg, skewered them on the wicker branches, put the meat skewers back on the fire and cooked them, sprinkled some salt on them, got up and walked to the wall, give each child one. The children didn't dare to take it at first, but the tallest boy tried to take one. The other children quickly snatched up all the meat skewers in Soldak's hand. They scratched the wall and started to wolf down the meat skewers. Who can tell me where this is? Serdak asked the children. Tanley Town, said the child closest to him. Didn't you see the stone monument at the entrance of the town? How long have you been here? Serdak took the opportunity to ask him, as he looked very smart. The child blinked his eyes, as if he had thought carefully before saying, I have been living here since I was born. Serdak asked curiously, Then what do your parents do? Hunters? Farmers? Tanners? Lumberjacks? Afraid that he wouldn't be able to tell. I named the possible professions one by one. The child replied, My father is a farmer and my family has a wheat field on the other side of the river. After that, he pointed to the wheat field beside the river outside the town. My family is the same. Several other children said that their families also have a wheat field. One child pointed to the child on the outside and said, The only difference is that his family is different. His father is a butcher, and the leg of beef you are eating is bought from his family. Following the direction of the child's finger, Soldak saw a shy child holding a meat skewer. Looking at Soldak in panic, his expression a little embarrassed and at a loss. Then do you have an army here? Serdek asked. The child bit off a large piece of meat, ate it with relish, and replied cheerfully, Yes, the Lord's army will come twice a year to collect taxes. Are there any troops in the nearby mountains? The child was slightly startled. The meat skewers in his hand shook imperceptibly. He looked away and said, I don't know. Do you know? Have no idea. 
didn't hear that, the other children said immediately, but their voices were much softer. Chapter 979 Chase Saldek sighed softly, turned around and walked back to the yard. It can be seen that the lives of the people in the remote mountainous areas of the Ganbu Plain are very difficult. The Lord Army has to collect taxes here twice a year, which also increases the burden on the people. The young people in the village have not left the mountains, and they seem to have nothing to do in the town. There is no doubt that there should be rebels here, and the rebels here should have some close connections with Tinley Town. The children subconsciously avoided those topics, probably because they had been subjected to similar cross-examinations, and the adults at home had warned them in advance. Serdak sat back on the chair next to the campfire. The magician abbot asked Serdak curiously, What did you say to those children just now? Why did you become so depressed when you came back? Evening in the mountains always comes earlier, and the sky dims. The firewood in the bonfire burned down to only some red charcoal fire, and with sporadic crackling sounds. Some charcoal exploded and splashed with some sparks. Serdak sat down, took a sip of water from the cup, and said with some worry, There should be rebels here. After the Lord stabilized the situation in Takarai town, they will definitely go around to wipe out the rebels. The residents of this town will inevitably be implicated. Avid's eyes widened. He struggled to sit up from the recliner and asked Serdak, You mean this is the rebels' lair? Serdak shook his head and said, Probably not, but there should be some rebels here. After hearing what Serdak said, Avid exhaled, lay back on the wicker chair again, and said, Why do you think there are so many rebels in the Ganmu Plain? Soldak thought about what the child just said. In the Bina province and even the entire Green Empire, the taxation of private lands is controlled by the lords. Normally, taxes are basically collected once a year, almost after the harvest festival. This is also the time when territorial residents have the most money. If there were years of famine or war, the lords would have to reduce or reduce taxes appropriately. In the event of a larger natural disaster, many lords would have to spend their own money to help the residents of their territories tide over the difficulties. But this is obviously not the case in the dry cloth plain. When he owned the territory of Pudu Mountain, he had not considered these things. Serdak only gradually came into contact with this matter after owning the large land of Invercargill Forest. After all, there are still 37 aboriginal tribes in the territory. How to appease these indigenous tribes? Serdak had also thought about it before. Think about it carefully. He put down the water glass in his hand and said to the magician Abbot, it may be that the taxes set by the local lords are too high. If Lord MacDonald dares to fight against the Bene Coalition in Tarapa, he will definitely need a large amount of gold coins and magic crystals, in addition to part of the savings from their treasury. The remaining part is destined to be it must be shared among the people of the Ganbu Plain. Magician Avid was slightly startled. As a magician noble, he does not need to pay taxes. So he is not very sensitive to these things and usually does not even think about it. Samira jumped off the roof and whispered close to Soldak. Our whereabouts have been exposed, and a black magician is chasing us over there. His light red eyes looked toward the town entrance with murderous intent. How many people are here? Serdak asked. Samira whispered. Three black magicians. Soldak thought for a moment and said to Samira. Maybe I just happened to search here. Samira slightly bit her knees and jumped up to a mango tree in the courtyard. The moment she stepped on the horizontal branch, her body stretched out, and she easily crossed more than 10 meters and stepped on the roof. In a few steps, she jumped onto the chimney and headed towards the entrance of the town. Look! They stopped at the guard tower at the entrance of the town and were questioning the guards at the guard post at the entrance of the town. Serdak rubbed his forehead. He originally just wanted to wait for the magician Abbot to recover his mana, repair the temporary teleportation circle, and return to Bena City. But these black magicians always followed behind and indeed it's very annoying. Thinking of the demon stuck in the door of Lord MacDonald's manor, Saldak felt that he should give these black magicians a little more color. Then teach them a lesson. Let's go and get rid of him. Serdak put down the water glass and said to Samira on the roof. Gulidam quickly stood up and prepared to go out to fight together with the stick. He was worried that the beef leg would be burned on the bonfire. So he conveniently picked up the beef leg with the bones exposed in his hand. Gulidam, you stay to protect Avid and Thea. Samira and I are enough to deal with those black magicians. After Soldak finished speaking, he took out the magic pattern structure from his magic belt bag and quickly put it on his body. Thea hurriedly ran over to help him fasten the shoulder straps. The two-headed ogre sat down again. Samira put on the devil snake's fong. And this set of magic pattern structure almost completely wrapped her body. 
and the two quickly walked out of the hotel yard. The evening light in the town was a little dim, and Samira disappeared next to Suldak as she walked. There is only one commercial street in the town. There are not many pedestrians on the street in the evening. The young people playing cards under the tree opposite the hotel have dispersed. Suldak holds the hilt of the broad sword in one hand and walks towards the village entrance step by step. Walking away, his eyes became extremely firm. The three black magicians were still standing on the sentry tower at the entrance of the village. Although the two guards put on a submissive look, they did not say a useful word. A magician had no choice but to take out two silver coins from his pocket and ask the question again. Yes, there are five of them in total. I saw them passing here at noon. The ogre is really ferocious in appearance. He actually has two heads on his shoulders. The guard immediately said with a smile after receiving the silver coin. They don't care who the other person is. The three black magician's eyes lit up. And they felt that they could ask each other about each other's situation in more detail. They looked at each other and felt that this time, they had gained quite a lot. Besides that ogre, who else is there? The magician stood on the simple sentry tower and continued to ask. Two more women with their faces covered. A knight and a magician. The guards felt that the two silver coins were worth providing them with some information. But that was all they knew. Just when he wanted to say something more to make this information seem more worthwhile. His companion secretly tugged at the corner of his clothes and pointed at the figure walking towards the sentry tower on the street in the town. The three black magicians also noticed something strange in the guards' eyes. They followed their gazes and turned to look into the town. They saw a knight striding towards this side with a sword on his waist and a shield on his back. The black magicians immediately mounted the magic handles and flew into the air with a whoosh. They received the news from above that the group of people stranded on the Ganbu Plain were all second-level powerhouses. Only by riding the magic shackles could they be in an invincible position. The three black magicians had no urge to take action. One of the black magicians rode a magic harpoon and flew out of the town, apparently wanting to return to Takarai town to fetch reinforcements. The other two black magicians are going to stay in the town to keep an eye on the night. They ignored an important factor. The opponent was a five-man team. The black magicians thought that Serdek happened to be heading towards the entrance of the town. They also wanted to fly to the back of a building at the entrance of the town on magic harpoons. They were not prepared to be exposed too early. The magician who returned to Takarai town to bring in reinforcements had just flown out of the town when he felt as if something was staring at his back. The hairs all over his body stood up, and he used all his strength to activate the magic weapon to fly south. He poured mana into the magic pattern array with all his strength towards the magic handle. The magic pattern array on the handle completely lit up, and his speed immediately increased. The black magician even made an evasive action while riding the magic harpoon, twisting into an S shape in the air. However, he still felt the sharp pain from his back, and a sharp arrow passed through his back. The tip of the arrow emerged from the throat at an angle. He raised his head. His Adam's apple made a gurgling sound, and a stream of blood rushed out of his throat, unable to hold the magic handle with both hands. The magic handle lost its magic power and fell directly from the sky. When the two black magicians saw that their companion who was about to return to Takarai town to report was shot by an archer, they were so frightened that they hurriedly pulled up the handle of the magic pot, trying to get out of the shooting range of the archer hiding in the dark. Unfortunately, it was too late when they realized this. Two arrows were shot from their feet at the most tricky angles, avoiding their sight. The arrows were extremely powerful and almost all flew in through the magic shackles in the body of the black magician. The black magicians are like birds with broken wings, falling from the sky. Serdak walked over slowly and searched the three black magicians carefully, not missing anything valuable. The body was dragged to the tidal flats by the river outside the town. A large pit was dug in the sand of the riverbed, and the black magician's body was thrown into it and buried together. When Suldak returned to Tonley Town, many residents of the town had gathered at the entrance of the town, and everyone looked at him coldly. No one spoke. But the coldness and resentment in their eyes could not be hidden. Serdak stood under the guard tower of Tinley Town, spread his hands and said to everyone, I know what you want to say to me. You think that if I kill these three black magicians, it will bring disaster to you. They came to arrest me. I didn't want to be caught without mercy, so I had to kill them. Soldek said while standing at the entrance of the town. In the crowd, a Boulder Town citizen said loudly, Knight, please get out of here. Serdak knew that since these black magicians could come over, there would definitely be black magicians coming later. Even if the townspeople didn't say anything, he would leave tomorrow morning. Now that the situation is like this, I have to leave early 
and have to sleep in the wild tonight. Okay, let's leave now. Serdak didn't even argue. Strode to the hotel. Called out the two-headed ogre. The magician Avid. And Thea. Walked through the town in the night. And continued walking north. After the small town residents left Serdak and his party, a group of young people took advantage of the darkness and went to the river, relying on their familiarity with the river. They quickly removed the three black magicians from the sand on the river beach. After digging them out, they worked in pairs and carried the three black magicians to the entrance of the village again. Everyone hurriedly searched the three black magicians, who had been dead for a long time, and then took off the last clothes and placed them on the wooden table. The town residents who had just stood up to speak came out at this time and told everyone, Put them here and wait for their people to come and claim them. No. The young people in these towns were very convinced of this leader and quickly took care of everything. The corpses of three black magicians were parked under the big tree. It was not until noon the next day that the second wave of black magicians from Takarai arrived at the town successfully. When they looked under the big tree at the entrance of the town, they happened to see three companions lying on the wooden planks. Corpse. The black magicians called several small town residents to inquire about the situation. And the general information they obtained was three magicians discovered an adventuring group. And they started fighting last night. Unfortunately, the three magicians were defeated. The one who killed them was an archer. One of the black magicians said, What should we do now? Continue to chase. Notify the garrison in Takarai town to dispatch. And come here to round them up, said an older black magician. After saying that, he took the lead in riding the magic harpoon and continued flying north along this mountain road. Cheer up, everyone. This time we are chasing a team of level two experts. We don't want to end up like them. The older black magician frowned and said, Customize three coffins in the town and take them back with you when you return. His teacher. A black magician stood nearby and said respectfully, Serdak originally wanted to find a small town to live in and wait for the magician avid to recover and return to Benna City but he did not expect that these magicians could catch up. Now they could only continue heading north. But the group didn't go far. They found a woodland with few shrubs and weeds in the forest, set up a few tents in the forest, and rested for the night. The next morning, before the three of them walked out of the forest, they saw a burst of dust flying in the direction of Tinley Town. A group of cavalry came out of Tinley Town carrying the flag and continued to pursue northward along the mountain road. Serdak and others hiding in the forest couldn't help but look at each other. They didn't expect the Lord's Cavalry to catch up so quickly. And more importantly, they actually caught up to the front. Since this mountain road couldn't be walked, Suldak thought of walking up the river valley, so that at least Sia would be more comfortable. After walking upstream for a whole day, the pebbles along the river turned into rocky beaches. The river sometimes passed through some canyons. The dense woods on both sides of the canyons were full of shrubs. Unless you use a hatchet to cut them out. A road that otherwise would have to be waded through. Fortunately, with Sia here, the team can barely pass through the rapid canyon waterway even if they cut a few logs and build them into rafts and push them into the water. Chapter 980 Battle On the third day after leaving Tinley Town, as expected, the team lost their way in the mountains. Since there was no map, Soldak could not identify the direction in the mountains. They walked up the waterway. Finally, the waterway turned into several channels in the valley. Mountain Stream Serdak also tried to find the mountain road leading to Makusuo City. But the five members of the team had been searching in this mountain range for a whole day. Now even the specific direction has been completely lost. Serdak decided to climb a high ridge and check out the surrounding terrain. There are many small beasts in the mountain forest. Skunks, hedgehogs, pheasants, and roe deer can be seen everywhere. There are also many birds in the forest. And there are even more mosquitoes. But the beasts of prey have never been encountered. Serdak and his party wanted to find a higher mountain. The team was on the top of a mountain that was difficult to walk. However, the trees here were dense. Standing on the top of the tree crown and looking around, the rolling jungle was almost completely covered by trees. The mountains and forests in the distance looked like an undulating green sea. Through a dense forest, the sound of fighting below the valley could be clearly heard, and the somewhat listless Amira immediately ran forward. When Serdak caught up, Samira was standing on the horizontal branch of a big tree, peering into the valley along a rare gap in the forest. A cavalry regiment of the Lord's army is surrounding a rebel army in the valley. The biggest difference between the two armies is that the Lord's cavalry regiment all wear uniform standard armor. And the weapons in their hands are also relatively uniform. And they are very excellent. However, 
the armor worn by the rebels is relatively mixed, including light leather armor and heavy armor. The weapons in their hands include swords, axes, flails, spears, etc. If you think about it, you know how limited the combat effectiveness of such an infantry regiment will be. When they met the cavalry regiment of the regular Lord's army, even though they had an absolute advantage in numbers, and the terrain in the valley where the cavalry could not complete the charge, a group of rebels were still defeated by the Lord's army. There were a lot of rocks piled up in the valley, and some rebel infantry soldiers fell in a pool of blood. They were killed and retreated steadily, but they still did not give way to the entrance of the valley. He felt a little admiration for the fighting will of this group of rebels. The cavalry regiment of the Lord's army also suffered some casualties. The cavalry horses were not armored. So many horses died on the battlefield at the bottom of the valley. Whether it was the Lord army or the rebel army, Serdak had no good impression of him. So he did not consider going down to join the battle. I just thought that since the cavalry could ride in, the valley below would be able to lead outside. It would be great if I could get a few war horses from the Lord's cavalry, which would save me the trouble of walking. At this time, Samira let out an exclamation, quickly jumped down from the tree, ran to Soldak and said, Among the people hiding in the valley, there are old people and children who ran out of Takalai town. Woman, Serdak patted his forehead. The bearded man told him that he was going to take a boat to Ban's town. But now it seemed that he appeared in a remote mountain valley in a dense forest. He had no idea that there must be something wrong with the identity of the bearded man. In order to understand the situation, Serdak took a broadsword and split the bushes and vines in front, and continued to approach the valley bottom. When the team got closer to the bottom of the valley, they finally understood that this valley should be a camp of the rebel army. The rebel infantry were killed and injured everywhere, but they still did not collapse because behind them were a group of unarmed women and children. The cavalry regiment of this lord's army should have discovered the rebel camp behind the valley, and they were not in a hurry to capture it in one fell swoop. The commander still asked the cavalry to attack in turn, preparing to eat away the rebel infantry regiment bit by bit. There were already corpses lying on the ground at the mouth of the valley, and the fighting still didn't stop. Fortunately, there is a group of archers at the entrance of the rebel army. Every time the cavalry rushes within the shooting range, there will be a shower of arrows. However, the number of archers in this group is not large, so the combat power formed is also very limited. The spears in the hands of the cavalry have a great advantage in battle. Basically, the infantrymen are stabbed down by the spears before they can get close. Under the repeated attacks of the Lord's Army Cavalry Regiment, the rebel infantry regiment soldiers finally could not withstand the fierce offensive. A cavalry squadron broke through the defense line composed of flesh and blood infantry and entered the valley camp. The women were protecting a group of children and wanted to retreat into the forest on the left side of the valley, but were stopped by the cavalry squadron. The young woman who had been molested by the Lord's army in the Ivid Manor ran at the back of a group of people, with a confused-looking little girl under her arm. A cavalryman caught up with her, raising her hand high. The sharp tip of the spear pierced the woman's back, stabbing her and the girl to death. The young woman's eyes were wide open, and she was lying in a pool of blood with the girl, who was no longer breathing in her arms. The cavalry continued to pursue. At this moment, Serdak seemed to be touched by some emotion in his heart. He no longer remained rational and hid in the woods. He pulled out the broad sword at his waist, split open the vines and shrubs in front of him, and strode through the woods, pounced out in the woods. Samira and Gulatim's eyes were also red. When they saw Serdak rushing out, they immediately followed behind. The half-elf archer arrived first, and the sky strike bow in her hand fired arrows frequently while running. The shadow of the big elf behind her almost kept the same movement as her, and the stainless steel arrow shot through the gap in the armor. The neck of the Lord's knight. The knight fell forward, with one foot hanging on the stirrup. His body lost the last bit of strength under the drag of the horse, and the horse stopped from running wildly. Samira shot five cavalrymen in a row. Her arrows could penetrate the armor, but the tip of the arrow penetrated half an inch into the armor and could not penetrate any further. The two-headed ogre Gilidim's pace was much longer than that of Serdak. When he ran with all his strength, Serdak could only catch up with him on horseback. At this time, the ogre's body was covered with a thick layer of ice armor, and he took the lead to collide with the cavalry at the front. The horse seemed to have hit a wall, and Gulidim hit it hard with his stick. On the horse's head, the knight and the horse fell at the same time. The cavalry on horseback rolled away the moment the horse fell, but was hit by a fireball thrown by Nohor. A ball of flame exploded on the cavalry, and the cavalry immediately turned into a burning man rolling on the ground. 
Serdak rushed up behind Gulitam. And the cavalry behind him also noticed this. They pointed their ninth spears at Gulitam and killed him from all around. Gulitam let out a war cry that shook the valley, rounded the big stick in his hand, and resisted the charge of the three knights by himself. Serdak quickly took the opportunity to rush forward and use Gerda's shield to block the spears of the knights on horseback. The broad sword in his hand slashed towards the unarmored horse's head. A sacred flame extended from the blade. The heads of the three war horses were chopped off at the same time. The war horse fell down, and the three cavalrymen were pinned down by the war horse. Serdak stepped over the horse corpses and slit their throats with his sword. Chapter 981 Faith Serdak has never been so determined. Eyes, pace, Eisenhard's iron of light in my hand. What is condensed in my heart is not anger, but it is like I have found a belief to continue fighting. He hopes to use the broad sword in his hand to chop away the thorns on the road to the future for these children, so that they can have a better vision of the world. Not when I first opened my eyes at the Handenar County Forest Farm Camp in the Warsaw Plain. The world in his eyes was gray at that time. The smiling faces of the soldiers of the second team filled his world with color again. But at that time, he was like a dandelion flower seed floating in the wind. Just moving around with the military camp. If it weren't for a warm invitation full of goodwill, he wouldn't even know where he would go in the future. Unexpectedly, in the end, he was the only one who fulfilled his original promise and returned to Halanza City alone. Not when I was studying at the Knight Academy in Halanza City. At that time, he just wanted to have a legal identity that was enough to protect the village. He was forced by the poor life of the whole village. Only by making some changes could the life of Wall Village in the desolate land gradually get better. It was as if there was an invisible big hand behind him pushing him forward without stopping. At that time, whenever he sat down, he always felt that there was someone watching him. And his warm smile was like a yoke on the oath. Although it had no binding force. It kept urging him in his heart that he must do it. Keep going. Not when fighting in Wazimra City on the Maka Plain. At that time, he was a guard battalion knight. And fighting was both a task and his job. He has the responsibility to save his comrades on the battlefield. It is the guard battalion knight badge on his chest that makes him an outstanding knight. There was no such thing in the town of Doden in the thorny mountains of the White Forest Plain. If Marquis Luther hadn't pushed for the garrison in the Belen Plain, he might still be dealing with a group of sand bandits in the desolate land. According to Marquis Luther's plan, Soldak needs to occupy several mines in the Invercargill Forest to stabilize his economic foundation. But if you want to get a mine, you must own a territory. So he didn't hesitate to anger the Wilk City Magic Guild and the Alchemy Guild to get that territory. In fact, Soldak did an outstanding job in this matter. Even Marquis Luther did not expect that he would occupy the entire Invercargill Forest and control one-third of the forest. Take your pick from all the land in the forest. It seems that none of these things were decided by Serdak himself. Some of it was an agreement, and some of it was someone pushing him from behind. The Ganbu Plain is filled with many members of the Black Magic Monastery, and the plain is clamoring to declare its independence. Unfortunately, the reputation of the Lord Army in the eyes of the people in the Ganbu Plain has been extremely bad. The original idea was to let the magician Abbot open the temporary portal and return to Bena City safely. After Lord MacDonald was caught, it was officially over when they came to the Ganbu Plain. He had been looking forward to returning to Bena City for the past few days. He does not belong to the Ganbu Plain. But now, he has watched for so many days from the perspective of a bystander, seeing the almost destroyed town of Takarai seeing the residents of the town who died in the war, and seeing the living conditions of the residents of the remote mountainous town. Until now, he saw the rebels lying in a pool of blood. Only then did he realize what he was going to do. He wants to split this corrupted plane with his own sword. Seeing the three powerful warriors who suddenly broke in, the commander of the Lord's Cavalry Regiment quickly mobilized several squadron leaders in the group. Dozens of knights rushed out of the group and quickly surrounded Serdak and his party. Come over. Among them, there are six squadron captains in the knights wearing magic pattern constructs. And they are all construct knights with good combat power. The warhorse stepped on the pebbles in the valley, making a crisp treading sound. A knight and the warhorse almost turned into a white light, and the shadow of a white rock rhinoceros appeared behind him, crashing towards Serdak like a steam train. Come over. Dozens of other knights are following behind this knight. They are waiting for Serdak to avoid the charge and make a tactical retreat so that their impact will be continuous like a tide. After all, Soldak has been a cavalry battalion commander for such a long time and is very familiar with the cavalry's standard charge tactics. As long as you take a step back at this time, 
you will suffer an overwhelming impact. He raised the Gerda shield in his hand, and the magic pattern flowed out of the magic glow. Behind him appeared an archangel with spread wings. The archangel's phantom had a hood on his head, and his face could not be seen clearly. But the figure behind him, the wings are as white as snow, and the archangel sits with his hands on his chest and prays. A halo of power lit up under his feet, and the magic runes of ancient oaths quickly appeared in front of him. At this moment, the rune language burst out with a powerful force in the form of a holy seal, pouring into Gerda's shield. The shield in Serdak's hand burst out with a strong sacred aura. The archangel hugged Serdak with his hands and wings intertwined. The construct knight in the Lord's army was holding a knight's spear in his hand. Just before the spear touched the shield, the horse under his crotch suddenly jumped up, and the spear in his hand also stabbed suddenly while withdrawing. Go out. Click. The knight's thick armed spear hit Gerda's shield and broke in the middle. Unable to stop, the warhorse stepped forward with its front hooves towards Serdak and stepped on Serdak's Gerda shield again. An invisible force was offset by the wings of the archangel. Serdak felt the archangel's wings dim instantly and he took the opportunity to sever the horse's leg with a sword. As the warhorse neighed, the knight on horseback decisively threw away the knight's spear. The shock in his hand was so complete that he lost consciousness. In a hurry, he dropped the knight's light shield with his left hand, drew out the long sword from his waist, and prepared to avoid the shield and stab the knight diagonally. Saldak shoulder, neck and clavicle below. Serdak raised his shield again, turned sideways to avoid the construct knight's sword and with his backhand made a cut that was more than a foot long on the construct knight's thigh. The warhorse fell down, and the construct knight also fell out like a cannonball, rolling into the rocks. The cavalry from behind followed one after another, and Serdak returned to his original defensive posture, blocking the continuous horseback killings of the knights behind him. At this time, the two-headed ogre also stepped to Serdak's side. The two of them blocked the charge of six construct knights side by side and then swept off a group of cavalry who rushed up behind them. Only then did the commander of the Lord Army realize the two warriors on the opposite side are likely to be second-level warriors. At this moment, Samira was already standing at the edge of the woods, shooting seventeen cavalrymen one after another. The fiercest offensive in the cavalry regiment came to an abrupt end. All the first-turn knights in the Lord's cavalry regiment gave up chasing the rebels and gathered towards Serdek. By use cavalry formed a charging wave in the valley, and crashed towards the two-headed ogre. The ogre's skin quickly turned to stone, holding a big stick in both hands to block Serdak's body. Samira squatted on the branch of the tree trunk and spat out the fruit core in her mouth. The magic patterns on her arms glowed with hot light. The magic crystal in the gem groove of the sky strike bow in her hand exploded again, and the entire sky strike bow was filled with water. Countless electric snakes stretched out their bow strings and attached a jet black steel arrow. The steel arrow instantly turned into a light arrow with swaying electric arcs. When the arrow flew in the air, it could no longer control the electric arc it contained. Countless electric arcs spread outward, as if spreading out a network of arc light. The arrow appeared and extinguished, accurately hitting the forehead of the knight rushing at the front. That knight is the strongest construct knight in the cavalry regiment. His strength has reached the peak of the first rank, but he has been unable to break through the second rank. He saw an arrow flying through the arc in the sky, and quickly moved a piece of black iron to make it. The delicate little buckler firmly blocked the light arrow. Just as the one-turn knight secretly said, this light arrow is nothing more than that, and the arc in the sky is nothing more than a mere appearance. His thoughts were floating in his mind, and a bolt of lightning fell above his head like a waterfall of light. Suddenly, the construct knights and war horses were struck by lightning and were scorched all over. The arc spread to all sides. Several knights and the war horses under their hips trembled almost at the same time, and fell to the battlefield one after another. Theo was standing next to the big tree at the feet of Samira. At this moment, the shadow of Queen Janna with six arms appeared behind her. A light blue magic pattern emerged from under her feet, and a surging sea wave emerged from behind her, surged out and rushed towards the group of knights. The knight in front was like standing in a fast-flowing river, and all the horses were unable to continue charging. The two-headed ogre's eyes widened. Gulidum had already rushed forward with a big stick, but at this moment, Nalhar turned back to Sia and shouted, Sia, you did a great job. Serdak was successfully promoted to the second rank, and his body's sacred attribute affinity had reached the full value. When his whole body was filled with sacred aura, his body became transparent like a glass bottle, and countless sacred auras around him gathered around him. His body slowly turned into a dazzling light golden color. At this moment, 
Almost everyone on the battlefield dared not look directly at him. He followed Gulitem and fought back towards the cavalry. He suddenly jumped up and stood among the enemy crowd like a god descending from heaven. Holy wrath. Countless golden light arrows burst out from Serdak's body. Like dazzling golden light. These light arrows pierced the bodies of the cavalry. And the cavalry of the Lord Army fell in pieces. The rebels around him finally took this opportunity to take a breath. They knew that this battle was far from over. Almost all the rebels who could fight quickly gathered towards Serdek. The ogre let out another war cry. The bearded man used a sheet to tighten the wound on his ribs. Propped the hammer in his hand on the ground. Stood up reluctantly and gathered around Serdak with difficulty. As he approached Serdak, he felt a sudden surge of power under his feet. Although his body was still bleeding, his steps became more powerful. The ogre's war cry also made everyone's blood boil and their spirits uplifted. With a big stride, Gulitem caught up with the cavalryman, lifted him off his horse, and threw him to the ground, holding the horse's reins with one hand. Although the horse tried its best to resist, the ogre still forced it to retreat to Serdak's side. At this moment, Serdak's body has returned to its original state. The holy anger just now is full of divine power in the body. It can be used once every two days without causing additional burden on the body. Without hesitation, he mounted his horse, raised the broadsword in his hand, and led the gathered rebels to fight back against the Lord's Cavalry Regiment. Samira also walked out of the woods and chased after the team. In the eyes of the ogres, these armors worn by the Lord's Cavalry are no different from paper. The three-meter-tall ogres are like war machines, rushing to the front. No matter where they go, they have just formed a little combat power. The Lord's army immediately began to disperse. The commander of the Lord's Cavalry Regiment closed his eyes. He did not complain that there were no second-level warriors in the Legion. He just regretted not bringing the bed crossbow because it was too troublesome this time. Even if there are only two bed crossbows, they can silence the extremely arrogant two-headed ogre opposite. Opening his eyes again, the commander of the Lord Army said to the assistant beside him, Give the order. The whole army retreats. The first squadron is left behind to take charge of the rear. After saying that, he stopped looking at the battlefield, turned around on his horse, and took the lead to leave the valley battlefield with his bodyguards. The herald immediately passed on the general's order. A group of cavalry lined up on the hill with five consecutive crossbows in their hands. They used crossbow arrows to block the charge here. The Lord's Army Cavalry Regiment quickly withdrew from the valley. They left the horse corpses on the ground and began to retreat in the direction they came from. Serdak also stopped and stood at the mouth of the valley watching the well-trained cavalry leave. The commander of the cavalry regiment also seemed to be aware of this and stopped on the mountain road. He held the reins of his horse with one hand, turned around and took a deep look at Serdak. His cold and arrogant expression was anything but. He is a commander who has just experienced failure. The magician avid walked out of the dense woods with the support of Sia. He was injured and his face turned pale after just a few steps. The bearded man walked up to the magician avid with difficulty and said to the magician avid with a grateful face. Thank you, magician avid. If you hadn't helped me this time, I'm afraid our entire camp would have been destroyed by this. The army of lords was completely slaughtered. Magician avid said with a look of shame. Well, it's not me you want to thank. I didn't help much. You should be grateful. These children in Takarai town. If we hadn't seen them suffering, we wouldn't have been able to help you. Magician Avid is a magic noble. How could he take action against the noble lord? Samira stood on the horizontal branch of a big tree nearby and said in a slightly hoarse voice. She and Sia covered their faces with black gauze. Looking very mysterious. The rebels on the side were peeping at the two of them. And they continued to rummage through the pile of corpses looking for their surviving companions. In any case, the battle ended with a tragic victory for the rebels. And victory often brings some gains. Chapter 982 Faith 2 The blood almost dyed the pebbles in the valley red. Serdak rummaged through the corpses for those seriously injured soldiers. As long as there was a breath of life that could be saved, he called for people to come and carry them to the temporary tent he set up on the battlefield. Seeing that Serdak turned out to be a paladin with the power of the holy light, the rebel soldiers took the initiative to carry the seriously wounded to the front of Serdak's tent. Soon there was no need for Serdak to take the initiative to find the wounded for treatment. He only needed to use the holy light spell on these injured warriors in the tent. Soldak's principle for treating the wounded is to give priority to the seriously injured. In the past, after such a big battle, the rebels would have to make a life or death decision for the injured soldiers due to the lack of healing potions and water magicians. Those soldiers who feel that their injuries cannot be healed 
and do not want to continue to endure the pain will have their closest comrades help them make a break. There is often a collective farewell ceremony at this time. Some soldiers who felt they could still survive would lie in the camp and fight death alone after being simply bandaged. But things are obviously different now. Cernak took the initiative to treat these rebels, and all the soldiers who could still breathe were carried back from the battlefield. Sia follows Serdak as an assistant. Magic has no borders. As an excellent water magician, Sia is very skilled in hydrotherapy and detoxification. However, Sia is more inclined to treat injured children, elderly and women in the rebel camp. The two-headed ogre brought back a war horse whose head was decapitated by Soldak's sword from the battlefield. He carried the war horse on his shoulder and held the horse's head in his other hand with some blood on his mouth. Daunting. He set up two bonfires next to Cernak's tent. On one of the bonfires, he boiled a large pot filled with clean water. After boiling, the water in the iron pot had to be cooled to prepare it for Cernak, used to clean the wounds of injured soldiers. The other bonfire was used to grill the war horses. He had tied the whole horse to a huge log, skinned it, and removed the internal organs. It seemed that he wanted to roast the whole horse. The ogre had carried it in his pocket. Apply some salt and spices to the war horse. Gulitam kept talking to Nalhor. This kind of horse meat is very chewy after being roasted. Especially the meat on the horse's legs is particularly delicious. What a good brother. Nalhor wanted to take a bite of the raw meat. Brother, stop talking. For ogres, every fierce battle consumes a lot of energy. And the best way to replenish energy is to eat a lot. Samira squatted next to the first turn construct knight took off the magic pattern construct from his body with her own hands and put the magic belt, weapons, and saddle together. She personally ran over to all the construct knights that Serdak and Gulitam killed personally and stripped off all the magic pattern constructs, weapons and shields, magic belts and gold and silver ornaments on their bodies. There were almost 20 construct knights in this cavalry regiment and 11 of them were killed by Serdak, Gulitam, and Samira. Ordinary cavalry Samira automatically ignored it. The biggest gain this time was 11 sets of magic pattern structures. Although they were all damaged to a certain extent, they should still be reparable. Samira's eyes became bright. She had never thought before that making money by hunting monsters, developing territories, and mining ores was far inferior to winning a war. It was simply too profitable. The winning side actually has a way to make up for the losses caused during the battle. The rebel leaders watched Samira carrying 11 sets of magic pattern structures from a distance. But they could not walk over and say anything. What can I say? If it hadn't been for others to lend a helping hand in times of crisis. The rebel army would probably have been slaughtered by this cavalry regiment. Now they are just collecting the trophies of killing the enemy. And now the knight is still treating the wounded soldiers. Although these magic pattern structures are precious to the rebels. They can only watch Samira pocket them. Middle. Of course. It was impossible for these rebel soldiers to forget this scene so quickly. An arrow of light hit a construct knight in the sky. Lightning from the sky actually exploded in the cavalry charge formation, causing all the archers in the rebel camp to panic. It was eye-opening to see that an archer could still deliver such a sharp blow. Many people died in the battle. And even more were injured. Serdak was very busy. The sacrifices he took out this time were all carried in the magic waste bag. The magic waste bag has limited space and the number of sacrifices he carried was not large. Aphrodite was no longer in the lava mine of Pussy Mountain, so there was no way to take it out. Inventory. So for the sacrifices of these Warcraft heads, Serdak basically saves as much as he can. One elementary head has to bless two seriously injured numbers with the blessing of God's blessed body. The surviving children in the camp gathered together, frightened by the brutal battle. The shadow of death shrouded the entire camp. Women hugged their children, and hid in the corner to secretly shed tears. Those who survived or those who had died were all crying. The rebel soldiers seemed to have adapted to this kind of life. They carried their injured companions back to the camp on the battlefield and lined up outside the tent to wait for Serdak's treatment. Others picked up a large amount of firewood from the woods and set up a huge firewood pile in the open space at the bottom of the valley. They neatly placed the bodies of their dead companions on it, waiting for the burning ceremony in the evening. People here believe that when day and night alternate, there will be an open door between the underworld and the human world. The dead lord's cavalry must also be burned to prevent their skeletons from becoming part of the undead army. However, their corpses were thrown away more casually. All valuable things were stripped off, and their bloody corpses lay in a mess on the firewood. The camp is not too big. It is just a small stronghold. The bearded Edgar had just brought more than 300 fleeing town residents here. 
unexpectedly. A cavalry regiment took the opportunity to touch them. The main force of the rebel army was not here. The infantry here were not those at all. Well-trained and well-equipped cavalry. The valley here is in the deepest part of the mountain call. Surrounded by mountains on three sides. With only one exit blocked by the Lord's cavalry. No one could escape and could only fight to the death. Watching the young warriors around him fall down one by one. Edgar even thought that he would die here. Although he was scratched by a knight with a bone deep wound in his ribs. He wanted to die before he died. Kill a few more Lord's troops before dying. And keep fighting on the battlefield. He didn't expect to meet the magician Avid here. And this enthusiastic magician actually sent his followers at the critical moment and saved a large number of people on his side. He also lay in the tent as a casualty with injured ribs and received treatment from Soldak. Serdak squatted beside him, cut open the blood-soaked sheets wrapped around him, and asked the bearded man curiously, You concealed your identity in Takalai town just to bring these children away. Come out? Bearded Edgar's face was unusually pale, and he was bleeding too much. Waves of dizziness hit him, and he did not dare to sleep. It is said that many of his companions fell asleep at this time and never woke up. Edgar is not afraid of death, but there is clearly a chance of survival now. Our camp is very short of supplies. We have no choice but to take advantage of the fact that the troops in Takarai town are almost empty and rush in to grab some supplies. The bearded man said weakly, The benefits of our attack on the town are really great. Kill less civilians. As long as the nobles do not resist and have no grudges against us. We are willing to let them go. However, we have to take away the property. There is a lack of clothes and clothing here. After all, we still have to survive. His voice was a little low. After this kind of battle to capture a small town, the Lord Army needs to appease the soldiers. They will search for all the ownerless things in the town. Of course, they will not let go even if they have owners. As long as the owner is dead, then it becomes an ownerless thing. The nobles are better off. But when this kind of thing happens to small town residents, everyone has almost no way to survive. It happens every time. The bearded man rubbed his messy hair. But it affected the wound? causing him to gasp in pain. Bring them out in the hope that they can survive? Big Beard said. Serdak felt that what he said was a bit high-sounding and expressed disbelief in his rhetoric. The bearded man wanted to smile awkwardly, but the pain from the wound only made him twitch the corner of his mouth. He lay honestly on the treatment bed made of wooden boxes. In addition, our rebels also need to replenish fresh blood. These children are our future. Serdak glanced outside. Through the gap in the door curtain, and saw many young soldiers outside, and asked, Don't your soldiers here raise more children? The bearded Edgar shook his head and said with a wry smile, How can I raise children if I can't support myself? Then the bearded man said, We often have to fight with the Lord's army. If we have to be careful to raise a child every time we have sex, or simply have the bond of children in the camp, how can these soldiers fight the Lord's army on the battlefield? What we pursue is freedom and faith. Soldak continued to ask, Then what is your belief? The bearded Edgar looked forward to the future, his eyes a little wandering, and said, Of course we will overthrow McDonald's Lord Army. At least we can give all the poor people a piece of land. Serdak almost said intern's honor. He paused and then complained. Well, okay, this is a good idea. Although it is a good idea. Your strength is really average. But the bearded Edgar smiled as usual and said, It's okay. It will get better gradually in the future. Chapter 983 Mermaid Probably this kind of battle scene is already familiar to the rebel soldiers. After they cleaned the battlefield, they lit two huge fires at dusk. The wood burned quickly, and thick smoke billowed out. The fire and thick smoke engulfed all the corpses on the woodpile, and there was a disgusting smell in the air. There was basically no wind in the valley, which made the smell of corpse oil even stronger. The rebel scouts who ran out for reconnaissance came back and reported that the cavalry battalion chose to leave the mountainous area overnight and did not stay nearby. It was completely dark, and the women and children in the camp were responsible for lighting a fire to prepare dinner. The dinner consisted of boiled horse meat, and the wounded also needed to drink some broth. Moreover, these horses that died on the battlefield belonged to the Lord's Cavalry Regiment. The rebel soldiers have no feelings for these horses, so they eat the horse meat without any psychological burden. They can quickly stabilize their emotions after a battle. Most of the rebel soldiers are sitting in the camp to rest. There were several large tents and more than 40 simple wooden huts set up in this camp. Before this battle broke out, there were almost 1,200 people in this camp, including the bearded Edgar who brought him from Takale Town. 300 town residents returned. 
after a battle. There are now less than 700 people left in the rebel camp, including more than 300 wounded. A group of rebels were sitting next to the iron pot. They were holding wooden bowls and eating horse meat from the soup before the blood on their bodies had completely dried. The atmosphere was somewhat silent, and a rebel soldier whispered to his companions, I thought I wouldn't make it through today. Guy, Herman, and Moslo are all dead. If the magician's followers hadn't helped, we wouldn't have been able to stop those cavalry. The companion picked up a large piece of horse meat from the wooden bowl and said vaguely, It was quiet again. A young woman poured a pot of chopped horse meat into the rolling soup pot, and she didn't know who said in the crowd, Acilia, sing us a song. The young woman did not hesitate, put down the tub, sat in the crowd, and said to everyone, Then I will sing a Scarborough song. Immediately there were protests from all around. Don't listen to such sad songs. That one is worse than the red-haired girl. Yes, let's sing the red-haired girl. Everyone agreed. Soon bursts of melodious singing came from the camp. Serdak could hear it clearly even in the tent. The wounded man lying on the treatment bed also opened his closed eyes, and his nervousness slowly eased. Singing at night is probably one of the few spices in their lives. Life in the rebel camp was very difficult, and supplies were quite scarce. The wooden houses in the camp were old and decaying, with mushrooms almost growing on the edges. This kind of wooden house is very simple to build in the forest area. You only need to dig a square pit in the forest, put a shelf on it with logs, then lay some arm-thick logs on it, and finally cover it with thick moss. Become a wooden house that can protect you from wind and rain. There were several large iron pots propped outside the wooden house, and the horse meat soup cooked in them gave off a faint fishy smell. The bearded Edgar introduced to the magician Abai that if the rebels had not just attacked the town of Takarai and obtained a large amount of living supplies, the situation here would actually be worse. Of course, most of the supplies seized in Takalai town have been transported to the rear. This camp is just a stronghold of the rebels here. Serdak had been busy in the tent. There were so many injured people that he almost never left the tent. At the beginning, only Sia helped Serdak. And Samira joined in after collecting the loot. Obviously, Samira is more experienced in this kind of thing. Not only did he line up the wounded waiting for treatment outside the tent, he also made a detailed screening of their injuries. The seriously injured ones, who were about to die could be carried to come ahead. She will also make some preparations in advance such as checking the specific injuries of the injured and taking Thea to clean the wounds. It is much easier to do these things with a water magician by your side. Sometimes when I meet some wounded rebels with wounds in their lower abdomen or thighs, Sia feels a little embarrassed when she sees the dejected third leg. After carrying the wounded person into the tent, when the two of them walked out, Samira raised her light red eyes and asked Sia strangely, Sia, are you really the Janice clan? Huh? Thea looked up at Sammy in confusion. Mila came to her ear with a wicked look on her face. Her hoarse voice had a hint of magnetism. Since you are Janna, why did you see the human body? Still blushing? Thea immediately lowered her head and blushed so much that she wanted to bleed. However, she then asked Samira in a low voice. Don't you feel embarrassed? What's so embarrassing? Half of the blood in my body belongs to elves. Samira turned her head away, raised her chin, and said to Thea with some pride. After saying that, he walked towards the end of the queue of wounded people. Thea secretly rubbed her red cheeks, took a deep breath, and kept hinting to herself, Thea, you are Janna. You are Janna. There is nothing to be ashamed of. Huh? Do not be shy. Thea, come on. Give him a hydrotherapy treatment. This guy's wound was bandaged without even cleaning it. Does he still want your leg? Samira's voice was hoarse. And she scolded the rebel soldier so much that he didn't dare to respond. When she was in the Independent Cavalry Battalion, Samira had nearly a thousand archers under her command. Most of these archers are young people from indigenous tribes who have no rules at all. To make them understand the rules in the military camp, Samira often curses them. The bearded Edgar always thought of the magician Albert and asked him to stay in the wooden house in the camp. Seeing that Samira and Sia were both acting as Serdak's assistants, they arranged for a young woman to take care of Avid. Another group of more than 300 rebel troops arrived at night, and filled the camp to capacity. In the tent, Serdak wrapped two whittled wooden boards tightly around the rebel's thigh with a linen bandage, firmly fixing the fractured area, seeing with his own eyes that the skin on his thigh healed quickly under the holy light spell. The rebel soldier completely believed that he could recover quickly if he broke his leg. Serdak warned the injured rebel soldier, Be careful. Try not to exercise while the leg injury is not healed. Once the bone seam is misaligned, 
The leg will grow crooked at least. Sometimes it will be bow-legged. Sometimes it will be like this. It's a duck leg. If it's serious, the misalignment of the bones will cause bone spurs to affect your walking. Every step you take will cause excruciating pain. And you may have to break it before you can reattach it. The rebel soldier was so frightened by Soldak's words that he lay on the bed and dared not move at all. Sardak finally wiped the blood stains on his hands with a handkerchief and said to the rebel soldiers, Okay, let's do this for now. Then he walked out of the tent and called to his companions waiting outside to carry the rebel soldiers out. Thank you, Lord Knight. Before leaving, the rebel soldiers thanked Sardak. Easy to do. Sardak pinched the corners of his eyes tiredly and shouted to the outside. Next one. It was not until the moment before dawn that all the wounded who needed emergency treatment were dealt with. When Soldak walked out of the tent and stretched his sore and stiff arms at the door, he discovered that the door of the tent was filled with various things, including not only wild fruits, flowers, and bird eggs from the mountains, but also some gold and silver jewelry, etc. When Samira saw that Sardak had finished his work, he jumped onto a big tree without looking back. He didn't even take off his leather armor and lay down on the hammock that had been prepared. Thea dragged her tired body and rearranged Serdak's tent. There was also a large pot of boiling water on the bonfire outside. Jana takes a bath twice every morning and evening to keep their skin from drying out. When she walked out of the tent, Serdak stood outside and said to her, Do you want to flush? Thea stood next to Soldak, blinked her charming blue eyes, pointed to the other side of the forest, and said to Soldak, I saw a mountain stream over there. Can I take a dip in the stream there? Sia asked. Yes, but please pay attention to safety. Soldak agreed without thinking. Thea asked more cautiously. Can you stay over there? Uh, okay. Since the little girl had been busy in the tent with him all night, although Soldak wanted to sleep, he could only bite the bullet and agree. Sure enough, after passing through the woods, there was a small stream not far away. Shia took Soldak upstream for a while and found a low waterfall. The water here was deep enough and very clear. Shia couldn't wait to slide. Get into the pool. Sardak found a rock by the pool, sat on the rock, and looked around. Thea transformed into a mermaid. The three-meter-long body was fluttering in the small pool. The huge, colorful fish tail was very beautiful. She kept the appearance of a mermaid, with light green scales on both sides of her arms and ribs, as if she was wearing an exquisite tight-fitting coat. Only her neck, chest, and lower abdomen were made of delicate skin as white as jade, and her face was full of purity in her mermaid form. This small pool was not that big, and she was somewhat unable to writhe in it, so she soaked her sexy fish tail in the water, with her upper body exposed out of the water, and her arms rested on the rock where Serdak rested. Blinking her big eyes like lake water, she said to Soldak with admiration, I have never seen a lord who is so easygoing like you. In my hometown, all the noble lords have aloof and stern faces. I don't know how annoying they are. It's as if they don't show that. It looks like he is no longer a lord. Serdak was a little sleepy. He was sitting on the boulder, adjusting the sacred power in his body. After becoming a second-level powerhouse, he discovered that his body could directly absorb the sacred elements from the outside world when releasing his potential. This was something Serdak did not expect. It was originally thought that the power of elements needs to pass through the body of the elemental contract partner as a bridge before it can enter the caster's body from the elemental world. But when Serdak was promoted to the second rank, for some reason, he didn't sign a contract partner at all. Now, as long as the sacred power in his body is consumed, he will release the angel, so that the body can be quickly filled with sacred power. So this night, apart from being tired, the sacred power in his body was not depleted due to overuse. At this time, Sia's upper body was lying on the boulder, and she came over to chat. Soldak had no choice but to turn his head and said to her, Well, shouldn't a noble lord be like that? And sometimes you have to show the majesty of a lord in order to convince your subordinates. In the early morning before dawn, a light mist gradually began to appear beside the mountain forest and stream. Can I call you captain like Samira and the others? Sia raised her head and said, her lips pursed slightly, like attractive petals, but she still moved up a little bit. When Serdak lowered his head, he happened to see. Uh? Of course. Soldak felt that he was even a little down just now. His heart was pounding hard, and he turned his head away. Sia's lips were close to his cheek, and the hot, moist and fragrant breath made him feel itchy in his ears. Sia took the opportunity to whisper in his ear again. 
Captain, I think life in the sea is quite boring. I like this adventurous life. I don't want to go back to the seventh sea for the time being. Can I stay and become your follower? I'm good at water magic. And I can also endure hardships. The archangel in the sea of spiritual consciousness prayed with his hands in front of his chest, exuding a faint divine light. Serdek wakes up. When Thea said these words, there seemed to be a hint of siren song in her voice, which made him irresistible. But she didn't seem to have any bad intentions. She probably just wanted Soldak to agree to this request. Serdak reached out and stroked Sia's long, soft, thick, seaweed-colored wavy hair, and said, If you really want to stay, of course I welcome it. Who would refuse a water magician? But when you return to the deserted land in the future, you will know what a luxury water is to the people there. The environment is not suitable for you. I heard from Gulitam that you built a big dam there. Sia's eyes smiled like crescent moons. What a talkative ogre. Well, I won't go back to Helanza City for the time being. If you regret it later, tell me. Serdak extended his hand to Thea and said, Then you are welcome to officially join us. Thea Magician, who knew that Thea didn't shake hands with him at all, but held his hand and let his hand caress her smooth face. The etiquette of the Janice clan is really special. Soldak inevitably thought in his heart. The morning breeze carried a faint mist in the forest, and footsteps and voices could be heard not far away. A group of women from the rebel camp came to the stream to fetch water. Sia then turned around and rolled back into the pool. Chapter 984 Invitation Every morning, Serdak practices shield swinging and slashing. Only through consistent practice can the body subconsciously accept these movements. So, he only slept in the tent for a short time, then crawled out and found a clearing in the forest to exercise. The rebel soldier carried a fan of horse meat and cut it into strips on a tree stump not far from Serdak. In the eyes of these rebels, Serdak, Sia, Samira and Gulitam are all followers of the noble magician Avid. Serdak had been busy treating so many wounded people all night. When all the rebels saw him, they would stop and say H, low to him. And they all respected him very much. The horse meat picked up from the battlefield yesterday will be salted today and smoked to store it for a long time. For the rebels who were short of food, this meat was a rare good thing. But it was a bit of a waste of salt. Good morning. Night, Serdak. A child ran out of the camp, squatted beside Soldak, watched him chopping with curiosity, and took the initiative to greet him. He once took refuge in the manner of the magician Avid, and met the knight who personally handed him a bowl of oatmeal. Good morning. Serdak responded casually. I can learn swordsmanship from you, the boy said with courage. Of course. But before that, you need to have a sword. Serdak stopped, walked to a big tree, broke off a branch, peeled off the bark with a dagger, and whittled the stick into a wooden sword without a guard, and handed it to a man with a face full of joy, the boy, and corrected his posture of holding the sword, letting him slash into the air. I thought this would be enough. But Serdak didn't expect that children would continue to join in. Serdak chopped several more wooden sticks and also wanted to cut them into wooden swords. When other children came after hearing the news, a rebel soldier who happened to be passing by came over and said gently to these children, Okay, children, don't pester night, Serdak. You need to go to the camp to have breakfast. This kind of meat porridge is difficult to eat in normal times. Let night Serdak take a good rest. In order to save our injured man stayed up all night. Although the children were a little reluctant, they still ran away obediently. The rebel warrior looked like a captain. Serdak nodded to him and continued practicing his sword swing in the woodland. Night, Serdak. I really want to thank you. The captain probably made a special trip here to express his gratitude to Serdak. Serdak didn't stop and just said casually, Okay, I've heard enough words of thanks. If you really want to thank me, you might as well take me around. The captain said with some embarrassment, I have to ask Captain Edgar for instructions on this. He has the final say in this camp. After saying that, he turned around and ran away quickly, then ran back not long after and said excitedly to Soldek. Captain Edgar agreed. Then you can come with us. We are going to patrol the surrounding area. There are eight members in this group of rebel fighters. They do not have long leather boots. Their calves are wrapped with some strips of cloth. Some ropes hang around their waists. They carry hunting bows on their backs and have daggers tied to their legs. Activities in damp woods make movement easier. In fact, the route they took was to walk in a large circle around the camp, explore the surroundings, and collect all the beast traps arranged along the way and hang them on their waists. Occasionally, a grouse or hare can be picked up on the cliff. 
They have many traps around this forest. And it seems that they often eat these small animals in the jungle. Are these clips going to be put away? Serdek asked. He followed their team. And the surrounding mountains looked very dense. It looked like a mountain call. With only the valley road extending in. Yeah. The pair of rebel captains replied. Then he added. The camp here has been discovered by the Lord's army. And their cavalry can rush in directly through the passage in the valley. It is no longer safe here. And we are ready to start moving. Serdek asked. Want to leave here? If you want to move to another camp. This place is actually very close to Tinley Town. Carts can come in, and it can be convenient for transporting supplies. But it is not safe here. We can't deal with the rebel cavalry yet. The rebel commander explained. Other camps are much further away. And carriages can't get in. Serdek followed him, and asked as he walked. What do you think is the specific difference between you, and that group of Lord's army? The woodland was covered with moss, and looked wet and slippery. The rebel commander stopped and thought for a moment before saying, The main difference lies in the equipment, such as weapons and armor. Also, their squadron leaders are all constructed knights. They are well trained and everyone is very powerful. A rebel soldier behind him added, We captured a batch in Takalai town. They should be stronger after training for a period of time. In the camp, the magician Abide put on his magic robe under the service of the young woman and slowly walked out of the wooden house. Your Excellency, Magician Avid, how did you sleep last night? The bearded Edgar was already waiting outside the wooden house. And when he saw Avid, he took the initiative to say H, low, not bad. Magician Avi glanced at the young woman next to him and thought he should find an opportunity to ask her if she was willing to leave the plain of Ganbu and follow him to Benis City. The bearded man deliberately did not look at his infatuated eyes, but asked directly, Your Excellency, the magician Avid, have you ever thought about joining our rebel army? Magician Avid was slightly startled. He had never thought about this. Give me some time to think about it. Magician Avid rolled his eyes and found an excuse to delay. Avid wanted to ask Serdak what he thought, whether he came out to help them on impulse, or whether he wanted to help them until the end. He couldn't make the decision on this matter. The bearded man could not help but feel a little disappointed when he heard the prevarication of the Avid magician, seeing the disappointment in the bearded eyes. Avi pondered for a moment and said, Um, do you mind if I go to your other camps? Of course, the bearded man replied. The magician Avid said to Edgar, I like to travel around on adventures and do something different. But that doesn't mean I have to do meaningless things. For me, what I pursue is to realize my self-worth. Yes, that's it. You want me to join you. But I also want to see if you are worthy of my help. I hope to see the real situation of your life in the rear instead of just showing off because of my arrival. If that's the case, I'm sorry. I will definitely refuse. Chapter 985 Abbott's Request When the patrol returned to camp, almost every rebel soldier was carrying an array of beast traps. They all had a few wild game hanging on their waists. Of course, taking these wild game back to the camp wouldn't actually solve much of the problem. Counting the 300 troops who came over to support in the middle of the night yesterday, there are probably nearly a thousand people in this camp. With so many people, you can imagine how much food they have to eat every day. Serdak returned to the camp with the patrol team, where the rebels had already begun to pack their bags. The wounded who could not walk lay on stretchers. The wounded who could walk were lightly packed, and the uninjured rebels had to carry heavy supplies. The leading troops have carried the wounded and left the camp one after another. The camp was cleaned up, and except for the wooden houses, almost everything else was taken away by the rebels. The magician Avid was standing at the entrance of the valley outside the camp. When he saw Serdak walking out of the woods with the patrol, he quickly walked up to Serdak and greeted the soldiers of the patrol team warmly. All rebels showed the utmost respect for this warm-hearted magician. When the rebel soldiers of the patrol team walked back to the camp, Avid quickly pulled Serdak into the nearby woods and said to him with a slightly embarrassed look, This Count Serdak, the leader of the rebel army, and they suddenly came to me in the morning and actually invited us to join their rebel army and also invited us to visit their rear. I thought we could go and have a look, since there is nothing to do now. Samira followed behind and said curiously, I saw that female rebel soldier walking out of your wooden house this morning. She seemed to be arranging her clothes as she walked. Did you really do nothing last night? Abbott's face turned red when Samira said it. And he said, Nora just saw that I had difficulty moving. So she took care of me for the whole night. I swear to the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty has abandoned you. Your Majesty the Magician, Samira continued. 
Thea who was following Samira was in a good mood. Just hiding behind and snickering. Serdek glanced at the rebel camp. The bearded Edgar was looking around. Seemingly looking for the magician Avid. Standing next to the bearded Edgar was a young woman with very fair skin who was explaining something to him in a low voice. Soldek smiled and said to Edgar, I just want to know more about this rebel army. If it is really resisting Earl MacDonald's lord army, maybe we can provide some support. Give them a break. I think so too, Avid said, waving his fist excitedly. He knew that he couldn't do this without Serdak nodding. Seeing Serdak's supportive attitude, he didn't know what to say. Magician Avid immediately expressed his thoughts. If there is an opportunity to set up a temporary portal behind them, then the rebels can establish contact with the Bena city side. Although the temporary teleportation array is too expensive and Bena province cannot send troops directly, I think the House of Representatives will definitely support the rebels. And I can also go to the Magic Guild and the Astrologer Guild to find connections. The Black Magic Hermitage here is so rampant. Shouldn't the Magic Guild law enforcement group send some magicians over? After he finished speaking, he looked at Saldek proudly. Thea narrowed her big lake blue eyes, poked her head out from behind Samira, and asked boldly with a smile. Magic Avid, I'm also curious, what exactly did Ms. Nola perform on you last night? What kind of magic? Avid's face turned red again, but his eyes were a little wandering. Obviously, he must have had some different experiences last night. You must know that Avid is a space magician who is not short of money. Soldak thought for a while and immediately decided, I will do as you say. Let's check their rear first. If they're not worthy of our investment, then we will find an opportunity to leave secretly. If they perform well, then we will return to Bena City and act separately. You go and convince the Magic Union and the House of Representatives. I will report this matter to the Bena Military Department. Hearing what Serdak said, the magician Avid wanted to hug Serdak. But when he opened his arms, his chest injury was involved. And the movement stopped abruptly. He could only cover his chest and said, You it's great to be okay with that. At this time, the two-headed ogre also came from the camp. He walked into the woods and asked, What are you talking about here? The magician Avid immediately said to Gulaitam, We are going to follow this group of rebels to their rear to have a look. Avid was injured. So the two-headed ogre usually carried him on his back. Therefore, with Avid's deliberate flattery, the two got along very harmoniously. Gulaitam groaned, then realized what he was doing and asked, Are you talking about these rebels? Serdak patted Gulaitam's arm on the side and corrected, Don't say that when you go out. Lord MacDonald's army is the real rebel army now. The bearded Edgar saw the magician Avid walking into the camp from the mouth of the valley. His face was very calm, probably because he had discussed it with his followers. Then he looked at the magician Avid expectantly. Avid asked the bearded man, Captain Edgar, when do we set off? The bearded man breathed a sigh of relief and immediately ordered Nora, who was standing next to him. Miss Nora, go and help magician Avid pack his luggage, and I will prepare again and try to leave the camp before noon. After saying that, the bearded man trotted away to arrange other things in the camp. However, the young woman stayed and cautiously approached Avid. Seeing that neither Samira nor Thea responded, she supported the magician Avid's arm with both hands, and most of her body was pressed against him. On the body of Avid magician, Serdak carefully looked at the young woman, who was called Nora by the bearded man. She had delicate skin and white and slender hands. She had obviously never done any rough work. And she knew how to watch people's movements. She was probably from a small noble family. Woman. Although he looks ordinary at first glance. He is very attractive. Moreover. Her figure hidden under the long skirt also looked very plump. She led the magician Ivet into the wooden house. Serdak didn't follow either. He asked Gulaitam and Samira to pack up the tents. And then took Sia to the rebel camp to check on the injured soldier's injuries. And check if anyone's injuries had worsened. Chapter 986 The Other Side of the Mountain This time, as he set off with the rebel army, there was no need for Gulaitam to carry the avid magician on his back. The bearded Edgar arranged for two rebel soldiers to carry the magician avid on a stretcher. Nora accompanied the magician avid. She took good care of the magician avid along the way, which made Sir Duck saved a lot of trouble. The mountain road is difficult to walk. It is hot and humid in the jungle. The gravel and soil underfoot are very soft and have a certain slope. Sometimes when you step on it, your whole body will slide down along with the sand and gravel. Although the soldiers walking in front had already carved a path in the forest. When passing halfway up the mountain, there was a steep and unclimbable vertical mountain wall on the left. 
and a 100-meter high valley on the right, with surging rapids at the bottom of the valley. The mountain road is very narrow, and a war horse will block the mountain road. If there is a slight problem at the front, we have to stop and wait later. Opposite the cliff is a dense forest. From time to time, you can see a group of fire-tailed monkeys jumping and running quickly on the top of the trees. They are not afraid of people at all. When they see the people on the mountain wall from a distance, they let out provocative roars and bared their teeth. It was so arrogant that the horses in the team became restless. The soldiers could only put blindfolds on them so that they could only see the road ahead. We kept walking like this until dark. In fact, we didn't go very far in this mountain forest. A series of rumbling sounds were heard not far away, and the entire mountain wall shook violently. After a while, the earthquake subsided. The team was completely at a standstill. The ogre Gulitum seemed a little irritable, but he could only sit next to the cliff. He mainly didn't eat dinner, and his stomach was protesting to him. He could only eat some scones, lunch and meat, and marching rations here. Food. But these things are currently completely unable to satisfy the two-headed ogre's appetite. Gulitum picked up a stone the size of a wash basin and waved his arms, like the group of fire-tailed monkeys on the opposite side, and threw it at it. A fire-tailed monkey couldn't avoid it, and was immediately smashed to pieces by a stone the size of a wash basin. The stone hit the tree trunk and shattered. The fire-tailed monkey's body was like a balloon filled with water, and it exploded with a pop sound. Colorful internal organs hanging on a tree scared the other fire-tailed monkeys and fled in all directions. There were no rivers along the way, and Sia couldn't take a bath along the way, which made it a little uncomfortable. She could only stand next to the cliff and nail the water-gathering rune board to the rock wall. The water-gathering rune board kept dripping raindrops. She stood on the edge of the cliff and was soaked in the rain to keep her skin moist enough. Dense raindrops hit her pretty face, and the gauze on her face accidentally fell off, revealing a touching and beautiful face. The rebels nearby were shocked when they saw Sia's beautiful face. Magician Avid didn't even raise his head. He was lying on the stretcher at the front of the team and chatting quietly with Nora with a calm expression. As a second-level eagle eye, Samira is completely unaffected by such cliffs. She can easily climb to the top of the mountain with her bare hands. It was almost dark before news came from the front. It was a huge boulder that had rolled down and got stuck in the rock crevice, blocking the passage. The ogres could not get past the horses and warriors blocking the road on such a narrow cliff mountain road. But Suldak and Samira had no problem at all. So they let Thea and Gulitum stay where they were. Samira climbed the cliff to lead the way, leading Suldak to climb over a cliff of nearly 300 meters. Serdak finally saw that at the corner of the mountain wall in front of him, there was a mountain crevice that opened to both sides. The team wanted to pass through this gap. The mountain trail here is a little wider, but the width is very limited. Serdak and Samira pushed forward and saw a huge boulder stuck in the gap, surrounded by some fine stones, which seemed to have killed several soldiers. A group of rebel fighters are pounding the rock with miner's hose, preparing to break it up bit by bit to open up the mountain road. This rock is almost six or seven meters high, according to their efficiency. They may not be able to open the passage tonight. The bearded Edgar was directing the dispatch over there. Soldak walked up and asked, Is there anything I can do to help? Edgar rubbed his forehead and said with some distress, I didn't expect that the huge boulder hanging above would fall down at this time. If it can't be cleaned up tonight, I will probably have to spend the night on this rock wall going up. It's a pity that Gulitum can't get through. Otherwise the ogre would be better at breaking rocks. Serdak and Samira looked at each other. Is there any good way? Edgar asked anxiously. Serdak thought for a while and said, Our companion is blocked in the back. I believe he can handle it. Now what we need to consider is how he can get here from the back. Samira suggested at this time. If you want Gulitum to come over, everyone needs to get out of this narrow mountain road. I can climb to the top of the boulder, throw a ladder down, and all the soldiers crowded here can use the ladder to climb over the boulder, and then push the horses blocking the way down the cliff, so that you can make way for Gulitum to come over. Captain Edgar, what do you think? Cernak asked Captain Edgar. Edgar was obviously reluctant to part with those horses. But if they were blocked here and the Lord's army caught up from behind, the losses might become even greater. Okay, we can't stay stuck here forever, said the bearded Edgar. Samira didn't even climb with her bare hands. She just relied on the excellent jumping ability of her legs to easily climb up the six-meter-high boulder by stepping on a few convex points. She squatted on the boulder and a soft ladder hung from it. This soft ladder is prepared for the armed thunder rhino. 
if you want to board the platform on the back of the Arm Thunder Rhino. In addition to going through this kind of soft ladder, you have to climb the shelves with bare hands. As the captain of the Archer Brigade, Samira also carries several such ladders in her magic waste bag. A group of rebel soldiers, under the command of the bearded Edgar, climbed up and over the boulder. The rebel soldiers were reluctant to kill the war horses loaded with supplies. At this critical moment, these rebel soldiers actually thought of tying the war horses with ropes and hanging them on the cliff to get out of the way. Have the two-headed ogre come from behind. By the time Gulitem caught up from behind the team, it was already midnight. It turns out this big guy is blocking the road. The two-headed ogre took the miner's hoe and let out a paw sound. Black totems crawled all over his body at a speed visible to the naked eye. His eyes also became blood red. And his skin became like stones. The miner's hoe in his hand waved. When you get out, the gravel falls off like pieces of scales. You are bloodthirsty just to chisel a stone? Serdak put one hand on his forehead and exclaimed that the Ogre Brothers are really real. It's rare to see them working so hard in a normal battle. However, the Ogre's method of chipping away at the stone was also a test for these miner's hoes. After he used up five miner's hoes in a row, the giant rock was finally completely shattered by the Ogre's brute force. As for the broken stones, they were transported out of the cracks and thrown into the mountain stream by beating drums and passing flowers. In the early morning, the passage was finally successfully opened. However, when the sky got dark, the team regrouped and set off. After walking through this gap in the mountain wall that was several kilometers long, the eyes finally opened up, as if all the mountains, rivers and rivers were close at their feet. The terrain here seems to be very high. If you look around, the entire forest below your feet forms a sea of green. A winding river is hidden in it. Countless tributaries converge together in an intricate way. You can actually see flocks of birds in the sky. It seems as if this mountain completely separates the two worlds. The north and the south. Walking all the way down the winding and rugged mountain road. The road here is very easy to walk. And when halfway up the mountain, Sardak saw several rebel camps hidden in the jungle. The exceptions are all built near rivers with easy access to water. Everything else here is fine. Large areas of fertile land can be reclaimed in the forest. And water resources are relatively abundant. The only threatening beasts in the jungle are some jungle tigers and poisonous snakes. They are not a big threat to us. The only disadvantage is that it is isolated from the world. Supplies are very scarce. The bearded Edgar said with squinting eyes and a look of longing. Then he pointed to several camps down the mountain and said, We have five camps built here. But this is not our rear area. Isn't this here already? Soldat couldn't help but asked curiously. He didn't expect the rebel army to be so large. Of course. We have only opened up several camps here in the past two years. And our rear area will continue to go south. Edgar said proudly. And then he took out a map from his arms. Pointing to the southwest corner of the map. He said. It's right here. Soldak also has a printed plane of this kind in his hand. Which is much clearer than the one in Edgar's hand. The southern edge of the Gonbu plain? Sardak asked doubtfully. Edgar nodded and said proudly. Well, that's where the Lord's army can't touch in the true sense. We have established three free towns there. Serdak touched his nose and fell into deep thought for a while. The team entered a camp by the river. The women living in the camp led the migrants into newly built wooden houses. It seems that preparations have been made here. The vacant wooden house is very clean. The wooden bed and wooden table inside have some moisture from the trees. It seems that they were built not long ago. The size of this camp is almost the same as that of a tribe. It originally had about a thousand people but now more than 700 people have moved in from the camp on the other side of the mountain. The camp seems a bit crowded, and almost all the wooden houses are occupied. There is also a group of rebel fighters building new wooden huts in the camp. Since the camp is close to the river and the terrain is low, we cannot continue to dig holes in the ground to build the wooden house. It is estimated that the water will be dug out with a few shovels. To build the wooden house, we need a moisture-proof still building. After everyone settled in this camp, Serdak walked around freely in the camp. Chapter 987 Rebel Camp Samira walked along the river. The dense trees almost drooped into the river. This was a low-lying plain, and the river flow was extremely slow. Several older children stood barefooted on the branches of trees, extending into the river by the river. They held long-handled harpoons tied with daggers and wooden sticks in their hands, waiting under the shade of the trees for the fish in the river to swim over and eat them. The frog legs hanging in the river. The fish in the river are not too big but they are very silly. From time to time, 
There will be fish coming up. The boy plunged the long-handled harpoon into the river. And there was a dong sound on the water. The coder let it run away again. The boy cursed. Then he pulled the long-handled harpoon out of the river, squatted on the horizontal branch again, and waited quietly for the swimming fish to come up. There was also a fish basket woven from wicker hanging around his waist. Judging from the heavy weight of the fish basket, there must be fish in it. Samira stood by the river and said to the boy, You can't catch many fish like this. Not only is it not accurate enough, but it's also not fast enough. And the range of movement is too large. The moment you make a move, the fish on the water will the reflection has given you away. The boy frowned and turned to look at Samira. When he saw a strange woman who was a few years older than him, she was wearing exquisite black leather armor with magnificent and strange patterns on it. And she was carrying a sharp bow behind her back. She immediately put away her contempt. But he still said a little unconvinced. That's easy for you to say. Do you want to try it? Her long leather boots stepped firmly on the horizontal branches protruding into the river. Samira stood beside the boy with excellent balance. She lowered her head and looked at the fish swimming in the river before taking out the sky strike bow on her back. Shook the boy and said, I use this. The child looked at Samira's sharp bow with Indy and said, Compared to your longbow, mine looks like a toy. It's just a toy. Why do you say it's like a toy? Samira looked at the boy with a half smile. The boy was so angry that he pouted his mouth and refused to talk to Sammy anymore. Mila didn't care, pulled out an arrow and looked towards the river. Are you a ranger? The boy was once again attracted to the dagger with golden patterns on her thigh and couldn't help but ask. That's right. Samira didn't say that she was a second level Hawkeye. Two water flowers suddenly appeared on the slowly flowing river. The two water flowers appeared almost at the same time in no particular order. It seemed that the shining scales could be clearly seen in the water flowers. Samira shot out the arrow in her hand almost at the same time like lightning. It was obviously one arrow. But it turned into two arrows when it shot out of her hand. The arrows split in the middle and hit two water splashes a little lower. The arrow entered the water, bringing up a string of white bubbles. After waiting for a while, the wooden arrow emerged from the water with two small swimming fish and slowly moved towards them along the river. The boy quickly picked up the fish in the river with a long handle in his hand and asked with surprise. You're so cool. How did you do that? Samira took the wet arrow, untied the fish from it, and threw it into the boy's fish basket. She rinsed the arrow in the river water before putting it back into the arrow pot. You just asked me a question. Now it's my turn to ask you, Samira said. The boy said impatiently. Then ask. How long have you lived here? Samira asked the boy with a smile. It's been several months. The boy thought for a moment before saying. Samira said it was fine. And then said, This is archery. It requires continuous practice to achieve such accuracy. First of all, your hands must be very stable. Secondly, let me see that your arm strength is not enough. At the same time, you must practice your eyesight. Just stare. It's not enough to catch the fish in the water. You have to watch the birds in the sky. Samira asked again. Where are you from? The boy replied without thinking. The town of Ronhild is just south of this jungle. How can I improve my arm strength? The boy asked seriously. Stretch your arms flat like this. And then hang two stones that you can hold on to your wrists. Do this for an hour every morning. And your arms will soon become stronger. While Samira was exchanging new tips on archery with the boy. Other boys who were fishing by the river also joined in. Serdak walked to the edge of the camp. Where a group of women were dealing with a patch of tangled bushes in the forest. After cutting these bushes, they cleared a clearing in the forest. Several men climbed up to the high crown of the tree with hatchets and cut down some branches and leaves at the top of the crown. These trees are so dense that no light can penetrate them unless they are cut down. Once there was enough light, the men moved in some logs and started to build a tree house using these trees as the main supports. They first skillfully propped up three pillars and connected them to the big tree to form a square platform. They laid a layer of thick wooden boards on the platform, and then continued to use some wooden boards to surround the walls. They are very skilled in building this kind of wooden house. A wooden house has three rooms and a terrace that can overlook the distance. The spiral staircase is also built on the trunk of a big tree, which is strong and beautiful. When building a roof, the trunks of big trees will also be avoided to prevent the tree house from leaking rain. The men are continuing to build wooden houses here, and Serdak is standing in the forest clearing below. He roughly counted the wooden houses in the camp and found that there were probably more than 200 wooden houses of this kind in the camp. 
at the construction speed of these men. They could build two wooden houses in one day, which basically solved the accommodation problem for everyone. Why are you still building these tree houses? Soldek raised his head and asked the man standing on the platform using a claw hammer to hammer nails into the wooden boards. The man raised his stubby eyebrows, glanced at the woman cleaning the bushes over there, showed a vulgar expression that everyone knew, and said with a smile to Soldak, Of course, the house is not enough to live in, and no one wants to squeeze in, in a room. The partner who was working with him on the other side also put his head in and said, And more people are going to move in here. Soldak continued to ask, Do you mind if I come up and take a look? The man spread his hands and said very casually, Whatever. If you can bring the following two pieces of wood, we will be very grateful. Serdak lowered his head, put the two pieces of wood on his shoulders, and walked along the spiral staircase to the platform. The man took the two pieces of wood, looked at Soldak wearing decent leather armor, and asked Serdak, I seem to have never seen you before. Oh, I came from outside with Edgar, Soldak explained. After speaking, he stood on the platform of the tree house and looked around. This kind of tree house really has an atmosphere that is very close to nature. Smelling the aroma of oil among the trees. I seem to relax a lot. Are there frequent wars here? Serdak asked the man. Not here. Normally we have to get out of the mountain to see the Lord's army. The man pointed to the other end of the board and asked Serdak to help him. Serdak nailed the plank to the trunk of the tree with color and said. Life here seems to be pretty good. Seeing that Serdak was not annoying at all and was willing to help. The man started chatting with him. It's just that the camp here is relatively primitive and the supplies for daily life are relatively scarce. But things will get better gradually in the future. A group of rebel fighters traveled downstream, hunting whatever they encountered in the jungle. Birds perched on the treetops. Eggs in bird nests. Badgers. Pigs. Hedgehogs hiding in the bushes. Snakes hanging on the branches of vines. Everything in sight will be caught. And everything that can bleed will be drained from the body. The blood in my body hangs around my waist. There are almost 200 people in this pair of rebels. They are a hunting team that hunts in the forest and provides food for the entire camp. Because of their presence, the area within one kilometer around this woodland has at most a few mosquitoes. And it is difficult to even see a grouse. In order to hunt more prey, they had to travel farther. Sometimes I go out in the morning and return the next evening. Sia soaked in the river upstream, diving her head into the water to prevent others from seeing her three-colored fish tail. She waited until the group of hunters had completely moved away from the river before resurfacing. With such a deep and wide river, she could swim a few laps in the river to stretch her body. On the other side of the river, there was a low bush full of berries. A group of women squatted in the bush with baskets, picking the red berries. A large tree that had been deliberately cut down lay across the river. The branches on the crown of the tree had been cleared away. The trunk was covered with a layer of wooden boards. There were handrails on both sides. There was a one-meter-high fence on one side of the root of the tree. Climbing the ladder, this design concept that combines with nature, makes this wooden bridge full of fun. After swimming in the river, Sia found a secluded place to go ashore, turned into a human, put on a black robe, her long wet hair spread behind her, and stepped on the slightly damp rotten leaves with her bare feet. On the soil, the dead branches on the ground were somewhat prickly, but she didn't wear shoes. The boots were wet and would make a puff plop, sound when she walked on them, which made people feel a little uncomfortable. She held the hem of her robe with one hand and walked barefoot into the women who were stepping on the berries, walking as gracefully as a princess. Her eyes were so clear that even women would find it difficult to have any hostility towards her. Crouching next to the bush, she watched a young girl picking berries with a smile on her face. She imitated her movements, picked a few berries from the branches and held them in her hands, and asked softly, are all these fruits edible? When the young girl saw Sia, her eyes froze for a moment. Then she generously raised the basket in her hand and invited Sia. Yeah. Would you like some to try? Okay. Sia took out a berry from the basket and threw it into her mouth. When she bit it, the sour juice overflowed. She closed her eyes and forced herself to swallow it. As a member of the Janice clan, Sia could not accept such sour fruit. In contrast, she would rather find something to eat in the river, such as water plants, river mussels, snails, etc. When she fled, she was hungry. Have eaten them all too. You guys have picked so many fruits. Can you eat them all? Sia couldn't help but ask when she saw that the baskets in the hands of all the women were filled with sour berries. Of course, 
There are so many people in the camp. And even if you can't finish it, you can make it into jam. The young girl skillfully threw a berry into her mouth and chewed it with relish. Then she asked Thea, Are you new from outside? Thea nodded and helped her pick berries. But then she didn't dare to put them in her mouth again. The young girl looked at Sia's wet long hair that was as green as seaweed with dark purple in it and said with envy, Your hair is so beautiful. I've never seen hair this color before. Then she extended the invitation very enthusiastically. Would you like to join our picking team? Sia hesitated for a moment, but still said, I haven't decided yet whether I want to live here, but I can try to learn to collect these wild fruits now. The young girl felt very connected with Sia, as if she had endless things to say. What's your name? Thea, did you just come from outside? Well, they came from Takarai town. They were fighting with the Lord Army in the town. Many houses in the town were destroyed by the Lord Army's catapults. A group of Lord Army wanted to cause trouble for us. So we just ran out with Edgar, Thea said casually. Why are those lords like this every time? Hearing Sia say this, the young girl's eyes suddenly turned red, as if she remembered something sad, seeing that the young girl was in agitated mood. Thea carefully put away the siren's song. Without this layer of temptation, the girl calmed down, and she was still a little strange in her heart. How could she become friends with such a beautiful girl? The women in the camp usually collect berries and wild fruits in the surrounding forest, and also plant some wheat in a forest clearing. However, the places that can be opened into fields in the jungle are very limited. This part of the wheat field alone can you can't feed everyone. They were busy until dusk before Shia and the women returned to the camp. Serdak was found back to the camp by Edgar at noon. There are still so many wounded in the camp, and Edgar hopes that Serdak will help treat them again, although it was just a tentative request. Serdak unexpectedly agreed readily. Edgar suddenly felt that Serdak, a paladin, had a really good character. Checking the injuries of these wounded warriors does not need to be as tiring as treating them. Despite this, Serdak also made some preparations in advance, returned to his wooden house, and started the sacrificial ceremony blessing himself with the eye of truth. At the very least, you need to use the sacred breath to enter the opponent's body, and you can see the injury at a glance. When other rebel soldiers saw Serdak treating the wounded with such dedication, they realized that this was a knight who had mastered the holy light technique, which instantly made Serdak's reputation in the camp greatly increased. You must know that on the battlefield, everyone will inevitably be injured. If there can be a knight with holy light in the camp at any time, the combat effectiveness of the entire team will be significantly improved. When Serdak walked out of the wounded barracks residence, he immediately felt being pointed at. Almost everyone knew that he was a knight who knew how to use the holy light. Chapter 988 Gift Serdak discovered that there was actually a blacksmith shop in this camp. But the facilities in the blacksmith shop were really rudimentary. In addition to the stove and wooden box bellows built of refractory stone, there was only an iron ingot nearby. The iron ingot was struck countless times with a hammer, and its outer outline was piled up like a short and thick king oyster mushroom. A Mediterranean blacksmith wearing leather pants sat on a chair to rest, and the fire was suppressed by the earth and did not fully burn. Some broken knives and swords were hung in the sheltered pavilion of the blacksmith's shop. Occasionally, a gust of wind would blow over, and suddenly a series of clanking sounds would be made in the shed. When Serdak got closer, he saw a red-faced old blacksmith lying on a wicker chair and snoring loudly, due to being smoked by charcoal fire for many years. His skin was stained red, and even the few beards and hair were curly. On. Serdak coughed slightly. The old blacksmith suddenly woke up from his sleep, stood up immediately, picked up the wooden bowl at hand, and walked towards the pavilion, saying as he walked, Have you had dinner? Have you had dinner? Well, what can you do? If the weapon is damaged, just hang it in the pavilion over there. It will take about two weeks to repair it. The old blacksmith rubbed his cheek vigorously and then looked at Suldek seriously, looking at him suspiciously. The blacksmith picked up the water glass on the small square table, took a sip of water, and picked up the hammer at hand. His eyes fell on Suldek's waist and saw that the sword on his waist was a broad sword with a delicate top. The pattern made the old blacksmith frown frequently and finally said, If what you are planning to repair is this kind of magic weapon, I can't do it here. I don't need to repair the weapons. Can I just take a look here? Soldak walked up to the old blacksmith and asked. Certainly. Seeing that Serdak did not need to repair the weapon, the old blacksmith sat back on the wicker chair. Serdak walked into the pavilion full of weapons and found that there were ordinary weapons hanging in the pavilion. 
Some of them seemed to have obvious joint marks. And the workmanship was extremely rough. What a stackforged steel knife. It is actually riveted and fixed with two layers of iron sheets. Even if the weapon is connected. Serdak was very speechless. It was better not to connect it. The broken blade was much easier to use than the steel-clad clip blade connection method. There is no way! The blade is too short, and it will be a disadvantage on the battlefield. The old blacksmith seemed to be able to understand Serdak's inner thoughts. He came up from behind and explained to Serdak. There should be a furnace here! Although Serdak is not a blacksmith. He owns a copper mine, and knows a little bit about this. The old blacksmith made a short sound from his nose. Umph! Let alone the furnace! Even a hard enough chopping board can make me feel more comfortable. Before he could continue to say anything, his voice was interrupted by Edgar. Edgar walked over and said with a smile, Old John, I really plan to carry one back for you this time. But Nataka, the chopping block in the blacksmith shop in Light Town cannot be carried by a horse. And the carriage cannot reach us. The old blacksmith didn't listen to Edgar's explanation at all and shouted directly, Go! Go! Stop giving me so many excuses! Where is the stove? Even if there is no stove, there is a wind box with a wind magic circle. Well, 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 you haven't got any of these. Why don't you just bring back a few bags of coke for me? Okay, my furnace isn't hot enough for this Damascus steel, so it won't melt at all. Huh? I really brought this back to you, Edgar said very proudly. Then he asked a few soldiers to bring in the sacks outside and untied one sack, revealing some dark gray coking coal inside. The old blacksmith was overjoyed and ignored Edgar. He immediately turned on the fire and piled a handful of coke on it. Then he called in the little apprentice who was playing alone outside. And the two of them pulled the wind box and started to heat up the stove. Edgar followed Serdak and said to him with a flattering look, The conditions in the camp are almost like this. But this time we captured the town of Takhale. And many things were quickly transported back. The situation here can still be improved to some extent. Serdak walked out of the blacksmith's shop without comment. Everyone in the camp eats in the canteen, which is just a canopy. The dinner was not bad. There was fish soup that the children caught in the river during the day. And there was also jam made from boiled and mashed berries that the women had just returned. Each person got a piece of rhizome of an unknown plant, as thick as an adult's arm. It tastes a little waxy and astringent. Each person takes a piece and tops it with some berry sauce. It's sour and not too unpalatable. There are three such awnings in total. You can see that the rebel fighters are basically sitting in the same area. Some officers and women are sitting in one area. And there are also a group of women and children sitting in the same area. The rebel soldiers were the largest group in the camp. The shelter was very large. With rows of log tables and chairs inside. There are fewer officers with women. So the pavilion to protect the rain is relatively small. Everyone eats the same food. The officers do not have extra meat. Soldak feels that the only advantage of these officers in the canteen is that that is. They don't need to wash the dishes themselves after eating. The rest of the women, the elderly, and the children were huddled in a pavilion to eat. According to the information from Samira's investigation, many of the children in the camp were orphans picked up from the battlefield by the rebels after a certain war, having lost their families. These children would probably become wanderers if they did not starve to death if they still stayed in the town. These children have experienced war and their parents are not around. So they are extremely sensible. Seeing that the children were living well in the camp, Soldak's impression of Edgar suddenly became much better. In fact, Edgar held a special dinner to entertain the magician Avid and his followers. But Soldak said that the magician Avid alone would be enough for such a reception dinner. He wanted to taste the big pot meal in the camp. After dinner, a group of children didn't want to go back to the cabin to sleep early. So everyone would sit in the forest clearing. The energetic rebel fighters said some provocative words to each other. And those who were dissatisfied had to stand up and compete in wrestling. There were basically no rules in this kind of fighting. The only thing was that they were not allowed to use weapons or wear armor. And they had to stop when they surrendered. Children's eyes sparkle with hope. They always like to worship the strong and cheer for the strong during fights. The eyes of the rebel soldiers were filled with lingering hatred. They just wanted to vent their anger. And they didn't even care about winning or losing but they were very measured in their actions. Life here is a little primitive, but overall it's pretty good. With the river, Sia's life is very comfortable. She spends more time in the river every day than on the shore. However, except for a few people in Serdak who know that she is from the Janna Sea tribe, her the identity of these rebels has always been a secret. Samira's ability in hunting not only impressed the children holding harpoons by the river, 
but also shocked some hunting teams in the camp. She went out for hunting with the hunting team and met her on the way. The birds are a kind of green feathered titmouse. Because of their small bodies, many people call them cow eyes. Samira chased the group of cow eyes over two hills. And the little tits she shot down actually gave the ogre a full meal. Peel off the skin of the little tits. Remove the internal organs. Marinate them with just a handful of salt. And fry them crispy in animal fat. The magician Abbot continues to live his happy life in this camp. The only trouble is that his injuries seem to be healing more slowly. And he secretly asked Serdak to give him blessings. Body. Which is said to allow him to win a war. Serdak stayed in the camp for three days. And then prepared to go with the magician Avid to inspect the rear of the rebel army. The night before he left. While everyone was having dinner. He walked into the awning where the children were dining. And pulled out two large wooden boxes wrapped in straw ropes from his magic belt bag. The oil tastes very strong. Although I don't know if I will join you in the future. I would like to give you a small gift before I say goodbye. Under the eager eyes of a group of children. Serdak cut the straw ropes and pried open the lid of the wooden box. Inside, there were a number of peeling knives wrapped in oil paper. Soldak distributed these knives to each child and said, Whether you need to skin or cut meat in the wild, it is a good choice. The only taboo is that you cannot always roast them on the fire. Otherwise, they will quickly become less sharp. The magician Avid really couldn't figure out why Serdak carried these things in his magic waste bag. And there were whole boxes of them in stock. In addition, what surprised Avid was that Serdak's magic pocket was bottomless. He didn't know how many things he took out along the way. Although he knew that Serdak had several magic pockets. As a space person, Avid is a magician. I still think this is incredible. In fact, Serdak also prepared several boxes of sentinel swords. This thing was not worth much in the blacksmith shop in Benis City. He was worried that Avid would see the clues. So he didn't take it out in the end. Chapter 989 A Journey with the Flow Bearded Edgar took Avid Magician and his party out of the camp in a small boat. This river meandering in the jungle is an important channel for the rebels to transport supplies. This flat-bottomed boat has a very shallow draft in the river. Even if it passes through some shoals, it can sail through it without any hindrance. There is only one boatman on the boat standing at the stern to control the stern rudder. And there is no need to rely on oars. The flat boat is pushed downstream by the current. In fact, the boat is equipped with four oars. The two-headed ogre. Samira and Sia have almost never ridden on this kind of water vehicle. And they feel particularly novel about riding in a boat. The three of them sat in the boat. Used the paddle to row the flat boat very fast. The scenery on both sides of the bank quickly slipped away from the eyes. A group of fire-tailed monkeys chased the flat-bottomed boat on the bank. They imitated Gulidum's throwing stones and threw wild fruits picked from the trees onto the flat-bottomed boat, making squeaking sounds, a chirping roar. Samira picked up the sky strike bow, but was stopped by Soldak. Letting them go will not pose any threat to us. It seems that some of these fruits are still edible, Soldak said. Gulidum could not wait to pick up a green fruit that had rolled down into the cabin, put it in his mouth and chewed it. Judging from the way he squinted his eyes, these green fruits should not be too unpalatable. This section of waterway in the jungle is very long. So Big Beard suggested that the flat boat stop at a shoal to rest for a while at noon. Serdak liked to eat grouse. The flat boat stopped next to the river beach. Samira jumped out of the boat and walked into the dense jungle on the shore with a sky strike bow in hand. The tangled bushes and vines in the woodland did not form any obstacles. And she could jump back and forth between these dense trees. Not long after, Samira came out of the woods carrying several grouse dripping with blood. The magician Avide was helped off the boat by the female rebel warrior Nora. When he saw the grouse hanging on Samira's waist, he said happily, Now we are in a good mood. In fact, foodies are often gourmets, and gourmets probably can cook before they are famous. The ogre is such a gourmet who is proficient in cooking. He showed great enthusiasm for how to cook these grouse. He even went out of his way to find a few washbasin-sized pebbles from the river and built a stove. The bearded Edgar thought that the ogre would go to the forest to collect some dry wood to make a fire and thought about helping. Unexpectedly, the guy took out a square magic rune board from his backpack and put it directly into the pot. Under the stove, another magic crystal fragment was placed on the gem base. With a bang, a flame rose from the metal rune plate. There are woodlands everywhere and firewood resources are so abundant that it is convenient and economical to collect firewood to make a fire. The bearded Edgar did not expect that the ogre would actually take out a metal rune plate and start a fire, showing off his attitude of being willful if he is money. Everyone had a rather sumptuous lunch on the river beach. 
did some activities by the river, and then continued to sail downstream by boat. After a long day and night, the flat boat finally sailed along the river and out of the jungle. There is a canyon in front of you, with cliffs nearly a hundred meters high on both sides. The river in the middle is tens to hundreds of meters wide in places, and only a few meters wide in narrow places. There is an illusion that the boat is passing under the cliff, and if you don't lower your head, it will hit the cliff. Entering this section of the waterway, the water suddenly became turbulent. Fortunately, the boatman knew this area of water very well. Although the flat bottom boat was a little bumpy, it was still able to ride the waves steadily. It took almost half a day to get out of this section of the canyon, and then everyone's view became wider. The mountains on both sides of the river are picturesque. Captain Edgar stood on the bow of the ship and introduced the magician Avid with a relaxed look. The scenery here is not bad, but it is too far away from the bustling world and living supplies are relatively scarce. In this area, the river flow became gentle again, and three flat boats were approaching, carrying loads of supplies. These boats go upstream, and the boatmen have to paddle hard. The flat boat had been traveling in the river for so long, and for the first time, Soldak saw a boat coming towards him. After walking a little further, I saw a simple pier on the river bank. The pier was almost made of wood. There was a row of flat-bottomed boats moored on the pier, and some people gathered on the pier. Looking inside along the pier, you can still see several tree houses under the cover of dense trees. However, the bearded Edgar did not let the boatman stop at this pier, but continued to move forward. This is Hopkins territory. He and I have a little conflict, so we won't dock here. The bearded Edgar explained to the magician Avid. Afterwards, he sat on the bow of the boat and introduced to the magician. The rebel organization on our side is very loose. Due to the limited resources around the camp, each camp cannot be built too large. If the population must reach 3,000, we will separate some people and build new camps. Originally, everyone had the same dream. But now there are many differences in ideas. Some camps have close contacts with each other while others are like this and basically have no contact with each other. Sardak asked curiously, Maybe there are residents in this mountain? The bearded man was silent for a moment, and then said cheerfully, About hundreds of thousands of people. But once a war begins, the number of troops will be reduced very quickly. Although we have female soldiers here, not many are willing to give birth here. Everyone is worried that once the Lord's army invades, they will drag their families with them, and they won't even have a chance to escape. It was really difficult in the past few years. There would always be some Lord armies coming to clear us out. The situation has been much better recently. The Lord's army has been fighting the coalition forces in Bena province and has no regard for our side. Our battlefield is mainly concentrated in the town of Bansk. There has been very little pressure from the recent fighting. Without the support of the main battle group, they dare not easily penetrate into our control area. We don't even need to fight with them. We can just look for opportunities to cut off their supply lines and these lord armies will retreat. The bearded man began to introduce the situation here to the magician Avid. The magician Avid asked curiously, Then how did you come up with the idea of attacking Takarai town? Avid was actually quite unlucky. He had just bought the manor in Takali for a week, but it was completely abandoned during the war. Edgar the bearded said, Usually, some lord armies are stationed around large towns. If we want to attack a large town like Takarai, even if the town only has a security brigade and local nobles, it will not be easy for our military to capture a town. This time I also heard that the garrison next to Takarai town was suddenly transferred away. Not only the garrison in Takarai town, but also the garrison near Katangata town also left their garrison and entered the country. Training in the Lop Mountains gave us an opportunity. Moreover, this victory is very important to us, as it helped us solve a lot of urgently needed supplies. As the boat moved forward, the bearded Edgar made introductions. Until the afternoon, the number of flat boats on the river gradually increased. Solnak realized that when the flat boats drove here, they should be considered to have entered the rear of the rebels. You can always see some rebel camps on both sides of the river. There is smoke from cooking everywhere, and life seems orderly. The bearded man's mouth was dry as he talked, but his interest in talking was not diminished. He took a sip of water to moisten his throat and heard Soldak ask him how to identify the direction in the jungle here. Since there is no star chart at night, and the sun cannot be seen during the day, even the growth rings of trees are extremely balanced. Big Beard immediately explained, In the jungle, we actually need to remember the trends of a few major mountain ranges, and all rivers flow southward. Sardak suddenly realized. Edgar continued, At night, 
it will be easier to identify the direction. You can look at the star trails in the night sky, which are the countercurrents of time and space. These lines are very regular. As long as you can understand these countercurrents of time and space, you can grasp the direction. These arcs always bulges toward the north. Edgar was extremely familiar with this place and told Soldak many ways to identify the direction. The flat-bottomed boat sailed on the river for another whole night. Until at dusk on the third day, Sirdak saw that there was almost no mountain scenery in the distance, and the flat-bottomed boat seemed to have reached the end of this plain. Just ahead, the river flows into a canyon again. The bearded Edgar stood on the bow of the boat excitedly this time, pointing to the valley in front, and said cheerfully to the magician abbot, Oh, look ahead. We're here. Chapter 990 The Small Town in the Rear Sirdak stood on the boat, and the land and mountains in front of him stopped abruptly behind the canyon looking into the distance. This void can actually extend to the feet, and the light strips formed by the reverse flow of time also go downwards into the endless abyss. Is this the end of the Ganbu Plain? Serdak asked. The bearded Edgar said with emotion. Yes. After the river flows through the canyon in front, there is a lake behind the canyon. These rivers form a waterfall on the other side of the lake, falling into the lower layer of the plain, into the abyss. If it keeps flowing like this, won't the water in the entire plain be drained? Ogre Gulitam asked curiously. The bearded Edgar shook his head and said, There is plenty of rain in the southern part of the dry cloth plain. At least in all the years I have lived here. I have never seen the river dry up. Magician Avid asked the bearded man. I heard that there are rock galleons here formed from the core of the earth element. The bearded man nodded and said, No, there is none here. I heard that there have been occurrences in the Fasher Mountains, but they are just legends. Many foreign adventure groups have gone there to look for these earth element cores. From then on, I've never heard of any adventure group finding it. The flat boat followed the river and skirted a cliff. At dusk, a small town built on the cliff above the river suddenly appeared in front of everyone. The light between the cliffs is a little dim, and many houses hanging on the cliffs have been lit with lights. The foundations of these houses are huge logs inserted into the rock walls, and wooden houses are built on these huge logs. From a distance, it looks like countless pigeon cages built on the cliff. There are countless wooden stairs connecting these pigeon cages. These staggered stairs are stacked one on top of another. Some of the green plants raised by residents are hung in wooden barrels and wooden boxes hanging outside the stairs. The lights of the town illuminate the river below the canyon, making the river sparkle in the dusk. The pier in the canyon was crowded with various flat-bottomed boats, and it looked very lively. This town is embedded in the cliffs between the canyons, and there is a body of water below which looks very unusual. The scenery at dusk is actually beautiful. Serdak was already shocked when he saw the edge of the world in the Ganbu Plain. But this rebel town gave him more surprises. The punt slowly docked, and someone on the dock actually knew the bearded Edgar, standing on the shore from a distance and waving H low to him. Is this your rear area? Soldak asked the bearded man. When our various camps need to engage in joint operations, we will meet at the Presbyterian Council. The Presbyterian Council here usually does not issue military orders to us, but we will regularly deliver supplies here. After all, this is where our group of people's dreams began. The place? We built a small town here that advocates freedom. Unfortunately, all the houses are built like bird's nests. I don't like this style very much. Bearded Edgar led everyone onto the dock. When they were about to walk out of the pier, a group of rebels came up the wooden stairs. The leader, a bald man, saw the bearded man and immediately waved familiarly and shouted, Edgar, you did a great job this time. The bearded Edgar chuckled and replied, Hey, you guys too. The two did not continue to talk in depth, but made a few simple gestures and tacit understanding and went their separate ways. Bearded Edgar said to the team standing next to the dock, It's so late. Let's go find a place to stay first and see if the hotel here is full. Serdak was somewhat looking forward to what the hotel here would be like. As soon as I walked out of the pier, I heard someone above me curiously ask, Edgar, where did you find the big guy? The man's eyes fell on the two-headed ogre, his eyes full of curiosity and some provocation. He jumped down from the wooden fence, stood firmly on the dock, stretched out his hand and patted Gulitam's arm. Before Gulitam could raise his glasses, the bearded Edgar stepped forward and pushed the man away and said, He is the follower of the magician Avid. If you don't want to be punched into the lake, Please take your hand away. The man stood by the fence with a look of astonishment on his face. And Edgar led a group of people to quickly leave the dock. 
It turns out that this town still has a hotel. And as Soldak expected, the hotel itself is a group of pigeon cages. So everyone has a separate room. Only the two-headed ogre was relatively tall and could not find a suitable wooden house for him to rest. Gulitem looked up at the top of the cliff and found a Z-shaped staircase leading to the top. He said to everyone, I'll go up there and have a look. If the scenery is good, I'll stay here tonight. There it is! Samira and Sia have already gotten into their own wooden house. Thea wanted to find a chance to jump into the river and swim for a while. But she didn't dare. Samira looked around the room, including the doors, windows, boxes, cabinets and many other details. She planned to bring the layout and design of the pigeon cage wooden house back to the white forest plain. The archer brigade armed the thunder rhinoceros to carry the wooden house in the middle of the platform. Obviously not as strong as the wooden houses here, and the space distribution is also very good. The magician Avide and the rebel female warrior Nora moved into a wooden house early. Serdak stood on the terrace of the wooden house, curiously looking at the small town on the cliff. When it gets dark, there are still some flat-bottomed boats sailing into the pier from outside. The dock is still brightly lit, and a large amount of supplies have been unloaded from the ship. There are many townspeople at the dock carrying these supplies. The bearded Edgar left the group of people at the hotel and walked out of the hotel alone. He was very familiar with the wooden spiral streets here, and disappeared among the layers of spiral stairs in the blink of an eye. Soldak was just about to go back to the room and lie down on the bed for a while, when he saw Thea standing beside him with an eager face, looking at him with her chin raised. Okay. Got it. Soldak waved to Thea. The two of them walked down the wooden stairs toward the water. Sure enough, Sia was very excited along the way. Thea did not return to her mermaid form at the canyon pier and walked out of the town. They walked from a corridor carved out of the canyon to the edge of the large lake behind the canyon. On the shore, there were a few older children standing on the bank of lush water and grass, inserting some fish baskets into it, probably setting up fishing traps. Sia and Suldak found a huge boulder on the shore. Sia stepped into the lake before the boulder. It seemed that with every step, her body changed a little. It wasn't until the lake completely covered her head that a huge splash appeared in the lake. Chapter 991 Postman Dennis By the lake, there is an evening breeze blowing. In the distance, there was the rumble of the waterfall hitting the rocks. The edge of the lake emerged and the water fell into the abyss. In the abyss, these lakes scattered into water droplets all over the sky. The strong wind blowing from the bottom of the plain turned them into pieces of rain and mist. These ground winds were then brought back to the northernmost snow peak of the plain forming endless wind and snow that fell down. Some women who were washing clothes by the lake gathered the clothes that were still drying on the grass. They carried baskets, wooden basins on their heads, and the children around them, and walked in groups towards the canyon town. At this time, a young girl with long legs and short hair was carrying a postal backpack and wearing a pair of leather boots, dragging her tired body all the way from the town to the lake. It seemed that many people along the way knew her. He squatted next to a beach by the lake. Two children who were waiting here cheered and ran over. They took out an aluminum lunch box to show off the day's harvest to the girl. The lunch box was full of fresh earthworms. I was worried that these earthworms had died in a lunch box with some sand in it. Good job, the long-legged girl said casually, causing the two children to cheer. She has a faint layer of freckles on her cheekbones. Her skin is a little rough. Her face has a layer of fine fuzz. Her nose is very straight, and her bright eyes are like two emeralds. Her face was somewhat tough, and there was a kind of perseverance between her brows. She dug out two precious fish hooks from a small cloth roll, tied the fishing line skillfully, hung an earthworm on the fish hook, then climbed onto a rock by the lake, swung the fishing rod, and threw in in the lake. Another handful of wet rice bran was sprinkled into the lake. On the shore, there were two old women walking slowly with wooden basins in their arms. They were a little bloated, and their eyes were a little bad. As I got closer, I saw clearly that it was a girl with long legs. The old lady with a stooped waist raised her head with difficulty and said, Dennis, it's so late. Are you still fishing here? Dennis, the long-legged girl, turned around and said with a smile, It's easier to take the bait at night. Sister Anthea, are you going back? The stooped old woman muttered, If you don't walk, you will no longer be able to see the road. As you get older, your eyesight will no longer work. After saying that, the two old women slowly left holding the wooden basin. Aunt Anthea, whose waist could no longer straighten, introduced to her companions beside her. This girl's name is Dennis. 
it's not easy for one person to not only raise her younger brothers and sisters, but also take care of her bedridden grandmother. Another old woman just sighed feebly and then said, What a good boy! Although Aunt Anthea's eyes were a little blurred and her ears were a little dull, the fire of gossip in her heart was still burning. As she walked, she said, A while ago, an officer said he wanted to marry her, and she brought him directly to his home. Let the officer look at the situation at home and say that if he wants her, he must accept everything from her. Then what? asked the old woman beside him. What else could there be? Then, the officer just said that he wanted to think about it, and then left without looking back. Aunt Anthea sighed helplessly. Hey, didn't you say that we have captured the town of Takarai? The old woman muttered in a low voice. Why hasn't our life changed at all? Aunt Anthea said with certainty. We only had five days to capture it, and the supplies in the warehouse were taken back by the Lord Army before we even had time to bring them out. The old woman's tone suddenly became more relaxed. It's already good, isn't it? At least we can distribute some supplies this time. Nowadays, there are more and more people, and there are fewer and fewer things to share. Aunt Anthea sighed and said, The life here is far worse than before. The two of them are drifting apart, not even noticing Serdak sitting on the rock next to him. Sia poked her head out from behind Serdak. She shook her wet fish tail, and her wet hair was spread on her round shoulders. With a touch of green scales, in front of Serdak, she no longer felt shy even if she turned into a mermaid. She stretched out her hand to pull the long hair on the back of her head into a bun, and with a pop sound, she jumped into the lake again. Dennis felt that he was very lucky tonight. He caught a trout as soon as he arrived, looking at the dark back of this big fish. It is obvious that it lives in deep water all year round. I really don't know why it would go to shallow water to eat earthworms. Seeing that dinner was settled, and he could still have fish soup tomorrow morning, Dennis was ready to call it a day. But thinking that I had just arrived here, and an earthworm had just been used for a short period of time, I felt that I should catch two more rods. Just after she threw the fish hook into the lake, within a few breaths, the fishing rod in her hand suddenly sank. She grabbed the rod with all her strength and battled wits with the big guy in the water. Children playing in the sand under the rocks cheered. At this moment, the lake shrouded in darkness, not far away, actually started to splash with water. Dennis saw someone struggling by the lake, but did not call for help. She stood up straight and took a closer look. An arm like a white lotus root was exposed in the lake. Dennis threw down the fishing rod without hesitation, rushed into the lake with two long legs, and threw his body forward. Huge waves appeared in the lake. The long-legged girl swam over awkwardly, holding her arms with one hand and drowning. The victim's neck desperately swimming to the shore. The incident happened not far from the shore, and we got ashore quickly. It was Sia who was rescued from the lake. Dennis placed Thea on the beach and was about to see if she still had a heartbeat and breathing, but he didn't expect that the other party had already woken up. Thea opened her deep blue eyes, smiled at Dennis and said, Thank you for saving me. Serdak, who was lying on the rock, covered his forehead with his hands. He didn't expect that Sia actually had a talent for acting. Dennis smiled easily. When Thea woke up, he squatted next to her and said, You're welcome. Where is your home? I'll take you back. I'm staying in a hotel in a small town. Thea explained to Dennis. Dennis helped Sia up and said, No wonder I think your face is a bit strange. You must be careful not to fall into the lake again when you come to the lake. There are no people here at night. Two children followed Dennis and Sia, one carrying a fishing rod and the other carrying a lunch box. Sia looked a little weak but her eyes kept glancing around. She walked back into the canyon town, where wooden stairs connected by the cliffs extended in all directions. Dennis was familiar with the town and sent Thea back to the hotel. Oh, where do you live? Standing at the door of the hotel, Thea asked Dennis. Dennis pointed to an unlit pigeon coop and said casually, Just over there. Look at the window sill hanging. And there are two pepper plants in the flower pot at the door. Thea came up, gave Dennis a tight hug and said, By the way, I don't know your name yet. Dennis. Dennis introduced himself. Thea, Thea pointed to her nose and said, Can I visit your home tomorrow? Dennis readily agreed. Of course. It's just that I'm not at home during the day. I have to be responsible for delivering letters to various camps during the day. And I can entertain you at night. After saying that, he took the two children and ran down the stairs quickly, and disappeared into the night in the blink of an eye. She runs so fast. Thea said to Serdak, who came out from behind. Soldak said, Aren't you worried about being found out one day? What's the matter? 
I just want to get to know her. Thea smiled proudly. Aphrodite was lying on the big bed in the luxurious cabin of the magic airship. The cool nightgown could not hide anything at all, but instead infinitely magnified the charm and sexiness of her body. Outside the window is a vast sea of white clouds. The dazzling sunshine made Serdak feel particularly friendly. And there was no sunshine at all in the dry cloth plain. In the distance, an albatross soars on the skyline. It also relies on the power of the wind to fly long distances. Aphrodite raised her chin, making the swan's neck appear extremely long. Apart from her fair skin, she doesn't seem to have any physical flaws. What did you see when you went to the rebel rear? How are people living there? She asked Soldak. Zerdak sat on a chair and explained to Aphrodite. Everyone is very poor, so there are not so many conflicts, and the lifestyle is very simple. Aphrodite looked at Zerdak with a half-smile and asked him, How are you? Are you determined to help the rebel army in the Ganmu plain? Zerdak shook his head. Do he and the magician Abide want to support the rebel army against the lord army of the Ganmu plain? He felt that this was unrealistic. After all, it was an independent plain half the size of the Bina province and its permanent population probably exceeded 3 million. Next, Avid will have a good talk with the rebels, and I will look through the information. Soldak said cautiously, When we fly to Benna City, I will discuss it with Marquis Luther. Aphrodite reached out, and picked up a red apple from the fruit plate on the bedside table, and threw it to Soldak. Serdak put it in the magic waste bag, and prepared to take it back to Samira. There were no apples, with such sweetness in the dry cloth plain. Oh! When will the temporary teleportation circle be repaired? Aphrodite asked again. We have to wait until we arrive in Benna City to buy a high-grade gemstone base, as well as some other simple parts. Serdak pressed his forehead and said, Just then, there was a knock on the door. Serdak and Aphrodite looked at each other, and Aphrodite motioned to Serdak to open the door. Serdak straightened his collar and put the noble badge on his chest. Then he walked to the cabin door and opened the door halfway with one hand. The second officer standing at the door saw Serdak in leather armor, and was a little dumbfounded for a moment. Through the gap in Serdak's body, the second officer could see the figure of the woman lying on the bed in pajamas. In fact, he can't be blamed for this. Except for the second officer who saw Serdak on the day he boarded the ship. Ms. Aphrodite has been alone on the airship these days. The second officer thought Soldak quietly disembarked the airship before it took off. This lady was traveling alone. Without even a maid. He seemed to feel such an obvious hint. So he came over with some wine to communicate. Unexpectedly, when the cabin door opened, he actually saw a genuine young nobleman. The second maid suddenly felt completely cold, although Aphrodite wore a mithril mask on her face. Her face could not be seen clearly, but with such a good figure. The second officer felt that lying on the bed, wearing a mithril mask actually had a different flavor. He was wearing a decent white shirt and a bow tie at the collar. He also specially sprayed some perfume. He was holding a bunch of baibaya in his hand and a bottle of white wine in the other hand. When the cabin door was pushed open, Soldak blocked the door. The second officer was like a lover who had been caught raping in bed. A little ashamed, he smiled guiltily at Serdak. What's the matter? Serdak asked with a straight face. The second mate served the white wine with both hands with an embarrassed look on his face and said, Dear Viscount, this is for you. In addition, the airship provides a service of dining on the top deck of the ship. Do you have any experience in this regard? Need? No. Is there anything else? Soldak took the white wine and asked impatiently. No need to interrupt. The second mate bowed to Soldak and then closed the door with his own hands. A bottle of white wine worth 40 silver coins was given away like this. Although the second officer worked on an airship and his monthly salary was 3 gold coins high, it still made him feel a little distressed. Perhaps seeing the figure lying on the bed made him feel even more distressed. Is this why you invited me here? Soldak raised the white wine in his hand and shook it casually and asked. Aphrodite rolled around on the big bed, blinked, and expressed her gratitude to Soldak with charming eyes. Serdak quickly withdrew his gaze, walked to the circular glass window, looked at the sea of clouds outside the airship, and asked her, Are you really not going to go and enjoy the breeze on the roof of the magic airship? Aphrodite said with half interest. Forget it. If you always wear this mask wherever you go, you will be regarded as a weirdo. Since you can't take it off, let's just lie in the room and sleep. After speaking, his black and purple eyes boldly glanced at Soldak. If there's nothing else to do, I'll leave first. Soldak said in a panic. When I cross the void gate, 
my steps became a little staggering. Aphrodite's silvery laughter came from behind. Serdak walked back to his room in the Canyon Town Hotel, opened the window, and looked down. This wooden house is built on a rock wall, with a big river at its feet. There are also some wooden houses on the opposite cliff, making this canyon full of fun. He looked at the white wine in his hand and put it on the table by the window. The fighting in the house next door to the magician Ivan finally subsided. Serdak supported the windowsill with both hands and leaned out half of his body to enjoy the night view of the town. The window next door was also pushed open by a snow-white arm. Magician Avide and Nora were wrapped in the same blanket, and they were also admiring the night view of the town from the window. Seeing Serdak, the avid magician smiled triumphantly at him, saying nothing. Chapter 992 News from Bansk The magician Avid sat in the council chamber on top of the cliff in the canyon town. In fact, this is just a slightly larger wooden house. There is a large round table in the living room. But there are only four people in the room. The magician Alvid, the bearded Edgar, Sheldon, the secretary general of the rebel round table, and his assistants. The magician Avid always looks like a rich man wherever he goes. If I were asked to personally donate a sum of money for free, it would be a simple matter. I just happen to have some magic crystals in my hand, he said. Then he twisted his body, straightened his waist and said, But if our team is allowed to join you and work with you to overthrow Lord Macdonald's rule, I need to join the council here and at least a certain decision-making power. In addition, a camp needs to be set aside for me to manage. I will. Before he could finish speaking, Sheldon, the Secretary General of the Round Table Conference, waved his hand to stop. In fact, he wanted to tell everyone that he had a temporary teleportation circle that could win over the resources of the Bina province. Unfortunately, Sheldon didn't have the patience to finish listening. So he interrupted and said, Joining the decision-making team is not something I can decide by myself. Indeed, this is not something he can decide alone. But he is also full of prejudice against the magic aristocrats. Then he said, The campground is not anyone's private property. We establish political power in the edge areas of the Ganbu Plain because we want to overthrow this private ownership of lords. The land here belongs to every resident of the Ganbu Plain. It can be used by everyone in the Ganbu Plain. All residents can breathe free air. The magician Avid was not a good-tempered one. The magicians of the Astrologers Guild were always full of superiority. Now being questioned by a rebel leader, Avid was not in the mood to continue the conversation and said directly, Well, if that's what you think, then what else can I say? Avid stood up with his hands on the table, turned around and planned to leave the council chamber. He has already begun to think about how to persuade Nora to return to Bena City with him. Magic Avid, please stay. The bearded Edgar quickly stood up, caught up and held down the shoulders of the magician Avid, and said, We can definitely discuss it again. Joining the parliament requires the approval of two-thirds of the parliament members. I think we can hold a voting meeting as soon as possible. In addition, if you want to manage a camp, I have one. The camp near Tinley Town can be leave it to you to take care of. Magician Avid looked at the sincere bearded man, and his heart softened again mainly because he was bribed by Big Beard and couldn't lose his temper in front of him. Will the paladin beside you become the camp commander? Bearded Edgar asked. Magician Avide thought for a while before replying. Of course. And we will also raise our own supplies. You just need to transfer some young soldiers and we will train them. He originally wanted to use the financial resources of the Bena province and the Magic Union to support the supplies of all the rebels. But now he has changed his mind. The bearded man's eyes lit up. He didn't expect that Magician Avide was so rich that it was such a good thing that he had to provide his own supplies. Even if others didn't agree, he wanted to come to them one by one until they agreed. That's it. I'll go and convince the other members of the parliament. Please give me a little more time. Edgar vowed. Later, the Magician Avide left the Canyon Town Council Hall. After Avid walked away, Secretary General Sheldon said with disdain, Why are you so accommodating to him? Edgar didn't care and sat down next to Secretary General Sheldon, put his arm around his shoulders, poured himself a glass of water, and said, Why do you think I brought them all the way here? Secretary General Sheldon then looked at Edgar in confusion. Edgar said seriously, Our army needs their help. There is a knight among them who has mastered the holy light. As long as he is on the battlefield, we can save many lives in a war. There is also a two-headed ogre and a water magician in his team. Secretary General Sheldon looked at Edgar in surprise and was speechless for a long time. Magician Avid took his lover, 
Miss Nora, and went boating in the lake below the canyon town. Serdak took Samira around the town. The two-headed ogre ran to the large lake behind, preparing to catch some plump red trout to eat. Thea ran away alone again. In the past two days, she and the girl named Dennis had been fighting fiercely, and they almost became good friends who talked about everything. Thea even took the initiative to help Dennis deliver letters in the town. It was not until evening that Sia returned to the hotel. When she saw Soldak and Samira sitting in the hotel restaurant, she walked over. After ordering a piece of fried fish, he proudly said to Soldak, Dennis has a day off tomorrow. She promised me to take me around this town. Do you want to go with her? Who is most familiar with this canyon town? Of course, it is the postman who is responsible for delivering letters in the town. Is it convenient for me to go? The expression on Soldak's face was a bit unflattering. The waiter brought a piece of fried fish, and Sia picked up a piece of fried fish with her hands and stuffed it into her mouth gracefully. Did you hear any new news? Soldak changed the topic. Sia put down the fish pieces in her hand, looked around again, and then whispered to Soldak. I heard that they were fighting with the Lord's Army in the Bance Town area. It is said that this time the Lord's Army dispatched a large number of magicians, almost recaptured a large amount of rebel territory around the town of Bansk. Are they those black magicians? Serdak asked with some confusion. Probably so. The relationship between the local magic union and the noble lords has always been very tense. There is a high probability that they will not come forward to eliminate the rebels. Thea said with confidence. If she hadn't seen her transform into a mermaid with her own eyes, it would be absolutely impossible. Imagine that a Janice tribe could analyze the situation in the Ganbu Plain. It seems that the rebels have not been having a good time recently. Soldak guessed. Samira? who was sitting opposite, also joined in and said, Now that the portal to the Ganbu Plain is closed, the Lord Army can finally free up its hands to deal with these rebels. The news has not spread yet, but each camp has sent soldiers to support the band's battlefield. Thea said while eating. Soon all the fried fish on the plate was eaten, leaving only one fish bone. It seems that these black magicians have completely colluded with Lord MacDonald's army. I need to take this news back to Benna City as soon as possible. Soldak put down the spoon in his hand and suddenly felt that he had no appetite at all. Chapter 993 Dennis Delivering the Letter The room was dimly lit. A ray of light filtered through the blinds. And the room was filled with a faint smell of perfume. This is the first gift given to Nora by the magician Avid. This was the first time for Nora to use this kind of luxury product that was usually only used by nobles. She would only sprinkle a little bit on her armpits after taking a shower. And she was sweating afterward. The whole hotel room was covered with these roses. A fragrance. The woman was wrapped in a blanket and fast asleep on the big bed. The magician Abbott got up from the bed. He stepped on the floor with his bare feet and walked to the bronze mirror in the room. He looked down at the bandage wrapped around his chest. He really didn't want to take it off. The wound was itchy. As if ants were gnawing at the wound. And he knew that the wound would soon heal. The scabs on it had begun to fall off. And he didn't even dare to take a bath because the scabs would definitely disappear after being soaked in hot water. The injury healed too quickly, and he had not yet enjoyed enough of the two worlds with Miss Nora. This female rebel warrior may not be so beautiful, but she is definitely gentle enough, and her flexible body can meet all of Avid's needs. Thinking of this, he rubbed his waist helplessly. It seemed that he still wanted to seek help from Viscount Serdek. That buff magic will do the trick. He didn't want to return to Benna City. The canyon town met all his needs for a hermit life. It is not easy to repair without temporarily teleporting the magic circle. First of all, the high-grade gem base is an extremely difficult problem to solve. And you can't buy it here. I originally thought of going to Makuso City to try my luck. But I didn't expect that I would end up at the rear of the rebel army while walking. Thinking of this, he felt a little secretly thankful that he was here. He greeted himself from the bottom of his heart. Hello. Such a happy and beautiful life. Avid has a little idea. He wanted to occupy a seat at the rebel round table but this required the full support of Viscount Serdek. So he thought about what bargaining chips he had to bring to persuade Viscount Serdek. Edgar the Bearded did not convince the other members of the Rebel Round Table that becoming a member of the Round Table required a group of staunch supporters, such as the support of those Rebel camps. Soldak, Samira, and Sia had breakfast in the hotel, and then met Dennis on the wooden steps outside the hotel. Thea introduced Serdak and Samira to Dennis. Dennis behaved gracefully. She was very familiar with the town and took the initiative to take everyone around. Starting from the hotel in the town, we went to the small town grocery store, blacksmith shop, 
leather workshop, and tailor shop to visit all these places. Although these shops are not big, they can basically meet the needs of the town residents. It can be repaired or made, but it cannot be made into high-end products. The wooden houses on the rock wall are the biggest feature of the canyon town, and all shops are located near the top of the mountain wall, especially in the blacksmith shop. Not only was there smoke coming out of the chimney, but there was also a constant tinkling sound. Denise wore a leather vest full of pockets, knee-high linen six-point pants, and a pair of thin-soled long leather boots, which made her two hemp pole-like legs appear longer. Putting his hands into his pockets, he stood at the door of the blacksmith shop and introduced the history of the blacksmith shop to everyone. Dennis, are you off today? The blacksmith shop boy stuck his head out and said H, low to Dennis. Most of the people who passed by the blacksmith shop knew Dennis. Dennis, why didn't you see Jimmy and the others? There were also some old women sitting at the door of the wooden house. When they saw Dennis, they asked casually, Dennis, is your grandma getting better? Some boys would chase after Dennis, shouting, Dennis, is this your new boyfriend? It seems that the whole town knows this female postman and is very enthusiastic about her. Are you very famous in Canyon Town? How come everyone knows you? Thea asked Dennis curiously. Dennis smiled lightly and said, My grandma took me to live here when I was very young. My whole childhood belonged here. So everyone is familiar with me. Now I am still a postman. Look at that watchtower. From there, you can see the entire lake behind the town. Let me take you there to see it. I think you can see the most beautiful view of the town there. Dennis pointed to a lookout tower on the top of the cliff. Ty introduced. Everyone followed Dennis up the wooden staircase, which was very long and very old. Serdak stepped on the wooden board, and there was a creak sound. Dennis! Dennis! You are asked to go to Bansk immediately. A rebel soldier caught up from behind panting and shouted towards Dennis. Dennis stopped on the wooden stairs, frowned and said, But I have a day off today. Can't I find someone else to go with? The situation is urgent. You run fast, and you are asked to go by the superiors. You are the most familiar with the mountain road over there. There are five postmen this time, and you are just one of them. The soldier ran up sweating profusely, explained to Dennis. I know. Why is it so urgent? Five postmen go together and worry about not being able to deliver it. Dennis pouted and complained. Then turned to everyone in Sia and said apologetically, I'm sorry. I can't take you to enjoy the most beautiful view from the overlook in Canyon Town. I have official duties now, and I need to leave the town immediately. Thea looked curious and couldn't help but ask, Dennis, where are you going? In fact, postmen need to keep confidentiality when delivering letters. But the soldier just shouted it out. Dennis blinked and said, Probably you want me to deliver the letter to Ban's town. Serdak knew that the matter was not that simple. Otherwise, he would not have sent five postmen at once. And it would have been very dangerous. But there was no fear in the young girl's eyes at all. She was just a little embarrassed about missing the appointment. How can I help? Sia asked enthusiastically. Dennis said to Thea with a grateful face. Thank you. No need. I can handle it by myself. Okay. Thea said with some disappointment. And then she seemed to have a sudden inspiration. She opened her eyes and said to Dennis, How about I go to Bans with you? Dennis was a little dumbfounded and looked at Thea blankly. I am going to deliver a letter. How can I take a tour group with me when I see him off? It's been a bit unsafe over there lately. Lord's troops often break into our territory. Dennis lowered his voice and reminded Thea, I'm just going to have a look. It doesn't matter if you don't take us with you. We can go by ourselves. Sia blinked her big eyes as clear as lake water. Her voice had a strong nasal sound, as if she was singing. Actually, we I came here just to understand the real life of the people here. Dennis felt dazed for a while, and his mind was a little out of his control. He agreed inexplicably. I can take you there, but I don't have the ability to protect you. If I don't do it, I will harm you. I am a battlefield postman. Thea's big blue eyes narrowed into crescent moons and she smiled at Dennis and said, It's good if you agree, and you don't need to worry about your family. I'll let my friend take care of your family. Dennis was a little more awake at this time. She touched her face and wondered if she had a fever, so she would agree to such an outrageous request. Then, she refused very politely. No, Jimmy and the others can do it themselves. Perhaps we can prepare more food for them. Thea began to worry about her new friend's family's life problems after leaving the town. Dennis suddenly became a little sober, and asked with a suspicious look on his face. Who are you? Thea didn't know what went wrong. 
which made Dennis struggle to wake up from his siren song. He obviously didn't do anything too excessive to stimulate her. For a moment, she didn't know how to answer. We are all Benna people. Serdak came out and said gently. Dennis' eyes were full of doubts. So you are not locals from the Ganbu Plain? We are from Alensa in the north of Darim. Soldak quickly explained to Dennis how he and his people arrived in the canyon town. And then said, If you still have any questions, you can also ask Edgar for confirmation. Wait, do you know Edgar? Bearded Edgar? Dennis asked doubtfully. When Dennis led Soldak and his party to find the bearded Edgar, the bearded man was troubled about how to persuade the magician Avid to stay. The senior officials of the round table conference did not want to add another chair to the round table. But they urgently needed the magician Avid to stay. Both Avid and his men were talents that the rebels urgently needed. It wasn't until Dennis asked Bearded Edgar for the identities of Serdak and others with doubts in his mind that Bearded Edgar realized that these people's investigation of the rebels was actually continuing. Although the Bearded Edgar is not a member of the round table, nor is he the combat commander in Bant's town, he is a figure with certain real power in the rebel army. His subordinates not only control three camps and 5,000 rebel fighters, 13 camps were also united to launch a raid on the town of Takarai. They not only captured the town of Takarai, but also successfully harvested a large amount of supplies from the town. Edgar told Dennis that Suldak and others were the guests he brought over, and there was nothing wrong with letting them visit the frontline positions. After Dennis received the letter at the round table, he began to prepare for departure. Serdak and the others had no horses in the canyon town. So the bearded Edgar came forward to help them solve the mount problem. Serdak rushed to the hotel and said to the magician Avid, This time we are going to take advantage of the opportunity of the Lord Army to launch an attack on the rebels in Ban's town and go to the battlefield over there. You can do it temporarily. Recuperate in the canyon town. Maybe when I come back, I will find the high-end gym base. Well, then be careful. If nothing can be done, then we will go back to Benna City, magician Avid said. This is what I want to say to you. Take care and wait until we come back. Serdak stood outside the hotel, holding the horse with one hand and bidding farewell to Avid. After passing several steps from here, Serdak took Samira, Sia and Gulitam out of the canyon town. Dennis was waiting outside the town wearing a light leather armor. When he saw Serdak and his party only holding hands he walked out with two horses. Slightly confused, she jumped lightly, her long legs like flying butterflies, and jumped onto the Gubalai horse nimbly. She leaned on the horse's back with her whole body. Her hands were not holding the reins, but hugging the Gubalai horse's neck. Clamp your feet in the stirrups. The entire ancient Bolai horse shot forward like an arrow from the string. Serdak was worried that the two ancient Bolai horses could not bear the weight of his armor. So he rode on the horse wearing only ordinary clothes. During his time in the Belan Plain, his riding skills had improved greatly. Thea couldn't ride a horse. So Samira rode a horse with her. A strong Gubo war horse could bear the weight of the two young ladies. Mr. Two-Headed Ogre doesn't need to ride a horse. He can run faster than both horses by stepping on his two elephant legs. Denise's riding skills are really good and her body is light enough. She took the lead and rushed to the front. The group of people ran all the way to the battlefield in Bant's town. Since four postmen had already left the canyon town with the same letter before Dennis set off. Dennis wanted to catch up with those people in front of him. So except for the horses that needed to be fed. Watered and rested at fixed times. She spent the rest of the time almost all of them were riding fast on horseback. She was very familiar with the mountain roads in front of her and took shortcuts several times in a row. Finally the next morning, the group touched the border on the east side of Bant's town. This place was originally an occupied area controlled by the rebels. But Samira was keenly aware of an unusual smell. She crossed Soldak and rushed to the front. She held Dennis's reins with one hand and asked everyone to stop. Dennis turned to look at Samira with a confused look on his face. Her eyes were bloodshot, and she looked very tired. But she was still holding on to a trace of clarity, and planned to be sent to the temporary command post on the battlefield before noon. The situation ahead is a bit difficult. There is an ambush in the woods, Samira said. The scout patrol of the Lord's army? Dennis immediately woke up and asked nervously. Maybe it's a secret sentinel specially arranged here. I'll go check it out. After saying that, Samira had already jumped off the horse, and was about to go into the woods ahead. How about we go around? Dennis asked worriedly. Don't go to so much trouble. It's easiest for us to go up together and kill all the sentries at the sentry post. The two-headed ogre Gulitam stood next to Dennis and said. His words gave Dennis enough sense of security. Dennis glanced gratefully at the two-headed ogre. 
Chapter 994 Ambush Before the rebels had time to celebrate their victory in Takalai Town, the 3rd Legion of the Lord Army had already stationed itself in Bant's town in the Ganbu Plain. Subsequently, this Lord's Army launched a clearing operation against the rebel-occupied area east of Bant's town. Soldak did not expect that the situation in the Ganbu Plain would deteriorate so quickly. He thought that after Lord MacDonald was captured, the MacDonald family would be in chaos. At least in the past few months. Lord MacDonald's son, they will have a lot of troubles over inheritance issues. What is surprising is that it is precisely because of this arrest operation launched by the House of Representatives of the Bena province that the issue of the first heir, which was originally a quarrel among the MacDonald family, was temporarily shelved for the first time. Now Lord MacDonald's three sons each led an army and began to quell the chaos in the Ganbu Plain. Samira held a dagger in her mouth. Her body was almost parallel to the ground, and she ran quickly through the grass. The moment she got into the jungle, her figure disappeared into the shadow of the jungle, and she climbed up a big tree using her hands and feet. It is not easy to find out the hidden whistles in the jungle. This requires hunters to have strong insight, as well as enough patience and reasoning ability. But these are no longer so important to Samira. After she was promoted to a second-level powerhouse, her five senses had become much better than ordinary people. She could hear the rustling of the wind in the treetops, the faintest murmur of the flowing water, and she could even hear the breathing of people nearby. Those light red eyes are also extremely sharp. When she is running fast, the things in her field of vision will be extremely clear. She jumped from tree to tree, and there was only the slightest hint of wind blowing in the canopy. Holding his breath, he calmed himself down and spread his awareness around him. Puff thump thump thump! She felt a strong heartbeat nearby. Looking for the sound, Samira threw herself on a mound full of fallen leaves. She reached into the piled rotten leaves with one hand and touched the hard leather armor. The sentinel hidden in the rotten leaves jumped up suddenly. The moment her body rose into the air, the dagger in Samira's mouth had already cut the sentry's throat. Blood spurted from the sentinel's neck and sprinkled across the forest floor. After finding a sentry hidden in the forest, Samira did not stop, but continued to move forward. On the leafy crown of the tree, a sentry from the third legion of the Lord's army squatted on a horizontal branch. Judging from the sounds of fighting and screams coming from the forest, an assassin master entered the forest area, and he must be a hunter from the rebel army. Several companions had been killed, but the sentry did not climb out or plan to escape. He knew that the other party was a master, and if he left this secret place rashly, he would definitely become one of the hunter's prey. He squatted on the branches of the tree and breathed very gently, even rising and falling with the tree crown with every breath. Keep the same frequency. He imagined himself as part of the tree. He lay down in the thick canopy of a tree. A pair of slender and soft hands quietly stretched out from behind his neck, turned his palms over, and a dagger appeared in his hands. The moment the sentry noticed it, the black dagger had already cut his throat. He struggled to cover the wound on his neck with his hands. He found that he couldn't shout. He wanted to struggle hard. Even if he fell from the top of the tree, it would be a warning to other companions. But he couldn't do it. Full of despair, he even wanted to look back at the hunter. The moment he turned back, a vine caught his neck, and his body suddenly fell from the tree. He had a feeling of relief. But then the vines around his neck tightened tightly around his neck, and he was hoisted into the air. The blood gushing from his neck had turned his whole body red, and his hands were weakly holding on to the vine ropes. The coldness hit me little by little. Darkness before my eyes. When Samira walked out of this woodland, all three secret sentries of the Lord Army in the woods were dead in this woodland. She returned to Serdak's side and mounted her horse. This was already the fifth time that the secret sentries guarding the fork in the road had been cleared. They were all ordinary soldiers, and the daggers in their hands were stained with blood, which made Samira feel a little uncomfortable. Otherwise, when we encounter such a secret whistle, we rush over directly to avoid wasting time. Samira might have been a little soft-handed in killing, stabbing an ordinary soldier with a knife. The level of suppression made her feel an inexplicable burden. Serdak was non-committal and said to Dennis, Let's go! We have just entered the border of Bant's town. This mountain range used to be the territory of the rebels. But now it is dotted with outposts of the Lord Army. Dennis shook the reins, rushed out of the woods, and ran along the mountain path toward a valley. She had a very bad feeling that this place had been occupied by the Lord's Army. If the situation were reversed, the rebel camp stationed here would be in danger, seeing the green smoke rising from behind the mountains. Her breathing became a little rapid. Follow the mountain road and rush into a valley filled with deathly silence. 
the ground was covered with ashes, and the camp no longer existed. The wooden walls, tree houses, and even the entire forest had been reduced to ashes. Even the fires in the forest were almost completely extinguished, with only a faint green smoke still rising from the roots of some trees. Some of the burnt corpses had not had time to be cleaned up, and there was a faint smell of protein in the air. Dennis urged the horse to move forward. There seemed to be a melee here, but the battlefield had been cleared, and no one could be found. The corpses of the Lord's army, the bodies of the rebel soldiers lay scattered in the forest. Their bodies had been turned into charcoal and shrunk much smaller. There were also the burnt corpses of old men, women and children. How so? Dennis was a little flustered for a moment and didn't know how to deal with it. Dennis, are there any other camps nearby? Let's go check out other camps. Turdek reminded from the side. Only then did Dennis wake up. She was a postman and had important letters to deliver to the captain of the camp here. This camp had been razed to the ground by the rebels. So she had to go to other camps to see. Without saying a word, she pulled the reins of Guba Elias horse, turned the horse's head, and ran towards the mountain pass on the other side. Serdak, Samira, and Gulitam followed closely behind. Ahead was the exit of this mountain ridge. Dennis was urging the ancient horse to run forward like crazy. The horse was so tired that foam was spraying from the corners of its mouth and nostrils. She turned a deaf ear to Serdak's words to stop, and her only thought was to rush to the next camp. Serdak followed and tried several times to dissuade him without success. If they keep running like this, several Guba horses will be ruined. However, Dennis' body was light and his horse ran at the front. Serdak's horse could not keep up. He shouted to the two-headed ogre next to him. Gulitam, go and hug her. We should take a break. Rest. The two-headed ogre was also a little thirsty from running. When he heard Soldak say this, he immediately increased his pace and soon caught up with Dennis. Before the two-headed ogre could reach out and grab the reins of Gubalai's horse, a series of arrows suddenly shot out from the woods nearby. Judging from the intensity of the arrow rain, Serdak knew that his group was ambushed. The two-headed ogre's good brother Nahua immediately released his ice armor. The ogre's body was covered with frost. He held the reins with one hand and blocked his face with the other, protecting Dennis on the horse. Behind, the reins of Gubalai's horse were grabbed by the ogre with one hand, and the body fell forward suddenly. The ogre quickly picked Dennis up from midair, and the horse fell out miserably. The arrows flew and hit the two-headed ogre's ice armor, making a series of jingling noises like exploding beans. Serdak also raised his shield immediately, blocking the rain of arrows while holding on to the reins. Samira and Sia's ancient bolai horse fell at the back. Serdak grabbed the ancient bolai horse, and they caught up in an instant. Just as arrows rained down, Serdak raised his shield to block the arrows for the two women. Arrow. Just to reduce the weight of Gubalama. Serdak did not wear the magic pattern structure. An arrow flew past his shoulder, leaving a blood groove on his arrow. Samira was furious. The shadow of the great elf Windrunner appeared behind her, and the magic crystal on the sky strike bow suddenly shattered. Chapter 995 Chasing Troops The scouts of the Lord's army who were ambushing at the west exit of the valley of the rebel camp never thought before the battle that a small field postman was accompanied by three second-level experts and they fired a round of arrows that hit him exactly. He killed Serdak, leaving a blood groove as thick as a finger on his right shoulder. The blood gushed out, completely igniting the teen's fighting spirit. Serdak did not expect that after becoming a second-level paladin, he would be scratched by random arrows shot by ordinary archers. Seeing the wound on his shoulder, Serdak was stunned for a moment, and the sense of superiority that had accumulated in his heart for a second-level powerhouse was instantly defeated by this arrow. If the arrow just hit his chest, maybe he would have fallen to the ground at this moment. It turns out that the so-called second-turn strongman is not the invincible warrior he imagined. If you don't take every opponent seriously, you will probably fall in front of a weak one one day. In fact, the wound was not too deep, and it did not damage the tendons of the shoulder. The arrow clusters with barbed wolf teeth tore the wound into a rather ferocious shape, and blood gushed out. Thea screamed in fright and the green scales on the side of her face had emerged. A shadow of Queen Janna more than ten meters high appeared behind Thea, and a water shield fell on Serta under the huge waves. Graham's body. Serdak raised his shield and rushed forward from Gubwa. He turned his head and glanced at the two-headed ogre in front of him, and saw that he had hidden Dennis behind the ancient Bolai horse. And then he felt confident and rushed forward. At this time, Gulitam also followed Serdak's footsteps and the two second-level experts charged towards the woods on the roadside. 
a huge wave unexpectedly surged out behind them. And the two of them were almost surrounded by the huge waves and moved forward. Those waves seemed to have some kind of vitality, constantly licking the sharp arrows shot from the sky. Countless electric arcs gathered from all around, converging on the hand where Sammy drew the bow string. And the entire arm was filled with the breath of wind and electricity. Thea, who was standing next to Samira, couldn't resist the pressure of these arcs and wind blades. The two elemental breaths turned the arrows into light arrows. Although they were launched later, they were faster than Serdak and Gulitum standing on the wave. As fast as lightning, the surging electric snakes flowed all over the sky. Those exciting electric lights seemed to have blinded the eyes of the lords in the woods. If they had known a minute ago that a hail of arrows from their side would provoke a joint counterattack from four second-level experts on the mountain road. Samira, who was even a second-level eagle eye, would have broken a magic crystal for them. Then they are probably on their way to escape now. Electric snakes danced all over the sky. This light arrow rushed into the forest. And countless electric snakes suddenly illuminated the forest. A group of scouts from the Lord's army felt as if these scurrying electric snakes were crawling into the woods. The hair on their bodies stood upright due to the electricity. And their bodies instantly became numb. As if the arrow had eyes. It penetrated the forehead of the scout who shot Soldak. A bolt of lightning struck from high in the sky and the scout's entire body was instantly scorched in the beam. A large tree next to him was also struck by the bolt and burst into flames. The scouts around him were also killed and injured. Then, the two-headed ogre wielding a club rushed into the woods. A big tree was knocked down by his strong arm, and the scouts hiding behind the tree rushed around. Two scouts avoided the fallen tree. They jumped out of the bushes and released their power. The shadows of two great swordsmen appeared behind them. They held a small round shield in their hands and held the craftsman's sword and stabbed Gulidim's ribs from the left and right sides respectively. They should be Bena swordsmen and the heavy swords in their hands were very accurate when stabbing out. It was steady and the movements were concise and clean. When the sword thrust out, it was extremely fast. The two of them launched an offensive at the same time, which made Suldak hesitate a little, thinking about which side the Gerda shield in his hand should block. The next moment, a water arrow pierced the forehead of the Lord Scout on the left. The shadow behind the scout collapsed, and the man fell backwards. The shield in Serdak's hand decisively moved towards the face of another scout. The sound of flesh and blood hitting the steel was like the sound of defeat. As soon as the scout's body flew backwards, Serdak took a step forward with the broadsword in hand. With a flip of his wrist, the blade of the broadsword moved diagonally upwards, and the scout was hit by the shield. The whole person was knocked unconscious. The sword handed out by Serdak touched the gap in the armor of his ribs and stabbed into the abdomen. As screams continued to be heard in the forest, a one-sided killing gradually stopped. Dennis turned to look at Thea. His eyes filled with shock. This new friend turned out to be a magician. And the others were powerful warriors. She felt exhausted and sat helplessly on the ground. The woods not far away looked messy and messy. As if they had been ravaged by a storm. The two-headed ogre and the knight walked out side by side. The blood stains on their bodies were washed away by a water column summoned by Sia. The group sat next to the mountain road and rested for a while. After using the holy light technique, a thin layer of fascia formed on the wound. Samira squatted aside and bandaged the arrow wound on Serdak's shoulder with a hemostatic bandage. Thea sat next to Dennis. Calming her down, Dennis covered his face with his hands, his whole body trembling slightly. It's not like she has never seen killing scenes. As a rebel, how could she not experience killings? She just had never experienced a lord's army being completely slaughtered by just four people. She felt a little cold in her limbs. Her body was trembling instinctively. And even her teeth were constantly colliding with each other, making a creaking sound. She looked at Sia and finally realized that this extremely innocent-looking beauty was actually a magician. Seeing that the look in her eyes softened, Dennis took a deep breath to calm himself down and asked her, Shia, who are you? I have never seen a warrior as powerful as you. I am a little scared. Dennis was indeed horrified. The rebel camp was burned down by a fire, which had already put her on the verge of collapse. And now she was even a little confused. The mermaid girl Thea gently stroked Dennis's thin back, handed her a kettle, and asked her to drink some water to calm down. Then he said, We came from the Bina province, and our mission here was to capture Lord MacDonald. Now Lord MacDonald has been captured by our companions. But we are left here. In short, we have the same goal as you, which is to end the McDonald family's dictatorship on the plane of Gumbo as soon as possible. 
Miss Mermaid lowered her eyes and winked at Dennis. But why do you come here with me? Dennis asked Thea. I'm just a little postman. This was probably the biggest puzzle in her heart. Sia replied without hesitation. Of course we are here to see the current situation and situation of the residents in the camp. We want to use our chips at the appropriate time in exchange for the greatest benefits. Serdak felt that his thoughts were clearly seen by Sia, or that he had not thought about them particularly seriously. I was just wondering how to join the rebel camp. Now the Lord Army seems to be a little impatient to clean up you. Serdak added next to him. They are ambushing here, probably to intercept the reinforcements coming here from the canyon town. Soldek held several blood-stained letters in his hand and placed them in front of Dennis. Dennis was stunned for a moment and took out almost identical letters from his arms. It seemed that these blood-stained letters should have been left by the postmen who were ahead. Dennis knew what this meant. And he also knew that if it hadn't been for Thea and her friends just now, the letter in his arms would have been one of the trophies of the forest lords. Thinking of this, her body couldn't help but feel a little cold. It was like an invisible hand was holding her neck making it impossible for her to breathe. At this time, Serdak took out an old plane map. To be fair, the map that Serdak took out was not as valuable as the leather itself to Dennis. The rough lines on it outlined the approximate locations of towns, mountains, and rivers in the dry cloth plain. It was simply too rough. Serdak found the location of Ban's town on the map, circled it with charcoal and said, When they evacuated, they did not choose to go east. It may be that their retreat was blocked by the Lord's army, or it may be that they were unwilling to lead the Lord's army to the rear. We can continue to search forward by following the traces they left. Maybe we can meet survivors. Hearing Soldek say this, Dennis's eyes lit up, and he immediately raised his head and said, Yes, let's go look for it. Serdak looked at the tall girl with long legs and asked, Dennis, can you still walk? We need you to lead the way. Denise gritted her teeth and got up from the ground. Although her body was still shaking, her eyes were extremely firm, and she said loudly, I can! Mountains, dense forests, grass, and wisps of green smoke can be seen in the distance. The wind blowing from the battlefield still carries the smell of blood, and unknown birds are hovering in the sky. Several rebel soldiers stepped on the grass and quickly entered the dense forest. There were thick bushes here and many vines and ferns growing there. The best way to get through these plants was to cut them with a hatchet. To cut them down, you also need to use your hands and feet to climb them using the weight of your body to push them to the sides and separate them into a narrow and stumbling forest path in order to fight against natural enemies. Many vines are covered with small pricking thorns, which are often poisonous. It is not easy for ordinary people to walk through such a dense forest full of shrubs. These rebels all had some injuries on their bodies, and the blood and tree sap made their leather armor very dirty. They carried shields on their backs, and the long swords in their hands kept cutting down the vines blocking the trees in front of them just behind them. There were more than 30 women and children following behind them. The children stared with big frightened eyes, and under the care of the women, they passed through the forest quietly. But the low roar from behind became closer and closer. Not far away, a group of infantrymen from the Lord's army were searching in the forest. Among these Lord's army were three men in black robes with their faces covered. They were holding H, L dogs that exuded a burning stench and were walking in front of the team. The front. The lava flowing on the skin of these H, L dogs has all been extinguished, and they look like hyenas with their fur burned off. Each H, L dog is very slender. There were collars with spikes around their necks, and a piece of thick chain was caught in the hands of the man in black robe. Hellhounds were sniffing everywhere with their bare noses. As long as they find a little clue, they will keep trying to break free from the rope and rush forward. Whenever this happens, the men in black robes will take out long whips made of thorns, and whipped them hard on the bodies of these H, L dogs. Let them calm down. It was precisely because of these three H, L dogs that the rebels could not escape their pursuit even if they got into the dense bushes. The roaring of H, L dogs in the distance became clearer and clearer, and a pale woman with countless small wounds scratched by thorns finally collapsed in the bushes. The two children she was holding were about to cry, but the woman covered their mouths with her hands. Don't cry. We can't run away. Don't worry about us. Get out of here quickly, the woman said to the rebels in front of her with a look of despair in her eyes. The woman behind her also sat in the bushes, refusing to take a step forward. They were exhausted, relying on a little faith in their hearts to support themselves and move forward. Now some people are unwilling to go any further, and that despair is like a levee broken by a flood, infecting everyone.
The rebel soldiers immediately stopped and looked at each other. One of the warrior captains said, We can still hold them for a short while. Pass through this dense forest and climb over two mountain ridges. As long as we can cross the river in front and hide in the cracked place, we should be able to get rid of them. There may be other people there. After saying this, the five rebel soldiers, who were slightly injured and could not even hold their swords, faced the pursuing Lord Army without hesitation. Seeing the women sitting there in a daze, the captain turned around and yelled, Go quickly! Don't let our death be in vain! A vicious H, L dog pounced into a dense bush, and the men in black robes were dragged forward by chains. The black robes on their bodies almost covered their whole bodies. They entered the bushes with thorny vines growing everywhere. The black robes on their bodies were gradually torn by the thorns of the vines. And there were even blood stains on their bodies. Under the torn black robes, arms covered with black inscriptions were revealed. The skin on their bodies has begun to fester. But they are like people who feel no pain. Devil servants is the name given to them by black magicians. They dedicated their souls to the devil and signed a magical contract with the H. L. Dogs. They not only lived and died with these H. L. Dogs, but also shared their abilities. The body skin degenerates and ulcers, and soon their skin will become charred like a H. L. Dog. This group of Lord Army Infantry soldiers followed behind the demon servant, with disgust on their faces. At this time, three H. Lounds roared like crazy at the bushes in front of them. Chapter 996 Rescue The demon servant immediately loosened the chains of the H. L. Dogs and the three H, L dogs rushed into the bushes and bit each other with the five rebel soldiers. The H, L dogs used their huge claws to throw the three rebels to the ground and opened their bloody mouths to bite their necks. The other two rebels carried long swords and chopped off the H, L dog's head. The sword blade left a deep wound on the H, L dog's forehead. The H, L dog paid a shrill roar and worked together to knock down the two rebels behind him. The demon servants also strode into the bushes, with looks of malice and hatred in their eyes. They took out blood-stained daggers from their waists. And just behind the H, L dogs, they swiftly cut the main arteries in their necks. It seems that these demon servants and H, L dogs are extremely thirsty for blood. They stretch out their scarlet tongues and lick the gurgling blood. The demon servants tore off the robes covering their bodies, knelt on one knee, dipped their thumbs in the warm fresh blood, and pressed it on their foreheads, chests and shoulders. There was almost a piece of intact skin on their bodies. After completing the simple sacrifice, the demon servants seemed to have gained some satisfaction and sat there enjoying themselves. The soldiers of the Lord Army took the opportunity to step forward and ended the lives of the five rebels with the weapons in their hands. They did not even want to look at these demon servants. In the eyes of the Lord Army soldiers, they are a group of monsters. If they are caught by the Magic Union Law Enforcement Team, they will be sent to the stake. After the 3-H, L dogs drank human blood. Lava cracks appeared on the surface of their skin again, and a trace of heat emanated from their bodies. Lava flowed out of those cracks, and when it dripped on the ground, bursts of steam emitted. The aura on them became much stronger, and the three demon servants also appeared much stronger. The H, Lound continued to drill along the thorny bushes. Growling sounds become more frequent. The Lord Army soldiers followed behind expressionlessly. From the moment, they entered the bush full of thorns. They felt as if someone was watching them. They walked back to back and looked around. But unfortunately, the bushes and dense forests blocked the surroundings very tightly. Suddenly, there were rapid footsteps behind them. And a dozen Lord Army soldiers turned around at the same time. But no one noticed them. Just when they were looking at each other, the warrior captain of the Lord Army suddenly changed his expression and asked, Where is Jim? Who has seen Jim? The Lord's Army soldier at the end of the team subconsciously turned his head and looked behind him. Jim had put his hand on his shoulder just now. But now there was no one behind him. A Lord's Army soldier actually disappeared out of thin air. They looked back to look for him. But the demon servant in front of them had almost disappeared. I'll go look for you in the back. After the Lord's Army soldier finished speaking, he wanted to go back. Go out quickly. Let's wait for him outside. The leader of the Lord's Army looked up at the dense bushes, wiped the sweat on his forehead and ordered. The captain of the Lord's army felt that this bush was a bit strange and did not dare to stay where it was. He didn't even dare to let his men look back to find the lost companion and hurriedly walked forward, preparing to follow the demon servants. Suddenly, several screams of H, L dogs were heard from the bushes in front. The Lord's army leader, with his leg shaking, rushed to the bushes in front. 
surrounded by a group of warriors. In just a short while, the three H, L dogs were hung high on the horizontal branches of the big tree by ropes. The ropes tied their hind legs, but their heads were completely missing, leaving only huge wounds on their necks. Dark purple blood kept dripping down. The three demon servants also completely disappeared. As if they had never appeared, the captain of the Lord's army pulled out the long sword from his waist and slashed wildly at the surrounding bushes. A group of Lord's army soldiers formed a large circle back to back in the bushes. But no one was found after waiting for a while. Rush up. The Lord's army soldiers continued to move forward. They wanted to leave the bush as soon as possible. The path underfoot is not so easy to walk. The vines and shrubs are like big hands stretching out from the soil. If you are not careful, you will trip. The corpse of a demon servant hung on the horizontal branch of the big tree. One of his arms seemed to be torn off by a huge force. But this time not even a fight or scream could be heard. The warrior captain of the Lord Army stretched out his hand to wipe the sweat from his forehead. He ignored the demon servant, who had no breath of life and did not intend to go any further. Let's withdraw, the warrior captain said coldly. A dozen Lord's Army soldiers immediately walked back along the way they came. The Lord's Army captain knew that the enemy must be hiding in the dark and they seemed to be proficient in assassination techniques. Even those H, L dogs could kill silently. Lose. The captain of the Lord Army Warrior did not dare to think further. He kept looking around, fearing that a murderous sword would stab out from somewhere he couldn't see. A soldier running behind tripped over a cane. The leader of the Lord Army Warriors did not stop, but kept urging the soldiers in front. Go quickly! Get out of here quickly! Just when they returned to the big tree where the three H, L dog corpses were hung, the warrior captain of the Lord Army saw an ogre with two heads on his shoulders sitting under the tree. He didn't know what to hold in his hand. What kind of bone is it? It's being bitten hard. When the two-headed ogre heard the noise, he turned around and saw the warrior captain of the Lord's Army. He threw the bone club aside and wiped his belly with his oily hands. Why did you come back again? His voice was somewhat deep, with a strong Hellanza dialect. Without thinking, the warrior captain of the Lord Army jumped up high to face the ogre. He raised his sword above his head and slashed it hard towards the ogre's head. The two-headed ogre almost seemed to be looking at a fool. He just took a step forward. Two thick arms stretched out like lightning. One hand grabbed the neck of the warrior captain of the Lord Army, and the other hand grabbed the warrior captain. The wrist holding the sword violently threw him to the ground. An irresistible force knocked the warrior captain to pieces. A mouthful of blood spurted out of his mouth, and he felt like he had lost all strength. At this moment, other Lord Army soldiers surrounded the two-headed ogre with weapons raised. A layer of ice armor formed on the two-headed ogre, and the big stick in his hand was rounded, knocking several Lord Army soldiers to the ground. Seeing that the two-headed ogre was unstoppable, the remaining warriors of the Lord's army dispersed, leaving their seriously injured companions behind and threw themselves into the thorny bushes. You can't help but chase us? Gulitam asked Samira, who was catching up from behind. There was a piece of grass clippings on Samira's head, and she held the sky strike bow in her hand. She glanced at the ogre and said, You go and join the boss and the others, and leave this place to me. After saying that, she rushed forward like a cheetah, wearing a dark magic pattern structure with brown dark lines on her body. The thorns in the bushes did not affect her at all. Gilladam's whole body was also the color of rock. He carried the big stick in his hand and rushed toward Serdak's position. The two-headed ogre walked out of the bushes. He had torn off many vines in the bushes along the way. He was wearing armor made of chains and armor pieces. And some broken branches were still hanging on him. On the body. Just outside the bushes. A group of women and children were sitting in the forest clearing. Serdak was using the holy light technique to treat the injured children. He always held a ball of golden light in his hand. Those children he looked at Serdak with admiration. Thea and Dennis were holding some scones to distribute to the children and women. And Dennis was still asking the women about the situation in the rebel camp. When a group of children saw the appearance of the ogre, they were so frightened that they hid behind the women. Don't be afraid. Everyone. He is also my partner. He is a kind ogre. Thea stood up and patted Gulatum's arm gently. Thea's explanation seemed very convincing. The children who were so frightened that they had secretly looked at the two-headed ogre. Gulatum didn't care about this. He sat directly next to Serdak and reported to him. Tamira went after those lords army. Serdak nodded and ordered Gulatum. Go and find some wooden boards for me. His arm is broken. Now I need to reattach his bones and need to fix them with splints. Oh, the two-headed ogre agreed. Then stood up, reached out and broke off a branch. 
and used his carving knife to peel off the bark and quickly cut out two hard boards. Serdak took the wooden board from Gilon's hand, took out a roll of bandages from the magic waste bag, and fixed the child's arm with the wooden board. At this time, Dennis squatted in front of a woman who looked relatively calm and asked her, Which camp are you from? The woman grabbed a piece of cake in her hand and took a big bite. She was probably starving. Dennis handed her his water bottle and asked her to put the food in her mouth into her stomach. Then the woman said, Ant's camp number two. The camp was captured the night before yesterday. Dennis asked eagerly, Where are the others in the camp? The woman buried her head in her knees and cried. A group of us escaped from the camp. There were probably a few hundred people at first. Later we ran into the mountains. Many people got separated. We followed a group of soldiers, prepared to hide deep in the mountains. But they chased many people. And they also brought some vicious dogs that were burned to the point of losing their fur. Those vicious dogs were very ferocious and killed many of us. We couldn't get rid of them at all. Okay. Okay. You're safe now. Dennis patted the woman's back and comforted her. Then he asked, Before the camp was captured, Did you say where everyone was going to evacuate? The woman shook her head in confusion and said, They didn't come so suddenly. We didn't have any alert at all. By the time we discovered them, half of the camp had already fallen, seeing that they were only wearing thin clothes. Many of them were barefoot and their feet were scarred. It was unknown how many hardships they had experienced along the way. Everyone, please rest where you are. I will take you out of here. After Serdak finished speaking, he began to prepare the sacrifice altar and sacrificed the heads of three H, L dogs, giving the most seriously injured child among the group the blessing of God's blessed body. To the east of the town of Bansk are hundreds of mountains, large and small, covered with dense vegetation. Occasionally, a black magician riding a magic harpoon would fly overhead in the sky. In a valley, a rebel team was hiding in a cave. A rebel soldier was lying on the big rock at the top of the cave entrance, paying close attention to the movements of the Lord's Army search team below the valley. His lips were a little chapped, and he touched the water bag behind him. He had already drank all the water in it last night. Although there was a river valley at the foot of the mountain, the rebel soldiers could only watch from a distance and did not dare to move at all. This time, the Lord Army actually dispatched the Third Army to capture the rebel camp east of Bant's town, and a large number of search teams were used to capture the remaining rebel forces in the mountains. As low roars came from the valley, the rebel soldier lying on the rock at the top of the cave was obviously unable to sit still. He quickly slid down from the boulder, got into the hidden cave, and faced to the squadron leader reported. Squadron leader, the H, L dogs are following. We can't hide here anymore. We must move as soon as possible. I will lead a group of people out from here and run forward, trying to divert the Lord Army and search team away from the river. A rebel commander wiped his face and said proactively. He then said to the others, You rush into the river and go down the river. The river water can not only wash away the smell on our bodies, but also save a lot of energy and run as far as possible. After saying that, the rebel captain whispered into the cave, Gather the third team. Follow me. The six rebel soldiers followed the captain and ran out of the cave. They skirted the rocks and ran towards the north exit of the valley. Soon a group of lords guarding the river discovered the movements of the rebel team. And a group of rebels immediately surrounded the rebel team from all sides. Several vicious H, L dogs also appeared in the mountains. Followed by several demon servants. These people chased towards the north slope at the same time. Naturally, the ones rushing at the front were those H, Lounds. They were so agile that they could jump onto a big rock with just one leap forward, seeing the H, L dogs chasing after them. These rebels ran forward even more desperately. An arrow flew from behind and hit a rebel in the back. The rebel's feet softened and he fell to the ground with a thud. The rebel captain running in front ignored the rebel. He gritted his teeth and jumped off a boulder. The five rebel soldiers behind him followed the captain closely and jumped off the boulder one after another. Those H, L dogs passed through the rocks in the mountains and quickly caught up with them. The H, L dog running at the front suddenly lunged forward, put its claws on the shoulders of a rebel soldier, opened its blood plate, and bit into the back of the rebel soldier's neck. The rebel soldiers were on guard for a long time. They immediately lowered their heads and bent down. The long sword in their hands thrust out backwards and stabbed into the soft waist of the hell dog. But he was not prepared for the attack of the H, L dogs. And one person and one dog instantly rolled into a ball. Chapter 997 Rescue 2 An arrow accurately passed through the H, L dog's head and nailed it to a stone wall. 
The rebel soldier under the H, L dog breathed heavily, pushed away the heavy body that was pressing on him, turned over and got up from the ground, and saw a man wearing black leather armor standing on the mountain ridge not far away. Female archer. Other H, L dogs on the mountainside also chased after them, holding the long sword in his hand. He glanced at the other team members who were running down the hillside, pointed at the H, L dog that was rushing towards him from below, and waved to the female archer to run away quickly. But the female archer with flying short hair stood on the boulder, drew the sharp bow in her hand again, and nailed the second H, L dog to the stone wall. The rebel soldier looked back at the female archer in surprise. He did not expect that she would have such a famous archery skill, seeing that the female archer had no intention of retrieving. The rebel soldier spat hard and rushed towards the H, L dog. Before his sword touched the third H, L dog that rushed forward. The H, L dog was shot in the head again, whimpered, and fell on a hard rock. The demon servants who were holding the H, L dogs in the back howled in despair. They signed a contract with the H, L dogs and enjoyed the power that the H, L dogs brought them. At the same time, their lives were tied to these H, L dogs. When the H, L dogs died, they were destined to be unable to live anymore. Before their death, they became extremely crazy, like ghouls crawling out of the cracks in the ground and rushing up the hillside. Just behind these demon servants, the warriors of the Lord Army formed a large fan-shaped net, trying to form an encirclement. The female archer on the rock ignored these people at all and continued to fire her bow and arrow according to her original rhythm. The 8H, L dogs were shot to death by the female archer one by one. The demon servants had already rushed up. The rebel soldiers rushed towards the demon servants. He cut off an arm of the demon servant at the front. But he was the other arm hugged him tightly. The demon servant opened its mouth and tried to bite the rebel soldier's neck. Just as he closed his eyes and waited for death. The demon servant's head rolled away from his eyes like a cabbage. Several other rebel fighters also resurfaced. The rebel captain held his sword upside down, stretched out his hand to pull the rebel soldier up, and said, Wake up and prepare to fight. After Samira dealt with a group of H, L dogs and demon servants, the rebels hiding in the caves also came out one after another and faced the Lord Army down the hillside. I never thought that the fighting will of this group of rebel soldiers would be so tenacious. Although the number of the surrounding Lord's army was several times theirs, these rebel soldiers still rushed forward without hesitation, or because she stood on the boulder and gave these rebels the courage to fight. Obviously, it is difficult for ordinary warriors to pose any threat to the second-level powerhouses on such a battlefield with complex terrain. And Samira relied on a sky-strike bow to almost kill most of the Lord's army. No one could dodge the arrow she shot. She didn't even release her power. Just before these rebels with the cooperation of the soldiers, this Lord army was defeated. Serdak brought Gulidum to the battlefield here. Samira had already commanded these rebel warriors to clean up the battlefield. She asked the rebel warriors to cut off the heads of the H, L dogs. While she personally took action from these lords, the army soldiers found money bags one after another. As for the armor and weapons they had on them, Samira generously gave them to these rebel soldiers. Thank you for coming to the rescue. And also thank you for your generosity. The rebel squadron leader walked out of the crowd and said to Samira. Samira pointed to Serdak, who was coming up from the hillside not far away, and said casually, This is our leader. Serdak. Soldak walked closer, looked at the bearded rebel squadron leader, and asked him, What is your name? Ned Mosby. The rebel squadron leader said, Ned, which camp are you from? Soldak asked again. Ned Mosby immediately replied, Camp 3. Serdak looked around and asked Ned, Are there any survivors around here? The rebel squadron leader showed a bitter smile and said, I don't know. We all ran away. We have been hiding in that cave since last night. Samira jumped onto a big rock high in the valley and then shouted to Serdek. Boss, the Lord Army is gathering at the intersection of the valley and rivers and there are black magicians flying over. Serdak looked at this group of rebel fighters. Almost all of them were injured. Most of them slightly injured. After thinking for a while, he said to them, We will retreat north along the mountains first. We must avoid the black magicians. As long as we get into the dense bushes, the black magicians will not be able to find us. Ned immediately called a group of soldiers under his command and followed Soldak and his party to retreat north. Along the way, Serdak used holy light to treat the injured rebels. As expected, a black spot appeared in the sky not long after, and a black magician flew over from the sky riding a magic harpoon handle. Samira immediately disappeared. 
preparing to shoot the black magician down once he got close. However, the black magician just followed from a distance and did not take the risk of flying at low altitude. Serdak saw that the Lord Army behind him could not catch up for a while. So he headed towards the northern mountains and led more than 40 rebel soldiers into the dense forest. The black magician was hovering back and forth on the edge of the dense forest. Samira also discovered that a large number of demon servants and H. L. dogs were gathering towards this side. Unexpectedly, the Black Magic Monastery would actually develop a group of demon servants in the plain of Ganbu. Serdak was ready to reveal the news to the avid magician, waiting for the large army of lords behind to gather at the foot of the mountain. Serdak led more than 40 rebels over the mountains and joined the women and children hiding in the dense forest. The women and children in the camp finally felt relieved when they saw Serdak bringing back a group of rebel fighters. However, these people are not in the same camp, so they are not familiar with each other. The team suddenly expanded to 80 people. These rebels and their families did not bring any dry food. Before meeting Serdak and the others, it was difficult for these people to even drink water. After all, the Lord Army search team would set up sentries near water sources. Although there are some small beasts in this mountain forest, there are not that many. Hunting the small beasts in the forest simply cannot fill the stomachs of this group of people. Fortunately, there was news from Aphrodite that the airship she was on was about to arrive in Benis City. Now it was necessary for Serdak to get back to the airship and take her off the ship. In this way, Serdak can purchase some supplies from Benis City and temporarily help the rebels. Chapter 998 Buying Grain Wearing an exquisite mithril mask Wearing a gorgeous evening dress And colorful feathers Aphrodite held Soldak's arm in an extremely high-profile manner and walked down from the airport tower from the magic airship. The sexy body attracted the attention of almost everyone on the airport tower. So much so that the crew members only remembered the Viscount badge on Serdak's chest and didn't even pay attention to what he looked like. This night, even the porters at the airport terminal were talking about the arrival of a lady with a mithril mask covering her face in Benis City. But no one knew her identity. The two walked out of the airport terminal and boarded a magic caravan smoothly. Aphrodite took off the cloak woven with colorful dragon and eagle feathers and covered herself with a black robe. He rushed to Benis City without any delay and even changed into a magic caravan at the gate of Benis City, with the Viscount badge on his chest. Soldak entered Benis City almost without any hindrance, and then reported the address of the Circle City Hotel to the coachman. Aphrodite leaned on the soft leather sofa in the carriage, lifting the mithril mask of the faceless man above her head. She had long eyelashes and dark purple eyes, which coexisted with innocence and charm. She lay half-lying lazily, opposite Serdak, squinting at him. So you plan to stay in the Ganbu plane for a while? Aphrodite asked. Serdak sat opposite Aphrodite, his hands casually resting on the generous backrest of the soft leather sofa, nodded and said, I have this plan, but this matter cannot be decided by me alone. I need the support of Marquis Luther. Otherwise, the two mines on the Belan plain and Pussy Mountain will definitely not be able to support this war. Before that, I must give myself a reason to return to Benis City. When the carriage passed through the city's inland river, Soldak glanced out the window. The ice flows on the river were already showing signs of thawing. Serdak whispered to Aphrodite. Do I need you to travel more recently? Aphrodite sat up directly from the soft leather sofa, widened her eyes and asked. Don't you still want me to help you go to Bailin's plane? Soldak gritted his teeth and said with a smile on his face. The portal of Bailin's plane is in the back garden of Duke Newman's mansion. It's not too far from here. I can personally take you to Will when the time comes. Kess City. Aphrodite shouted to Serdak with an angry face. Soldak, I've had enough of you. Her voice may have been so sharp that even the coachman driving outside was startled. Serdak quickly accompanied Smiley, leaned over and put his arm around Aphrodite's shoulder, and kept comforting him. Ha! Huh. Please, please, I know you have worked hard all the way. Aphrodite was sitting in the magic caravan. Her beautiful eyes turned slightly. She immediately changed her tone. Her tone softened a lot. And she said to Serdak, It's not impossible for me to go to the Belan Plain. Hey, Serdak, let me ask you a question. As a paladin, how can you not be hostile to me? Aren't we supposed to be natural enemies? Serdak was a little dumbfounded and didn't understand why Aphrodite asked this at this time. Huh? When I met you, I was not a paladin. Serdak said with a blank look on his face. As a paladin, should I hate every demon? Soldak added, Normally. That's it. Paladins should be hostile to all demons. Aphrodite replied seriously. 
Sardak smiled, reached out and pinched the succubus smooth face, and said with a half smile, Maybe it's your gentleness and beauty that impressed me. Dear Miss Aphrodite, believe it or not, when you met Marky Luther, I followed you secretly and spread my wings when you met. Aphrodite said angrily. The magic caravan slowly stopped at the door of the Circle City Hotel. Sardak quickly opened the door, jumped out of the car first, and reached out to support Aphrodite's arm. Aphrodite held her black robe in one hand to prevent the ham from dragging the floor when she got out of the car. Then he took Soldak's arm and walked into the hotel. I chose a room in the noble area on the north side and paid for one month's rent. Sardak sent Aphrodite back to the room, stood at the door and asked Aphrodite, Okay, dear Ms. Aphrodite, the room is here. Do you want to go out with me later? Aphrodite was about to take off the mask on her face when she heard Soldak ask, Aren't you planning to go to the Marquis Mansion? Sardak waved his hand and said, I can't go yet. I'm going to purchase some food and will return to the Ganbu Plain immediately. Aphrodite asked tentatively, Are you going to see your two fiancés? Well, now that I see them, what do you think I can say? Tell them that I have a demon friend who can summon me from the Ganbu Plain at will. Sardak said angrily. Aphrodite felt inexplicably beautiful when she heard that Sardak had arrived in Benna City and had not yet gone to meet his two fiancés. She turned around, closed the hotel door directly, took Sardak's arm and said to her go outside. Actually, it's not impossible for you to say that, she said duplicitously. Sardak chuckled and said, forget it. I'll buy the damaged components of the temporary teleportation circle step by step, and then return through the teleportation gate to see them again. Whatever. Aphrodite felt inexplicably want to laugh after saying this. Although the mithril mask covered her face, it could not cover her swaying shoulders. Ciudad Bena is the capital of the province of Bena and the largest city in the province. The General Magic Guild here has registered almost half of the magicians in Bena province. You can meet magicians wearing black robes just walking on the street. If they don't reveal their identity, it will be difficult to tell that they are ordinary magicians. He is also a magician in the law enforcement group. In addition, the demon hunters from the Mercenary Guild and the Adventure Guild also gathered in Bena City. Therefore, this city is definitely a crisis-ridden city for the succubus Aphrodite. Unless Serdak was in the city of Bena, Aphrodite had no intention of staying in the city. After Soldak was promoted to the second rank, she had enough power to stay in the Ganbu Plain. She planned to handle the affairs in Bena City with Serdak, and then open the Void Gate and go to Ganbu. Walk around the plain. The two took the magic caravan to number 75 Street, which was dotted with large and small grain merchants. The magic spray truck stopped at the street corner. Soldak pulled Aphrodite out of the magic caravan, and the two quickly walked into a business that looked good in size. The plaque of the business house is a bunch of copper ears of wheat, and the box at the door contains a large amount of wheat flour. Soldak put the noble badge on his chest before getting out of the car. He looked around the grain store and saw that there were quite a lot of customers in the store. At this time, a commercial bank manager walked up to Soldak and said to him respectfully, Lord, what can I do for you? Serdak glanced at the business manager and couldn't figure out how he knew that he belonged to the Lord. After thinking for a while, he said, Well, I need ten tons of wheat flour. I can also get some grains and black beans. The store manager's eyes lit up slightly, and he immediately invited Soldak to the booth in the hall to introduce various wheat flours at different prices. Finally, he said, I can give you the best price. Wheat is also grown in the province of Bena but it has never been able to grow on a large scale. Nowadays, the grain market is basically monopolized by the southern lords. Wheat flour is sold for only 60 silver coins per ton, while miscellaneous grains and black beans are cheaper. Only 25 silver coins per ton. The price quoted by this trading house to Soldak was only 55 silver coins per ton of wheat flour, and only 20 silver coins per ton of grains and black beans. Of course, this requires a large amount to enjoy the price of this bulk deal. Serdak's purchase volume is actually not large. It can be regarded as just getting involved in a large-scale transaction. This is still a large order after adding 10 tons of grains and black beans. These southern grain merchants have their own way of doing business. We will never hesitate at all, because the first order amount is small. On the contrary, we will try our best to provide all the convenient services allowed by the firm. After Serdak had inspected the wheat flour, the manager of the trading company asked Serdak, Lord, when are you going to transport this grain? Just now, Soldak said casually. The manager of the trading company then said, 
If you have not prepared a four-wheel truck, our company can deliver these grains to any warehouse or airport terminal in Venice City for you. Soldak thought that he didn't have any warehouse here. And of course, he didn't need to transport it to the airport terminal. He waved his hand and said, Well, no need. I'm going to put it here. After saying that, he patted the magic fanny pack on his waist. Serdak took out 10 gold coins from his wallet and handed them to the store manager. The clerk here had already piled Soldak's grain into a pile. Then he put the wheat flour into four magic waste bags. Aphrodite wore a mithril mask and stood beside Serdak without saying a word the whole time. After purchasing the wheat flour, Soldak went to the bakery and bought more than 200 baked wheat cakes. He also bought 10 boxes of luncheon meat and 20 marching tents from the grocery store next door. This was the completion of the project. Shopping trip. Just before the sun set on Benes City, Serdak took Aphrodite back to the mountains of the Gonbu Plain. Serdak emerged from the marching tent, and the two-headed ogre moved his butt away from the tent. Gulitam was boiling a large pot of boiling water in front of the tent, with some unknown contents in the pot. When the wild vegetables are boiled, the whole soup pot is filled with green juice. Gulitam, please don't make breakfast so disgusting. Aphrodite came out of the tent and said to him, as he watched Gulitam stirring the soup pot with a big wooden spoon. Aphrodite, hey, long time no see. Gulitam said H, low to Aphrodite naively. Good brother now Huar put his ear to Gulitam's ear and whispered. Hey, brother, what do you have to say to that woman? Gulitam didn't care. He just patted the plate armor on his belly with a big hand and said with a hee 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 smile. Boss, if you don't come out, we will eat grass for this meal. Serdak stood by the soup pot, looking at the messy little animals that were not thrown into the pot, and nodded and said, It's a good thing I made it in time, wasn't it? As he spoke, he took out a stack of baked wheat cakes from the magic waste bag and handed them to the ogre. These baked wheat cakes were still warm from the heat of being freshly baked, and the crusts were crispy. The two-headed ogre gave a low cry, picked up a large piece of cake, and stuffed it into his mouth. Be reserved. Pay attention. Brother, you are a noble ogre. Nohar was a little dissatisfied with the appearance of his good brother. Gulitam picked up another piece of big cake and said vaguely, Forget it. If you don't eat it again, I will help you eat your share. Nohar immediately grabbed one and sat next to the soup pot and started chewing. Serdak ignored them pulled out the dagger from his thigh, cut a box of lunch meat in half, scratched the inside of the lunch meat box twice with the dagger, and then threw the lunch meat into the tumbling soup pot. One box, two boxes, three boxes, and it didn't stop until the tenth box. The children and women were almost staring straight at the rebels, who were resting on the grass and tree roots next to the marching tent. Even if this kind of lunch meat is included in the march ration quota of the Lord's army, only the squadron leader is eligible to enjoy it. It's not that they haven't seen it before, but few people have eaten it. It's a pity that without vermicelli, this stew has no soul. As he spoke, Serdak pulled out another bag of wheat flour from his magic waste bag, untied the hemp rope at the seal, poured some wheat flour into a small pot, and then took the wooden stick from Gulitam's hand. Use a spoon to add water to the small pot while stirring constantly. The crumbled dough is poured into the iron pot. The soup in the pot began to become cloudy and thick and after a while small bubbles began to appear. After Serdak poured a small pot of noodles into it, he said proudly, Let you try the delicacies of my hometown. After saying that, he first scooped a small pot full of pimple soup for the ogre. The ogre was never willing to give in when it came to eating, and this guy is not afraid of the heat. He put his thick lips on the edge of the small pot, took a thin mouthful, and then took another bite of the crispy pancake. Come on, let's eat. First the wounded, then the children. Then the women and soldiers. Serdak stood next to the large soup pot, waving the wooden spoon in his hand, and shouted loudly to the rebels in the forest. The women took the initiative to help these wounded soldiers receive food. Each of them had a large bowl of pimple soup and half a piece of scone, which was quite generous. These rebel children have also been lining up since childhood, each holding a large wooden bowl in their hands, and their big eyes looking expectantly at the spoon in Serdak's hand and the pile of scones behind him seemed a little worried that the food would be distributed before it was their turn. After breakfast, Soldak checked the condition of the wounded, and then led a group of rebels to search the valley on the other side through the dew-covered grass. Chapter 999 Revenge With the help of Postman Dennis and Ned Mosby, Soldak also found out the situation nearby. 
The latest news is that the five rebel camps located on the eastern outskirts of Bant's town have been successively captured by the Lord's Third Army. A large number of soldiers and residents from the rebel camp were scattered in the mountains in the southeastern area of Bant's town. A large number of soldiers from the Third Legion of the Lord's Army and the local security team also entered the mountains to hunt down the remaining rebel troops. This place is close to the edge of the plain, and rocks often break off and fall into the abyss. Therefore, although there is dense vegetation growing here, it is an inaccessible place. This mountain range becomes more dangerous as you go south. The rebels originally chose to set up camp here mainly because they considered that the Lord Army would not easily capture it. No one expected that the Third Legion of the Lord Army would boldly enter this mountain forest this time. And with the help of the Black Magician Investigation Team, they would find five rebel camps one after another. Aphrodite did not return to the hotel in Benis City. She stayed in the camp. But even in the camp, only a few people actually saw her. She said she wanted to wander around the nearby mountains and left the camp. Samira brought back a group of wounded rebel soldiers. The women and children in the camp were already familiar with how to take care of these wounded soldiers. They first checked the specific injuries of these wounded soldiers and then helped them treat their wounds, waiting to receive Serdak. Treatment. These new rebel fighters immediately asked others about the situation in each camp. When they heard that all the rebel camps around Banks Town had fallen, the camp fell silent. That night, Serdak gathered everyone in the forest glade. Nearly a hundred rebel soldiers have gradually gathered in the camp, although more than half of them were injured. The fact that these rebels were able to escape from the roundup of the Third Army was not only good luck, but also proved that they were a group of jungle soldiers, a warrior with rich combat experience. The children and women in the rebel camp stood on the periphery of the crowd. Everyone looked at Serdak. Serdak stood on a boulder and said to the rebel soldiers at his feet, The third army of the Lord's army has been on the outskirts of Bansk for ten days, and the five camps here have been captured by them one after another. This time, the Lord's army is stronger than ever before. They have air units for reconnaissance, early warning and communications. Each search team also carries H, L dogs and demon servants. These people are working with demons. Maybe one day, the demon lord of the age, L world will come to this plane. You have been able to survive the pursuit of the lord army. Many of you have created opportunities for you because of your dead companions around you. Now I can provide you with basic treatment. But I also hope that you can join our temporary search and rescue team. And let's search the nearby area together to find anyone else who's still alive. Lord Serdak, I want to join. I join. For a time, the morale of the rebel soldiers in the camp was high. Everyone responded positively. And many people's eyes also had more color. No matter what those colors are. Whether they are hope or the anger of revenge. These are the beliefs they live by. Dinner was prepared by the women in the camp. A large pot of oatmeal was cooked in the camp. The women wanted to save food as much as possible. They took a group of children with them to dig some bracken around the woodland and returned and added it to the soup pot. For this reason, Soldak took out a few more bags of wheat flour, saying that the camp was not selling food for the time being and there was no need to save so much. Serdak returned to the tent. Samira, Thea, and Aphrodite were all sitting inside the tent. The two-headed ogre was so big that he could only sit outside the tent and put his two heads close to the open door. Serdak spread the map on the ground, held it down with a lantern, and then said, This time, because the Black Magic Monastery has openly joined the Lord Army's camp. They have the advantage of aerial reconnaissance. And it is still unknown how many H, L dogs they have summoned from the H, L world. Samira, the top priority now is to do everything possible. You may be able to trap those Black Magicians, lure them down from the sky, and then take the opportunity to kill them. In this matter, you are probably the only one in our group who has such strength. Ahem. The succubus Aphrodite sitting next to her cough twice. Serdak had no choice but to add. Well, if Aphrodite has any good ideas, she can also hunt down those black magicians. In addition to using force to kill those black magicians, you can also use your brain, Aphrodite said in the tent. She took off the mithril mask on her face, and Thea discovered that she actually had two horns on her head, and she opened her mouth in surprise without knowing how to close it. Serdak ignored Aphrodite and continued. In short, we must knock out a few of their teeth to make those black magicians restrain themselves even in the sky. After speaking, he set his eyes on the map. Although this map is useless, he still likes to take it out every time he assigns a task. He pointed to the southeastern area of Bant's town and said, We are currently in this mountain range. 
With our camp as the center, our search team has searched an area of 10 kilometers around here and has encountered several encounters during this period. Since this afternoon, the number of black magicians flying through the sky in this area has also increased significantly. According to my judgment, the third army is likely to know the approximate location of our camp. I will lead them by the nose and continue walking to the south of the mountain to see if they dare to follow. Samira frowned and asked Soldek, Do you want to lead them to the collapsed mountains? Maybe. Serdak's eyes fell on the map, and he said noncommittally. Late at night, the night sky overhead hangs with golden ribbons formed by the countercurrent of time and space. The black magician who rides on a magic harpoon to conduct reconnaissance in the sky will occasionally fly overhead. Aphrodite squatted on a stone by the river, staring at the blonde girl crying on the two corpses next to the sand pile not far away. Her clothes were in rags, probably scratched by vines and branches while fleeing and even one of her shoes was missing. The foot was wrapped with a straw rope, and there were some blood stains all over her body. While she was crying, she dragged the body to the sand hill and scraped it. He removed some weeds with well-rooted roots on the sandy hill, dug out two sand pits on the sandy hill with branches, buried the two bodies in them, and inserted the branches in his hands into the sand. Then she threw herself in front of the cemetery and started crying. She was probably too tired. So she laid down in Shadong Cemetery and fell asleep. Aphrodite walked over lightly, stepping on the sand with her bare feet. She looked at the blonde girl who was guarding the cemetery and refused to leave. She reached out and gently lifted her long, greasy hair, revealing her full face. It's the face of dirt. They just stared at it for a while, until the blonde girl suddenly woke up from her nightmare and saw the woman in black robes sitting opposite her. She was almost like a frightened orange cat and the hair on her body was about to explode. Her first reaction was to get in. Enter the grass and shagong. Don't be afraid. I don't mean any harm. On the contrary, it may be an opportunity for you. Let me think about it. I will give you two choices now. Oh, no. You can actually make three choices. The blonde girl hid in the grass and stopped inexplicably. Aphrodite's words seemed to have a kind of magic power. Attracting her again. Listen. I can take you to a relatively safe rebel camp. And you can follow them out of here. Also, I can also help you get revenge. But this is risky. You may die. But the chance of killing your enemy is also very high. The third option is your right. You can also choose to leave now. Aphrodite stood up casually, exuding a strong coercion that made the blonde girl tremble from the bottom of her heart. The blonde girl also stood up from the grass. She stared at Aphrodite and said in a hoarse voice, I want to know who you are. Aphrodite still had a mask on her face. Her open hands ignited dark purple flames and said to the blonde girl, My name is Aphrodite. I came here from the canyon town to help you. Although I don't really want to do this. I choose revenge. The woman's eyes are filled with flames of hatred. To be honest, I like your choice. Aphrodite flicked her fingers and the flames immediately disappeared from her fingertips. She said to the blonde girl excitedly, Come on. Let me tell you my plan. It's great. With you. I don't need to appear in person. And this game will become more fun. In the early morning, by the river, the fog was blown away by the breeze. Amidst the rushing sound of the river, there was also an unusual sound, like someone splashing water on themselves. A small team of Lord's army approached the river cautiously. They were very careful. Recently, many Lord's army had been ambushed by rebels hiding in the mountains. Obviously, there must be a very powerful commander on the opposite side. The search teams now carrying out searches carry magic flares with them. As long as an emergency is discovered, they can release the flares at any time to summon air support. But thinking about those black magicians, the captain of the Lord's army shook his head silently. Unless those black magicians are given enough benefits, the result of summoning them rashly is to become a servant of the devil. At this time, the mist by the river suddenly dispersed, and all the Lord army soldiers' eyes fell on the river. They saw a blonde girl washing her hair in waist-deep water in the bend of the river not far away. She bent her slender waist, although there were still slight scars on her ribs. Her long wheat-colored legs and plump breasts made these Lord Army soldiers look straight at her. Under the assignment of the leader of the Lord's Army soldiers, the two soldiers quickly rushed to the commanding heights of the sand hill. Then the two soldiers made all safe gestures, and the warrior captain asked them to continue to stay there. The rest of the Lord's Army formed an encirclement and surrounded them. Chapter 1000 Hunting The blonde girl in the river quickly discovered the Lord Army surrounding her. She shook off her long wet hair, 
splashed in the waist-deep river water, and ran towards the other side of the river bank in panic. The gleaming weapon and the dark armor stepped into the river, and the splashing water was like a wall of water. The blonde girl's heart was beating wildly, and she ran with all her strength in the cool river water. The soldiers of the Lord's army had been prepared for a long time. The warrior captain asked the two soldiers to sneak across the river valley from the shallow water area in advance, and they had already landed on the beach. These heavily armored warriors move clumsily in the river, but become much more agile on the shore, although she knew that Aphrodite was nearby. The blonde girl still felt an almost desperate panic in her heart. She gasped violently, and her heart was ready to jump out of her throat like a runaway wild horse. The blonde girl was about to run to the river bank when she saw the Lord's army soldiers rushing over from the beach. She immediately turned around and threw herself into the river. She planned to go down the river and break through the encirclement of these Lord's army. But at this time, a Lord army soldier jumped from the shore and threw her into the river. The blonde girl struggled to stand up in the cold river water. Two Lord army soldiers holding long swords were already standing beside her. If these lords and soldiers hadn't been staring at the blonde girl's plump breasts, I'm afraid they would have discovered the hatred in the girl's eyes that was not afraid of life and death. A soldier from the Lord's army put his sword on the shoulder of the blonde girl. The blonde girl stood in the river and did not dare to move. At the same time, she lowered her eyelids and her body was trembling. She wanted to pull up her bra, only to find that there wasn't much fabric at all. Two Lord army soldiers escorted her to the river bank and kicked her down on the beach. The warrior captain led a group of warriors over from the other side, stepped on the soft sand, and looked closely at the blonde girl. The blonde girl was not very beautiful, but by the river in this remote valley, she was dressed so coolly and her figure was above the passing mark. She had a very fatal attraction for these lords, who had been in the mountains for almost two weeks. The soldiers all seemed very excited, and some even started jumping into the river excitedly, preparing to wash themselves first. However, Everyone knows the rules in the military camp. Everyone is waiting for the soldier captain to come first. So the soldiers look at the captain. The captain stood in front of the blonde girl, looking at her with arrogant eyes. In the jungle not far from the river bank, a magic flare suddenly flew into the sky. The dark red light bomb dragged a long tail in the sky and finally slowly fell into the valley. Who the H? Al dares to call a magician at this time? Is it because I don't have enough viewers? The warrior captain turned his head and looked over, just in time to see the flare rising into the sky. His scarred face was fierce, and he put down the blonde girl in a rage, and rushed into the forest with his long sword. A group of warriors followed closely, followed by a soldier guards the blonde by the river. These Lord Army soldiers searched around the forest, but unfortunately found nothing. Captain, do you think it's the brother team that is ruining our good deeds? A Lord Army soldier asked the warrior captain. The warrior captain took a long sword and cut off the horizontal branches of a big tree and said fiercely, If you let me know who did it, I will kick him out. With that said, he gave up the search near the jungle and turned back to the river. The soldier guarding the blonde immediately stepped aside. The warrior captain came over and handed the long sword in his hand to the henchman beside him, took off the heavy helmet with a mask on his head, and unfastened the leather buckle at the waist of the heavy armor with one hand. The blonde girl sat on the sand. She felt that her ribs might have been broken by the warrior's kick. The warrior captain unfastened the buckle of his breastplate. But at this moment, the confidant beside him came over and whispered in his ear. Captain, the master magician is flying over from over there. The warrior captain immediately threw his armor on the sand in annoyance. Captain, what should we say later? The cronies were preparing to lead people to intercept the black magician who came from the air. The captain of the Lord's army rubbed his forehead hesitated for a moment, gritted his teeth and stared at the surrounding Lord's army soldiers, and said to his cronies, Just say I'll grab a girl and give him a gift. The soldiers waiting in line suddenly asked reluctantly, Captain, do we really want to give this piece of meat to others? Otherwise, what else can we do? Are we supposed to report to the regiment leader that we sent out a magic flare for no reason to trick him? Now in the Legion, the relationship between us and these black magicians is already very tense. Do you think the board has fallen? Keller? Will the army commander attack us or those magician nobles? The Lord Army Commander said bitterly. He bent down and picked up the breastplate from the sand and put the helmet on his head again. His irritability gradually calmed down and he heard him say, I want to find a woman in the tavern in Bankstown. Ten silver coins I can just find a bar girl. Isn't it better than this? Come on. Don't you guys say anything. I'll deal with him. 
a group of Lord Army soldiers quickly dispersed, pretending to be on guard around them. The warrior captain lifted the visor on his helmet, rubbed his face vigorously, and forced himself to smile. A black magician rode a magic harpoon and circled over the river valley without detecting any enemy signs. When he saw the pair of Lord Army soldiers waiting obediently by the river, he lowered his flying height and moved closer to these Lord Army soldiers. Did you just send the flare? The black magician flew over the captain of the Lord's Army soldier and asked with an unhappy look on his face. The magic harpoon hovered in midair. The warrior captain tried his best to raise his head, but could only see the soles of his shoes and the floating magic circle that lit up on the magic harpoon. The warrior captain of the Lord Army nodded quickly and said to the black magician, Mr. Magician, we found a rebel nearby. Why did you tell me if you found a rebel? Wouldn't you kill him? Before the black magician could finish speaking, the captain of the Lord's Army had already moved his body away, revealing the blonde girl on the beach by the river. There was a hint of surprise on the originally displeased face of the black magician. He looked around suspiciously and saw Lord Army soldiers guarding the surroundings. It seemed that the river valley was quite safe. So he slowly took back his hand and transported it. Magic. The energy of the floating array gradually weakened. And the black magician rode a magic harpoon and slowly landed by the river. He stood and narrowed his eyes, staring at the blonde girl, slowly shaving the stubble on his chin with his left hand, and said intriguingly, Is this the rebel you found? There is indeed a strong suspicion. He walked towards the blonde girl with a lustful look. The black magic robe could not bring him much dignity. He just wanted to kill a black crow jumping on the ground with its wings spread. His eyes were like venomous snakes. He reached out and grabbed the blonde's chin. And the black magician lifted her head up. The blonde girl's eyes were filled with hatred. And she sneered at the black magician and said in a voice that only the black magician could hear, Do you know how long I have been standing in the river waiting for you? The black magician looked at the blonde girl in surprise, wondering why she said such an inexplicable sentence. An inexplicable panic rushed from the soles of his feet to the top of his head, and a strong urge to urinate welled up under his lower abdomen. His magic harpoon handle was still floating not far away, and he had no time to run back. He reached out and took out a magic shield scroll from his magic belt bag. With a short spell, a golden translucent edge, El covered him. At this moment, a huge eyeball emerged from the river, floating in the air little by little amid a dizzying spell, before anyone else could react. A ring of black mist suddenly spread out the moment the spell stopped. Sleeping Cloud? The black magician in the magic shield was the first to bear the impact of the black mist with frightened eyes. He almost didn't have time to take out the sobriety pendant in his pocket, and fell straight on the beach as if he was fast asleep. Superior. The other Lord Army soldiers also fell to the ground. The river water under the huge eyeball suddenly swelled high. Aphrodite stood up from the river water, walked ashore wet, and came to the blonde girl's side, waking her up from her sleep. She patted her face gently and said in her ear, Hey, wake up! The blonde girl opened her eyes in confusion and looked around. Memories slowly filled her mind. She suddenly sat up from the sand and looked around. Aphrodite thrust a dagger into her hand and said, Now it's your turn to fulfill your wish. The blonde girl tightened her grip on the sharp dagger. She walked to the black magician tremblingly, squatted beside him, lifted his jaw with one hand, made him look up to reveal his bulging Adam's apple, and pressed the sharp black dagger hard. Go up. She closed her eyes. When the blade cut into her throat, it was like cutting a sausage at home. The dagger was so sharp that it touched the vertebrae of her neck before she could exert any force. Hurry up. I plan to do it again in a different position. I guess the river won't be so cold after a while. When Aphrodite said this, she was carefully studying a magic harpoon in front of her. Although it is called the magic harpoon by all magicians, its appearance does not seem to have anything to do with the harpoon. The magic harpoon is mainly divided into three parts. The tiller that controls the direction, and the saddle containing the magic crystal, a magical floating device used as a source of power. The blonde girl's tears rolled down her cheeks, but she bit her lip to prevent herself from crying, and took the dagger to cut off the heads of other Lord Army soldiers. Aphrodite rummaged through the black magician's belongings again tied the magic belt bag around his waist, pulled off his black robe and threw it to the blonde girl, and said to her, Put it on! This kind of robe in terms of texture alone. It's pretty good! The blonde girl found a good dagger from the corpses of these Lord Army soldiers and tied it to her thigh. She also picked up a long thin-edged sword and put it on her back, and then quickly followed Aphrodite out of the valley. 
a magic flare broke through the sky and drew an exaggerated arc in the sky. Jude rode the magic harpoon and flew in the direction guided by the magic signal flare. He bought this magic pot the year he graduated from the Binna City Magic Academy. At that time, he could get a high monthly allowance from the magic guild to magicians. And because he had room and board at the academy, basically all this money could not be spent. So when I graduated, I actually saved enough money to buy a magic pot that cost as much as 80 magic crystals. He still remembers the white roses on the balcony of the Magic Academy. The olive branch extended to young people like them by the Bena noble who attended their graduation ceremony. And the sexy and beautiful aristocratic ladies at the ball. After young magicians graduate from the Magic Academy, some will choose to join an adventure group and travel around the world to experience. They seek to break through themselves on the road of experience. Some will choose to join professional unions, such as alchemy, inscription, enchanting, gem processing, potions, astrologers, etc. These magicians will become richer, and some will join the law enforcement team of the magic union and become a part of defending the honor of magic. But Ju chose a completely different path that year. He chose to join the Priory of Dark Arts. Since then, Jude has never received a magic subsidy and has been studying black magic day and night every day. But now, the most he can do is use the summoning magic circle to summon two two-headed H, L dogs. The wind in the sky hurt his cheek. An open valley suddenly appeared in front of the river valley. This low-lying open land was filled with small puddles and lush aquatic plants. On both sides of the open area were cliffs tens of meters high. When Jude flew over the cliffs, he deliberately looked down. The bare cliffs were covered with messy rocks and occasionally some small bushes. Jude finally saw the team of soldiers who sent the magic signal. He saw them huddled together against the cliff in a low-lying swamp. There was a two-meter-high stone platform here, and a dozen Lord Army soldiers were huddled on it. On the stone platform, and under the stone platform are dozens of giant swamp crocodiles. Jude flew across the valley, and the Lord Army soldiers waved to Jude desperately. These damn fools! Jude cursed in his heart but he had to fly over to deal with such trouble. The Lord Army soldiers in the swamp saw a black magician flying over on a magic harpoon. And they cheered almost simultaneously. Samira was lying on the cliff. Her back covered with a camouflage made of vines and thorns. In order to keep this layer of camouflage green leaves longer, she also sprinkled some water on it to make it look greener. She lay on the rock on the top of the mountain and waited quietly for the whole morning. The rebel soldiers below the valley had to throw some fresh meat to the crocodiles in the waterhole every quarter of an hour to keep them willing to gather around the rock. The weather was scorching hot, and the soldiers were all crowded together, and they were all wearing the heavy armor like the iron cans of the Lord's army. They were like pies in the oven. The fourth magic flare flew into the sky. Samira felt that if this magic flare could not attract the black magician, then the hunting operation would start here, just when her last bit of patience was about to disappear. A black magician finally flew towards the wind. The black magic robe was flying fiercely in the wind. Samira couldn't control her hand to grab the sky strike bow. After waiting for so long, it still came. She licked her dry lips and stuffed a green apple into her mouth, just as the black magician flew over the cliff on his magic harpoon, turned around and dived towards the bottom of the valley. The black magician holding a big fireball in his hand. Close. Closer. Closer. Samira also stood up from the boulder on the top of the mountain and detonated a magic crystal on the bow arm on the boulder. Surrounded by countless arcs and wind blades, the shadow of a great elf windrunner appeared on the top of the mountain, and two lights Yaichi flew out from the top of the mountain one after another, flying towards the black magician, who was swooping down with a big fireball held high. Jude looked at the flying arrows with a horrified expression, never expecting that this would be a trap. He desperately raised the helm of the magic helm, preparing to fly into the sky again. A light arrow filled with electric arcs shot into Jude's chest. The electric arcs instantly spread all over his body, and he felt numb all over. The next moment, a bolt of lightning fell from high altitude and hit Jude accurately. There was a loud bang, and a huge fireball appeared in midair. The whole person became scorched in midair, and the magic harpoon was instantly broken into pieces and fell into the swamp. This huge earthquake also scared the group of crocodiles in the swamp and fled in all directions. It took a lot of effort to find so many giant swamp crocodiles. In the past, it was difficult to deal with them without such sophisticated weapons. Now that the rebels are wearing sophisticated heavy armor captured from the Lord Army, they are naturally no longer afraid of these crocodiles. Naturally, 
they wanted to take this opportunity to kill two more. They also heard that they could exchange the crocodile meat with the two-headed ogre for some unexpected good things, such as a few silver coins. Samira stood on the cliff, looking at the vast mountain forest in front of her, and slowly eating the green apple. The light red eyes looked towards the horizon in the distance. Chapter 1001 Pigeon Cage During these seven days, Aphrodite and Samira's seven hunts had successes and failures. When the number of black magicians hunted in this area has increased to five, black magicians can no longer be seen flying around in the sky. And this area has become a forbidden zone for black magicians. At the same time, the main force of the Lord's Third Army also concentrated its main force here. As a large number of troops began to search across the mountains, Serdek led the nearly 300 rebels who had gathered together these days to climb over the mountains and head towards the Honkai Mountains in the south. Nearly half of this team was injured and they basically had to be carried on their backs along the way. They didn't walk very far every day, because Samira and Aphrodite drove away the black magicians in the sky. These Lord Army search teams were blinded. Those H. L. dogs didn't know what went crazy recently, and they dared not leave no matter what, entering the mountain to the south. Even those demon servants can't do anything with them. The Lord Army soldiers in the same team just stood by and watched their jokes from a distance. But no one stood up to help them analyze what went wrong. This resulted in the process of searching the mountain for the main force of the Lord Army being quite slow. The greater difficulty faced by the Third Army is that the supply line is too long and the military supplies from the rear cannot be transported. To say that the supply line is too long is actually a bit exaggerated. The straight line distance between this mountain range and the town of Bansk is less than a hundred miles. The main reason is that four-wheeled carriages cannot travel on the mountain roads and can only rely on human transportation. The town of Takarai has just been turned into ruins. In Banks, a town with a population of less than 100,000, many civilians are inextricably linked to the rebels in the mountains. So no one is willing to work for the Lord's Army. A large number of migrant workers were brought over from Makusuo City by the Logistics Department of the Third Army. About 2,000 people. But these people were not enough to support this supply line. Originally, the top brass of the Third Army hoped that a merchant group would be willing to join the army in this war, specifically responsible for purchasing trophies and transporting food. But when they heard that the third army was going to the mountains to encircle and suppress the rebels, these business groups lost interest in continuing the conversation. There was nothing to be gained from the rebels eating wild vegetables in the mountains. And in the end, they would inevitably lose money to the Lord's military transport. Food. At this point, the biggest problem of the third army in this mountainous area has become apparent and the supplies can no longer keep up. Therefore, their speed of marching through the mountains was slower than that of Serdak's rebel team, half of whom were wounded. Finding that the 3rd Legion of the Lord Army behind him did not follow up as expected, Serdak stopped walking towards the collapsed mountains. He didn't have the patience to waste time waiting. Under the guidance of Dennis, the team walked southeast along Black Crow Ridge. From here, they could reach the canyon town behind the rebel army. The team gathered nearly 300 more separated rebels along the way, and the entire team increased to more than 700 people. The food that Serdak bought from Benna City was consumed very quickly. And someone suggested that every day the food allotment was halved. A proposal that was firmly resisted by the two-headed ogre. But what everyone didn't expect was that the food Soldak brought out was much more than everyone expected. His magic belt seemed like a huge warehouse of supplies. Covering almost everything from wheat flour and canned lunch and meat to marching tents and hemostatic bandages. There was ample food supply along the way and the wounded received proper treatment. When the team walked out of Black Crow Ridge, no casualties occurred. Dennis followed the team. She and a rebel soldier carried a stretcher and followed the team forward. Her horse had been given to a wounded man with a calf injury. The entire team stretched for one kilometer on the mountain road. The team came to a river, and Serdak asked everyone to camp in the woods by the river. Dennis and four other rebels rode on fast horses and ran eastward along the river bank. This river was connected to the river in the canyon town. As long as the canyon town could send some flat-bottomed boats to meet them, they would be fine. Say these wounded the trouble of walking. However, while Dennis was asking for help from the canyon town, Serdak was not idle. He led a group of rebels all the way eastward along the river. Finally, two days later, they encountered a fleet of 30 flat-bottomed boats. Dennis was standing on a flat-bottomed boat at the front, waving desperately to everyone. Everyone got on the boat, and Serdak also returned to the canyon town with the team. This time, in addition to bringing back more than 700 rebel soldiers and their families, 
He also brought back a high-grade gem base for the somewhat carefree magician Abbott who lives in the canyon town. That's right. He bought this high-grade gem base last night when he and Aphrodite secretly ran back to the largest magic gem store in Venice City. Just for this gem base inlaid with eight magic crystals. Serdak spent 130 magic crystals. According to the sales manager who sells gem pedestals, this high-grade gem pedestal can provide power for magic airship aerodynamic devices and magic cannons. Of course, the temporary teleportation circle is also one of them. The wound on the chest of the magician Abbott has almost healed. His relationship with Miss Nora has been heating up rapidly in recent days. He was quite happy to see Soldak return safely from the rebel camp in Bant's town. Of the news that the camp near Bant's town was attacked by the Lord's army had already reached the canyon town a week ago. Now that Serdak had not only returned safely, but also saved so many rebels along the way, the news spread all of a sudden in the canyon town. And even the magician Abbot became the hero of this operation. When others talked about this, it was the followers of the magician Abbot who saved us. I heard that they were going to join us and build a new camp. Perhaps for Abbot, that camp was his and Miss Nora's love nest. It was also because of this incident that he knocked on Serdak's door and ran over to discuss setting up a new camp with him. This was an excellent opportunity for them to join the rebel army. As for when to return to Venice City, he hasn't thought about it recently. Anyway, the temporary teleportation circle is broken. Right? But now a brand new eight-hole high-grade gemstone base was placed on the coffee table in front of him. When Soldak took out the gemstone base, his eyes were filled with, How about it? I'm surprised. Magician Avid didn't know what to say at this moment. Okay then. I'm trying to build a temporary teleportation circle now. But I hope to find a safe place to live. At least for the time being that I won't be allowed to demolish. So that we can build it with a Gonbu plane at any time. Get in touch. Avid collected his thoughts and then said to Soldak. I've already prepared this. The place we selected is right next to Miss Dennis's house. There are two unused pigeon cage wooden houses here. I bought them both today. Soldak said to Avid with a smile. You have no other objections. How about we go over and take a look at the two wooden houses now? Of course. Go now. Abbott stood up and walked out of the hotel with Serdak. Over at the pigeon cage wooden house. Dennis is cleaning the two pigeon cage wooden houses with Thea and Samira. In fact, Thea and Samira were paddling the whole time. And neither of them worked as fast as Dennis's two sisters. I'm so glad that you are willing to live here in the canyon town. Dennis said to Thea sincerely. Wearing an apron and holding a linen scarf on his head cleaning the dust in the corner with a tong handle. Sia stood by the fence, leaned out and looked at the lake in the canyon below, and said casually, We should be able to live here for a while. I'm not sure about this either. Chapter 1002 Support from Marquis Luther There was a faint musty smell in the pigeon cage cabin. Some mushrooms grew on the wooden boards on the roof, and mold grew in some places. However, the wooden bed and curtains in Magician Avide's room are brand new. The living room and bedroom of the pigeon cage wooden house are connected together. There is a bed next to the window. The rest of the room is the bedroom. And the kitchen is in the house. Outside on the balcony. Magician Avid insisted on placing a curtain between the bed and the living room. Miss Nora couldn't understand it at first. As the magician Avid took out materials engraved with runes one by one from his magic pocket. Miss Nora finally understood that the magician Avid was going to build a temporary building in the living room of the room teleportation circle. This kind of esoteric and profound work that involves advanced magical knowledge is what avid magicians are best at. Unlike those magicians who can only throw fireballs, the ability that avid magicians master is space. The magician avid squatted on the floor, arranging the magic circle with precision measuring tools. He pursed his lips, focused and serious, and the look of being completely immersed in his work made Miss Nora a little obsessed. She was a little worried. Her life these days made her seem to be floating in midair. There are many things that I have never enjoyed before. She didn't know how long this magician aristocrat with the magic badge of the Astrologer's Guild would love her. She was not a beauty. Her figure could only be said to be neither thin nor bloated. Living in the camp for a long time gave her eight-pack abs. Avid, are you going back to Venice City? Nora tried to keep her voice calm. On the day her parents were killed by the Lord's army, she swore to be a strong girl who would never cry. In fact, she's been doing a great job. The bearded Edgar assigned her the task of taking care of the magician Avide because he believed that she was a calm-minded and strong-willed female warrior who was willing to dedicate everything to the cause of resisting the Lord Army. Don't worry. Just wait here for me. 
I'll be back in a few days. The magician Avide was almost lying on the ground. Without raising his head, he used a magic pen to draw a magic line to connect the two rune metal plates. Together. Seeing that Nora didn't speak, he hesitated, raised his head and asked, How about you come with me to take a tour of Bina City? This invitation means that he has to pay for the transmission of 30 magic crystals out of his own pocket. If he wants to return to the dry cloth plane, the magic crystal spit will be doubled again. This is the internal price of the Astrologer's Union. Unexpectedly, Miss Nora sat beside the bed and hesitated for a moment, but then said silently, I'd better wait for you here. Avid certainly didn't know that she didn't know about the teleportation fee at all. He thought that Nora thought that teleportation was too expensive and refused in order to save some money. Moreover, when he returned to Bena City this time, he had many things to do. Probably don't have time to spend with her. Hearing what Nora said, the magician Avid felt warm in his heart. He got up from the floor, grabbed Nora's hand, and said to her very moodly, I will come back. Believe me, the Ganbu plane needs a space magician. The most important thing is that I need you too. Nora's arms hugged Avid's waist tightly, and she pressed her face against his chest. Magician Avid felt that if it was going to be this intense every night, it would take at least half a month to successfully build the temporary teleportation circle. Drowsiness came over him, and with a cool night wind, he hugged his chest and fell asleep again. The magician Avid wants to stay in the canyon town, but before that, he must submit an application to the Bena City Magic Guild and the Astrologer Guild. The black magicians in the Ganbu Plain are so rampant that the Magic Guild of Bena Province may have to send magicians from the law enforcement team. However, this situation requires not only a letter, but at least Ivid personally going to the Magic Guild. The law enforcement team will make a detailed report. When Serdak went to Avid's pigeon cage in the morning to check the progress of the temporary teleportation circle, Avid said to Serdak, I'll go back with you this time. Soldak stood at the door of the pigeon cage, yawned and asked, Decided? Thea followed Serdak like a little tail, peeking out of the door to look at the messy scene in the room. Well, it's not bad to be a teleporter here, and you can make a lot of money, Avid said. Soldak smiled slightly and said no more. Magic crystals are nothing to magicians. Serdak wanted to know what the charm of Miss Nora was that made Avide so fascinated. Dennis asked me to go swimming in the lake. I'm leaving first. Thea whispered to Soldak. Be careful not to scare the children. Also, are you sure you won't return to Bena City with me this time? Great Swords Manchester promised to send you to Chien Port. Soldak grabbed hold of him and turned around to slip away. Sia warned her. Oops. Got it. Sia's arms were very smooth and she broke away from Soldak's big hand with a slight flick, holding the long skirt with both hands, shaking her long algae green hair. She ran away without looking back. She was so happy that she seemed to have forgotten that she was a Naga. Samira and Gulatum were guarding outside the wooden house of the magician Avid. They would take turns to guard here before Serdak and the magician Avid returned. Magician Avid has everything ready. As the temporary teleportation circle in the room begins to operate, the wooden boards around the pigeon cage cannot block the magical glow of the teleportation circle. The entire pigeon cage hanging on the stone wall is trembling slightly. Those glows shine through the wooden boards. As if the entire pigeon cage may explode at any time. The rebel residents on the other side of the cliff all opened their windows and shouted loudly in this direction. The rebel residents, who heard the shouts, ran out of their homes one after another. Everyone looked at the wooden house next to Dennis's house in horror. Some wanted to run away while others wanted to rush to rescue them. Amid the noisy sounds, this dazzling magical glow gradually returned to calm. Nora and Samira were the only ones left in the room, and both Serdak and Avide had already entered the portal. By the time Soldak came out of the teleportation gate, he had already arrived at the teleportation hall of Bena City. The teleportation master on duty in the teleportation hall saw Avid coming out of the teleportation gate and looked at him excitedly. Say H. Lo. Avid. I thought you had an accident in the Ganbu plane. It's great that you can come back from there. Magician Avid politely took off his magician cone hat, saluted the old man and said, It is true that a small situation happened, but everything is under control. Serdak also quickly performed the night salute. The magician nodded kindly to Serdak, releasing the kindness in his eyes. I will go to the union to report. This time, I encountered some unexpected situations in the Ganbu plane. Avid said politely to the teleporter. After saying that, he and Soldak walked out of the teleportation hall. Serdak found that there were actually quite a lot of people in the teleportation hall. 
although there was no queue. There were many nobles who wanted to spend money to teleport. Are all the noble lords so rich? Serdek asked Avid in a low voice. He knew that when the two of them returned to Bena City this time, the House of Representatives in Bena City would need to pay a large amount of transmission fees to the Astrologer's Guild. Avid responded in a low voice. The noble lords all have mines at home. In addition, most of them provide fixed teleportation services, which are much cheaper. The average cost of a single teleportation is about five magic crystals. This is not absolute. It depends on the teleportation, far and near. After walking out of the teleportation hall, Serdak looked at the sun in the sky and found that it was just afternoon. The two separated at the door of the teleportation hall. The magician Avid left his address and asked Serdak to send someone to notify him as soon as he finished the work. Serdak boarded a magical caravan. Sure enough, the fare quoted by the coachman was much higher than elsewhere. Magician Avid went directly to the magic guild. Soldak went to the Marquis Luther's mansion. The magic caravan stopped at the gate of Marquis Luther's mansion. And the coachman ran down eagerly to open the door for Soldak. There were even some simple refreshments in the carriage. And the journey was very smooth. This made Soldak sigh. Sure enough, different prices have different services. The guard at the gate of Marquis Luther's mansion had recognized Soldak and opened the gate from a distance and someone had already reported to the manor. The housekeeper and two rows of servants actually ran to the gate to greet Soldak. Marquis Luther and Lady Marion also stood on the steps in front of the castle gate, looking at Soldak with smiles on their faces. I knew you would find a way to get out of trouble, but I didn't expect to come back so soon. Marquis Luther stepped forward, patted Soldak on the shoulder, and said with a smile. Soldak saluted quickly. Hurry up and tell me about the situation in the Gombu Plain. Since it was run by Lord Macdonnell, it has actually been out of the control of the military. Marquis Luther put his arm around Soldak's shoulders and went to walk inside the hall. Mrs. Marion quickly arranged for the housekeeper to prepare the dinner. Soldak followed Marquis Luther to his study, which was his private meeting place. Marquis Luther asked Soldak to sit down on the soft leather sofa and couldn't wait to let him talk about the situation in the Gonbu Plain. Soldak naturally described in detail the current situation of the people in the Gonbu Plain as well as the current situation of the Lord's army and the size of the rebel army. Soldak told Marquis Luther that he wanted to build an army in the plain of Gonbu. Marquis Luther stood in front of the map of the plain of Gonbu and pondered for a while. The butler beside him lit a cigar for him. Under the smoke, Marquis Luther squinted at the map for a long time. Finally, he turned to Soldak and said, The province of Bena will not care who the owner of the Gonbu plain is, but the Gonbu plain needs to be in the hands of the Bena people and all uncontrollable factors need to be eradicated. Since you have contacted the resistance forces in the Gonbu Plain, I think the Bena Military Department may hope that we can gain the dominance of this resistance army. In the future, we should allow the existence of the resistance army and set aside an area for them. Well, but the Gonbu Plain must be controlled by us. No matter who rules the Gonbu Plain in the future, these resistance armies should no longer be a source of uneasiness. In this way, I will report these situations to the military department. It will probably take some time before the resolution is passed. We can make some preparations in advance during this period. Since the temporary teleportation circle has been reopened, I will transfer the first constructed swordsman group in the Legion to you to help you open up the situation within the resistance army and wait until the official battle plan passed at the House of Representatives meeting. I will transfer you to the battalion level commander and logistics dispatching officer at that time. At that time, other lords and legions may enter the dry cloth plain to share this cake. But we want to get the largest share. Serdak was stunned. Unexpectedly, he just said that he wanted to cooperate with the rebels and resist the plain lord army. Marquis Luther actually wanted to fight a plain war in the Gonbu plain. Seeing Serdak's puzzled expression, Marquis Luther asked him to stand in front of the map of Bina province, pointed to the large land in the Terrapagan area, and said to Serdak, Although the Gonbu plain itself is not big, it is a plain rich in products, which can just make up for the poor land, severe desertification, and lack of much crop output in the Terrapagan area. From the Gonbu Plain transporting a large amount of supplies can alleviate the increasingly serious conflicts between the lords and civilians in the Terrapagan area. What's more, Lugite City, which is now connected to Makuso City in the Gonbu Plain, belongs to my territory. When you complete the garrison mission from the Belan Plain, I hope you can go to Liyite and be the consul there. This will make it easier for you to manage the territory of Gonbu Plain. Serdak repeated, Luth City. 
hearing what Marquis Luther said. Zerdak finally understood that no matter who the Donbu plane belonged to now, whoever controls the city of Rut also controls the entrance to the portal of the Donbu plane. Seeing the clarity in Soldak's eyes, Marquis Luther nodded with appreciation. He said more firmly, When you return to Ruder City, I hope you will prepare a grand wedding there to marry my dear Hathaway. Soldak quickly saluted. At this time, he should show his loyalty. He put one hand across his chest, knelt on one knee, and said to Marquis Luther, As you wish, I will calm down the Ganbu plane as soon as possible. Marquis Luther sat on the chair with dignity, accepted his salute calmly, and said in a loud voice, Very good! The door to Marquis Luther's study was pushed open violently, and the blonde-haired Hathaway rushed in from the outside, holding the hem of her skirt in both hands. Her face was rosy as she ran, and her breathing seemed a little rapid, but her eyes fell on Sewer. Dark's face never left. Followed by the housekeeper, he shouted hurriedly, Miss Hathaway, the Marquis is talking to you. Marquis Luther waved his hand and asked the butler to step aside, allowing Hathaway to rush in. Followed by Beatrice, Hathaway blinked her green eyes and curiously asked Marquis Luther, Dad, Duck, what are you talking about? Marquis Luther stood in front of the map of Bena province with his hands behind his back and said with a smile, We were talking about you and Duck. Us? Hathaway's eyes are like a pool of green lake water. Marquis Luther glanced at Soldak and then said, Dak and I have reached an agreement that your wedding will be held in Root City, but the time will probably have to wait until the end of this plain garrison mission. Hathaway's face seemed to be stained with a layer of red rouge, and she walked into Soldak silently. Beatrice's bright eyes looked at Soldak expectantly. Soldak bent down, lifted the back of Hathaway's hand, and put it to his lips. Chapter 1003 Bena Reinforcements The living room was full of laughter, and the atmosphere was very harmonious. Everyone was very fond of the young Viscount. He didn't have any of the bad habits of the playboys from the old families. And because he was favored by the holy light, he almost always saved rather than killed on the battlefield. Everyone listened to his experience on the battlefield. Although they knew that the battle would be cruel and difficult, it was not too bloody. After dinner, Soldak sat in the living room with Marquis Luther's family and chatted. The other two wives of Marquis Luther, Mrs. Mabel and Mrs. Cece, also accepted this future family member. Marquis Luther sat on the main seat and patted his forehead and said, By the way, I seem to have forgotten to mention that Lord MacDonald has been deprived of his title of nobility and will be executed on the guillotine at Prater Square in Paina City in the middle of next month. The hall suddenly became quiet. No one was willing to say such bloody things. Mrs. Mabel gave Marquis Luther an angry look and complained. Why are you saying this at this time? I think there should be a dance tomorrow. She gave birth to three daughters to Marquis Luther. But Marquis Luther didn't like them very much. Marquis Luther was noncommittal about the ball suggestion and turned to Soldak and asked, What are your next plans? Serdak said truthfully, I am ready to provide some material assistance to the resistance army. This time the temporary teleportation circle has been repaired, and Serdak can return to Bena City through the void gate. Marquis Luther thought for a while, and then said, I will apply to the Bena military department for this. In my opinion, it is better to directly calculate it into gold coins. If it is materials, how to bring them back to the Gombu plane may still be a problem. The evening tea party in the living room ended quickly. Mrs. Mabel's three daughters hurriedly approached Marquis Luther and asked him for exquisite jewelry and gorgeous magic cloth dresses. Marquis Luther looked perfunctory. Agreed. The three ladies even looked at Soldak with a look that said, You came to our house, and you didn't even think of bringing us a gift. This made Soldak a little embarrassed. Hathaway walked up at this time, hugged Soldak's arm, ignored her three sisters, turned around and took Soldak to his guest room. The guest room is located in the front half of the castle, across the side cloister and inner courtyard from the back house where Hathaway lives. However, being able to stay at the Marquis Luther's mansion obviously means that the relationship with Hathaway has taken a further step. What Serdak never expected was that when he fell asleep, a young maid actually stayed with her. But Serdak sternly refused. Are you kidding? I didn't know this was just a little test. Serdak covered himself with a quilt and lay in the soft quilt full of sunshine. Thinking secretly, the room was very quiet, with a separate bathroom, and tea and milk were prepared on the coffee table. It seemed that he was worried that Soldak would be hungry in the middle of the night and would not be able to find anything to eat. This was probably the most sound sleep Soldak had had in recent times. The early morning sunlight shines into the room through the gaps in the curtains. Soldak opened the window and felt the strong breath of spring. 
the maid specially brought Saldak's breakfast to his room. After breakfast, she discovered that Hathaway and Beatrice had already gone to work at the Foreign Affairs Bureau. They didn't know about Saldak's sudden appearance last night and didn't ask for leave in advance. So they had to go to the Foreign Affairs Bureau to handle some official business in the morning. At noon, Hathaway and Beatrice hurried back and had lunch with Saldak. The three of them sat in the back garden of the manor, quietly basking in the sun and enjoying the beautiful afternoon. Since noon, there have been reports of constructed swordsmen coming to the Marquis Luther's mansion. By the time the great swordsman Quintus arrived at the Marquis Luther's mansion, the first constructed swordsman group of the Luther Legion had already assembled in the front yard of the Marquis Luther's mansion. Great swordsman Quintus is the leader of the Luther Legion's first constructed swordsman group. And Serdak knows this. He directly found Serdak in the back garden, sat in front of the stone table, and chatted with him about the situation of Serdak and his group after the assassination team left the Gombu Plain. Serdak introduced in detail Ichiban. I didn't expect you to have so much experience in the Gombu Plain. I thought you would hide and find another chance to repair the temporary teleportation circle. Great swordsman Quintus said with emotion. That was indeed the plan at the beginning. But various things happened along the way, Soldek said. Then the great swordsman Quintus said directly, The Marquis summoned us this time to let me go to the Gonbu Plain with you. Serdak knew that when the House of Representatives dispatched the assault team, they limited the number to about 40 people. Now they wanted to use the temporary teleportation circle to teleport 500 constructors to the Gonbu Plain. He said in surprise, Ah! If you want to use the temporary teleportation circle to teleport 500 constructed swordsmen, how much will it cost? Normally, it costs about 50,000 magic crystals, but there should be a discount for large-scale teleportation. Great swordsman Quintus laughed. These were not things that he should be too concerned about. So he didn't think about it. Serdak asked curiously. Do we have to pay for this out of our own pockets? The great swordsman Quintus said matter-of-factly. Of course. The Gombu Plain is now considered unexplored territory. We enter the plain to develop the territory and bear the travel and military expenses. Every time we occupy a piece of land, we can get one-third of it, belonging to the pioneers. This is expressly stipulated in the Lord's Land Distribution Law. No matter who stipulated it, Soldak touched his money bag. He couldn't come up with so much money at the moment. When Marquis Luther returned to the Marquis Mansion in the afternoon, he called Soldak and great swordsman Quintus into the study. Ten magic sealing boxes were placed on the carpet in the study. Open it and see what's inside. Marquis Luther said to Soldak. Serdak walked over and opened the magic sealing boxes one by one. It's filled with colorful magic crystals. The colorful colors almost made Serdak's eyes dizzy. These 100,000 magic crystals are the military expenses I helped you apply for at the military department. What you need to do is to form an infantry regiment with about 20,000 people as soon as possible. These military expenses include weapons and equipment and half-year military expenses. There will be military expenses. The quartermaster assigned by the ministry will go to the Ganbu Plain with you. And he will supervise your expenditure on this military expenditure. Marquis Luther smiled at Soldak and said, The infantry regiments formed will be directly under the Benham military headquarters. These cannot become your private army. You have absolute command rights while in the Ganbu Plain. Although the resolution to conquer the Ganbu Plain has not yet been passed. This does not hinder our preliminary preparations. And don't worry about the military expenditure inspector. Marky Gulas from the munitions department and I were classmates who graduated from the Bena Swordsman Academy at the same time. This inspector is his confidant. I have already communicated with them and constructed it in advance. The teleportation cost of the swordsman group comes from the military expenditure. But you need to obtain equivalent wealth in the Ganbu Plain. And finally add it to the military expenditure. Serdak opened his mouth and was a little at a loss. This allocation was really a bit ridiculous. Master Marquis, are there too many magic crystals? Soldak calmed down and said to Marquis Luther. Marquis Luther waved his hand casually, looked at the constructed swordsman outside the window and said, What we need is the most fertile area in the Gonbu Plain. Don't you think that Makuso City alone is not worth a hundred thousand magic crystals? Also, please note that the ownership of this army does not belong to you. When the Gombu Plain is recovered in the future, this army belongs to the Bena province. What do you think the military has lost? If you can train these 20,000 infantrymen into an elite force, this will be the biggest gain for the military. Now the Bena province has put all the military forces it can mobilize into the Warsaw Plain as much as possible. And other lords are still waiting and watching. So if you can form an infantry regiment in the Gombu Plain, 
It is everyone's hope. Have witnessed. Actually, 100,000 magic crystals is just the basic cost of forming a 500-person constructed knights. The prerequisite is to find 500 first-level warriors. In addition, future military expenses must be taken into consideration, and they must be able to buy them in the end. The magic pattern structure that is short of resources. Soldak looks like a country boy who has never seen the world. I hope you can accumulate the wealth of a knight in the Ganbu Plain. Serdak quickly stood up straight. This group of constructed swordsmen had dinner at the Marquis Luther's mansion and came to the teleportation hall under the leadership of the great swordsman Quintus. Chapter 1004 Let Me Do It Magician Abbott and 30 magicians from the law enforcement group are already waiting in the teleportation hall. This group of magicians wore dark green Kalinian magic robes and black magic cone hats. They held different wands, magic books, and magic secret swords in their hands. Everyone stood in the corner of the hall and lowered their heads. Talk loudly. Abbott was surrounded in the middle and was introducing the situation of the Ganbu plane to these magicians. A middle-aged magician in the crowd asked loudly, Avid, are the black magicians on the Ganbu plane really so rampant? How dare they openly cultivate demon servants on the plane? Abbott turned to look at the magician and said very seriously, Well, this Count Serdak was chased by the third legion of the Lord's army and the black magician on the outskirts of Bankstown a few days ago. Each of their search teams will basically be equipped with three H, L dogs and three demon servant. The middle-aged magician nodded, walked out of the crowd and said with a smile, This time we are summoned to the Ganbu Plain, mainly because we hope that we can establish contact with the local magic union so that we can fight against the black magic monastery over there. A young magician next to him introduced, This is our leader this time, Archmage Harper. Abbott saluted quickly. The middle-aged magician with green stubble on his face laughed and said, if Mr. Morrison wasn't currently busy with official duties, he would have planned to be the team leader this time. The magicians in this group of law enforcement groups were chatting away. The magicians once again turned the topic to the magician Avid. Avid, I heard that something happened to you last time you went to the Gombu Plain. Avid subconsciously touched his chest. Although the injury had completely healed, he still felt a dull pain in his chest when he stretched his waist occasionally. Yes, it's all thanks to Viscount Soldak. Otherwise, I might have died in the plain of Ganbu. Avid laughed dryly. After all, no one wanted to talk about his own embarrassment. There was a magician in the crowd who was a little impatient and asked, Magic Avid, why hasn't your friend arrived yet? Avid craned his neck and glanced at the door twice, with a smile on his face. Maybe there was something delayed. In the afternoon, I received a message from him, saying that he was at the door of the teleportation hall at this time. Meet. He walked to the main entrance of the teleportation hall. I saw Serdak leading a team of constructed swordsmen to the teleportation hall, and his metal boots made a crisp sound when he stepped on the steps. Serdak was walking here with a great swordsman. He saw Avid at the entrance of the hall from a distance and waved quickly. Avid's eyes glanced at such a large group of constructed swordsmen, as if a transparent duck egg was stuffed into his mouth. This time he brought 30 magicians from the law enforcement group, thinking that the momentum was huge enough. Unexpectedly, Serdak actually brought a group of constructed swordsmen. Nowadays, there are not many big lords in Benes City who can easily send out a group of swordsmen. He quickly walked down the steps and came to the great swordsmen Soldak and Quintus and greeted the great swordsman Quintus politely. Then he whispered to Serdak, You brought so many constructed swordsmen here. Are they all going to the Ganbu Plain? Yes, Soldak admitted. The magician avid wiped the sweat on his forehead with a handkerchief pulled Soldak aside, and whispered to him, Do you know how much the temporary teleportation fee is? Those teleporters in the teleportation hall are not because you go to the plane to quell the rebellion. I will teleport you for free. I know this. I hope that with so many of us, it can be cheaper? Serdak immediately patted the money bag on his waist to indicate that he had brought some money. Magician Avid touched his chin, thought for a moment and said, It's impossible for you to enjoy the internal price of the Astrologer's Guild. How about you go inside with me and talk to the teleporter first? The teleporter whom I had just seen yesterday afternoon was standing in the hall. And Avid and Serdak walked over. The teleporter looked at Avid with a smile. Avid, you brought so many people this time. Are they all going to the Ganbu plane? It seems that you are in a lot of trouble. Avid nodded honestly and said, The Black Magic Monastery develops demon servants there and raises H, L dogs. So this time we invited the magicians from the law enforcement group and the swordsmen from the constructed swordsman group. 
Work together to eliminate those black magicians. The teleporter's face looked a little solemn, and he said casually, Oh, so that's it. Allied took the opportunity and said to the teleporter with a shy face, Teacher Griffin, look at the number of us. Can we enjoy the teleportation benefits for the teleportation fee? Teleporter Griffin thought for a moment and then said, The magicians of the law enforcement group can do it, but these constructed swordsmen may not. But since they are going to clean up the black magicians in the plane, the Astrologer Guild should indeed provide some support. Some fees can be waived. Each of these magicians will pay 50 magic crystals for teleportation and 60 magic crystals for the Swordsman Corps. That's it. Hearing the price set by Teleporter Griffin, Avid glanced at Soldak secretly and saw him nodding slightly. Immediately say flatteringly, Thank you for your support of the Priory for the clearance of dark arts. Teleporter Griffin stood behind and continued to warn. When letting everyone pass, Try not to block the door of the teleportation gate. Serdak obediently paid 30,000 magic crystals before following the magician into the portal. The magician Avide was carrying a bag full of magic crystals, squatting next to the high-grade gemstone base of the temporary teleportation circle at the pigeon cage wooden house in the dry cloth plain, and kept loading magic crystals into the base. Stone. Seeing the speed at which the magic crystal exploded, Soldak thought to himself, this temporary teleportation circle is really a money-eating machine. Thirty senior magicians walked out of the pigeon cage wooden house and stood on the intricate folding staircase passage of the canyon town. Everyone looked curiously at the wooden houses on the cliffs on both sides of the canyon. Their eyes were full of curiosity, and they couldn't help but point, talking in a low voice and pointing, seeing the rebel residents in the town. Some magicians couldn't help but walk up, take out the food they brought in their magic pockets, give it to some ragged-looking children and ask them for some basic information. For example, where is this place and who are you? The sudden appearance of so many magicians almost caused a sensation in the entire canyon town. When all the magicians came out of the pigeon cage wooden house, they were followed by neat teams of constructed swordsmen. The cloaks behind these constructed swordsmen and the emblem of the Luther family on the chests of their armors. They did not stay in the town at all, but were directly led by the great swordsman Quintus and stationed at the lake behind the canyon town. The presence of so many magicians and constructed swordsmen in the town naturally alerted the high-level roundtable members of the rebels. Sheldon, the secretary general of the roundtable, wore a black robe and personally led a group of people to run down the wooden steps from the top of the cliff. At this moment, Lord Sheldon's attitude changed almost 180 degrees. He took the initiative to find the magician Avid who came out of the wooden house. His face was wrinkled but with a friendly smile. He said to Avid, asked, Magic Avid, please bring me here. They had no idea that the magician Avid was actually an astrologer. He built a temporary portal in his home and brought over so many powerful mages and swordsmen. The magicians of the law enforcement group were not in the mood to negotiate terms with the rebels. They came here just to clean up those black magicians. This matter was completely left to Avid. Avid raised his chin and said to Secretary General Sheldon, Those of us came from Benna City for two main things. This is not the place to talk. Why don't we find a place to sit down and talk? Okay, let's talk, Secretary General Sheldon said, wiping the top of his head with almost no hair with a handkerchief. In addition to Soldak, other people involved in the negotiations here were the great swordsman Quintus and Louis Fitch, the quartermaster assigned by the Benna City Munitions Department. Nora stood in the crowd and saw the magician Avid surrounded by everyone, standing with the adults in the round table. She felt inexplicably excited and slightly worried about herself. She really didn't expect that magician Avid was actually a big shot. Avid and Soldak were invited to the conference hall on the top of the cliff by the parliamentarians. This conference hall is actually a relatively large wooden house. The round table inside is also made of wooden boards. The map on the wall has a big burnt hole. The rebel-occupied areas are drawn in extremely detail on this map. There are even there are still many traces of alteration. Standing at the window of the wooden house, you can see the bare cliff top. The view on the top of the cliff is relatively wide. And you can see the wonderful scenery at the edge of the plain. Those times that flowed backwards into the abyss beneath the bottom of the plain also shocked the great swordsman Quintus and the quartermaster Louis Fitch. Is this the edge of the plain? Quartermaster Louis Fitch asked the great swordsman Quintus in a low voice. That's true. Great swordsman Quintus replied. As the members of the rebel roundtable entered the conference, hall one after another. They mainly discussed the strategic purposes of the three parties, how to conduct coordinated operations, and the preliminary division of interests. When the magician Avid spoke this time, 
his tone kept rising. He first stated that the magicians of the law enforcement group came to the Ganbu Plain mainly to eliminate the protemic forces of the Black Magic Hermitage, including those demon servants and hellhounds. Magicians will only join the war when black magicians and demon servants appear on the battlefield. Currently, these 30 magicians have two main tasks. The first task is to rush to the outskirts of Ban's town and investigate how many people have been demonized by the black magicians there. Several more magicians will fly north along the Ganbu Plain. They will contact the magicians in the Ganbu Plain to see how bad the situation in the entire plain has deteriorated. Great Swordsman Quintus then stated that the constructed swordsman group came to the Ganbu Plain to assist Soldak in organizing an army to fight against Lord MacDonald's army. The ownership of this army will belong to the Bena military department. The rebel MPs in the Parliament Hall looked ugly. But they did not break out on the spot. We can admit the current sphere of influence of the resistance army in the Ganbu Plain. Even if we occupy the entire Ganbu Plain in the future, we will not take back the rainforest in the southeast region. It depends on how much territory you can gain in the future. In future battle situations, we can divide the land we occupy next according to the Green Empire's 433 land allocation method. This is the preliminary division of interests for our cooperation. Of course, this requires that we occupy enough territory so that I can have enough voice to promote this matter. Currently, I have brought huge resources from Bena province. 500 there are a number of armored swordsmen and a huge amount of supplies and armaments. But I also need some resistance fighters who are willing to join my infantry legion. I will form a heavy armored infantry regiment of 20,000 people. Serdak finally said, the members of the Rebel Roundtable fell into silence for a while. Little did they know that Serdak's words clearly meant that he wanted to draw blood from the rebels to expand his army. But although the rebels have a population of hundreds of thousands scattered in various camps in the jungle, the number that can truly be considered elite is only about 20 or 30,000. Currently, the five camps in Bant's town have been severely damaged. If no allies join in, the rebels may not be able to resist the third legion of the Lord Army alone. You haven't considered the time, and you're going to vote now. Agree. Let's stay and form a new army. If you don't agree, we will leave immediately. I will recruit new troops in the 16th town of the mountainous area, Atangata town, and Bant's town. When I defeat the third legion of Lord MacDonald's army, I will take control of the situation in the south of the Ganbu Plain. At that time, I can provide whatever you order is entirely up to me. Serdak stood beside the round table, supporting his hands on the table, and said without hesitation, I have lived in Takale town for about 10 days, and I have some understanding of the situation of the residents of the town. I know what kind of life they live. Not only do they have to pay various types of taxes every day, but they also don't get what they deserve. Protection of. Businessmen and nobles exploited the common people in the towns. And then you robbed the merchants and local nobles. After you robbed them, they ran away. The Lord Army came in and robbed again, taking away everything they could, and finally forced those who had lost everything. Most of the townspeople will die, and those who survive will join you, while some residents will stay to rebuild the town and continue to be exploited by merchants and nobles. If this place wants to regain new vitality, it needs to restore prosperity and change the current social status quo. What you do cannot fundamentally change the Ganbu Plain. So this time it's up to me. The faces of the MPs at the round table became extremely ugly. And some even looked a little ugly. Secretary General Shelton looked at Soldak's resolute face. His lips were trembling. And his face was pale and a little embarrassed. Can we discuss it in private for a while? Serdak stood up and said decisively, Okay. Before noon. I want to hear the results of your discussion. Great Swordsman Quintus and Quartermaster Lewis Fitch followed Soldak out of the wooden house. The magician Abbott also walked out behind. Chester told me about you, saying that you were born to be a lord. But I didn't expect that your temper is quite to my liking. Great Swordsman Quintus stood on the edge of the cliff and said with a smile to Serdak. The two double-edged swords behind him looked very domineering. Serdak looked at the lakeside camp under the cliff, where the constructed swordsmen were camping. He turned around and said, I only came up with some ideas when I was in Takarai town. You are right. This plane does need someone to change it. And I will fully support you this time. Great Swordsman Quintus said with bright eyes. Chapter 1005 Registration The Rebel Roundtable reached a consensus with Serdak and the Magician Avid, and agreed that Serdak would recruit troops in the areas occupied by the rebels. At the same time, the Roundtable meeting put forward three requirements. First, it can ensure the current power territory of the resistance army. 
Second, the legal status of the resistance army must be recognized. Third, there will be no interference in the internal management of the resistance army in the future. Serdak added a note after these three basic clauses, if the people in the territory want to move, the rebels cannot stop them, and all people must be guaranteed to be free. Finally, there is an additional clause related to the avid magicians. That is, the Astrologers Guild will set up a temporary teleportation circle in the canyon town. Of course, this teleportation circle is open to everyone, and a single teleportation costs 100 magic crystals. Well, for the time being, the rebels can't expect to use this teleportation circle. After reaching such a consensus, Serdak's recruitment work officially began. Thea and Dennis took some recruitment flyers and posted some on various traffic arteries in the canyon town. Samira, who knew a little bit of imperial writing, moved a small table outside the constructed swordsman court camp by the lake, spread a parchment roster on the table, and waited for the rebels to come over and sign up. Serdak also stood aside, ready to see how many people in the canyon town were willing to join the heavy armored infantry regiment. Samira, wearing a hood and a black gauze covering her face, said to Suldak nervously, Will no one come? He stared at the exit of the canyon town with his light red eyes. After waiting for a while, he didn't see anyone coming over, so he was a little worried about the outcome. It should be a little bit. Although Suldak said this, he actually didn't have much confidence in his heart. The first person to find Serdak and apply to join the heavy armored infantry regiment was the bearded Edgar, and he not only signed up himself, but also signed up nearly 5,000 rebel fighters in the three camps under his jurisdiction. Serdak still needs to interview one by one, and only rebels who agree with the conditions can join the heavy armored infantry regiment. The people who came after him were Captain Ned Mosby, who was rescued by Serdak in the mountains outside Bant's town, and he was followed by more than 600 rebel soldiers who returned to the canyon town safely. As these rebels took the initiative to join the heavy armored infantry regiment, many young people in the canyon town also came to sign up. Serdak even thought about going to various camps to give a few sensational speeches. He never thought that there would be so many young people signing up in just a canyon town. At night, the residents of the town were all when discussing this matter. A craze instantly formed, and almost all young people who agreed with these conditions wanted to join Serdak's heavy armored infantry regiment. There is no way. There is no harm if there is no comparison. They are also resisting Lord Macdonald's army. The rebels have nothing but basic guarantees. However, the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment is a regular army officially established by the Bena Provincial Military Headquarters. It is not only issued with sophisticated weapons and armor, but also receives a military salary of 40 silver coins every month. The welfare benefits are also first class and generous. Marching tents, as small as kettles and lunch boxes, are all issued by the army. In addition, during the march and fighting, whether you dig trenches or kill enemies and seize trophies, you can gain merit points. These merit points can be exchanged for gold coins and other materials in the military camp. If someone is accidentally killed in battle, the army will also send a consolation payment to their families behind the scenes. Living in the rebel camp, when there is no war, everyone is free. Once there is a war, all men in the town are soldiers and need to take up arms and fight bravely. Under the current situation, the Lord's army might reach here at any time. Instead of passively participating in the battle, it is better to actively join the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, which at least provides some protection. As a result, young people in canyon towns are more willing to join Heavy Armored Infantry Regiments. This resulted in a very popular registration scene. In fact, Quartermaster Lewis Fitch was also very curious. Although he brought 70,000 magic crystals this time. After all, neither standard armor nor weapons could be transported from the Beta City Military Headquarters. So many weapons and equipment were wanted to be shipped here, to purchase in the Ganbu Plain. At least go to a place like Makuso City. But even if they can be purchased, how to transport these supplies from Makusuo to the rebel rear is still a problem. Also, as the heavy armored infantry regiment recruits more and more soldiers, the food consumed every day will also increase day by day. The rebels' food supply was originally very limited. And now they have no obligation to take out the stored food and give it to Sir Duck Emergency. It can be said that this heavy armored infantry regiment currently has almost nothing except 70,000 magic crystals. It has no logistical support, no armor weapons, and no marching tents. This Count Soldak rashly started recruiting troops without making any preparations. No one with any sense would do this. But when it got completely dark, 
Five large iron pots were set up right next to the edge of the constructed swordsman regiment's camp, with firewood placed under the pots. What was boiling in the large iron pots was actually broth. From the soup pot, what was exposed was actually the skeleton of a yellow sheep. The aroma of mutton wafted far away, and the milky white soup mixed with the aroma of pepper made people standing around salivate. There are also chopped haggis and cooked mutton on the square table meat table next to it. Every soldier with a bowl full of mutton soup will come here, and the cook will use a spoon to add some cooked mutton into the soup bowl. You can choose to add haggis or not. You can also choose chopped coriander and onion. And at the end, each person will be given half a baked wheat cake. Quartermaster Louis Fitch was a little curious. Pepper was a rare spice in Venice City. Where did the rebels get it? Louis Fitch's family is well off and has a small fortune in Venice City. The family is usually very particular about food, especially baked wheat cakes. The cook at home rarely makes them by herself. Basically, they buy them from a restaurant called I Bought It at Maggie's Bakery. And Louis Fitch has very strict requirements. He only eats freshly baked wheat cakes for every meal, just to feel the aroma of wheat and crispy texture. When I came to the Gonbu Plain this time, I had already thought that the conditions here would be very difficult. After actually stepping through the portal, I realized that my thoughts were still a bit too idealistic. The life of the poor here really has no bottom line. Quartermaster Louis Fitch and Quintus Great Swordsman were also queuing up to choose their meals. When Louis Fitch arrived at the place where baked wheat cakes were distributed, the cook threw half a piece of baked wheat cake into his plate. Inside? Huh? Quartermaster Louis Fitch leaned over and smelled it with his nose. He was a little puzzled. Why was this baked wheat cake so similar to what he ate every day? The wheat flavor is almost the same. He pinched a corner with his fingers and broke it off hard. There was a click, and the scones looked extremely crispy. After tasting it carefully, Quartermaster Lewis Fitch finally had an emotion. Probably all the baked wheat cakes made by excellent pastry chefs may have the same taste. Beside the lake, several rays of golden thyme flowed countercurrently and fell silent into the abyss at the edge of the plain. Quartermaster Lewis Fitch suddenly felt that it was actually pretty good to spend a day like this once in a while. Chapter 1006 Departure The lake water washes the beach on the shore. And the sound of the waves hitting the beach is the most beautiful note of nature. Sitting on the grass by the lake and listening quietly will give you a feeling of relaxing your soul. The mermaid girls Thea and Dennis were sitting on the grass by the lake. And they actually had grilled fish to eat. The marching tent not far away was brightly lit. Serdak brought the great swordsman Quintus. Quartermaster Louis Fitch. The Archmage Harper. The Magician Abbot. Samira. The Bearded Edgar and called by a resistance squadron leader named Ned Mosby. Everyone gathered in the tent for a discussion. Serdak built a square table with wooden boxes in the middle of the tent. With a lantern hanging above his head. There were several bags of wheat flour in the corner of the tent that had not been moved out in time. Soldek said. The next first step is to regain the town of Bansk and then expand northward based on the town of Bansk. The map on the square table was kindly provided by the Resistance Army Roundtable. The mountains and rivers on the map were drawn in great detail, mainly indicating some canyons and mountain passes hidden in the dense forest. Seeing that everyone was listening attentively, Serdak continued, Now the third army of the Lord's army is still staying in the eastern suburbs of Banks Town, cleaning up the remaining resistance forces. I plan to rush over now and contain this Lord's army in the mountains to prevent them from retreating to Banks Town. I don't want to put the battlefield in the town of Bansk. In addition, the Third Army is one of the three main forces of Lord Macdonald's army. Their most famous is the Heavy Cavalry Regiment. But the Heavy Cavalry Regiment cannot exert any combat power in the mountains here. So this is very important to us. It's actually an advantage. Serdak and the Great Swordsman Quintus have just discussed that this battle will use the Constructed Swordsman Group as the main force. Archmage Harper, who was sitting next to the Great Swordsman Quintus had his eyelids drooped and his eyes fell on the map. After Soldak finished speaking, he continued, This time, the magicians of the law enforcement group will cooperate with you. Action. He raised his eyes, and there was a trace of magic flowing in his eyes. Archmage Harper continued, I want to know where those demon servants and age, lounds came from. Hearing Archmage Harper say this, the atmosphere in the tent became a little solemn. If we were just dealing with Lord MacDonald's army, no one would think that this war would be that difficult. However, once the demons are involved, this kind of cross-race war is usually an endless life-and-death battle. And it is impossible to the drama of paying a ransom in exchange for a prisoner. Archmage Harper continued, Just now, our people were conducting investigations in the town. 
Hell dogs and demon servants appeared on the battlefield here half a year ago. Avide, you have been with Lord MacDonald for a while. Could it be that didn't you find any signs of this? He turned to look at the magician Avid, with a hint of questioning in his tone. Of course, this is also the job of a magician in the law enforcement corps. Avid grimaced and explained, I am with Lord MacDonald. Lord MacDonald has been resisting the Bene Coalition forces in Tarapa for most of the past six months. He has no time to manage the Ganbu plane. His sons have always been specifically responsible for the affairs on the cloth plane. Archmage Harper asked Abai. The black magic hermitage has spread to such an extent here. And the local magic union has not responded at all? Abai shrank his body back slightly. And what was a good discussion about the battle plan suddenly turned into his public trial. He did not dare to offend the members of the law enforcement team. So he quickly explained. I didn't hear any relevant information when I was in Takarai town. Great swordsman Quintus also felt that there was no need to discuss these here. So he took the opportunity to ask. Viscount Soldak, when will we leave for Ban's town? We'll set off tomorrow morning, Serdak said. The recruitment plan here is temporarily left to Dennis. The soldiers who join the heavy armored infantry regiment today will join us. I will spread the news, and there should be more resistant soldiers joining along the way. Great swordsman Quintus thought that Serdak would stay in the canyon town for a few days to recruit troops but he did not expect that he would set off so eagerly. Since Serdak said this, great swordsman Quintus could only fully support it. So he said cheerfully, Okay, then we'll set off tomorrow morning. The meeting also discussed various preparations for the next step. And then the people in the tent dispersed in a hurry. The late night in the Ganbu Plain happened to be the morning in Bena City. And Soldak had to rush there. This time, he did not come out to purchase things in person, but directly bought things for him from the butcher shop owner Xander. The business of the butcher shop in Sandy Magic Market is pretty good, and fresh meat from monsters from the Belan Plain is constantly being delivered. However, everyone seems to be a little tired of this powerful ghost striped red and meat. Many magicians have sent assistants to ask when the salamanders will arrive. Serdak could only tell him that he might not be able to do it in the recent period. It was dawn in Tian Gang, and the swordsmen of the Constructing Swordsman Regiment had already finished their breakfast and were dismantling the temporary camp in an orderly manner although they had only built this camp yesterday afternoon. Many of the wooden frames that had been built were completely dismantled and piled together, form a square stack of wood, compared with these constructed swordsmen. Those soldiers who were originally from the resistance army seemed to have much poorer military quality. They rushed from the town to the lake one after another. Even when they walked, they were loose. The gap was very obvious. Some newcomers didn't even understand anything and were still playing and playing on the road. They gathered on the grass by the lake and lined up very loosely, in small groups, and some even stood in the lake to wash themselves. Serdak regretted not directly bringing over the commanders whom Marquis Luther had lent to him. At this time, I happened to see Ned Mosby rushing from Canyon Town to the lake. He was followed by a large group of resistant soldiers. He quickly asked him to organize and organize these recruits, count the number of soldiers again, and check them with the roster. The soldiers will be the first soldiers of the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. Dennis, Sia and others also rushed to the lake. And Soldak revealed last night's resolution. Dennis asked in surprise. The recruitment work has not been completed and we are about to go to the battlefield? Don't the new recruits undergo training? Sia also asked curiously. We are leaving. What will happen to the canyon town? Serdak stood in front of Dennis and said. Dennis, I plan to leave the work of recruiting and absorbing new recruits to you. The long-legged girl opened her mouth wide, pointed at her plain face, and asked, Leave this matter entirely to me? Serdak nodded and said, I will leave some food and a fund. You only need to gather the new recruits who came to report. When we regain Ban's town, you will take them to Ban's town. As for the training of new recruits, the people we are currently absorbing are basically veterans who have experienced hundreds of battles in the resistance army. They have rich combat experience. What they lack is military discipline and sophisticated weapons and equipment. But these can all be used in the training of new recruits. We'll solve it on the road. He pointed to the wounded who came to Canyon Town from Bant's Town. And explained to Dennis. Dennis, you have to take better care of these wounded soldiers. When Bank's Town is recovered, take them there together. I know. Dennis pursed his lips and agreed. Denise is clearly excited about her new job. Soldak didn't wait any longer and took Dennis directly to his marching tent and said to her, This tent and the inside will be left to you. Complete the recruitment work here in Canyon Town and take care of those. Wounded, 
As he said that, he opened the tent door curtain, which was almost filled with bags of wheat flour. The entire tent was actually full of grain. Dennis patted his chest and promised, Don't worry. I will complete the recruitment task. The lakeside camp was still distributing wheat cakes to the newly joined resistance forces. Soldek was already standing on a big rock by the lake, calling all the new recruits of the heavy armored infantry regiment to gather here. Not far away, the constructed swordsmen were ready to go. Soldek waited for the new recruits to gather together. With the efforts of Ned Mosby, the new recruits finally arranged themselves into a crooked square formation. Serdak shouted to them from above. Okay, before we set off, it's still too late for you to quit. But as long as you follow us out of Canyon Town and take the first step towards Bans Town, if you want to regret it, then you will be a deserter and I will personally send you to the Bena military court. According to Bena's military regulations, deserters on the battlefield will be treated as slaves. Everyone must think carefully. Behind the favorable conditions is a strict military management system. And, of course, the honor of being a Bena soldier. The group of recruits gathered in front of Serdak was very emotional. And no one wanted to quit at this time. Soon the team set off from the lakeside in Canyon Town and headed straight to Bant's town. While Serdak was sorting out the new recruits of the heavy armored infantry regiment, the magicians were already heading west along the river on magic harpoons. Bearded Edgar had returned to the Lingnan camp overnight last night, preparing to summon the soldiers there to join Soldak in Bant's town. Serdak did not go along the river, which would have been a long way. He chose to take the road that Dennis took him to Bant's town last time. Although his memory was a little vague about that road, many people in the resistance were familiar with this road. The constructed swordsman regiment was at the forefront. The newly recruited heavy armored infantry regiment recruits were organized into a squadron of 60 by Ned Mosby. These recruits were almost formed by Ned Mosby. A squadron will follow immediately. Seeing that these swordsmen lined up neatly, even the steps were very consistent. The recruits of the heavy armored infantry regiment following behind were obviously unable to do so. However, after all, they had the power of example. So the recruits also learned to line up like the swordsmen. In this way, a newly formed army, without any weapons or armor, followed the constructed swordsmen on the road. Great swordsman Quintus frowned when he saw these new soldiers who didn't even have half a piece of leather armor on their bodies. Some resistant soldiers originally had some leather armor and miscellaneous weapons. But Serdak informed them last night that the heavy armored infantry regiment would be responsible for all their armor and weapons. There was no need to return their leather armor and weapons. Take it with you. So in the morning, these new troops of the heavy armored infantry regiment came to the lake wearing only thin linen clothes. He has an upright character and a straightforward way of speaking. He directly found Serdak and questioned him. Dak, do you want to send these new troops to the battlefield to be used as cannon fodder? Serdak and Ned Mosby were counting the number of people on the list. Thirty squadrons had been formed so far, and there were still many new recruits waiting by the lake. It is initially estimated that these new troops will number about 3,000. Each squadron now has a squadron leader, and these squadron leaders were also handpicked by Ned Mosby. Serdak put down the charcoal in his hand, smiled at the great swordsman Quintus, and said, Cannon fodder? How is it possible? The lives of each of these resistance fighters are precious. They have been tempered on the battlefield. I have no intention of letting them go to the battlefield before the equipment is gathered. Have you ever thought about what to do with such equipment? Great swordsman Quintus asked. Not all equipment will be captured on the battlefield. Right. Serdak quickly waved his hand to deny. Of course not. In fact, I also brought some of the heavy armored infantry's standard armor. Now I am selecting outstanding warriors from the team to form the first heavy armored infantry regiment of 1,500 people. No. Can you bring these supplies? Great swordsman Quintus saw the large amount of rations that Serdak left for Dennis. Now Serdak said that he had prepared a batch of heavy armor. My jaw almost dropped. I did bring some, Serdak said with a smile. Since there were no horses, everyone in the group had to walk. The road outside Canyon Town was potholed and very muddy. Set off in the morning and rest in the evening. If you get hungry on the way, just eat the toasted wheat cakes given out in the morning. Serdak asked the two-headed ogre to rush to the front of the team, then sat on the roadside and began to distribute the first daily necessities to the new soldiers in the heavy armored infantry regiment. A brand new leather water bag, which was not only stuffed in the mouth it has a cork, and the water bladder has a strap for carrying it on your back. There are hot stamped four-leaf clover-shaped marks on the leather surfaces on both sides of the water bag. It is said 
that this is the mark of the largest water bag making workshop in the Bina province. For the two-headed ogre, it is also a novel thing to distribute water bags to every new soldier. Later, the two-headed ogre distributed a small copper round pot to everyone in the new army. It can be said to be a small pot or a lunch box. Anyway, it is only one for each person. It is a very practical item. The bronzeware was heavy to acquire. The third daily necessities can be said to be a weapon. A horn dagger. The only purpose of this dagger is to skin and cut meat. Each dagger is made with great care and is brand new. When pulled out of the leather sheath, there is still a faint smell of grease on the blade. Chapter 1007 The Quartermaster's Troubles When we camped at a riverside camp at night, each squadron was given five marching tents. When camping by the river, you don't need to consider drinking water, but the trouble is that there are too many mosquitoes. This is the southernmost rainforest in the Ganbu Plain. No matter where you camp, mosquitoes are inevitable. When camping in the summer, you have to set up a tent to avoid being bitten by mosquitoes while sleeping. It's just that there are 12 recruits squeezed into each tent, which is indeed a bit crowded for this type of standard marching tent. Although there was no yellow mutton soup in the evening, dinner turned into oatmeal mixed with cabbage and lunch and meat. Even the great swordsman Quintus couldn't figure out where Serdak got so much. A cabbage. When the new army climbed out of the tents the next morning, they found 12 pairs of long leather boots hanging outside each tent. This was even more outrageous. They had walked on the dirt road for a whole day without starting yesterday morning. At this time, I happened to get this kind of long leather boots with a shiny and dark surface. These standard leather boots are made with very sophisticated craftsmanship and are very strong. They are more suitable for walking on such muddy mountain roads. Although the armor and weapons have not yet been divided, these new troops have already felt what is different from the regular army. These ordinary benefits are simply great. Before distributing weapons, Soldak and Ned Mosby conducted a survey among each squadron and organized all new troops who were good at archery into a separate squadron. On the night of the third day, Quartermaster Louis Fitch and Soldak calculated the military expenses of these supplies. Because Serdak has brought over the standard weapons of the heavy armored infantry regiment, a squadron of 60 people is divided into shield warriors and spear warriors, with 30 night long swords and 30 iris shields. This kind of shield slightly lighter than a tower shield. This skin shield is named after blue fleur de lis printed on its surface. In addition, it is equipped with 30 paglio spears. The blades of these spears purchased by Serdak are all added with lapis lazuli to improve the sharpness. The handles of each spear are made of iron and wood and the top engraved with spiral patterns. One can tell at a glance that it is produced by the Dwarf Master, the most famous weapon shop in Benna City for making spears. Quartermaster Lewis Fitch is indeed an old military quartermaster. He didn't even need Serdak to quote the prices of these items. He just added 20% to the original prices of these items and converted the payment into magic crystals. Return the stone to Serdak. The quartermaster calculated silently while chattering endlessly. The military department asked you to form a heavy armored infantry regiment. It seems to be true. Along the way, you have equipped these resistance forces with almost top-notch infantry. The equipment, the four-leaf clover water bag from the auction-like leatherworking workshop. Only Bitter knows how exquisitely made this thing is. This is a copper lunch box from a copper shop in Coder County. Who told you that the copper lunch boxes made by his family are the most durable? Diggler from Wood's blacksmith shop is used by you as a skinning table knife. Why don't you change the knight's long sword they distribute to the Cyan Fury? Serdak could only say with a smile on his face. You still have a pair of leather boots and no comments. Those boots are military standard boots. What do I have to say? Quartermaster Lewis Fitch rolled his eyes upward and said, I don't know if it's because the new army can eat wheat cakes and oatmeal with luncheon meat every day, or because they have distributed a new set of armaments which is extremely enviable by other resistance armies around them. You want to know which of the items used by these new armies in the past were not ripped from corpses? Then something happened along the way that created a trend. There will always be some resistance army camps along the way. So whenever the team passes by these camps, there will always be a small group of resistance army soldiers gathering on the forest path, quietly joining Serdak's heavy armored infantry regiment. Come here. Every night when camping, Serdak would find that the team was growing continuously and Serdak needed to prepare new armaments for these new troops. Fortunately, when he was purchasing in Benna City, each item was customized according to 20,000 copies. For these stores, Soldak was also the first big order this spring. If there was stock, he would directly place it first. Clear inventory. Samira and Sia have to register the new troops every day. 
the heavy armored infantry regiment has been gone for nearly a week. And the team already looks like a regular army. At least every time these recruits move, they move in small groups. As a unit, everyone works together. Moreover, the number of soldiers in Serdak's heavy armored infantry regiment quickly doubled from 3,000 to more than 6,700. Now the heavy armored infantry regiment of Serdak has been divided into five battle groups, of which the first four battle groups are currently at full strength. The fifth team is the reserve team, and new troops that join one after another will enter the fifth battle group. On the eighth day after leaving Canyon Town, the heavy armored infantry regiment was still walking through the rainforest and did not enter the territory of Bant's town. Archmage Harper of the Magician Group, who was walking in front of the team, found Serdak specifically and said to him solemnly, The magician who was scouting in front today has seen the black magician on the opposite side scouting over the jungle. But the other party ran away immediately when he saw our people. Soldak immediately pulled out the map and confirmed that the current position of the infantry regiment was at least a hundred miles away from the border of Bant's town territory. I didn't expect them to prepare for the eastern expedition so soon. I thought they would be held back by the resistant soldiers scattered in the mountains, Serdak said with a frown. He originally planned to rescue the resistant soldiers in the mountains, come out and become the backbone of the infantry regiment. They are veterans who crawled out of the death pit. Only by completely clearing them out can the lords of the third legion begin their eastern expedition. Tomorrow I will ask the magicians to increase the scope of investigation to see if they can find the main force of the third legion. Archmage Harper said. I will also prepare for the battle here. It is better to fight in the suburbs than to have them huddle in the town. When the time comes, I will rebuild the town after it is destroyed, Serdak said confidently. That night, Serdak took out 1,500 pieces of infantry heavy armor and equipped the first heavy armored infantry regiment. However, shield warriors also need a lot of physical strength to wear this kind of full coverage armor. Generally speaking, Spear warriors were half-body armor without leg and arm guards. The entire camp was completely boiling. And Quartermaster Lewis Fitch also covered his eyes, looking like he couldn't bear to look directly. He stood outside the camp and said with a painful expression, I should have guessed that you would buy this. The alloy full-cover armor mixed with black iron. You probably have completely revitalized the Gutiki blacksmith shop this time. I believe that their manager will not be able to make such a very cost-effective full-cover armor in the future. Soldak stood next to Quartermaster Lewis Fitch and said, Actually, it's not bad. I ordered 10,000 sets from the store. Chapter 1008 Interrogation In just one week, the first constructed swordsman group led by great swordsman Quintus has initially adapted to the environment and climate of this rainforest. This rainforest is extremely humid, and even in the dense jungle, there are everywhere. There are shrubs, vines, and ferns growing in the jungle. There are many small animals and birds in the jungle, but large carnivorous animals are basically invisible. A jungle ocelot can dominate this jungle. From the mouths of the magicians of the Law Enforcement Corps, we learned that there were traces of the reconnaissance team of the Third Legion of the Lord's Army in the nearby area. The great swordsman Quintus led the constructed swordsman group into the rainforest, looking for traces of the reconnaissance team. He wanted to capture one or two scouts from the Third Army of the Lord's Army and learn about the intelligence on the other side. The jungle is humid, and some rotten trees are lying in the jungle. Slippery moss is everywhere, and you will slip if you are not careful when walking. There is a lot of moisture in the leaf mold soil. If you step into it, water will seep into the footprints. Many rainforest plant vines are covered with thorns. If you want to pass through these thorn vines, you not only need to prepare a machete, but also need to wear a suit of anti-thorn leather armor. Although the moisture in the leaf rot soil is almost saturated, the long when you step on it with boots, the saws won't get much mud. The food chain here is very simple. Flying insects and poisonous snakes are rampant in the forest. The spotted ocelots in the jungle like to hunt snakes. Most of the birds in the forest also feed on these flying insects. A team of five constructed swordsmen entered the rainforest. The captain who was walking at the front used his sword to separate a small green snake as thick as a thumb. The group passed through trees with huge aerial roots. And the colorful insects just park on the tree trunk. They had been walking in this rainforest for most of the day, following a row of footprints made by military boots. The leader of the constructed swordsman captain was good at tracking, and he saw no traps set along the way. It was probably not a hunter passing by here. The construct swordsman captain suddenly stopped behind a big tree and winked at the construct swordsman behind him. The construct swordsman used his hands and feet to climb up a big tree in a few clicks and squatted down, peeking ahead from the leafy horizontal branches. Soon he slid down from the tree 
and said to the constructed swordsman captain, Captain, those people are right in front. There are fifteen people in total and three dogs. The constructed swordsman captain whispered, Attention everyone. Prepare to fight. Leave two alive to take back. Kill the dogs first. Yes. The constructed swordsman responded softly. Five constructed swordsmen surrounded the Lord's Army reconnaissance team, who were resting in the forest from all sides. This reconnaissance team has a total of 12 members and is a standard infantry team. They are a reconnaissance team. So each team member is equipped with a jungle hunting bow, short sword and shield, and they also wear leather armor that makes it easy to travel through the forest. The members of the reconnaissance team found a mysterious tree in the jungle. In fact, there is nothing special about this big tree. It has a huge root system that holds the entire tree nearly two meters high. The crown of the tree is like a flower umbrella in a secret room. It has five corners. There are some small white flowers blooming between the star-shaped leaves. This small flower exudes a refreshing fragrance, which not only has the effect of calming the nerves and promoting sleep, but also has the effect of repelling mosquitoes. The rainforest is oppressively hot. There are many mosquitoes, and the forest is covered with thorny vines. The soldiers usually cover themselves tightly in the forest. In the jungle, every mysterious tree is a rare resting place. This reconnaissance team has been wandering in the jungle for three days and is now ready to take a good rest before returning to the 7th Infantry Battalion of the 3rd Army. Hell dogs hate the humid environment here. The moist water vapor causes the lava veins on their skin to form a thick layer of hard skin. These sharp-edged hard skins are always scratched everywhere in the forest. Now they have stains on their bodies, covered with green moss. These wet moss were quickly dehydrated by the heat from the age, L dog's body, and finally turned into some green powder floating in the air, carrying a pungent smell. Hellhounds especially hate this smell. Three demon servants, completely wrapped in black robes, were using tree branches to brush the moss off the H, L dogs. Their skin transformed into the same skin as that of H, Lounds, like volcanic rocks flowing through mottled black rock formations, with blood always seeping out of the cracks. The three demon servants sat together in silence with pain in their eyes. In contrast, the twelve soldiers of the reconnaissance team seemed much more leisurely. They spread their sleeping bags under the tree, took off their light leather armor, and lay on them, enjoying the rare coolness. At this moment, the three H, L dogs lying under the tree suddenly stood up, and three pairs of blood-red pupils looked around vigilantly. The demon servants stood up hastily, and one of them shouted to the reconnaissance team in a hoarse voice enemy attack. The soldiers of the reconnaissance team woke up from their sleep. They put on the light leather armor randomly. But it was too late. There was a rustling sound in the forest, and the branches above the head shook suddenly. A swordsman jumped down from the tree crown, and the long sword in his hand drew a sword light in midair. A ray of sword light flashed across, and the H, L dog that was looking up to the sky was killed by the construct warrior's sword on the spot. The moment the constructed swordsman landed, his feet stepped diagonally on the air roots of the mysterious tree. His body curled up and rolled to the left, avoiding the bites of the other two H, L dogs. The long sword in his hand was like a spirit. It stabbed the demon servant in the chest like a snake. A handful of purple blood spurted out from the demon servant's chest, and he fell backwards. At this gap, four constructed swordsmen rushed out from four directions in the forest at the same time. The magic pattern structures on their bodies were all flashing with gorgeous magic patterns and their bodies were as light as ocelots in the jungle. Every jump has a unique rhythm. To ordinary warriors, these three H, L dogs are definitely more ferocious monsters than tigers and leopards. However, under the joint efforts of four constructed swordsmen, the remaining two H, L dogs were beheaded. When the three demon servants saw the H, L dog dying in battle, they immediately went crazy and rushed towards the constructed swordsmen. The demon servants howled and stretched out their sharp claws but were killed one by one by the constructed swordsmen next to the H, L dogs. When the soldiers of the reconnaissance team saw the swordsmen wearing magic pattern structures, they immediately knew what kind of swordsmen they were encountering. They didn't even have the courage to fight. And some of them didn't even have time to wear the leather armor on their bodies. At the captain's whistle, they immediately dispersed and fled into the dense forest. Naturally, the constructed swordsman captain would not let them escape like this taking advantage of the speed advantage provided by the magic pattern construct. They stabbed the two slowest reconnaissance team soldiers under the tree through their thighs, and then used daggers to pierce the thighs of their right hands. Palms nailed to tree trunks. This is what they left alive. When chasing down other members of the reconnaissance team, 
The movements of these constructed swordsmen are free. They were like a group of jungle headhunters, jumping almost continuously, catching up from behind, wiping their swords on their throats, and immediately chasing the next one. This team of constructed swordsmen cooperated extremely well with each other. Almost everyone chased down two reconnaissance team soldiers one after another, and then dragged their bodies back to the tree. The items on these reconnaissance team soldiers, including leather armor weapons, etc. And of course, it became their trophy. If these reconnaissance team soldiers don't have much money, they can also report them and turn them into performance points. Of course, if you plan to collect merit points, all the belongings of these reconnaissance team soldiers will be confiscated. In addition to two soldiers from the reconnaissance team whose thighs were almost completely broken off, they were brought back to Serdak's camp. Even the body of a demon servant was brought back. The corpse of the demon servant was now lying in a tent in the camp. A group of magicians lifted the corpse to the table. Everyone was busy dissecting the demon servant. Archmage Harper looked at the gradually decaying organs with a serious look on his face. There was a putrid smell in the tent. Archmage Harper pulled out the silver knife and looked at the blackened blade. These internal organs were gradually becoming demonized. They should be ordinary residents of the plane. Archmage Harper lowered his head and said expressionlessly, Why did they sign a sole contract with the H. L. Dogs? A young magician standing behind the crowd asked doubtfully, In order to control these H. L. Dogs more effectively, these people sacrifice their souls to the big devil through some evil rituals. And then, they can sign a devil contract with these H. L. Dogs. Although they become such ugly appearances, they are basically it is equivalent to having the lifespan of a H. L. Dog. But in order to survive for a few more days, the price paid is a bit too high. A middle-aged magician explained accordingly. How come so many people are willing to become servants of the devil? The young magician sighed again. What if they are not voluntary? Archmage Harper raised his head, glanced around sternly, and asked. The faces of the surrounding magicians changed slightly, and everyone remained silent, as if if they stopped chatting in death. Such cruel things would not happen. On the other side of the camp, in order to prevent the two soldiers from the reconnaissance team from dying prematurely during the interrogation process, Soldak personally treated their wounds, performed basic hemostasis, and also injecting blood into their thighs. The wound was resutured. Great swordsman Quintus, as the chief judge, sat under a big tree, while two infantry regiment recruits silently dug a hole next to the big tree with shovels. Both pits are almost two meters long and half a meter wide. The roots under the big tree are crisscrossed, making it difficult to dig. The great swordsman Quintus was polishing a dagger with a whetstone, and the constructed swordsman escorted the two reconnaissance team soldiers under the big tree. The Lord's Army soldier's face turned a little gray when he saw the two square pits under the tree. The great swordsman Quintus tapped the two people's bloodless faces with his dagger and approached them and said, Listen, I will only say these words once. If you answer the questions I ask you without thinking, hesitate, don't know, or answer incorrectly, you will be punished. The punishment is very simple. If you cut off your fingers and count the toes, 20 chances for you to answer incorrectly or fail to answer. He paused for a moment with a cruel smile on his scarred face, and opened his mouth and said, Besides, don't worry. None of my questions are difficult. The two of us will answer them together. For a moment, the air seemed to be barred. No one in the constructed swordsman group wanted to watch the interrogation of great swordsman Quintus. There was only a group of new heavy armored infantry regiment recruits in the distance, who did not dare to come close, and could only watch from a distance. Where are you from? Great swordsman Quintus said suddenly, the highly nervous reconnaissance team soldier immediately blurted out, The 7th Infantry Regiment of the 3rd Army. 3rd, another warrior might be a little nervous. Not only did he stutter, but he also got stuck in the middle. You're too slow! Quintus pointed at the soldier. Two constructed swordsmen suddenly came up from behind. One held down his arm and covered his mouth with his hand. The other swordsman chopped off his fingers like carrots, and his bloody thumb rolled away, falling on the soil under the tree. Woo! The soldier's mouth was covered and he couldn't even scream. After a short pause, the great swordsman Quintus raised his hand again and said, Second question, where do these demon servants come from? It was those black magicians who brought it here. Acre Town. The two blurted out almost at the same time. But when they said brought by the black magician, they obviously widened their eyes and shouted almost desperately with a bitter tone. Oh, I also know it's Acre Town. Seeing that the two prisoners' emotions had been brought up, 
The great swordsman Quintus showed a hint of satisfaction and said slowly, Very well. What is our mission as we continue the 7th Infantry Regiment of the 3rd Army? No one answered. Woo. This time both of them had their mouths covered at the same time and let out muffled screams. The two soldiers of the reconnaissance team eventually died during the interrogation process. Quintus' great swordsman asked a lot of information, which required the scout team of the magician reconnaissance team and the constructed swordsman regiment to rush over to verify. In fact, according to the information obtained by Quintus' great swordsman, due to a serious disconnect in the Lord's Army's logistic supply line, the entire Third Army was almost scattered in this mountain range. Commander Glover MacDonald is the seventh son of Lord MacDonald. This young man who hastily took over the command of the Third Army does not have any leadership qualities. Although he led the Third Army to defeat five rebel camps in one fell swoop and achieve significant results in the town of Bansk, this only shows that the Third Army is an elite force and has nothing to do with his commanding ability. The Third Legion is currently trapped in the Black Crow Ridge area, and there are three voices in the Legion alone. The commanders of the cavalry regiment suggested maintaining the original results, returning to the town of Bansk, and then starting to prepare a logistics regiment for further western expedition plans. The commanders of the infantry regiment suggested that the five rebel camps should be used as the center. Search outwards, completely eliminate the hidden dangers on the outskirts of Bansk town, and then move closer to the west steadily. But the young commander grow a plan to attack the rebel rear in one go. If he could eliminate these rebels in one fell swoop, he could easily control the situation in the south. Chapter 1009 Holy Light Currently, the total strength of the Third Army is approximately 30,000 troops. Among them, the most elite troops are the six heavy cavalry regiments. The officers above the squadron commander of these heavy cavalry regiments are all constructed knights. The cavalry are equipped with full black iron armor and green scale horses. The six heavy cavalry battalions total about 3,000 people. Ten light cavalry regiments. These light cavalry regiments were formed entirely to cooperate with the heavy cavalry. This part of the army has a total of 5,000 people. These cavalry are the main force in the third army. In addition, there are 10 heavy armored infantry regiments in the legion, with almost 15,000 elite heavy armored infantry, two regiments of archers, approximately 3,000 strong. Finally, there is the auxiliary corps of 5,000 people, which is mainly responsible for material transportation, setting up camps and other tasks. The problem lies precisely with these 5,000 engineering and auxiliary soldiers. All the troops of the legion have entered this mountainous rainforest and the various battle groups are relatively scattered, resulting in the supply line of the entire battle being too long. Sixteen cavalry regiments have been lingering on the outskirts of Bant's town, refusing to take one more step toward the mountains on the east side. Since they are relatively close to Bant's town, the cavalry regiments are fairly well supplied. But life was very difficult for the infantry regiment. Material supplies were not available, which slowed down the infantry regiment's clearing operations in the mountains. Even with the full cooperation of the black magicians, there is still no way to completely eliminate the remaining rebel forces in the mountains. The information obtained by the magicians in the law enforcement group is, in order to allow the army to communicate with the hellhounds, the black magicians asked some ordinary townspeople to enter into magical contracts with the hellhounds. These demonic servants are all from Acre Town. It is said that Acre Town is in the north of the Ganbu Plain. The magicians of the law enforcement group are worried that this northern town may have been completely controlled by the black magic hermitage. There is so little information here. The situation is far more serious than imagined. And it seems that the magical priory must have a bigger conspiracy. In addition, just today, the magicians of the law enforcement group once again encountered black magicians over the jungle. A fierce battle began between the two sides in the air. The magicians of these law enforcement groups did not take any advantage. It can even be said that he suffered a small loss. A magician was shot in the arm by a shadow arrow and fell headlong from the handle of the magic pot. If he hadn't been lucky enough and fell into the river, he would have lost more than just a high-performance magic harpoon handle. The strength of the Third Army is much greater than that of Serdak's heavy armored infantry regiment that has not yet been formed. However, Serdak has many advantages. Currently, everyone is in the dark. Groa, the commander of the Third Army, does not know that there is such a newly formed army ready to hit them. And the most important thing is that there is also a regiment of constructed swordsmen who have experienced hundreds of battles. This Black Crow Ridge is an area where the Resistance Army often operates. The Resistance Army soldiers are extremely familiar with the environment here. 
Serdek discussed with great swordsman Quintus and Archmage Harper, and planned to eat the 7th Infantry Regiment of the 3rd Legion in one bite. This infantry regiment had approximately 1,500 infantrymen. If you look at the map, you will find that the 7th Infantry Regiment has already thrust an all from the border of Bant's town and penetrated into the jungle mountains on the east side. In the afternoon, the magicians once again flew to the 7th Infantry Regiment camp on their magic harpoons to detect possible reinforcements around their camp. The great swordsman Quintus led the constructed swordsmen into the jungle in advance and blocked the retreat of the 7th Infantry Regiment. Serdak's heavy armored infantry regiment will set off in the evening. Ned Mosby is currently the commander of the 1st Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. Serdak only brought back 1,500 pieces of full coverage armor. Only one heavy armored infantry regiment was equipped. In addition to this heavy armored infantry regiment, there were also 500 archers accompanying the army. In addition to an alloy bow, these archers almost wore leather boots and linen clothes on the battlefield. But the recruits didn't care. They liked this standard longbow with a longer range. The latest news from the Magic Envoy is that the 7th Infantry Regiment is at least 10 kilometers away from the infantry regiment behind it. Even if other infantry regiments came to rescue him, it would be at least an hour later. The team stepped through a puddle full of duckweed and stepped on soft dead branches and leaves. When night fell, they saw dim lights lighting up in the distance of the jungle, and clusters of bonfires passed through the gaps in the trees. In Serdak's eyes, it seems that the soldiers over there are having dinner, and there is the smell of barbecue in the air. Maybe the military rations are not enough, and they need to hunt some small forest animals. Samira personally eliminated the sentry in the forest area on the west side of the 7th Infantry Battalion. The team was close to 50 meters away, and the chatter of the Lord Army during the meal could be heard very clearly in everyone's ears. All the archers came to the front of the team and lined up in a long row. Maybe the bonfires in the camp were too dazzling. Maybe the infantry regiment trusted the surrounding sentries too much and they didn't know anything about the arrival of the Serdak Infantry Regiment. The battle started so suddenly. The archers stood up from behind the trees and aimed around a flat fire at the 7th Infantry Regiment camp. The infantry soldiers near the bonfire on the west side of the camp were hit by arrows. The infantry soldiers who survived quickly found bunkers and hid behind them. Wails, screams, and curses came from the camp. Some people shouted enemy attack, and some people picked up the weapons around them and prepared to fight back the archer continued to approach and fired a second round of arrows. This was the first time Ned Mosby participated in such an attack on a camp. When he saw the infantry warriors in the opposite camp starting to fight back, he quickly asked the unarmored archers to retreat behind the shield warriors and spear warriors. Suddenly, a group of shield warriors wearing jet black armors emerged from the woods, holding brand new swords and shields in their hands. A three-meter-tall two-headed ogre rushed to the front of the team. He was carrying a big stick covered with barbs. Every step he took, he felt the forest ground trembling. Under the thick ice armor, he actually held a fireball in his hand. He threw the fireball in his hand towards an archer who was about to draw his bow and set an arrow. The fireball exploded in front of the archer, immediately blowing the archer away. Go out. The squadron commanders of the 7th Infantry Regiment have assembled their teams in the camp, and the infantrymen on the west side have come to support them along with their commanders. The squadron captains of these infantry regiments are all first-level warriors, but they are not heavy cavalry regiments. The squadron leaders do not have magic pattern structures, although they have rich combat experience and their combat prowess is not bad. In the two-headed group with the strength of the second level in front of the ogre, he was as harmless as a little sheep. Gulitam swung his big stick and knocked away a squadron leader who was charging towards him with a shield. His body flew more than 10 meters into the air and hit a big tree. When the blood spurted out, there were even some broken pieces. Cracked liver. Serdak is still in the center of the infantry team. The aura of strength under his feet is the biggest support for these heavy armored infantry. This armor is too heavy. When the soldiers charge in this armor, their physical strength is exhausted very quickly. Only with the help of Serdak, only Dak's power aura can alleviate it. However, Serdak's power aura is limited in scope. Only warriors standing within 60 yards of Serdak can feel it. Not all infantry warriors can grab such a good position. This also forces the charging team to be cohesive enough. These poor lords actually took off their armor when they were eating lunch. Now many of them had no time to put their armor on and started fighting fiercely with the new recruits of the Serdak Infantry Regiment. At the front of the team was a two-headed ogre, followed closely by a paladin with an aura of power. The new army didn't even have a charge formation, led by the two-headed ogre. 
it naturally formed a sharp arrow formation, like a sharp arrow piercing the barracks of the 7th Infantry Regiment. At the beginning, the commander of the 7th Infantry Regiment was still standing at the door of the Chinese army's tent, commanding the battle with a determined expression. As the infantry of the Lord Army retreated steadily, the commander was completely panicked for a moment and quickly fired three red magic flares into the night sky. Samira followed the battlefield with 500 archers to finish up the damage. Soldak quickly rushed to the center of the camp, and the commander of the 7th Infantry Regiment quickly retreated westward surrounded by his cronies. And just in the corner of the camp, there were more than 50 H, L dogs and demon servants gathered here. Before they joined the battle, they found more than 20 magicians floating in the air, and their hands almost lit up with fireballs and blazing flames. If it is smashed down, the camp here will turn into a sea of fire. The hellhound suffered countless casualties under the fireball. In just half an hour, the camp of the 7th Infantry Battalion was declared broken. Commander Alex led a group of defeated troops to flee to the dense forest to the west. Since it was dark night, the forest was full of fleeing lord armies. There were also some lords who raised their hands and surrendered as they watched the people behind them catch up. The archers who arrived behind picked up the ropes around their waists and tied up all the prisoners. Regardless of whether the prisoners were injured or not, everyone was dragged to the front of the big tent in the center of the camp for centralized custody. Each constructed swordsman was five meters apart. They were like a huge fishing net, blocking the 7th Infantry Regiment's return path. Hearing the cry of killing coming from the camp, great swordsman Quintus became a little impatient, but he still resisted the urge to lead the constructed swordsman group to kill them. Finally, I heard the sound of hurriedly fleeing in the jungle, as well as the violent breathing of many soldiers. The great swordsman Quintus drew out his double swords, and finally there was a warrior running at the front. He jumped over a cluster of low bushes with flying strides, grabbed a horizontal branch above his head with both hands, and then used his strength to jump. Jumped out more than ten meters. In a panic, he saw the silhouette of a constructed swordsman in front of him getting bigger and bigger, as if he had sent it up on his own initiative. The sharp sword flashed across his neck, and he felt a sudden coldness in his throat, and something warm and wet sprayed out under the severe pain. In fear, he covered his throat with blood gushing out with both hands, writhing on the ground, making a death struggle. The constructed swordsman didn't even look back. His cold eyes were still staring ahead as countless fleeing figures fled in the forest. The magician in the night sky continued to drop fireballs into the forest, and the low-light flares lit up the entire forest. Strangle. It wasn't until the two-headed ogre Gilladum and the great swordsman Quintus came together that the ogre knew that the 7th Infantry Regiment had been completely killed. There was still fighting in many places in the forest, but as a large number of the constructed swordsmen were free to send reinforcements to various parts of the forest, and the battle was coming to an end, the entire battle lasted less than an hour, and there was a large amount of loot on the battlefield waiting for someone to deal with it. This time, the Constructed Swordsman Regiment is still tasked with blocking reinforcements from other infantry regiments. The magicians of the law enforcement group also captured a black magician at the Hell Dog Camp. Five magicians flew to different directions to the west and began to detect the movements of these reinforcing infantry regiments in the night sky. We only waited for about a quarter of an hour here, and everyone had just taken a breath. The 1st Infantry Regiment that came over for reinforcements had already met the resistance of the constructed swordsmen. The construct warriors hiding in the dark night jungle are extremely lethal to these heavy armored infantry. The construct swordsmen are extremely flexible when fighting, especially with the agility of the magic pattern construct. They can run his jumps. Jumps and dodges were all a bit higher than usual, and he was able to kill the heavy armored infantry rushing over for reinforcements in a blink of an eye. At this time, the spear infantry hidden behind the constructed swordsmen rushed out again behind the shield warriors. These reinforcements had been killed by the constructed swordsmen until they cried for their mothers. When they saw more warriors coming out from behind, they stayed behind. The comrades who were killed and wounded on the ground retreated decisively until the sky was slightly light. Five infantry regiments of the Lord's army were participating in this battlefield. Unfortunately, they did not arrive at the same time and their strength was too scattered. The final result was that Serdak's heavy armored infantry regiment moved back the supplies of the entire camp of the 7th Infantry Regiment. In addition, more than 3,000 sets of armor and weapons were captured, as well as more than 1,000 prisoners of the Lord's Army Infantry Regiment. By the river, the great swordsman Quintus took off his bloody boots and threw them into the clear river water to rinse them. The river water was instantly dyed red. He washed the magic pattern structure that he took off again. 
by the river. Five hundred constructed swordsmen were washing their equipment, and the smell of blood was simply too strong. They are the swordsmen of the first constructed swordsman group of the Luther Legion. When Marquis Luther presided over the Battle of Terrapagan, when the swordsman group of Quintus Great Swordsmen fought, most of them fought against the opponent, the elite heavy cavalry regiment. Such a battle to strangle an infantry regiment really rarely happens. Almost even if it is a dimensionality reduction strike, victory in the battle is expected. Especially when there were four second level experts in a battle, and 30 magicians were fully supporting them in the night sky. If Serdak hadn't wanted to digest these trophies as quickly as possible and increase the combat effectiveness of the heavy armored infantry regiment, he would have wanted to continue the pursuit and expand the results. At this time, Serdak was treating the injured warriors in the camp and the more than 30 heads of H. L. dogs he had hunted were put to full use here. Balls of holy light kept flashing in Serdak's hands. This golden holy light not only reflected in the eyes of the surrounding new army soldiers, but also seemed like a beam of light falling from the sky, shining into their hearts. Chapter 1010 10, Groa's Plan Thea followed Serdak. Her hydrotherapy technique could heal the minor injuries of most warriors, but it was a little painful during the treatment process. At this time, Everyone realized that this girl with eyes, as beautiful as Lakes was actually a water magician. They usually saw this little girl surrounding Lord Serdak all day long. But they didn't expect that she was actually a magician. The magicians in the law enforcement group are also ready to take action. Everyone wants to get to know this beautiful girl. Among the magicians. Only Archmage Harper saw some clues. And he immediately stopped the unreasonable behavior of these magicians, who were full of male hormones. The captured black magician took poison and committed suicide before dawn, and did not reveal any information about the black magic priory until his death. When the merit points were counted the next day, the new soldiers of these infantry regiments realized that the trophies they captured were not handed over for free, but could be exchanged for a certain amount of merit. The heavy armored infantry regiment had issued an announcement that 100 points of merit would be given to them. You can exchange it for a gold coin. Well, in this battle last night, all the soldiers of the 1st Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment earned their first 100 merit points in their lives. This alone makes other infantry regiments envious. Lord Serdak did not keep the captured metal armor in his pocket. But with everyone's efforts, he reassembled 2,500 complete sets of armor. These sets of armor were then issued to the 2nd Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. In addition, about a 1,000 infantry soldiers in the 3rd Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment received this captured armor. There were nearly 4,000 new troops wearing armor in the entire camp. The quality of this batch of armor is far inferior to the 1,500 sets of heavy armor purchased by Serdek. Even so, for these infantry recruits, being able to put on a complete set of armor means that they are qualified to participate in the next battle. And everyone is looking forward to this. When Big Beard captured Takarai Town, although a large amount of supplies were captured, the armor and weapons obtained were very limited. There are not as many armors, and weapons as Serdak captured in this battle. The soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment continued to rest in this camp for half a day. Afterwards, Serdak took them to another area of Black Crow Ridge. That afternoon, the black magician investigator also found this abandoned camp. When he wanted to follow the clues, he was almost shot down from the air by Samira with an arrow from the sky strike bow. If this black magician hadn't been proficient in some electrical magic and magic armor, he might have become Samira's trophy. When he fled back in a hurry, and several other infantry regiments of the 3rd Army came here. All traces of the camp here were covered up by a heavy rain. The 6th Infantry Regiment commanders rode their war horses, and circled twice in the ruined camp, gathering together with gloomy faces. The soldiers from the guard surrounded the open space, forming two distinct circles with the H, L dogs. Not far away, there are some stinking demon servants, who are calming the restless H, L dogs. More than two dozen black magicians were hovering in the sky on magic harpoons. They took the trouble to circle back and forth over the jungle, looking for clues left by the resistance army. However, these magicians just wandered back and forth in this forest, not daring to fly too far. After all, a lot of their companions had died recently. Who knew whether the next person would be them? So there was nothing wrong with being careful. This time, the black magician transferred 2,000 H. L dogs and demon servants from the rear of the 3rd Legion. Just to make these H, L dogs play their due role in the jungle. These vicious H, L dogs searched a large circle in the abandoned camp. But unfortunately they found nothing except causing a group of birds in the forest to fly up from the top of the trees, and killing a few small animals that were slow to escape. The black H, 
Hell dogs roared and whimpered from time to time. In the eyes of these black magicians, hell dogs are much more reliable in combat than the group of infantry soldiers in front of them. It's a pity that the black magician didn't expect the heavy rain to come so quickly. By the time they got here, all the smells had been washed away by the heavy rain. Even the last bits of blood on the ground seeped into the soil. According to the information provided by the infantry regiment, the magician arrived here early, but unfortunately, he has found nothing until now. The black magician suspected that the disappearance of several black magicians on the outskirts of Bansk half a month ago might be indirectly related to the annihilation of the 7th Infantry Regiment. The 7th Infantry Regiment was raided by the rebels at night and was completely wiped out. The 3rd Army Corps finally realized that it had underestimated the strength of the opponent. At the same time, the internal strife within the 3rd Army finally subsided and the internal supply line of the army finally extended to Black Crow Ridge, the eastern border of Bankstown. Those distinguished cavalry gentlemen also urged Glover MacDonald, get off and drive slowly towards the eastern border. Several infantry regiment leaders gathered together. They were incompatible with the black robe magicians. Even if they were in the same camp, they despised each other and didn't get along well. Therefore, the two groups of people rarely get together. If the 7th Infantry Regiment had not been wiped out this time, these regiment-level commanders would not have endured the stench and stood in the same abandoned camp with these H. L. dogs. The campground was deserted. With only a few extinguished campfires left, the commander of the 1st Infantry Regiment was a bald man with a steady personality. And he spoke in a loud voice. I heard him say, With so many people, are there any tracking clues left behind? His adjutant quickly explained in a low voice. The rain yesterday covered up all the smells. And now those H. L dogs can't do anything about it. The group leaders glanced at the other side of the ruins, where a black mass of H. L dogs gathered. And low roars could be heard from time to time. I heard that those demon servants came from Acre Town. A young infantry commander was about to tell the gossip he had learned when he was interrupted by a bald man. Hey, don't pry around if we don't know. Look, we might end up with the same fate as the 7th Infantry Regiment one day. But at least we'll die decently this way. We really have to be offended by talking nonsense. If I meet some people, they might be used as fertilizer and sprinkled on the vegetable garden. That would be too worthless and I won't accept it. Hearing what the bald man said, the infantry regiment leaders who wanted to talk about the recent strange events collectively became silent. The commander of the 5th Infantry Regiment looked around and asked the bald man, Where do you think those constructed swordsmen come from? The bald man chuckled with disdain and said, Aside from those stubborn old lords in Benna, is there any province that is willing to cultivate constructed swordsmen? The commander of the 5th Infantry Regiment asked with a worried look. So what are we going to do next? How can our infantry regiment defeat the constructed swordsmen? I heard that the legionary cavalry are coming soon. The bald man touched his bald head and added. Master Groa will arrive in the afternoon. I think we should prepare carefully to see him. When the time comes, there should always be some words to say. The expressions of the several infantry commanders immediately became much more serious. Soon after, the infantry commanders dispersed and led the infantry regiments to conduct a carpet search in the area. The black magicians also began to urge the Hellhound Legion to search westward, and they followed them in the air on magic harpoons. By the afternoon of that day, Glover MacDonald led a group of cavalrymen to arrive at the ruins of the camp. First, dozens of green-scaled horses emerged from the jungle. They were a group of well-equipped knights with a young man in the center. This young master Groa looks very similar to Lord MacDonald when he was young. His eyes are slender. His eye sockets are sunken. With a little dark circles. His face is a little pale. And his skin color is a little sickly. At first glance, he gives people a sense of gaze. Somewhat sinister. Looking at everything around him with a scrutinizing gaze. Seeing master Groa arriving at the ruined camp. The black magicians in the sky hurriedly gathered over. They are very familiar with Groa. If Groa hadn't pulled the strings from him, it would have been difficult for the black magicians to gain a foothold in the Ganbu Plain. It was also because of this relationship that Groa Nike was able to transfer from the north. 3,000 H, L dogs and demon servants, as well as 50 black magicians, participated in this battle to annihilate the rebels. In fact, the encirclement and suppression of the rebels went very smoothly in the past few days. After all, it was the elite troops of Lord MacDonald's regular Lord Army. They pushed through five rebel camps with overwhelming force and used two weeks to hunt down and kill them in the mountains. Killed countless rebel fighters. 
The only thing that made Groa a little irritated was that the logistics group of the 3rd Army was not fully prepared. And there were no businessmen willing to go with the army. As a result, the logistics supplies of the 3rd Army could not keep up. In addition, because of the victory in the initial stage, there were many voices in the Legion. The contradiction between the cavalry and the infantry also deepened day by day. These problems made Groa scratch his head. Sir McCarthy, what went wrong with the reconnaissance team? So many rebels gathered here, and they didn't notice it? Groa asked the leader of the Black Magicians. Magician McCarthy. A while ago, there were some second-level experts who were hunting our people in the mountains. Recently, a group of magicians from the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group gathered here. Our flight detection trajectory has been greatly restricted, and we cannot get close to them at all. The main force, McCarthy explained gloomily, he is the leader of this Black Magician Support Group, and he has always had a good personal relationship with Groa. He had lost six Black Magicians in succession recently, leaving him wondering how to explain to the president when he returned to Acre Town. Groa's eyes softened a little, and he turned around and asked again, Then can you roughly determine the location of this group of rebels? Black Magician McCarthy nodded reluctantly and said, Okay, they should still be lurking in the western mountains of Crow Ridge. I will send the H. L. Dogs out to investigate all areas next. I think the places that cannot be explored are probably their hiding places. When will your cavalry regiment arrive on the battlefield here? It won't exceed ten days at most. Groa said firmly. Come here. All the commanders of your infantry regiments. I don't need you here to look for clues about the rebels now. And from now on, you will take all the infantry soldiers to cut down trees in the jungle for me. I need a clear road. Leading from here to the town of Bansk which can facilitate the transport group to transport strategic materials. Groa held the reins of the war horse in one hand and ordered the infantry commanders, who arrived one after another. The commanders of these infantry regiments didn't care what they were doing. It was much safer to cut down trees in the jungle than to rush to the front line and face the group of constructed swordsmen. Yes, Commander Groa. The infantry commanders took the order one after another and then quickly retreated to the ruined camp with their infantry regiments. The reconnaissance team that was conducting a search mission in the mountains ahead also saw the retreating magic flares. They immediately stopped and evacuated the Black Crow Ridge as quickly as possible. A heavy armored infantry squad ambushing on the ridge of Black Crow Ridge looked at the Lord's Army Infantry Reconnaissance Team turning away 150 meters down the mountain. And they looked at each other for a moment. Why did they retreat? The infantry soldier crouching behind a boulder looked down the mountain and murmured in a low voice. I thought we were going to fight here. The companion beside him also said with some regret, I even pulled out the sword. But they actually slapped their butts and ran away. A soldier put the shining knight sword back into the scabbard and stretched his neck and said, In order to find out the situation, this infantry team took advantage of being very familiar with the surrounding environment and ran back to the original ruined camp at night to investigate the situation. Only to find that the infantry regiment of the Lord Army was building a camp here. A soldier in the team climbed up a tree and looked at the campfire not far away. He said, They camped at our original camp. Don't tell me. They are quite discerning. An infantry soldier standing at the front, who was responsible for sentry, said quickly, Everyone, be careful. The H. L. Dogs are coming. Let's lure them back. The twelve warriors no longer hesitated, turned around and headed into the dense jungle. Chapter 1011 Target Green Scale Horse The forest floor was filled with moist vapor and some H, lounds covered in black smoke were walking through the forest. Thousands of H, L dogs appeared in Black Crow Ridge in just one night. The small beasts in the entire mountain range were almost wiped out. No animal could escape the killing of the H, L dogs. Each H, L dog is followed by a demon servant. They actually eat raw meat and drink animal blood with the H, L dogs. Their breathing was very heavy, like wild beasts, and their blood-red eyes were staring with hatred except for some birds and insects. Almost everything else alive in the mountains was eaten by the H, L dogs in two or three days. And their stomachs seemed to never be full, no matter how much they eat. Their appetite is still very strong. As soon as the H, L dogs emerge from the mountains, Serdak, under the guidance of local resistance fighters, led the army to a mountain call on the north slope, which was relatively remote. The constructed swordsmen guarded the entrances at both ends of the call and it was still safe for the time being. A.H. L. Dog had already touched this area, but before it had time to retreat, its head was chopped off by the constructed swordsman hiding in the dark, and the demon servants died with it. 
following the instructions of the great swordsman Quintus. The constructed swordsman chopped off the head of the H, L dog, pulled off a leaf like a cattail leaf, and threw the bloody head on it. There was a rustling sound in the woods inside the mountain call, and a group of constructed swordsmen walked out of it. Thank you for your hard work. Friends, now our team will change the defense. You can rest. Oh, remember to take the heads of these H, L dogs back. The commander of the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment seems to be particularly interested in these things. The Constructed Swordsman Captain stood up and said, The team of Constructed Swordsmen, who had begun wiping the demonic blood off their swords immediately cheered. The Captain here asked the Swordsman Captain, who had just walked over to change defense. Jesse, do you know how we will arrange tomorrow? The Swordsman Captain had already climbed up the horizontal branch of the big tree. At this time, he turned back and said, our entire regiment will fully cooperate with the law enforcement team's magicians and the H. L. Dogs in the mountains. The swordsman captain, who hastily collected the loot and cleaned the battlefield, then said, To be honest, there are really a lot of these demon servants. Then he asked, As the magician sent to the north to find out the news not come back yet? It's definitely impossible to come back so soon. The swordsman on the tree said, The battlefield in the glade was a mess, filled with the smell of demon blood. A constructed swordsman killed the last H, L dog. He used the long sword in his hand to chop off the heads of all the H, L dogs. He put the heads of these H, L dogs into linen bags and poured out thick purple blood. The bottom of the cloth bag dripped to the ground. Other constructed swordsmen dragged the corpses of the demon servants and H, L dogs to the pit under the big tree and covered them with a thin layer of sand. The strength of this kind of H, L dog is close to the second level monster. Ordinary infantry warriors need several people to work together to defeat one. Only these constructed swordsmen can fight the H, L dog alone. I don't know how many were killed. Those demon servants whose faces are covered with magic marks have left a shadow in the hearts of the constructed swordsmen. When they are about to die, their extremely ugly faces will always reveal pain, hatred, cunning, relief, etc. and other complex expressions. Occasionally, a team of magicians would fly over in the sky. But in the recent battles, the black magicians had suffered a lot and no longer dared to fly into this forest. I heard that the half-elf female archer was also injured. She was blown away by a ball of fire and hit in the shoulder by a shadow arrow. At that time, the swordsmen who formed the swordsman group happened to be involved in the battle. When they rushed over to rescue them, they discovered how charming the opponent's face was under the black veil. The corners of his eyes and eyebrows had the purity of an elf, but also the human girl's aura especially her eyes, are actually light red. Just looking at this face, one would never think that she is a second-level eagle eye. The number of black magicians who died in her hands could not be counted on one hand. The team of constructed swordsmen walked into the call. Samira was sitting next to a big tree, leaning against the trunk. She had a scratch on her forehead. Thea was treating her with hydrotherapy. Her hair, which had been a little longer, was cut short, broken hair, and a burn on the back of her neck. The shoulder area of the devil snake's teeth magic pattern structure on his body was also burned to a large extent. The magic pattern on it has become extremely dim. And the attribute increase of the structure on the shoulder has become very weak. Hey, why did you end up like this this time? Thea asked Samira. Her shoulder was wrapped in a bandage just inside the leather armor. And it looked like the injury was not serious. During the process of casting the hydrotherapy spell, the subject will feel special pain. Samira frowned and then said to Sia, I saw their captain. That must be their head. He is the only one who can fly. He was the fastest and released his magic quickly. But unfortunately, the arrow didn't kill him, and he ran away. What kind of magic am I talking about, and you didn't avoid it? Sia knew how fast Samira was in the jungle. Just like a cheetah. I don't know. I just felt a green skull coming out of his chest. And some black thorn suddenly grew under my feet. Entangled me tightly. And I couldn't run away. Fortunately, this magic pattern structure is not bad. If I hadn't worn this, my upper body would have been burned. Samira rolled her eyes. This small injury was really nothing to her. Back then, her arm was almost broken when she shot an arrow. So she couldn't just wrap it with a strip of cloth. For a moment, continue fighting, carrying the heads of two foul-smelling H, L dogs in his hands. Soldak walked out of the tent and said to Samira, Archmage Harper said that was a death entanglement. If you don't die this time, follow me. Your strength has nothing to do with it. Count you lucky. It was rare that he would be so angry 
and put on such a bad face that Samira and Thea did not dare to speak. Be sure to be careful next time, Saldak said again, before leaving in a hurry. Seeing Saldak walking away, Sia patted her chest and breathed out softly. Snort! Samira wrinkled her straight nose and made a face at Saldak's back. Serdak has been very busy lately. The Lord's army has been expanding its frontline camps and has not sent out infantry soldiers to search the mountains. Recently, the mountains and plains are full of H, L dogs, and black magicians are constantly flying around in the air. The great swordsman Quintus and his constructed swordsmen are divided into several fighting teams, hunting H, L dogs all over the mountains and plains. Magicians are also flying. Go to the sky and start chasing each other in the air with the black magicians. Generally speaking, the magicians of the law enforcement group have a certain advantage. Especially since there is a second level eagle eye hidden in the mountains here. As long as the black magician flies into Samira's range, it will be difficult to escape intact. The black magicians on the opposite side will also set various traps. If some magicians and constructed swordsmen are accidentally injured, Serdek will have to take care of them. Following this, Lord MacDonald's army built a camp with log walls in the rainforest below the mountain ridge, and in just one week opened up a straight forest road, and the other end of this road connected to the town of Bansk. On the day the forest road was opened, the heavy cavalry regiment of the 3rd Army entered the camp. Serdak and others also stood on the high black crow ridge opposite the camp, and saw with their own eyes nearly a thousand cavalry trotting along the forest road, followed by a large convoy of supplies. Preliminary estimates indicate that there are nearly 10,000 infantry regiments in this camp. Now that nearly a thousand cavalry have moved in, the entire camp seems overcrowded. Seeing the slightly familiar forest road, Serdak remembered that when he was at the forest farm camp in Handanar County, the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment was tasked with opening a forest road in order to allow the Bena Heavy Cavalry Regiment and the Heavy Catapults can enter Moyen Ridge. However, in the end, these troops fell in large numbers under the ferocious counterattack of the evil spirits, which ultimately led to the failure of the Moyenling battle. Even after all this time, those tragic scenes still lingered in Soldak's mind. Yes, how could I forget it? This stupid move by Groa really makes me feel a little familiar. Serdak muttered in his mouth. What? Great swordsman Quintus stood beside him and didn't hear what he said clearly. Archmage Harper looked at the young man in front of him and wanted to know what kind of unique charm he relied on to gather so many powerful second-level players. Even an Earl Lord may not be able to make a strong second-level follower willingly. Serdak wiped his face vigorously with both hands and then said, Nothing. Starting from tomorrow. Our small group of troops will be retreating steadily. We can only lose, not win. We are going to lead their cavalry all the way to Black Crow. At the end of the ridge, there happens to be the intersection of three rivers, and their horses will be just decorations. Great swordsman Quintus looked surprised. He didn't expect that Serdak had such a big appetite and actually wanted to eat the heavy cavalry on the opposite side. Are you interested in someone else's horse? Great swordsman Quintus couldn't help but ask. Green scale horse. Of course. I have wanted this kind of war horse for a long time. Serdak said bluntly. Although I have never come into contact with the heavy cavalry of the 3rd Legion. I know the heavy cavalry of Lord MacDonald's 1st Legion very well. On the Terra Pagan battlefield. None of us constructed swordsmen can face them head on. War. Great swordsman Quintus made an extremely positive evaluation of these heavy cavalry. Serdak was a little speechless. Of course he knew that foot combat was what swordsmen were good at. Chapter 1012 Valley Chase In just a few days, the H, L dogs wandering in Black Crow Ridge were wiped out by the Construct Swordsmen group. The Black Magicians did not expect that this group of Construct Swordsmen were not afraid of exposing their whereabouts at all. Although during this period, the Black Magicians the Magician forcibly interfered several times and lost several Black Magicians. This made the Black Magician McCarthy very angry. But there was nothing he could do. The only gain was to find out the specific location where the Serdak Legion was hiding. Subsequently, Glover MacDonald immediately sent two heavy cavalry regiments and three infantry regiments to go straight to this mountain call. Because there were magicians probing in the sky, Serdak knew the movements of the Lord's army in advance. By the time they surrounded the mountain call, Serdak led the heavy armored infantry regiment to the valley at the foot of Black Crow Ridge. During this period, some new troops were recruited one after another, and the number of Serdak's troops has exceeded 8,000. Although the team is a bit bloated, these soldiers are all members of the Resistance Army. They have rich experience in jungle survival 
and are also very experienced in how to escape the pursuit of the Lord Army. A heavy cavalry regiment of the Lord's Army of less than 200 people was wandering at the foot of Black Crow Ridge Mountain and happened to encounter a retreating heavy armored infantry regiment. This heavy cavalry squadron actually wanted to hold back Serdak's heavy armored infantry regiment by itself, relying on its equipment advantages of heavy armor and knight's lances. The great swordsman Quintus and the constructed swordsman group happened to be away. Otherwise, Serdak planned to directly eat the heavy cavalry squadron of 200 people. The soldiers of the 1st Heavy Infantry Regiment fought and retreated in the jungle, retreating all the way to the river. There were vines growing all over the jungle, making it impossible for the war horses to run. In some places with dense vines, the cavalry had to take teachers. Their large cavalry force is chasing us from behind. What should we do? Samira jumped down from the crown of a big tree and reported to Serdakwi. Serdak looked at the 30 or so flat-bottomed boats docked by the river and said, Call the soldiers to get on the boat and let's go to the other side of the river. Most of the heavy armored infantry had crossed the river, and the remaining first heavy armored infantry regiment also jumped on the punts. These 30 punts could only transport a thousand people at a time, leaving 500 people unable to board the boat. He quickly took off his heavy armor and threw it on the boat. However, he jumped into the river and swam across the river holding on to the side of the boat. The heavy cavalry tried to rush to the river bank to stop them but they were blocked by a hail of arrows fired by archers on the other side of the river. I watched helplessly as a wave surged in the river, pushing more than 30 flat-bottomed boats, and almost all of them docked without ferrying. The heavy cavalry stood by the river, facing Serdak's heavy armored infantry across the river. Some knights couldn't help but try. The water in this river was a bit deep. As soon as the front legs of the green-scaled war horse stepped into the river, they were already below the chest of the war horse. In desperation, the knights could only pull the reins of the horse and let the green-scaled war horse plop back to shore. At this time, Groa MacDonald, who had been following behind and eating ashes, finally led a large force to catch up, looking at the heavy armored infantry regiment retreating on foot along the other side of the river to the west. Commander Groa finally gave the order again. The first and second heavy cavalry regiments continued to pursue the rebels across the river bank. The 3rd and 4th Heavy Cavalry Regiment circled from the shallow water area 10 miles behind the river to the other bank and continued the pursuit. Then Groa looked at the panting infantry regiment running all the way, thought for a moment and said, Let's set up some rafts here. Among the supplies brought over from the camp, there are sheepskins that can be blown into airbags. Inject air into these sheepskin airbags and tie them under the raft to become a raft for transporting troops. It was this kind of raft that Groa wanted to make he said to several cavalry regiment commanders. I want to deploy some troops on both sides of the river bank, and then the cavalry on both sides will go hand in hand. I will make some rafts here to meet you. This river will be an important passage for our eastward expedition in the future. I will have the infantry regiments along the river bank. Forest roads were opened on both sides for the cavalry to pass. After hearing Groa's arrangement, several commanders of the heavy cavalry regiment had no choice but to take orders and set off. Just as the four heavy cavalry regiments began to take action, Groa suddenly noticed a noble knight standing under the shade of the trees on the other side of the river. Although he had never seen it before, his intuition told him that the man opposite was the commander of the rebel army. Serdak looked at the young commander quietly. Samira originally wanted to shoot an arrow from a long distance to see if he could hit it. But after hesitating, he jumped down from the top of the tree and followed without looking back. Lead decisively behind the large group. More than 30 flat-bottomed boats also followed the large army down the river. A group of heavy cavalry was pursuing them along the other side of the river. But it seemed that they did not dare to stay too far away from the large army behind them. The rainforest was overgrown with vines, and the cavalry had no speed advantage. In this chase, because the Soldak Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment had been adopting a strategy of avoiding battle, the main cavalry of the Lord's Army of the Third Army believed that these heavy armored infantry, the armored infantry, were vulnerable. Under the influence of this overconfidence mentality, a large number of the lords of the Third Army were scattered along the river. Groa's army of lords participating in the battle totaled 15,000 people, including 10,000 infantry warriors, 2,000 heavy cavalry, 2,000 light cavalry, and 1,000 archers. But all combat units of the Third Army, they are all scattered in a narrow valley area between the frontline camp and the Kempola Valley, in order to allow the cavalry to pass. Groa planned to open a forest road in the dense woods on both sides of the river. The infantry of the 3rd Army were once again reduced to a group of lumberjacks. 
the heavy armored infantry regiment finally reached the decisive battle place set by Serdek, and the lords of the third army on the opposite side were finally dragged out of their formation. Almost all the lords' armies could only operate in battalion units. The pursuit of the cavalry at the front was always to hold back the heavy armored infantry regiment until reinforcements from the rear arrived. It's just that during the pursuit, they didn't realize that they had put some distance between themselves and the main force. In other words, there were no large troops at all, and the entire third army was dragged into a ball of loose sand. This is a low-lying canyon where three rivers meet and then split into two branches. A river flows to the canyon town to the east. Another river flows to the collapsed land in the south. On both sides of the valley are fault mountains more than 50 meters high. The area in the middle is still 3 to 4 kilometers wide. But the entire canyon is 10 kilometers long. The place is divided into various parts by meandering rivers. Which is called the Kempella Valley by the locals. Once here, the heavy armored infantry regiment no longer needs to retreat blindly. At this moment, Serdak's heavy armored infantry regiment has been fully equipped with four heavy armored infantry regiments that can participate in the battle counting 500 constructed swordsmen and 500 archers. There are a total of 7,000 people participating in the battle. At this moment, it is ambush in the canyon. As night fell, there were flowing rivers everywhere, which blocked the progress of the heavy cavalry regiment. Those cowardly rebels! In front of the cavalry of the 3rd Army, they would just run away with their tails between their legs. If it weren't for this river, they might not survive tonight. Now we can only let them live a little longer. Wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow is the time for our cavalry to level this canyon. Many cavalrymen in heavy cavalry regiments think so. Currently, there are only four heavy cavalry regiments catching up. And a large number of infantry are still cutting down trees behind. As for the thousand strong archer group, there is actually no archer group left. Just now, the great swordsman Quintus led the constructed swordsmen to ambush the archer group. For the constructed swordsmen, this group of archers is in the jungle and is not qualified to act alone. Chapter 1013 Battle of Kempella Groa's auxiliary team actually set up more than a hundred rafts in just one day and set off down the river that night. When it was just dawn, Groa led three infantry regiments to the Kempella Valley on rafts. At the same time, he also received news from the messenger that the 10th Archer Regiment, which was rushing here day and night, had arrived last night. They were ambushed by unidentified swordsmen and the entire army was destroyed. This was another battle group that was attacked and killed after the 7th Infantry Regiment. The shadow of this constructed swordsman group shrouded the entire 3rd Legion. And Groa stepped off the raft with a livid face. Because the black magician McCarthy was shot by Samira. Although he was not killed by her arrow, he has been unable to command other black magicians recently. Under the siege of the Hell Hounds by the constructed swordsman group, only a few walked out of Black Crow Ridge alive. The main reason is that Serdak urgently needed the heads of these H dogs. So he offered the constructed swordsmen a price they couldn't refuse. The troops sent by the Black Magic Priory suffered heavy losses. So Groa had lost aerial reconnaissance at this moment. Groa stepped off the raft and began to lay out the battle plan with the commanders of the heavy cavalry regiments waiting here. He even took some notes for this and marked the locations of each cavalry regiment on the map. The only thing they lacked was knowledge of this canyon. Groa did not expect that this place would be divided into five somewhat twisted triangles by five rivers. Moreover, it was the rainy season and the river water was always high. Even tall war horses, like the green scale horse cannot cross the river on foot. The carefully prepared battle plan was completely useless. And Groa felt a little irritated. Then he assigned the four heavy cavalry regiments to other continents. While he and his personal guards guarded one continent. Subsequently, there were only three fully equipped infantry regiments which were also dismantled by Groa into 5,000-man troops. Evenly distributed on the five continents, the raft shuttled back and forth in the river, quickly spreading out the troops. But this canyon did not light up as Groa expected. The canyon is low-lying and has many rivers. So heavy fog filled the air early. If viewed from a high altitude, the Kempella Valley looks like a vast sea, with infantry and cavalry all shrouded in heavy fog. At this moment, Serdak stood on the high cliff on the north side of the Kempella Valley, quietly waiting for the Lord's army in the mist to disperse as much as possible. Sia was lying among the water plants on the riverbed. When she raised her head, she could see the rafts floating on the river slowly coming to a stop. Hearing the low sound of the horn in the distance, Sia pulled out the magic dagger given to her by Soldak from her waist, swung her gorgeous fish tail, and moved her body smoothly close to the bottom of the raft. 
she raised her dagger and silently punctured the airbags of the rafts floating on the water. One, two, three. Every time she punctured an airbag, she used a small wooden wedge to gently plug the hole. Without too much external pressure, the airbag only leaked a little. Serdak slid down the valley along a vine. At this moment, all the soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment were in the depression on the north side of the valley. Soldak made a gesture to Ned Mosby. And Ned Mosby led the 1st Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment towards the west side of the canyon. He glanced at the commander of the 2nd Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment again and nodded to him. This newly promoted commander was the camp leader with a high reputation in the Resistance Army. He led the 2nd Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment to the canyon. Surround the east entrance. Group after group of infantry soldiers disappeared into the Sea of Fog. Serdak personally led the 3rd and 4th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiments. The Constructed Swordsman Regiment and 500 archers out of this low-lying swamp, and focused on the center of the triangle in front of them. The great swordsman Quintus, the two-headed over Gulidum, and Serdak walked at the front of the team, followed by the fully armed shield warriors. The friction of the armor made a neat rustling sound, especially in the mist. Infiltrate people. Before the fog cleared, Groa commanded a thousand infantry soldiers to spread out in a fan shape at the front moving forward to explore the location of the Soldak Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. There was only the sound of gurgling water and the chaotic footsteps of the army. Sixty Construct Knights gathered around Grova. These Construct Knights were his personal guards, different from the squadron captains of the Heavy Cavalry Regiments in the Legion. These Knights were Groa personally spent a lot of money to establish, and it was the team of this Constructed Knight Squadron that allowed him to quickly take control of the command of the Third Army. The Knights surrounded Groa in the center, and everyone groped forward in the fog, hearing the scraping of armor. The infantrymen walking in front finally realized that they were about to encounter rebel soldiers. Everyone raised their tower shields and held long swords. Everyone stood close together to form a human wall, and the infantry soldiers behind were also ready to attack. The mist was blown by the wind, and the footsteps on the opposite side became clearer and clearer. The outlines of heavy armored infantry soldiers gradually appeared in the thick fog. The human wall was much longer than this side and the shield warriors had countless sharp and long swords coming out from behind. Spear, Serdak, Gulitum, and Quintus stood at the front. In the mist, great swordsman Quintus and Serdak exuded a faint magical glow, and a halo shone under Serdak's feet. Before attacking, Gulitum let out a loud roar similar to a roar. With this roar, all the shield warriors began to run, rushing towards the human wall of the Lord Army. When the infantry soldiers on the Lord's army saw that the soldier at the front was actually more than three meters tall, like a mountain of meat, their eyes widened and their faces suddenly changed. Everyone had a look of horror on their faces. Are all warriors this tall? How can we defeat such a tall warrior? The soldiers of the Lord's army became panicked. Before the battle began, the human walls of the defensive formation showed signs of loosening. When the two-headed ogre rushed into the crowd, he immediately knocked down the infantry soldiers opposite him. The big stick in his hand was rounded and smashed down. The infantry soldiers in front of him fled in all directions. A huge gap suddenly appeared in front of Gulitum, and he rushed in with big strides. The great swordsman Serdak and Quintus behind him could only block the ogre's left and right sides firmly, and the shield warriors behind also rushed up in the footsteps of Serdak and Quintus' great swordsmen. The constructed swordsmen were not in the first echelon of the charge formation this time, but followed behind the spear warriors. When the shield warriors of the infantry regiment collided with the soldiers on the opposite side, the first to attack were the spear warriors in the second row holding Paglio's spears. They only needed to thrust the spears out through the gaps in the shields without thinking. It is best to avoid the opposite shield. Suddenly, there was a sound of armor breaking on the battlefield, and the infantry soldiers of the Lord Army were stabbed by spears continuously. Screams were heard frequently in the fog. Groa could feel that the entire formation was slowly retreating and the battle was starting in the front, as if those who screamed were his own people. The heavy armored infantry on the opposite side pressed forward unstoppably and quickly. Before the soldiers here could react, the human shield wall in front had been completely broken through. The screams were like a curse, making people feel scared. The constructed swordsmen hiding behind the spear warriors jumped out one after another at this moment, holding big swords in their hands, like meat grinders on the battlefield, crossing the defense line composed of shield warriors. They began to choke and strangle these infantry warriors. The number of heavy armored infantry on Serdak's side showed an overwhelming advantage. The successive attacks overwhelmed the opposing lord's army and they continued to retreat backwards, leaving only a pile of corpses. 
Perhaps it was because Commander Groa was personally supervising the battle from behind. Or perhaps because these infantrymen had no way to escape. Although the troops here were being attacked and retreated steadily. No one still took the initiative to surrender. The fog finally lifted a little. And I could see farther. Commander Groa saw that this continent was crowded with countless heavy armored infantry. And people kept falling in the battle. Under the protection of the construct knights. Groa led a group of men to fight and retreat and finally retreated to the fork of the river in the center of the valley. At this time, his troops were forced into a blind corner, but sixty construct knights blocked several attacks launched by heavy armored infantry soldiers and construct swordsmen. Under the command of the constructed knight guard captain, the infantry soldiers reformed a shield wall. Serdek also slowed down his offensive pace. He didn't want to overwhelm the opponent's defense in one go. The commander on the opposite side made such a bold battle deployment, which made Serdak feel a little incredible. What kind of self-confidence does he have to dare to divide his troops like this? The constructed night guards were worried about the constructed swordsmen rushing over from the opposite side and did not dare to join the battle on the frontal battlefield. They could only gather together to protect Commander Groa. Several magic flares flew into the sky like an unfolding iris. In the Kempola Valley shrouded in mist. The infantry regiment in the distance could not see Groa's magic flare at all. The raft stopped on the other side of the river. Groa ordered his men to shout loudly to the soldiers guarding the other side. Finally, someone noticed the fighting here. Infantry soldiers from other continents crowded to the shore. The fog dissipated a bit. And other heavy cavalry regiments from other continents discovered the fighting situation here. The third heavy cavalry regiment was the first to notice the fighting situation here. Coincidentally, more than a hundred rafts were leaning against their side of Lujo. The heavy cavalry quickly led their horses onto the rafts, preparing to cross the river to support them. 500 heavy cavalry and war horses almost filled the raft. The infantrymen jumped into the river one after another, supported the raft with their shoulders, and pushed the raft closer to the mainland on Commander Groa's side. But just when the rafts floated to the center of the river, something shocking happened to all the heavy cavalry. The rafts were actually sinking slowly, and the river water soon submerged the wooden rafts on top of the rafts. The cavalry's boots also stepped on the river water. When everyone realized that the raft was sinking rapidly, the knight shouted. The raft is going to sink. Everyone push it quickly. The infantry soldier in the river wiped the water stains on his face and complained to the cavalry on the raft. The waves are too big. They hit me right after a wave and I can't push it at all. The cavalryman looked at the heavy fog and couldn't feel a breath of wind at all and immediately yelled. Bart, there is not even a breath of wind in this canyon. Where are the waves? Before the cavalryman could finish his words, a huge wave came over and the raft tipped sideways. A group of unprepared heavy cavalrymen and their horses fell into the river one after another. Chapter 1014 The Horn of Victory The heavy cavalry of the Lord's army were wearing heavy armor. These heavy armors quickly sank to the bottom of the river with the heavy cavalry. No matter how hard they struggled, they could not float up. Instead, these war horses fell into the river and swam to the shore one after another. Many heavy cavalrymen wanted to take off their armor when they fell into the river. However, in the turbid river water, the armor that could have been easily put on now became impossible to take off no matter what. The surface of the river is like a tumbling dumpling soup pot, constantly boiling. There were also infantry soldiers who were good at water and wanted to rescue the heavy cavalry who fell into the water. Some smart heavy cavalry simply hugged the necks of their horses and asked them to bring them to the shore. At this time, two rows of archers formed behind Serdek's team. Everyone stood neatly on the shore, shooting the lords in the river together with the spear warriors. They avoided the green-scaled war horses in the river. Some people did not even wait for the green-scaled horses to swim to the shore, but used their spears to pick up the reins in the water and drag the struggling horses to the shore. Suddenly, the entire river was stained red with blood. Seeing the tragic situation in front of them, the Lord armies on other continents did not dare to cross the river like this. They could only watch as the soldiers in front of Commander Groa fell one after another, seeing that the heavy cavalry on other continents refused to cross the river for reinforcements. Serdak waved his hand to Quintus' great swordsman and ghoul item. The two second-level warriors suddenly burst out with stronger combat power. Behind them were no longer shield warriors, but a group of constructed swordsmen. Almost instantly, all the infantry soldiers in front of Commander Groa fell. The remaining sixty construct knights were protecting Commander Groa, but they were unable to charge. So they showed the knights' strongest combat effectiveness. Under the trembling of five hundred constructed swordsmen, these constructed knights did not last long at all. Serdak did not persuade them to surrender and let them die in the most honorable way on the battlefield. 
As for Commander Groa, the moment the defense line set up by the constructed knight squadron was broken, he had already taken off his heavy armor and jumped into the rolling river, guarded by two of his henchmen. Before he could adapt to the water environment, he felt as if a big fish was grabbing his legs and dragging him to the bottom of the river. He was so frightened that he struggled and screamed. The river water poured down his mouth into his stomach, and he suddenly passed out in the river water. By the time Sia dragged the unconscious Groa to the shore, the war on this continent was over. Serdak was preparing to lead the infantry regiment around to another continent. The fog cleared, and the magician's figure appeared in the sky. They cooperated with the shield warriors to drop fireballs from the sky. Originally, the heavy cavalry on the second continent had prepared their charge formation. Balls of fireballs fell from the sky and exploded in the formation of the heavy cavalry. The entire heavy cavalry was immediately stunned. The regiment blew up the camp. Even a specially trained green-scaled horse would neigh in terror when encountering fireballs exploding around it. The shield warriors lined up in a dense shield wall and approached little by little. As they approached, they struck the edge of the iris shield with their long swords, shouting, Surrender without killing! Surrender without killing! Surrender without killing! It was as if this voice was the only voice left on the battlefield. The heavy cavalrymen tried their best to control the horses under their crotches, and the magicians in the sky were flying back and forth on the handles. The first cavalry soldier jumped off his horse, dropped his weapon at his feet, and raised his hands high. With the first one, there will be the second one. Gradually, everyone chooses to surrender under this oppression. The battle lasted until noon, when Serdak announced that he had captured the second continent. Naturally, the heavy cavalry on other continents would not sit still and wait for death. They began to choose to break out towards the outskirts of the Kempela Valley. However, there are only two exits in the Kempela Valley, and there are cliffs 40 to 50 meters high in the north and south. These heavy cavalry chose to break out collectively from one exit. There may be a chance to rush out, but they are on their own continents. There are two continents in the Kempera Valley that are more like two weird-shaped islands. Without rafts to cross the river, they can only be trapped on the islands. The first thing these heavy cavalry had to solve was to cross the continent in shallow water. Another heavy cavalry regiment rushed towards the West Valley exit along the winding passage of Lujo. The first heavy armored infantry regiment was stationed at the entrance of the valley on the west side. Naturally, Ned Mosby would not let these heavy cavalry go. He did not even want these heavy cavalry to surrender during the battle. In order to offset the charge of the heavy cavalry, Ned Mosby asked the soldiers to cut down some logs in the forest outside the valley mouth. Each log was thicker than an adult's thigh. He framed these logs into the most primitive shape. The resisting horses almost blocked the entire valley entrance. In this way, the strongest charge of the heavy cavalry was defused. And then, they desperately blocked these lords, who wanted to break through. These lord armies also rushed out with all their strength. Because they also knew that if they could not rush out, they would definitely die inside. Unfortunately, the magician in the sky once again flew past the reinforcements. And nearly 4,000 heavy armored infantry surrounded them from behind. The entire battlefield was filled with the sound of swords hitting shields. And the sound was like a spell that bewitched people's hearts. Waves of poignant and soft songs came from the battlefield. The songs did not have any lyrics. But it was easy for people to get lost in them and make everyone lose their fighting spirit. Like a wife confiding her longing to her husband on the battlefield. Like an elderly parent praying to their son on the battlefield for his safe return. Like a young child eagerly praying to see his father. Put down your weapons and go home. Let the battle in front of you end. As the last two heavy cavalry regiments were declared destroyed, some of the infantry in the valley chose to escape over the cliff more than 40 meters high, while more of the desperate infantry soldiers finally chose to surrender. Commander Groa led 15,000 soldiers of the 3rd Army to participate in this pursuit. However, a large number of infantry soldiers were scattered along the rivers along Black Crow Ridge, and the total number of 3rd Army entering the Kimpella Valley was less than 8. Thousands of people. Among them, the 10th Archer Regiment, which was supposed to arrive on time, was intercepted and killed by the Constructed Swordsman Regiment halfway. Among the 8,000 people who entered the Kempela battlefield, there were four heavy cavalry regiments and four infantry regiments. In addition, there were 60 Construct Knights around Commander Groa, as well as infantry supporting rafts, and some loose infantrymen who were logging along the way were temporarily recruited to the front line by Commander Groa. Only one of the four heavy cavalry regiments surrendered to Serdek, and both men and horses became prisoners of Serdek. Among the other three heavy cavalry regiments, one of the heavy cavalry attacked the west exit of the valley. 
after declaring failure. They slaughtered the horses one after another, and then fought to the death with the heavy armored infantry who rushed up. The last one died on the battlefield, although the other two heavy cavalry regiments surrendered. The way of surrender was rather strange, and it firmly grasped Serdak's heart. When they surrendered, they made it clear that they wanted to exchange their belongings for freedom and a chance to live. Their belongings included green-scaled horses, black iron heavy armor, knight spears, etc. However, Commander Serdak needs to make a promise in public that he will not cause trouble for them during their withdrawal from the rainforest. In order to get these green-scaled horses, Serdak chose to accept their proposal without hesitation, and even allowed them to take away the knight's sword for self-defense. And each person could also take away a bag of dry food and a water bag. After all, although this rainforest there are no large beasts, but the venomous snakes and beasts in the jungle can sometimes kill people. As the main force of the third army was completely wiped out in the Kempera Valley, Serdak quickly led the constructed swordsmen on green-scaled horses to kill all the way to the third army on the forest road opened by the Lord Army. Legion Forward Camp With the cooperation of the team of magicians in the sky, the frontline camp with a capacity of 10,000 people was breached the next afternoon. When Serdak broke through the camp, the soldiers here didn't know that Commander Groa had become Serdak's prisoner. After the Third Army's frontline camp was captured by Soldak, the remaining Third Army forces retreated along the forest road. In the mountains outside Bant's town, there were still many reconnaissance teams. They didn't know it yet. Major changes have already occurred on the front line. Serdak collected a large amount of trophies at the frontline camp. When 8,000 heavy armored infantry arrived at the frontline camp, Serdak only rested in this camp for two days. All the prisoners were escorted back to the rear. But Groa McDonald was handed over to Archmage Harper of the Law Enforcement Group. The Battle of Kempella completely turned Soldek over. A large amount of loot had to be recorded in the account books. And Louis Fitch, the quartermaster, almost broke his hand from writing. Serdak selected the best armor and infantry soldiers. And then continued to advance westward, aiming at the town of Bansk. Along the way, countless baggage trucks were picked up by soldiers of the 3rd Army. With this forest road, the time from the frontline camp to the town of Bansk was shortened by nearly three times. Just a week after the Battle of Kempela, Serdak and the constructed swordsman group had arrived outside the city wall of Bansk town. It wasn't very obvious on the map, but when he arrived at Bansk town, Serdak realized that the town was really big. It was said that it had a permanent population of about 150,000. It was also the southernmost town in the Ganbu Plain. Countless adventure groups have chosen to come to Bansk town in order to search for those rock golems in the collapsed land. It is said that these rock golems contain the heart of rock inside their bodies, which is an important material for making magic puppets. There are not many noble lords settled in this town, even far less than the town of Takale. The main reason is that because of the frequent rebel activities here, they will always come to blackmail these noble lords from time to time. At this time, the Green Empire had just entered March. Chapter 1015 Bans Town When Serdak gathered his army in Bans Town, the rebels hiding in the surrounding mountains also emerged one after another and joined Serdak's heavy armored infantry regiment. In just three days, Soldak gathered 10,000 heavy armored infantry outside the town of Bansk. If the rebels attacked towns in the past, the size of 10,000 people is really not that much. However, the weapons and equipment of the heavy armored infantry regiment in Serdak are already quite luxurious. Everyone wants to cover their teeth with armor. At this moment, Bant's town only has less than 3,000 people from the 3rd Army gathered. And there are also nearly 1,000 city defense guards. There is a very simple city wall outside Bant's town. The height of the city wall is only 4 meters. And there is no room for people to stand on the wall. There are only arrow towers every 10 meters to place the guards. And there is no moat outside the city wall. When the city wall was built here, it was only to prevent wild beasts in the mountains from attacking. And it did not even consider war. The entire Ganbu Plain is not that big. This is the territory of the McDonald family. And the people have also moved here from other territories of the McDonald family. Duke Numa originally agreed to set up the portal of the Ganbu Plain in Rith City because this plain did not have many resources. It can only be said that the climate is pleasant and suitable for living. Therefore, no one thought that Lord McDonald actually wanted to move his family to the Ganbu Plain and break away from the jurisdiction of the Bina province. Serdak waited outside Bant's town for three days, until the heavy armored infantry regiment set up an offensive posture outside the city, and the constructed swordsman group also appeared on the siege battlefield, flying around in the sky. 
the garrison of Bansk finally decided to leave the city and surrender. Soldek smoothly took over the town of Bansk without losing a single soldier, and also received 4,000 surrendered troops. Among these 4,000 troops, there are 1,000 city defense brigade guards, and the other 3,000 are the soldiers of the 3rd Legion, including 2,000 light cavalry and 1,000 infantry. The remaining cavalry heard the news of Commander Groa's defeat. The town of Bansk was evacuated early, when Soldak's heavy armored infantry took over the town of Bansk and led a group of cavalry into the city. The residents of the town also ran out to welcome them. It can be seen that the rebels and the team are familiar with the people in the town, especially Ned Mosby. Soldak saw more than one girl holding flowers and waving to him. Thea and Samira rode green-scaled horses side by side and followed Serdak. Gulitam and Nalhuar chatted while walking forward. The cavalry entering the city went directly to the town hall in the center of the town. Compared to the inexplicably excited civilians, the nobles in Bant's town couldn't help but smile. However, it was these people who actually made the decision to surrender. Without them lobbying the city defense forces and the remaining troops of the 3rd Army, it is estimated that Soldak would have inevitably fought a brutal siege. Although Serdak won the Battle of Kimpala, this does not mean that the combat effectiveness of the 3rd Army was weak. In fact, Serdak highly recognized the combat effectiveness of the elite troops of the 3rd Army. The town hall of Bant's town is much more grand than the town hall of Doden Town. And there is also a special memory hall. In the center of the semicircular hall is a high podium, surrounded by stairs, the shaped auditorium. Wooden tables and chairs are all old furniture. And there is a simple atmosphere everywhere. Parts of the coat of nobles and the coat of territory are also engraved on the surrounding walls. The emblem of the Green Empire and the emblem of the McDonald family hang high above the hall. Serdak summoned all the nobles in the town together. And everyone sat in the audience with some uneasiness. Soldak took Samira and Sia into the conference hall and stepped onto the podium alone. Standing in the center of the podium, Serdak stood up straight. He wore a noble badge on his chest and an exquisite magic pattern structure on his body. Looking very heroic. Introducing myself to everyone. Luther Legion Independent Cavalry Battalion Serdak. Serdak spoke the first words. All the noble lords were surprised and confused. It turned out that Lord Benna's army had entered the Gonbu Plain. For a while, the scene was a little commotion. Soldak waved his hand, signaling everyone to quiet down. Later, Serdak continued. Now the Bena House of Representatives and the Bena Military Department have appointed me to the Ganbu Plain. The main purpose is to clear out the McDonald family. This plain has been recognized as an openable territory by the House of Representatives. Everyone here. Now! On behalf of the Military Department of Bena Province. I accept your surrender application. I will ask the clerks to re-register based on your territorial certificates later. For the nobles who did not participate in this meeting. The territories under their names will be regarded as war-exploited territories. I don't care what reasons they have. As soon as he said this, the conference hall suddenly exploded. All the noble lords were secretly feeling lucky. Fortunately, they had the courage to attend this meeting. Otherwise the family property they had worked so hard to build on the Ganbu Plain would have been confiscated. Serdak paused. His eyes scanned all the nobles in the conference hall. And said, In fact, I don't even want you to surrender. As soon as these words were spoken, everyone's expressions changed instantly. Serdak still kept a faint smile on his face and said bluntly, War is a harvest for me. If you don't surrender, I will attack this place. According to the Green Empire's 433 land distribution law, this is my territory. The residents of this small town will become residents of my territory. You either die in battle, or surrender, or of course you can leave early. I prefer you to choose the third option. But now, you have saved me a lot of unnecessary trouble. According to the laws of the lords of the Green Empire, I should ensure that your territory will not be affected in the next war. Hearing what Serdak said, the nobles breathed a sigh of relief. Those nobles in the conference hall, who did not have territory were also secretly anxious. It would be great if they could have a piece of land for such a good opportunity. Serdak continued. In addition, I reiterate here that the resistance's previous lands will be recognized in accordance with the decree issued by the House of Representatives. Next, I will gradually regain large areas of land in the north of the Gombu Plain. Serdek summoned all the nobles in the town, mainly to read out the decision of the Bena military department, and to show the local nobles that he came from the Bena province and understand the situation at hand. During this period, the nobles were frightened when they heard this. But fortunately, 
Serdak did not do anything excessive. Many noble lords were secretly glad that they came to attend this meeting of noble lords. The magic guild in Ban's town has become a temporary base for black magicians. Great swordsman Quintus and Archmage Harper walked into the town's magic tower together. Black magic had evacuated Ban's town in advance. All books, magic items, experimental equipment, and blueprints and scrolls in the magic tower had been destroyed by the black magician. They evacuated it in advance, and the entire magic tower was in a mess. With scraps of paper everywhere, some of the glass windows were open, and gusts of wind blew in. The curtains fluttered in the wind, and the papers on the ground were rolled up and fell down like fallen leaves. There was no one in the magic tower. Only a few crazy age, eld dogs were imprisoned in the dungeon. And in addition, there were several dying demon servants. When these demon servants saw a group of magicians coming in from the outside, their desperate eyes showed endless pain, and they stabbed their hearts with black magic weapon daggers and died on the spot. The H, L dogs in the dungeon also fell to the ground and died. The magicians of the magic guild have disappeared, and they have not left any clues. Archmage Harper did not expect that the situation in Bant's town was so bad. For the magic guild, the loss of more than a dozen magicians without any reason is a huge loss. Not to mention there are so many books, materials, utensils and scrolls. These are the wealth of the magic guild. And anything involving magic is expensive. Of. In addition, great swordsman Quintus also received a report from his swordsman constructor. The prison at the guard camp was also empty. There were no prisoners in the entire town. The great swordsman Quintus suspected that it was the black magician who took away all the prisoners in the prison. This may have something to do with the demon servants. Chapter 1016. Grill skewers when you have time. The night in the town of Bansk was noisy and noisy, and was not affected by the war in the slightest. The heavy armored infantry regiment set up camp on a high ground outside the town. There was no curfew in the town. The city gates were open, and the shops on the main streets had extended their business hours. The streets are busy with traffic, and many infantry soldiers enter the town in groups. Everyone will find a decent restaurant to have a good meal. Then go to a bar street for a drink. If you still have a little bit left in your pocket, you can drag the ale girl up to the temporary room on the second floor of the pub to chat. These rooms are more expensive to stay overnight. Usually room rates are charged by the hour. Continuous victories have made the soldiers of the heavy armored infantry regiment very rich in wallets. And none of them have the habit of saving money to buy a house. Isn't it possible to build a house just by buying a few pieces of wood? It doesn't cost much. Serdak refused the banquets and balls given by the local noble lords. His residence in the town was the original residence of the mayor of Bant's town. The mayor took his whole family and fled to Makuso City the night before Soldak's soldiers invaded the border. The houses are among the best in the town. When Soldak passed by the butcher shop, he bought some chicken and two slaughtered yellow sheep. The fish and fruits were bought at another stall. He found that the recipes of Sia and Samira seemed to be similar. The elves also eat fish. Just like the Nagas also eat fruits. After returning to the house, he set up a barbecue grill in the pavilion in the backyard garden, marinated the mutton himself, and then began to barbecue by himself. The barbecue he made always tasted so unique. After buying a barrel of home-brewed ale from the town tavern, Serdak, Aphrodite, Samira, Gulitum, and Sia held a barbecue dinner in the yard. Everyone has worked hard during this period. Serdak will hold up his wine glass and speak to the cronies in front of him. Aphrodite did not wear a mithril mask and Samira did not have a black veil to cover her face. Without Andrew, this dinner would be a bit overwhelming. The ale tastes average, and there are always grains of wheat in the barrel. It needs to be filtered through a filter again, so that it won't irritate your throat when you drink it. Thea was sitting by the pool with a glass of ale, her face a little blushing. She was leaning on the stone railing of the corridor. If she tilted her body slightly, she might fall into the pool. A pair of blue eyes with a hint of intoxication. Opposite the mermaid sat the succubus. Aphrodite seemed to be drunk, taking a sip from time to time. Her purple eyes were as deep as the night sky. I didn't expect life here to be so interesting. Sia looked up at the night sky and let out a sigh of life. Seeing Serdak, Gulitum and Samira all sitting in the pavilion chatting, Aphrodite couldn't help but ask, Is King Jan out of the sea tribe that boring? Sia shook her green algae-like hair, twisted her body, and let her lower body sink into the pool. Her arms were only at the edge of the pool. She picked up the wine glass again and whispered, It's not bad. But here, life gives me something new to look forward to every day. Ha ha. 
It's really strange. Aphrodite smiled. Don't just talk about me. Tell me about you. I think you have more stories to tell. Thea looked at the succubus with wide eyes. Aphrodite asked doubtfully. What do you mean? Sia stretched out her fingers and drew randomly in front of her. Those lines could always form some strange magic patterns at will, showing her strong affinity with the water element and her unique ability to understand magic runes. Then she said, Even if there are not many demons who can open the void portal through magic contracts, do you think I'm different from other succubi? Aphrodite raised her soft eyebrows, staring at the mermaid girl with her deep purple eyes, her gaze becoming somewhat sharp. At least there are no annoying wings. Thea pursed her lips and took a sip of ale. She turned around on the edge of the pool, leaning against the edge of the pool, supporting her body with her elbows, raising her head, her long hair falling to the platform of the pool like a waterfall, and her eyes like the sea staring at the night sky. Aphrodite's eyes softened, as if she was caught in some kind of beautiful memory, even though she doesn't think about it all the time. It's always etched in her heart. When I met him, I almost died. It was he who snatched me back from the demons and was willing to take me into the human world. He said he would always keep me with him. He was worried that I would be in the human world. The world is running around and hurting other people. So it signed a contract of equal symbiosis with me. From that moment on, I no longer have anything to do with the demons. Aphrodite said lightly. Sia raised her chin and looked at the night sky. Her swan neck and delicate collarbones vividly displayed. Well, what you said is really enviable. Sia said with a wink. Aphrodite sat on the stone railing of the corridor by the swimming pool and said softly, As for the void portal, although this has nothing to do with the contract, it does have something to do with it. Do you know Hex technology? I don't know much about human civilization, Sia said. Aphrodite shook her head and said, This is not human civilization. It is goblin civilization. The hearty laughter of the two-headed ogre could be heard in the distance. And it seemed that they were having a pleasant chat. After waiting for a while, Aphrodite showed a small smile on her face. She had never shared these secrets with others. But this Miss Naga is different. Aphrodite also discovered some of her secrets. Sometimes a friendship between two women is built on sharing little secrets. Aphrodite scratched the fluffy hair on her head. And two short devil horns emerged from her hair. She said, In the underground ruins of the plain our people conquered. There happened to be the ruins of a goblin civilization. We found construction drawings about the gate of summoning there, as well as some related academic works. It's a pity that it's a goblin text, but I am also responsible for translating one of the books. The book translated into imperial language should be Space Rift in the Void. It is a goblin expounding the space magic in the void world from a technological perspective. Miss Naga wrinkled her delicate little nose and said, That's a convoluted statement. Although she is a water magician, she doesn't know much about space magic and she has never heard of goblin civilization. Aphrodite said, It's not easy to understand at first. Generally speaking, he is a goblin scholar studying space magic. But the theoretical knowledge is a bit distorted. And the magic pattern array he designed is just suitable for the contract summoning array. It's a different approach. Thea asked. So those who sign the contract can freely summon people in both directions as long as they have the ability to cast spells? This is what Miss Naga Mermaid is most interested in. Of course, it can't be that simple. But I can't say any more. I don't want you to take the answer to this secret back to the Janna Sea tribe. Aphrodite said bluntly. Thea shook the big fish tail in the swimming pool, raised the wine glass in her hand, and said to Aphrodite, Come on. Here's to you. Thank you for being willing to tell me so much. Do you like me? Or do you have other expectations for me? Aphrodite put her beautiful face close to Miss Mermaid's delicate ear. Her plump lips almost touched Miss Mermaid's cold ear. There was a trace of charm in her deep purple eyes. She whispered, He is a conservative-minded person. I don't like foreigners very much. So it would be good if you could open his heart. I heard that Janna has some special abilities and is very popular with human men. Thea blinked and thought that her way of speaking mixed with the siren's song did not affect Serdek. So she asked doubtfully, I do not know how. She watched Aphrodite smile without saying a word, pouted her lips and said, Fine. After saying that, he put down the empty wine glass, turned over, and lay down in the swimming pool. As the water splashed, a three-color mermaid's body appeared in the swimming pool and rushed to the opposite side with a swipe of its tail. In front of the barbecue grill, Soldak brushed grease on a roasted chicken, and the charcoal fire grilled the fat chicken until it was brown. Samira sat to the side with a dinner plate, 
There were only a few simple pieces of fruit on her plate and a glass of juice in her hand. The half-elf archer rarely drank alcohol. Drinking alcohol would affect the accuracy of her archery. Gulodim's way of drinking was much more generous. He sat across from Suldak, holding a sausage in his hand and stuffing it into his mouth. Then he poured a glass of ale into his mouth, then raised his head and closed his eyes. Chew carefully. Influenced by Serdek, he took care of his rotten teeth very cleanly. Without the dental problems, the ogres found the food tastier. Of course, he also has very strict requirements on his good brother Nailhuar when it comes to brushing his teeth. Nailhuar didn't drink either. He originally spoke with a bit of a tongue, and his brain and mouth were not in sync with each other. Sometimes what he thought was not consistent with what he said. He attributed this problem to his not being very smart and his reaction being a bit slow. So he didn't want to be unable to recite magic spells in the future because of drinking. It's actually good to drink some broth. Dak, when are we going to talk like town? The ogre asked. The three of them had been talking about the war in the Gonbu Plain. Serdak paused for a moment before saying, If everything goes well, maybe next week. The heavy armored infantry regiment needs to be reorganized. These resistance forces have enough combat power, but they lack the understanding of military discipline. In addition, I am also preparing to wait for the next batch of soldiers recruited by the resistance army. It is estimated that they will arrive in Bant's town this week. At present, these forces are facing the main army of the Lord Army. It is still difficult to win. Another reason Soldak has not mentioned yet is that the magicians of the law enforcement group found that the Black Magic Monastery here is more rampant than expected and have submitted a reinforcement application to the Bena City Magic Guild. Chapter 1017 The Person Laughed by the Crow. This time, a group of second-turn mages will arrive in the Ganbu Plain. The magicians have sent Groa MacDonald back to Bena City. It is said that this son of the MacDonald family is not only a peripheral member of the Black Magic Monastery, but also the founder of the Hell Dog Army. 1. This battle in the Ganbu Plain completely brought Gulitam and Samira into everyone's sight. Their performance was too dazzling. Especially the half-elf archers with elven blood, favored by the great elf Windrar, and holding the sky strike bow in their hands. They are completely the nemesis of the mage. It is estimated that their personal information has long been registered by the Magic Union. Case closed, Serdak said. If we can successfully conquer the Ganbu Plain this time, we may have to go to the big battlefield when we go back. Is there any delicious food over there? Gulitam always looks at the problem from the perspective of a foodie. Serdak said uncertainly. For you, there will be some more advanced monsters. Maybe worth tasting. For me, it's just some more powerful demon warriors. I need to kill some. Maybe in exchange for some advanced weapons. Or advanced magic pattern structures. For Samira, the ground over there is full of gold. The two-headed ogre's eyes lit up, and he said excitedly. This is great. I have been participating in such battles all day long. I feel that my strength is weakening. My dream is to be able to slay dragons. And then have the title of Dragon Slayer as the prefix of my name. And then take a bath with dragon blood. Of. This idea of yours is very dangerous. Do you know how far behind you are in terms of strength compared with a dragon? Serdak asked Gulitam. Of course. It's not possible now. But if it's not possible now, it doesn't mean it won't always be possible in the future. Gulitam said somewhat unconvinced. Serdak thought of the Estander plane at this time. And didn't know when he would have the power to go to that plane. He turned to look at the half-elf archer again. Samira was peeling mangoes. She raised her head in confusion and asked. What do you want me to do? Or can I choose not to go? Cannot. Serdak shrugged his shoulders and said. Samira said indifferently. Then before you go, prepare some more dog heads. Of course, no amount of sacrifices like H. L dog heads is too much. The next day, Soldak gave a speech in the central square of Bankstown. And the entire square was filled with town residents. There are nobles in decent clothes. Ladies with gold and silver ornaments and hats like flower baskets businessmen in leather vests, shop owners, small vendors, ordinary workers whose clothes have been washed and faded, and farmers with muddy legs. Everyone gathered in the square, and everyone had their own area. For example, the farmers would never stand in the middle of the nobles. Everyone knows that he is the current consul and military officer of the town, and he also represents the military headquarters of the Bena province. His army team comes from the rebels, and is fully supported by the rebels. Now these rebels have become for the entire Bena province. Lord MacDonald's army is the real rebel army. Serdak, surrounded by a group of heavy armored infantry. 
ascended to the podium in the center of the square. This used to be the richest town at the southern end of the Ganbu Plain. Many adventurers gathered here. They came here to find the secrets hidden at the edge of the world. They also brought some wealth to the town. But now here, but it suffered from wars and gradually declined. I know that everyone here is not satisfied with the current life. Maybe some people here think that we are responsible for all this. If we did not provoke a war, we would not let the town decline to what it is now. What I want to make clear to you here is that we don't like fighting. But when our homeland is invaded by foreigners, someone must stand up and fight for it. Some people will definitely say that wherever there are foreigners, you are a group of rebels. If you really think so, I can tell you responsibly that if we don't stand up now, more H, L dogs will slowly appear here. Those demon servants who are like walking corpses will lead them and exude. The appalling stench passes through your front garden. If you don't stop them, they will hurt more people. It may not be you now, but there is no guarantee that it won't be you next time. I believe everyone must have experienced it deeply in their recent lives. McDonald's inaction does not speak for everyone and most importantly, they have betrayed the Ben and Noble Lord's covenant. This is our land, and we will drive them out if they encroach upon it. The townspeople in the square all shouted. Kick them out. Get out. Serdak raised his hands and pressed down to calm down the agitated townspeople. I know that many people are very afraid of us. Afraid that we will come here to take away what originally belongs to you. We are not here to suck your blood. On the contrary, we hope that the lives of everyone in the town will get better and better. Our income is based on the prosperity of the town. Only when the people here are rich will we gain more. I just came here. And there are many decisions that have not yet been announced. Of course, I am also worried that someone will misinterpret my meaning when I explain these things. So I want to announce them here first. The tax plan for Bant's town this year. In one sentence, all transactions are tax-free. When these words were spoken, there was an uproar in the square. Everyone cannot understand that without tax revenue, how can the town hall maintain itself? Or is there no need for a town hall at all? Soldak waited for the scene to become a little quieter and then said, In addition, all farmers engaged in agricultural farming in the small town will receive corresponding financial subsidies based on the area of cultivated land. The town supports the opening of shops and workshops. The free market is not only tax-free, but also exempt stall fees and health fees. In addition, people in the town who have no income will receive a minimum living allowance every month. And this money will be directly allocated to the town's welfare homes and shelters. Unexpectedly, further financial subsidies will be implemented, which is something that has never happened in Bant's town. Serdak looked at the confused crowd around him and slowly explained. Many people will be confused. If this is implemented, how will the town's financial revenue be maintained? Will the civil servants in the town still have food to eat? Will this place become a chaotic place where management is abandoned? My answer is simple, no. First of all, the town will publicly sell a large part of the unowned land. The arrears obtained from the sale of these lands will maintain the current normal operation of the town. I believe that such days will not last long. This kind of low-priced land, it can only be bought now. Of course, according to imperial law, land transactions are only for nobles. After saying this, Soldak took Samira and Sia and hurried to the military camp outside the town. A large amount of materials have been seized from the Third Army and have been cleaned up. The next few days will be about merit point statistics. Recently, resistance fighters have joined the heavy armored infantry regiment one after another. The number of people in the Legion is increasing. And there are also some management problems. Serdek rushed back to deal with several thefts in military camps. These resistance fighters lack knowledge of military discipline. At this time, you always need to hold the big stick in your left hand and the sweet dates in your right hand. Regarding the problem of theft in the army, Samira dealt with it more severely. No matter what the resistance soldiers say or do in the military camp, she doesn't care too much. Even if they are lazy in training. It doesn't matter. Everyone has only one life on the battlefield. If you don't cherish it yourself, how can you expect others? But if anyone touches the things in the military camp, it is of a different nature. The supplies in the military camp now belong to Viscount Soldek. Even if it's just a grain of wheat falling out of the grain bag. That's it. Samira, who has been used to a hard life since she was a child, has an excessive obsession with money. No one can touch the property belonging to Viscount Soldek. Those who dared to take their belongings out of the military camp were nailed to the wooden rack outside the military camp. Not far outside the military camp is a mass grave. There was originally a pine forest, 
and the townspeople often used the wood there to make wooden coffins. Over time, the hills became bare. In order to replant some pine trees, the town hall encouraged the townspeople to bury their deceased relatives there. A pine tree was planted in front of the tomb. It did not belong to the family cemetery and was not managed by a tomb keeper. It gradually became a mass grave. Some of the town's death row prisoners are also buried there. Some of the heinous ones simply hang themselves on wooden crosses. Rather than burying them, they just hang them on wooden shelves and let them rot. Crows and vultures are frequent visitors to mass graves. Now these red-eyed crows and bald-headed eagles land on the wooden shelves outside the military camp from time to time. They didn't eat fresh meat either. They just squatted on the wooden frame, staring with blood-red eyes, waiting for the soldiers who were being tortured on the wooden frame to die. The anticipation of death in their eyes will drive the soldiers who are nailed to the wooden frame and being tortured crazy. The soldiers can even think of the miserable appearance of their own intestines and stomachs. Being eaten by a group of crows. Before the theft, there was still a merit point in the military camp's accounts. But now, just stealing a shield and selling it to the weapon shop in the town will cost him not only his merit points, but also half his life. In such a hot summer, sweat and tears flowed down the face, gathered at the chin, and fell into the soil drop by drop. All the soldiers in the military camp would pass by the cross when they walk out of the camp. Some acquaintances looked embarrassed and didn't even know whether to say a word of comfort. Or someone simply came up and said, you are so confused. There were crows laughing and laughing on the side. It felt like life was worse than death. Chapter 1018, Who Destroyed Takarai? The town of Bansk is located at the southernmost point of the Gonbu Plain. It is the southwest corner of the eastern rainforest and is on the edge of the rainforest. There is a large area of fertile land on the west side of the town. Many local noble lords in Bansk town have their noble territories on this flat land. Many manors have been built here, which are basically farming and grazing. However, there are no pastures here. Horses. Mainly because Lord Macdonald was worried that the horses raised on the pasture would be given to the rebels in the eastern rainforest at a cheap price. So he asked the Lord here to only raise some cattle and sheep in the pasture. In fact, the land owned by the noble lords in Bant's town is not very large. And it is far less than the standard of a barony. Some of the land that Serdak wants to trade is fertile land in this area. He plans to confiscate and sell all the land of the noble lords who did not attend the meeting at the town hall. And the auction plots will be announced soon. It stood in the lobby of the town hall. As for whether the original owners of the land want to spend money to buy back their land, that is entirely their business. Serdak doesn't care who he sells the land to. However, his move really dealt a blow to the noble lords who were preparing to alienate the Bene coalition. Some lords were simply willing to use some cattle and sheep to offset the land purchase price. The vast majority of the noble lords did not want to hand over the family fortunes they had worked so hard to build to others. And they were unable to resist Serdak's tyranny. So they could only take the money to redeem the land. Soldak is going to hand over this money to the town hall of Bant's town. Part of it will be used as the salary of the civil servants of the town hall for a long time in the future. The other part will also be used to provide some financial subsidies to the farms that are planning to engage in planting. The last part is the startup fund for the rescue station. In fact, if the welfare homes and shelters are to be maintained, it will require long-term funding. Soldak plans to allocate a portion of the town's future fiscal revenue specifically for this purpose. The second batch of resistance troops arrived from Canyon Town to Bant's Town exactly a week later. And it was already mid-March in the Green Empire. The new army that arrived in Bant's Town has nearly 15,000 people. So far, the Soldak Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment has almost 27,000 people. According to the establishment given by Bena Military Headquarters, this army is currently seriously overstaffed. The bearded Edgar and the long-legged Dennis also rushed to the town of Bansk. They saw the military camp outside Bansk town, the neat tents in the camp, and each infantry soldier wearing exquisite full-coverage armor. The bearded Edgar de Gas was completely impressed by Soldak. In just one and a half months, such a large army was created out of thin air. Even if the Bena Military Department gave it maximum authority and support, it would not be an easy task. In addition, there were ten great magicians who came from Bena City, and the leader was the great sorcerer Morrison. Serdak once had a chance encounter with this archmage when he was in the Paglos Mountains. These ten archmages are all second-level powerhouses, and each of them possesses an elemental body. This is the law enforcement group, specially transferred here to deal with the Black Magic Monastery. Now the number of magicians from the Magic Guild 
who have entered the Ganbu plane has increased to 40. However, it seems that the strength of the Black Magic Hermitage that wants to fight against the Ganbu plane is still insufficient. In addition, following this group of new soldiers, there were 10 commanders sent by Marquis Luther. These officers were the backbone of Luther's army. Marquis Luther was worried that Serdak could not fully control such a large army by himself. So he transferred his direct lineage to help Serdak control this new army. However, what these ten commanders did not expect was that when they walked into the military camp outside the town of Bansk, they found that the camp was in order and there was no chaos at all. Of course, they didn't see the crosses outside the military camp that had been demolished two days ago. There are not just one or two resistant soldiers who were nailed to the pillar of shame. After they accepted this double baptism of body and soul, some chose to leave, and some were still reluctant to part with the benefits of the army. Besides, they had nowhere to go. He could go, but he shamelessly chose to stay. The newly arrived resistance troops had just arrived in Bansk. On their first night, after eating toasted wheat cakes and vegetable soup, the first thing they did was to be repeatedly warned by the veterans here not to steal anything in the military camp. In addition, you must not stand behind Lady Samira and peek at her. These two things are also very dangerous. Of course, this time the new army has joined the heavy armored infantry regiment. Serdak already has sufficient supplies and can even equip everyone with heavy armor. Quartermaster Lewis Fitch had to repeatedly convey one thing to Soldak. Your army is overstretched. Serdak said, the extra soldiers can temporarily serve as reserves. There is no such thing as a war without death. At present, in addition to various military supplies, the heavy armored infantry regiment also has 1,200 green scale horses, 2,000 ancient horse horses, and 500 ordinary draft horses for transporting supplies. These are what Serdak needs most at the moment. These horses he plans to take back to the Belan Plain in the future. After all, when the military asked him to come to the Ganbu Plain, he only established a heavy armored infantry regiment. In addition to these horses, Serdak actually harvested 70 sets of magic pattern structures. Some of these magic pattern structures were confiscated from the personal guards of Commander Glover MacDonald. And the other part was obtained from the squadron commanders of the heavy cavalry regiment after the Light Cavalry Regiment in Bankstown surrendered. Although they obtained 2,000 intact horses and 2,000 sets of armor, they obtained nothing in terms of the magic pattern structure. In order to complete this eastern expedition plan, Commander Grova has actually turned the town of Bansk into a material transfer place. So the various materials stored here are also extremely rich, which also saves Serdak a lot of trouble. Even Louis Fitch, the quartermaster, said that the Battle of Kempola was the most profitable he had ever seen. It was actually more profitable than Marquis Luther leading his army to capture Luther City. The main reason is that when the Bene Coalition captured Ruth, the total strength exceeded 200,000. Once there were more people, the oil and water allocated to each lord would be diluted a lot. After another week of reorganization of the heavy armored infantry regiment, Soldak left the reserves of 7,000 heavy armored infantry regiments in the town of Bansk to guard the rear supplies. The town of Bansk was temporarily handed over to Bearded Edgar and Dennis to manage. Bearded Edgar was also responsible for managing the 7,000 heavy armored infantry reserves. Serdak personally led the elite troops of the 20,000 heavy armored infantry regiment towards the town of Takarai. Archmage Morrison and great swordsman Quintus led their respective teams to accompany them. A month and a half ago, the town of Takali had been destroyed by the resistance. The town's war served as a breakthrough for the resistance. Bearded Edgar teamed up with three other resistance forces to carry out a looting of the wealthy households, businessmen and nobles into Kaliai town, and moved away almost everything in the town, valuable items, even some solid wood furniture. After the Lord's army reoccupied the town of Takarai, these people looted the town again, in addition to the ruins of bricks and tiles. Only some poor people who could not survive were left in the town. The nobles who escaped would come back to take over their lands around the town. Some of the poor people who could not survive were taken back by the resistance army, and more of them fled to other towns, leaving the entire town of Takarai in ruins. By the time the army arrived at Takarai town, the ruins were already covered with grass, and only the broken bell tower in the town square still stood in the wind. But I don't know who moved the big bronze bell. The inside of the bell tower was in tatters. Apart from a few uncared for wild children, there was only a skinny, lame old dog. Serdak was a little surprised that the old dog was still alive. After asking the children, I found out that the reason why this old dog survived was that it went down the river to fish. This dog provided at least half of the children's food every day. 
Serdak stood in the abandoned yard that the magician Avid once bought. The damage to the house here was not too serious. But the doors and windows were removed. It was probably taken away to start a fire. All the utensils in the house had been looted. After he walked out of the door and looked back at the entire dilapidated manor, he realized that this was really the most failed real estate investment by Magician Avid. The initiator of this was actually the Resistance Army. If they had not attacked this town, then this town would at least have maintained its original dignity like the town of Bansk. And the poor could have continued to live under the oppression of the rich. Alive. Of course. It's just living. Serdak did not receive any supplies in Takalai town. The supplies needed for the 20,000 strong army to reach here could only be transported from Bansk. But there were only so many supplies in Bansk town. So supplies such as food. He still chose to act together with Aphrodite and transport it from Venice city. There is a garrison camp between the towns of Hatangata and Kale. If Serdak wants to attack Hatangata town, he must capture this garrison camp. The magician who went to the north to gather information brought back information that the second legion of Lord MacDonald's army had assembled in Makuso city and was preparing to go south. There are also thousands of troops stationed in this garrison camp. But what is a bit strange is that the black magicians, H, L dogs and demon servants, who originally appeared in the army have never been seen. Chapter 1019 Those Oak Barrels According to the news brought back by the magician who inquired about intelligence from the north, the first and second legions had been assembled in Makusuo city, but currently only the second army has chosen to go south. The vanguard has arrived at the town of Katangata, but the first army has chosen to go north for some unknown reason. Soldak stood in front of the map thinking hard about what considerations the MacDonald family had in choosing to separate the 1st and 2nd legions even after the 3rd legion had just lost. Having a mage group in the army brings many unexpected benefits. Not only is various intelligence information more detailed, but it can also be delivered to Serdak's ears in a very timely manner. And when the battle begins, the mages can also provide aerial fire support. If they don't need to fly in the air on a magic harpoon, magicians can also unleash more powerful magic skills. Now. What surprised Serdak the most was the hexagonal magic crystal in front of him, which was inserted into the gem group by itself. In fact, there are many such magic crystals in the secret room of the red dragon treasure in Serdak. The magic crystals there contain the words of runes, but the magic crystal in front of Serdak recorded real image data on the battlefield. This kind of magic crystal with memory carrier is extremely precious because they have the ability to remember images. Magicians usually record some magic inheritance in magic crystals under the instruction of Archmage Morrison. This magic crystal was taken out to record the vast land between the towns of Takarai and Hatangata. The magician flew in the air and had a bird's eye view of the entire land. With such a clear sky perspective, every big tree on the entire battlefield could be seen very clearly. Serdak did not expect that the mage group would be so generous. He took out the magic crystal and recorded the military camp of the Lord Army between the towns of Takalai and Hatangata. In Serdak's eyes, this military camp was displayed in front of him without any defense. According to Archmage Morrison's original words, If the mage group wants to defeat the black magic hermitage in the Ganmu plain, their own strength alone may not be enough. They must also rely on the help of the Bena constructed swordsman group. At present, Sernak completely controls this swordsman group. If the mage group wants to cooperate with the constructed swordsman group, it needs the support of Sernak in order to support Sernak's heavy armored infantry regiment in winning the next war. Archmage Morrison also showed full sincerity. Not only did they send magicians to the military camp to investigate the situation, they also recorded the distribution of the opponent's troops in detail. The surrounding mountains, woods, rivers, lakes, valleys, and the terrain in the direction of Hatangata town are all recorded in the magic crystal. The magician held the magic crystal in his hands, and a picture appeared from the magic crystal. Cernak and a group of officers were amazed by this in the military camp tent. As these terrain displays end and the illusion disappears, the magician takes his hands away. There is no need to worry about the garrison in the military camp now. Our heavy armored infantry regiment only needs half a day to bulldoze the military camp here. Said a heavy armored infantry regiment commander in the military tent. He was sent by Marquis Luther. One of the ten commanders who came over was good at combat deployment and training new troops. Another infantry regiment leader also nodded and said, It is easy to seize the military camp. The difficult problem is the heavy cavalry of the 2nd Corps stationed in Hatangata town. How can we block their reinforcements to the military camp? Everyone became agitated. But no officer was still optimistic about the heavy armored infantry regiment in this situation. 
an infantry regiment leader frowned and said, Judging from the layout in the magic crystal, they want to hold on to the town of Atangata. The military camp here is their frontline bridgehead. If we can lead them to the mountains, we can the advantages are much greater. Some people even took out some stones and placed them one by one on a square table covered with maps. Arranging the formation of the second army of the opposite Lord Army when it attacked. And then said, The second army has 3,000 heavy cavalry. This part of the force alone is our heavy armored infantry regiment can be defeated in one fell swoop. If ten light cavalry are deployed to outflank, it will easily form an encirclement on the battlefield. This battle will be difficult to win. Someone later added, It is estimated that there are more than 3,000 heavy cavalry. The third army also has two heavy cavalry regiments and six light cavalry regiments that should return to Makusuo. Then the current number of heavy cavalry in the second army has probably accumulated to 4,000 people. Serdak pondered for a moment and said to a group of infantry commanders, We have already figured out the strength of the troops. How about we practice this battle on the sand table? That's a good note. Everyone nodded in agreement. It is not difficult for people like Serdak to make a sand table. The entire sand table is 4 meters long and 2 meters wide, showing the terrain from the Kale to Atangata town. After the sand table was ready, Serdak, the great swordsman Quintus, and several regimental commanders hid in the military camp tent and spent almost a whole day rehearsing the war. Everyone had lunch and dinner. Having a simple meal in the military camp tent, every officer looked very tired. However, what is even more difficult for everyone to accept than being tired is that after dozens of deductions, the heavy armored infantry regiment can't see any hope of victory. Adding the advantages of the mage group and the constructed swordsman group, it is not very effective against the heavy cavalry on the battlefield. In fact, during the sand table simulation, no matter who used the heavy armored infantry regiment and the constructed swordsman regiment to attack the Lord's second army, they could only capture the garrison camp with not too many troops. But not long afterward, the garrison camp would be recaptured by the officers commanding the second legion of the Lord's army, and heavy cavalry would be used to completely overwhelm the infantry regiment in this area. Although there are a lot of mountains in this area, there is a broad valley with flat terrain near the garrison camp. In this valley, the heavy cavalry can gallop and charge at will. Serdak's legion simply didn't have any units that could restrict the heavy cavalry on the opposite side. With no hope of victory in sight, even the great swordsman Quintus advocated taking a stab at it first. Ned Mosby, the commander of the 1st Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, suggested, Why don't we stop for a while and run the town of Takhale? We can build a city wall on this ruins first. Even if we can't stop it, the second army's attack was complete with enough time to withdraw from the dock. Serdak pondered for a moment and said to the group of officers in front of him, This is our best chance to defeat the second army. As long as we can stop their heavy cavalry to support us, we will have a chance to capture the garrison camp. And I there is a way to defeat their heavy cavalry. But they are relatively expensive. I really can't bear to part with such a good green-scaled horse. Serdak planted a small red flag on the slope of a valley between the military camp on the sand table and the town of Hatangata, and then said, My battlefield is here. I will mobilize six corps and mages. Stop their heavy cavalry here. Then he raised his head and looked around. Surprise was written on the faces of all the group leaders. Soldak set his sights on Ned Mosby and said to him, Ned Mosby, in the next battle, you and the second, third and fourth heavy armored infantry regiments will besiege the military camp. I will be responsible for blocking the heavy cavalry of the second regiment here. We cannot return the second corps to Makuso City. Otherwise, if we want to capture that city, I am afraid that countless soldiers will lose their lives. We must firmly hold the second army in the town of Hatangata. Hearing what Soldek said, great swordsman Quintus asked with a puzzled look, Dak, what are you going to do? We don't have any knights to block those heavy cavalry, and we don't have a strong wall. You could it be that they want to use heavy armored infantry to stop these thickly armored war horses? Of course not. But I have a way, and I have the support of the magician group. Right, Serdek said very optimistically. Archmage Morrison, who had been standing silently in the corner, raised his head and said with a smile, Yes, I will provide all support within my ability. Serdak turned around, inserted small branches into the mountainous area, and said confidently, Believe me, with the help of Archmage Morrison, my plan will become much simpler. Serdak's heavy armored infantry regiment did not stop at Takalai. He did not even prepare to establish a material turnover center in Takalai, and advanced directly along the road towards the military camp. 
according to Serdak's original words, that garrison camp is very good and can meet all the needs of my army. Along the way, Serdak asked the soldiers in the heavy armored infantry regiment, who knew how to tie up a straw man to each make a straw man and carry it on their shoulders. On March 17th, Soldak led nearly 8,000 heavy armored infantry regiments to bypass the military camp and directly inserted into the valley between the military camp and the town of Hatangata. These heavy armored infantry soldiers arrived at night. These scarecrows were buried in the forest and on both sides of the road. Hundreds of scarecrows were spread throughout the forest and on both sides of the two kilometer long road in the forest. Buried in the soil with these straw men were 2,000 oak barrels filled with black powder. To be honest, Burying these oak barrels is really a technical job. In order to transport the black gunpowder to the plain of dry cloth, Aphrodite returned to the city of Haranza in advance. And transporting so many oak barrels to the military camp was also a big project. Serdek and Aphrodite almost been busy all night. And that night, many officers and heavy armored infantry soldiers in the military camp thought that Serdek was doing some indescribable things with the mysterious female magician in the camp. In fact, the two men only moved 2,000 oak barrels. Everything was ready. And even the 8,000 heavy armored infantry disappeared into the dense forests on both sides of the valley. Chapter 1020 The Burning Scarecrow March 20th The 1,234th Heavy Armor Infantry Regiment simultaneously launched a fierce attack on the military camp. Nearly 3,000 Lord Troops are stationed in the military camp between the towns of Takarai and Hatangada in the Ganbu Plain. They never thought that the heavy armored infantry regiment on the opposite side would actually attack their own heavy cavalry regiment. Attack the camp right under their noses. The military camp station dispatched the fast horse responsible for reporting the news before the heavy armored infantry regiment on the opposite side formed an encirclement. Although there were several magicians in the sky responsible for intercepting and killing, these messengers still delivered the news to the town of Hatangata. The heavy cavalry regiment of the 2nd Army stationed outside the town of Katangata was immediately mobilized. The majestic blue-scaled horses carried the heavily armored knights and marched toward the military camp. These heavy cavalry lined up in four columns on the avenue. But none of the heavy cavalry made a rapid march. They kept trotting all the way. The horses' hooves stepped on the solid less road, making a rumble that could be heard for miles. On the side of the military camp, Ned Mosby led the heavy armored infantry to form a shield wall. Under the rain of arrows, they slowly rushed towards the gate of the camp. Countless arrows fell, and some arrows hit the heavy armored infantry behind them through the gaps in the shields. However, these heavy armored infantry were also covered with a layer of full armor, and ordinary arrows could not penetrate them at all. For crossbows were set up on the arrow towers in the military camp. The giant crossbow arrows were accompanied by a buzzing sound. As the giant crossbow arrows were shot out from the arrow towers, the heavy armored infantry regiment began to suffer casualties. A giant crossbow arrow flew out from the arrow tower and first hit the iris shield in the hands of the shield warrior in the front row of the heavy armored infantry regiment. The huge force caused the giant crossbow arrow to pass through the iris shield, and the sharp tip of the arrow passed through the heavy armored infantry soldier. Chest. The infantry soldier fell backward. A gap immediately appeared in the military formation, and the infantry soldiers with giant crossbows stuck in their chests fell one after another. Ned Mosby gritted his teeth and shouted hoarsely, Take up the position and raise the shield! Archmage Harper, who was standing behind the entire team, immediately summoned several magicians, and everyone flew into the air on magic harpoons. High in the sky, Archmage Harper took out a scroll of fire magic from his arms. He pulled the magician hat on his head and shouted, Get ready to explode the flame scroll! Then he dived towards the military camp from high altitude, and the magic handle even kept hovering. At the critical point of the casting distance, he tore open the explosive flame scroll. The spell and the magic circle appeared at the same time and were completed instantly. A ball of fire, as it rolled towards the arrow tower and crashed down, Archmage Harper pulled hard on the steering wheel of the magic harpoon handle. The magic harpoon flew high into the sky again. The big fire ball rolled with endless flames and hit the arrow tower. There was a loud crackling sound. The roof of the entire arrow tower exploded. A huge fire broke out on the arrow tower. The hand of the crossbow operator who was standing around the crossbow was burned. The explosion spread, and two people were blown out of the arrow tower, and the rest of the controllers fell on the arrow tower. As for the bed crossbow, it quickly caught fire and was engulfed in flames soon after. The other three arrow towers were also blown down by the explosive flames. The four bed crossbows suddenly misfired, 
and the Lord Army soldiers hiding in the garrison camp suddenly let out desperate curses. The archers hid on the log walls of the military camp and fired rounds of arrows. But these ordinary arrows did not pose much of a threat to the heavy armored infantry. The heavy armored infantry regiments were almost outside the gate of the military camp. Archmage Harper returned to a chariot and, protected by two rows of shield warriors, arrived forty yards in front of the main entrance. As the jerky and lengthy spell sounded, magic arrays appeared under Archmage Harper's feet, and a fire elemental also appeared behind him. This fire elemental was wrapped in countless flames, and it would use these fire elements to power poured into Archmage Harper's body. Archmage Harper's eyes also turned red, and the huge magic circle rushed into the sky amidst the sound of the spell. A small fire cloud suddenly gathered in the originally dark red sky, and countless magic runes appeared on the body of the fire element. But at this moment, it returned to the elemental world. The fire cloud and the sky gathered together fiercely, and then countless blazing flames rolled over. Surging, a huge meteorite fireball rolled down from the sky, and the Lord Army soldiers hiding in the military camp retreated one after another. A huge fireball meteorite fell from the sky, smashing the heavy wooden door of the general camp into pieces. Rows of heavy armored infantry stepped on the flames, rushed in from the main entrance of the military camp, and fought with the garrison soldiers inside the military camp. The progress of capturing the camp was very slow, but Ned Mosby worked steadily. The injured soldiers on the battlefield were carried to the back of the battlefield, and there were special people to help treat their wounds. Subsequently, the other two gates of the military camp were also announced to have been breached. At this moment, Ned Mosby's ears still echoed with Suldek's words. Slow down the attack and give the soldiers in the station some time. Serdak was standing on the mountain ridge now, and the 8,000 heavy armored infantry were also hiding on the slopes in the valley. From a distance, I could see a large, dark mass of the heavy cavalry regiment rushing towards the military camp from the road. They are well equipped, covered almost from head to toe in thick, shiny black armor. The war horses also wore iron masks on their heads, and their long necks were scaly neck armor. Surrounding the bodies of the war horses are four each piece of armor is covered with armor. And even the four legs of the war horse are equipped with hard leather armor to prevent the enemy from cutting off the horse's legs. Lord Macdonald actually raised nearly 20 heavy cavalry in the Gonbu Plain. In terms of the number of heavy cavalry alone, it can be said that it exceeds most of the noble lords in the Bena province. It is no wonder that Lord Macdonald once wanted to control the entire Terrapagan region. With this army alone, he really suppressed all the noble lords in the Terrapagan area. He didn't know where he bought so many green-scaled horses. The war horses didn't run very fast. When they entered the forest in the valley, setting up snagging ropes in the forest had no effect at all. They stopped at the entrance of the valley and seemed to have discovered the heavy armored infantry ambushed in the woods on the hillside. However, they did not attack the heavy armored infantry in the woods of the valley. Instead, they simply ignored their presence and passed by on the mountain road in front of them. The valley slopes are densely covered with jungle, and there is no way to arrange rolling stones. When they continued walking into the canyon, the heavy cavalry suddenly discovered that there were straw men wearing tattered clothes and holding signs on both sides of the road. They had that weird smile on their pumpkin heads, which made people feel a little bit weird. Fear. The leader of the heavy cavalry regiment rushed forward with the horse's reins in hand, swung the heavy sword in his hand, and slashed hard at the scarecrow's body. With a slash of the knife, the straw man broke off. There seemed to be nothing inside except dead grass. Why are there so many straw men on the road? The leader of the heavy cavalry asked the bodyguard behind him. Not what I passed by here a few days ago, the guard replied. The leader of the heavy cavalry was a little worried. So he walked forward another ten meters and chopped down the next scarecrow, but still found nothing strange. What exactly do they want to do? The cavalry squadron leader behind him couldn't help but ask. The leader of the heavy cavalry continued to move forward slashing down all the scarecrows he encountered along the way with his sword. The commander of the heavy cavalry regiment said, Don't worry about him. Our mission is to support the military camp and tell the knights that they must maintain their physical strength before fighting. The heavy cavalry regiment continued to advance along the road. The commander of the heavy cavalry regiment looked back at the hillside on the left and said to a heavy cavalry squadron leader, You stay and keep an eye on those people on the hillside. If they dare to come down, just charge them to death. Got it. The squadron leader took the order, pulled out his team and parked it on the roadside, carefully watching the group of soldiers on the top of the hillside. The heavy cavalry in front found the magician's figure in the sky. What about those magicians in the sky? The guard asked worriedly. 
Heavy Cavalry Regiment Zhang pulled down the mask on his face and continued to move forward while saying, Ignore them for now. If they dare to come close, let the archers shoot them. Archmage Morrison led a group of magicians riding magic harpoons in the sky, watching the heavy cavalry passing by on the narrow valley road. They lined up neatly and ignored the heavy armored infantry ambushed on the hillside. Care about this group of magicians, including himself. It was seen that the cavalry force had completely entered this two kilometer long valley road. An offensive magic flare was also sent out from the other side of the hillside. And Archmage Morrison waved to a group of magicians following behind. These magicians controlled the magic pots and suddenly accelerated and flew out from the left and right sides of the Archmage Morrison's body. Each magician has a fixed target on the battlefield. They don't even need to use magic scrolls. These magicians are the elites of the magic union. Almost all of them can do fireball instantly. So everyone has it in their hands. With a roaring fireball, they swooped down and dropped the fireball from the furthest distance. The fireball in their hands was not thrown at the knights on the avenue, but at the scarecrows on the edge of the avenue. Arrows that were not too dense flew towards them. Although they flew to the highest point in the air and lost any strength, the cautious magicians still supported themselves with magic shields. The armors worn by the heavy cavalry were not afraid of such powerful small fireballs, not to mention each of them held a knight's light shield in their hands. These light shields were engraved with magic runes and had a certain degree of magic resistance. The fireball ignited the straw men standing on the roadside. At first, no one among the knights paid attention. Just let them burn casually. And many of the scarecrows were broken into two pieces. The straw on them was very dry. And the wooden poles that supported them seemed to be covered with grease. And they burned violently when exposed to fire. Then I heard a Bah! 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 Sound coming from the wooden pole. This strange sound was like the sound of flames in a blacksmith's furnace. 